so this is regarding the ca final advanced auditing november 23 exams marathon video this marathon is going to be in two parts right now you are watching part 1 which is which is around 11 to 12 hours again part 2 will be there which is also will be for 12 hours now what are the things that we are covering in this marathon kindly watch this introduction don't skip it getting it in this i'm going to give you certain instructions and uh, material sources all that so that you can comfortably watch the entire marathon and get maximum benefit now so first of all we are going to cover 70 percent of the syllabus 70 percent of the syllabus definitely if at all you watch this entire marathon and do prepare solidly you know from the book whatever the book you are following getting it i can assure you 50 plus marks provided you need to listen to this fully and also read thoroughly after understanding everything so what are all the chapters or topics which i am covering i am covering something called fundamentals topic will be there 700 theories nothing but this is nothing but audit report chapter caro also will be covered and the peer review quality review will be there nbfc audit and all will be there insurance audit consolidation is there remaining standards will be there ethics is covered you know fiscal loss overview we are going to give bank audit risk assessment automated audit committee uh, you know i don't know up to bank audit i will surely upload these chapters depending upon the duration i will upload them as a part three primarily i'm thinking two parts on it will come if at all part three comes then part three also i will be adding so all these videos we are going to merge and then upload that's it so that's how you see 12 hours video getting it now all these were recorded during may 2023 revision class which i have taken on face to face so that recording i'm merging i have not yet publicly posted this anywhere so now only i am posting publicly for november exams purpose now in this particular marathon even amendments that are applicable for november are covered specifically for november there are no amendments whatever amendments were there in the may exam the same amendments will be applicable for november but don't worry once rtp gets released if at all any additional amendments given for november we will be covering through a separate video but i don't think it will be applicable i don't think it will be, there will be any amendments for november all the amendments that were there for may same will apply for november be you know that i am very sure next up so marathon will be in two parts now what are the important instructions what material we have used we have used you know sresta material like uh, just a minute uh, we have used our own material getting it like uh, we can call we call them as we call it as smart notes you go to our website rest of a cacma in the study materials you see there is a study material option you just click on that see a final so in this notes and videos all the pdfs are available at free of cost getting it you can just simply download you know this colored notes is what we have used you can download the colored notes right now the colored notes is out of stock hard copy is not available we can only order them on a bulk basis only then we get at a cost of 200 rupees around getting it again courier and all will be again costly so if at only thousand out of thousand books we order considering only two to three months time already majority of my students have got smart notes so i we are not going for any special publishing if at all we order for lesser copies the price will be too heavy and i don't want student to be overburdened with the price so soft copies being provided at free and other materials which i have used in the marathon is also given as part of this getting it so this is the material which i am going to use now while watching this marathon commonly you do certain mistakes like what i noticed is many students watch the marathons at a higher speed playback speed they just increase 1.5 times 2 times speed and watch don't do that you know what is your objective of listening to any videos is to understand and retain many students are forgetting this fundamental logic and they are just simply trying to finish it up trying to finish the video that's it if your targeting is to finish the video exam result will finish you getting it don't be hurry up like i'll tell you you some of you might argue sir i'm a very speed learner even if i watch at higher speed i can understand everything it's not just about understanding it's about having strong connection it's about having strong connection while listening to this marathon you will understand how many unknown points you will discover in the audit subject it's not even unknown i can say they are all part of the syllabus they are there in the book but you did not realize that point getting it you will discover so many so please watch sincerely at standard speed if you watch at standard speed you not only understand you retain it for longer period of time your revision time later reduces a lot if you increase the watching speed you need to spend more time on the revision many of you might have felt this earlier you watch some videos but when you're revising you're unable to reconnect you're unable to recollect anything that you learned earlier see if you do not remember the provision that's okay if you are unable to recollect what you learned 
you did not you are you are not understanding what you learned earlier that the reason is you you finished up the videos please listen at standard speed very important getting it that that enhances your learning you know perfection more you require very less revision later so one important that most important instruction so part one will be 12 hours part two will be 12 hours anyhow so that's it so it will be definitely useful post your you know whatever views as comments below if at all you are having any doubt also post it i'll try my best to reply every query maximum possible okay if at all i couldn't reply don't be like you know i don't think wrong but maximum i'll try to reply getting it that's it so continue you know happy watching bye so fine so let's start with uh, the chapter audit report which is the first topic now so in this audit report first uh, we must understand how to prepare audit report getting it after after doing i mean after uh, you know even preparing this chapter many of us are not having good command on how to draft an audit report correct so what is the procedure so what is the process to prepare the audit report what is the format of the audit report what is the contents of the audit report so the chapter audit report itself the learning objective is you need to understand how to prepare the audit report getting it so now any any report or any letter it has some format it has a particular structure getting it same way audit report also has a particular format so what is the format of audit report the format of audit report is first we will have something called title the audit report is having something called title next it has addressing addressing now what is the title of audit report first of all independent auditors report the title must be with a clear heading called independent auditors report third one second one addressing in case of in case of private sector entities in case of private sector entities the title is generally to the owners in case of company the owners are members so it is to members in case of government companies to the president of india that word also we can use because for government company predominant ownership is held by the president or in order to avoid conflict we can also use simply the word to the members and first of all understand we are discussing this entire audit subject in the context of general purpose financial statements audit in which context general purpose financial statements audit that to financial audit because audit is a subject which is a general term audit is a general term audit is is an aspect which is there in every field not only in the finance field but in every field audit audit aspect is there so we are discussing financial audit that to in which context auditors general purpose financial statements which are prepared either under fair presentation framework or compliance framework getting it so what are all that terms that we will gradually learn getting it so address means to the members of the company now next the first and foremost paragraph is opinion the first and foremost thing is opinion the first aspect in the audit report straight away after title after address is opinion we have various types of opinions so what are the definitions what are the concepts and how the wordings will be all that we will be looking into then whenever you are giving an opinion for your opinion there will be some basis there will be some logic behind it there will be some reason behind it more importantly so what is that reason what is that basis you need to clearly talk about that in the next paragraph that is basis for opinion paragraph getting it so once you give the opinion whatever the opinion you give what is the basis for that so that you need to give in basis for opinion then next up, material uncertainty related to going concern material uncertainty related to going concern this paragraph will come only if sa 570 situation applies only if the condition only if the situation given under sa 570 if it applies only then this paragraph will come into picture otherwise sa 570 matter that paragraph will not come in the audit report getting it next sixth one we have the next one is key audit matter we have the next paragraph key audit matter then we have 
emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraph actually other matter paragraph is, is a different section in the audit report so let's give a different number to it so other matter paragraph so emphasis of matter paragraph other matter paragraph so these are the main contents in audit report the main discussion is on these paragraph on these sections remaining are very simple remaining are very simple so what is the next section of the audit report 9 to 1 we have something called other information para we have something called other information para immediately after other matter paragraph you can have other information para other matter paragraph is sa 706 emphasis of matter paragraph is sa 706 and even key audit matter is 701 whereas opinion and basis for opinion these two are discussed under 700 and 705 put together next other information para is something SA 720, SA 720. So that standard talks about other information. Then eighth one, management responsibilities. Management responsibilities. Ninth one, auditors responsibilities. Actually, uh, actual heading is eighth one, responsibilities of the management. Ninth one, responsibilities for audit of financial statements. Actual side heading is responsibilities for audit of financial statements so responsibility of audit is with whom for whom the auditor so indirectly what is that paragraph talking about it talks about auditors responsibility able to understand next then tenth one we have another matter called report on legal other legal and regulatory requirements report on other legal and regulatory requirements here we have 143 subsection 1 duty to enquire and report 143 subsection 3 approximately 15 matter checklist items and 143 subsection 11 caro which consists of 21 clauses broadly all these matters we have to report all these matters we have to report so 21 here 15 here 6 so 21 plus 21 42 clauses so, in this side heading, under this section, under this para of the audit report, the auditor has to give comment, his opinion, his report on 42 different clauses, 42 variety of information. Getting it? You see, auditor is not just giving opinion. Audit report is no more a boring document. Getting it? He is giving a lot of information from his report, from his particular end. Getting it? Next, after this audit report, with this contents will be over, then finally, then finally, signature of the auditor, signature of the auditor, then date of the audit report, date of the audit report, then place of the audit report. With this, the audit report contents will be finished. So these are the broad contents of the audit report. Now for each of them, there is a question, there is a concept. Getting it? In exam, they may ask you about, write about sign of the audit report, write about the signature or write about the place of signature getting it signature of the auditor's report the auditor's report date must not be later than must not be later than the date on which he obtained sufficient appropriate evidence and the date on which the those who are having responsibility for the financial statement have asserted that they have accepted and acknowledged their responsibility this is a definition a signature this is the point what the point simply says you know it simply says Auditor must sign the audit report. Auditor must sign the audit report only after. Only after. Actually, signing the audit report, we, we need to discuss 145 subsection 2 provision as well. Uh, sorry, 140, 141, section 141 subsection 2 and 145 section. These two sections talk indirectly about who should sign. These two sections indirectly talk about who should sign. Date of the audit report. What should be the date of the audit report? It should be only on or after approval of the financial statements by those who are having authority to give approval. And it should be signed. The audit report must be dated. The audit report must be signed only after obtaining sufficient appropriate evidence. That is what the actual sentence meaning. Anyhow, we will discuss all that. Getting it? Right. So this is the broad contents of the audit report. 
Now, what is meant by title we understood. The title must be clearly mentioned as independent auditor's report. The auditor must mention title as clearly independent auditor's report. Then addressing to the members of the company. Clear? Now, opinion. So, first what we will do is we will discuss each and every concept. Then at a glance we will we'll look at the material. Getting it? First of all, understand this is a revision class. So, come out of regular class assumption. Getting it? Only audit report we will we will discuss in regular for 20 25 hours. In a regular class, we will discuss for 25 hours only audit report. But now here we hardly have a time of 6 hours for this. So, what is the first paragraph in the audit report? No need to worry. This is the material. Okay. Now, where you can download this material? You can download this material which is open. OMG. Just a minute. Just a minute. Yes. So, the first and foremost thing is the opinion pair up. Getting it. So, like what are the various types of opinions we are having? In the audit report, in the auditor's uh, report, what are the various types of opinions that we will have to give? First of all, if you look at the objective of the auditor. So, where the objective of the auditor is discussed in SA 200. And even in your CA inter, it is discussed in nature, objective and scope of audit, the first chapter. So, where you start with the definition of audit, then objective of audit. So, what is the objective of auditor as per that uh, SA 200? The objective of the auditor is to obtain reasonable assurance. Reasonable assurance. Whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements whether due to fraud or error and to give opinion. Now this phrase financial statements are free from material misstatements. Financial statements are free from material misstatements. This phrase can be expressed in a different way as well. Whether the financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework. Financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework, that particular phrase, financial statements are free from material misstatements, this phrase, both can be used interchangeably. Both conveys the same meaning. Like, if you look at the word misstatement, there is a definition for misstatement. For misstatement, there is a definition. Misstatements are two types. One is fraud, another one is error. Now, what exactly the definition of misstatement as per the standard? Misstatement is a difference between, misstatement is a difference between amount, classification, presentation, disclosure of a reported financial statement item and amount, classification, presentation, disclosure which is required as per applicable financial reporting framework. This is actually the definition of misstatement. Don't worry. So, we will, we will look at that definition of misstatement, very important definition. This you need to understand with the word exception. Okay, I will show you, don't worry. So, what is the difference between mistake? What is what is meant by a misstatement? Misstatement is difference between, difference between amount, presentation, classification, sorry, amount, classification, presentation, disclosure of reported, reported financial statement item and between that and amount amount present sorry classification presentation disclosure required as per required as per applicable financial reporting framework required as per applicable financial reporting framework see how the financial statements have to be prepared first of all who should prepare the financial statements the or man manage Whoever audit is there, whoever the client is there, it is his primary responsibility to prepare the financial statements and we auditors will only verify. We will not prepare the financial statements, we will not involve in any step of the preparation process. Getting it? Because of self-review threat. If we prepare the financial statements or if we involve in judgments or in decision making process while compiling books of accounts or financial statements, naturally, we can't audit them because whatever we prepared, how can we verify them? Independence is missing. No, independence of mind is not there. Maker and checker should be different persons. 
So it is their responsibility who should prepare the financial statements. Now, how they should prepare? They should prepare as per applicable financial reporting framework. Now, what do you mean by applicable financial reporting framework? If you look at, there are two words, applicable financial reporting framework. There are three terms exactly. Applicable financial reporting and framework. Framework refers to rules and regulations for preparation and presentation rules and regulations framework refers to simply rules and regulations for what for financial reporting what do you mean by financial reporting financial reporting means preparation and presentation of financial statements preparation of financial statements means accounts final accounts reporting means presentation today we are not preparing financial statements for owners purpose Today we are preparing financial statements for stock exchanges, for prospective investors, for global markets. Correct? So, the objective behind preparation of financial statements has changed a lot. So, you are presenting the information, getting it? You are not just preparing. You need to prepare in order to present the information to various users. Able to understand. Who are the users? We don't know. Anybody. So, by using which framework we prepare? general purpose framework which framework we use here general purpose framework that's why the financial statements we prepare we call them as general purpose financial statements we have another set of financials called special purpose financials it is nothing but if the financial statements are prepared for a special purpose as per special purpose framework then it is called a special purpose financial statements how to audit them how to give opinion on them? We have SEA 800 series. In It is not there in our syllabus. Earlier it, it is there in our syllabus, CA final, but later it was removed. So the discussion on special purpose financials, discussion on audit report on special purpose financials is removed. So you need not think about that. Okay. So framework refers to preparation and presentation of finance, sorry, uh, financial reporting refers to Preparation and presentation of financial statements. Framework refers to rules and regulations for preparation and pre I mean preparation and presentation of financials. Now, what do you mean by the word applicable? For a bank, the applicable framework is different. For an insurance company, the applicable framework is different. For an NBFC, the applicable framework is different. For a company operating somewhere in Netherlands, the applicable framework is different. For a company which is operating in India, the applicable framework is different. For a listed entity, the applicable framework is different. For unlisted entity, the applicable framework is different. Correct? Schedule 3 itself is having three divisions. So, which division is applicable for a company? For a company itself, we have multiple frameworks. Schedule 3 itself talks about three different frameworks. If at all, a company is preparing financial statements as per India's. In this, for them, Division 1 is applicable. Division 1, huh? Division 1, Division 1 or Division 2? Division 1, Division 2, Division 3. We have totally three divisions. Getting it? Third division is for NBFCs. Correct, huh? Division 1 is for normal companies, which are preparing financial statements as per 2006 accounting standards. Division 2 is for NDAs. Able to understand. Which means, the moment I talk about a company, how the financial statements have to be prepared by that company? First, we need to understand, is it a listed company or unlisted company? Accordingly, I can apply Division 1 format or Division 2 format. So, which means, depending upon the nature of the entity. What is it? Depending upon the nature of the entity and the objective of the financial statements. Depending upon the nature of the entity, objective of the financials. Objective means, is it general purpose or special purpose? Getting it? That one. So, depending upon the nature of the entity, objective of the financial statements, whatever framework, whatever framework adopted by the management for preparation and presentation of the financial statements is called as applicable financial reporting framework. In uh, December attempt, I think so, not, uh, yeah, December attempt or that before attempt at CA Inter, they have asked a 5 marks question. Write about applicable financial reporting framework. Getting it? If at CA Inter itself that question asked means, at final also, you are not exceptional.
So they may ask you a four marks question. Write about applicable financial reporting framework. Getting it? So applicable financial reporting framework means in view of nature of entity and objective of the financial statements, the framework adopted by the management is called as applicable financial reporting framework. This framework can be a general purpose. I mean, this framework is also known as general purpose framework because we only discuss in the context of general purpose. Again, this is divided into two types. Fair presentation framework, compliance framework. What is it? Fair presentation framework, compliance framework. In India, across the world, more or, more or less, for all general purpose financial statements, most of the general purpose financial statements, they follow fair presentation framework. They follow fair presentation framework. What do you mean by fair presentation framework? Simple, the financial statements must be true and fair. The financial statements must be true and fair. Or, or another way we can express. The management should prepare the financial statements so as to exhibit True and fairness of the transactions and events. True and fairness of the transactions and events. Even in the audit report, the word true and fair view will appear. In the audit report, the word true and fair view will appear only in case of which framework? Fair presentation framework. If it is a compliance framework, in audit report, true and fair view word we will not use. What exactly the compliance framework and fair presentation framework? Suppose, see, uh, in company sack, suppose if you take a company as an example, a company will prepare financial statements as per which law? As per company sack. Company sack, which section talks about financial statements? 129. What 129 says? Every company shall prepare financial statements as per Schedule 3, as per accounting standards, and shall convey, and shall disclose, and shall present true and fair view. If you look at the Companies Act, it emphasizes on the word true and fair view. So, Companies Act recommends which framework? Not recommends. Companies Act makes it mandatory which framework? Fair presentation framework. Suppose, if Companies Act 129 section, if at all the word true and fair view was not included, if at all the word true and fair view word is not included, then it is called as compliance framework. Very simple. How it will look like? Every company must prepare financial statements as per Schedule 3 and as per accounting standard. Which means I cannot deviate. Suppose if a particular requirement given in an accounting standard or a particular disclosure requirement in Schedule 3 is not suitable for my operations, is not suitable for my company business. In such a case, I can't deviate. I have to follow that whether it is suitable to me or not. Very simple layman example I'll give you. Suppose accounting standard says only two methods. Accounting standard says only two methods. Depreciation method, SLM or WDV. Only two methods accounting standard says. Let us assume accounting standard is not talking about any other method. My organization, whenever they are charging depreciation, they should either follow SLM or they should follow WDB for the purpose of computation of depreciation, for the purpose of arriving profit, for the purpose of preparing financial statements. Suppose, what if on a particular mission, on a particular mission, for me, hours method is important, units method is important, that is more suitable method. Not SLM. My asset is not used in an exact same percentage every year. My asset will not depreciate every year. Getting it? In one year I will use at a higher excessive rate. Maybe second year I will not use at all. Third year I may use. Fourth year I will not use. So asset has a capacity. Asset useful life is not exhibited in years. The asset useful life is exhibited in units. The asset useful life is measured in hours of performance. If my asset useful life is measured not in number of years but in usage capacity, in such a case, SLM method is not suitable for me. WDV method is not suitable for me. Now, can I follow a different method which is suitable for me? In case of compliance framework, you cannot follow. In case of 
compliance framework you cannot follow a different method if i do not follow a different method if i cannot follow different method i am depreciating asset in some manner but i am charging depreciation equal every year it is not exhibiting true and fairness what is there in the reality is not exhibited to shareholders through amounts able to understand so the defect in compliance framework is fair presentation cannot be there able to understand company sect gives importance for true and fairness what the word true and fairness indirectly signifies you know if you look at fair presentation framework definition what the definition it is a framework in which the financial statements shall be prepared in accordance with the requirement of the framework in accordance with the requirement of the framework however you can deviate you can deviate from the requirement of the framework or you can give additional information beyond the requirement of the framework so as to achieve fair presentation able to understand in order to achieve fair presentation in order to give fair picture about the affairs of the company if you want you can deviate from an accounting standard if you want you can deviate from schedule 3 any of the requirement in order to achieve fair presentation able to understand all of you so fair presentation means we can deviate from accounting standard understand for what purpose you can deviate if at all accounting standard requirement is not meeting fair presentation objective then i can deviate so as to meet a fair presentation objective able to understand until now so now if you look at the word misstatement misstatement can be four varieties how a misstatement happens in financial statements in four ways a misstatement it may happen in amount it may be in a classification it may be in presentation or it may be in disclosure disclosure how a mistake can happen non disclosure is a misstatement wrong disclosure is also a misstatement getting it you are not disclosing again non disclosure means full non disclosure partial non disclosure non disclosure can be two types is it fully not disclosed or partially not disclosed and wrong disclosure means obviously wrong disclosure you are disclosing something else other than what is reality able to understand now presentation we all know debtors gross debtors minus provision for bad and doubtful debts this is the way to present a debtors as per schedule 3 or even as per generally accepted accounting principles this is accepted way of presentation what if the company is not following the netting of approach the provision they are showing it under liability side that's not a right presentation so in that way a company can manipulate shareholders a company can manipulate shareholders understand many a times we say many a times we speak about for better understanding of the users better understanding of the users across financial reporting you come across this word across auditing you come across this word but understand most of the users of the financial statements are illiterate in terms of financial statements they can't understand financials if you open any company's financial statements first two pages itself 99% of the ca final students themselves can't understand how about a general public getting it financial statements or something because the first page of any notes to accounts if you look at the first page it talks about the company prepared the financial statements using gap principles and using going concern assumption and uh, uh, financial instruments are measured at so and so financial instruments so and all the content will come in the first page itself we we ourselves understood financial instrument word only after attending fr classes correct huh? and do you think a normal stock market trader will understand what is financial instrument all that definitely not do you think he will understand going concern do you think he'll understand gap who is not a commerce background so financial statements the words financial statements the terminology is something something which a normal person cannot understand only commerce background people can understand to some extent if at all you studied financial reporting subject thoroughly not from lojax but from the original text then only you can understand the financial statements if at all you studied that also from lojax that also you can't understand the financial statements getting it fine so this is misstatement definition so whatever framework says other than that if at all the company is reporting something else 
company is reporting something else other than what is required as per framework then it is called as a misstatement able to understand suppose inventory has to be measured at cost or nrv whichever is lower cost is some 20 crore nrv is some 17 crore company presented at 10 crore what company reported sorry 20 crore what company reported 20 but what is that uh, principle 20 or 17 whichever is lower 17 you have to follow as per framework what is the right value 17 but how much company actually reported 20 there is a difference difference between what is required and what they did there is a difference and that's called misstatement able to understand now it can be in classification it can be in classification suppose a company purchased a land for value appreciation for value appreciation company has surplus funds so they want to park it somewhere they want to invest it somewhere so they found a land a suitable land getting it they invested very little in the land but for investment objective so what is that land constitutes it constitutes investment property and it has to be classified under investments but the company classified it under fixed assets the company classified under actually fixed assets the company reported the land under fixed assets value they classified it wrongly how they have to classify as per the framework as per the accounting standard it's an investment property it has to be classified as investment but how the company classified it as fixed assets so here it's a misstatement in the form of classification so a misstatement can be in amount can be in classification presentation or disclosure and understand our objective of audit is to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence whether the financial statements are free from material misstatements as a whole misstatement means this able to understand all of you next next now so again i'll come back to this so the objective of auditor is to give opinion ultimately ultimately is what to give opinion and these opinions are broadly two types one is unmodified opinion another one is modified opinion so one is unmodified opinion another one is modified opinion yes so there are two types of opinions one is unmodified opinion and one another one is modified opinion so what do you mean by unmodified opinion the auditor will express an unmodified opinion the auditor will express an unmodified opinion if the financial statements are prepared and presented as per applicable financial reporting framework and they are free from material misstatement generally these are students right getting it but the actual definition is if auditor concluded based on sufficient and appropriate evidence that the financial statements are free from material misstatements and are prepared in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework then the auditor will express unmodified opinion concluded based on sufficient and appropriate audit evidence this phrase 90 percent of the cases they'll eliminate that's why we will not get full marks getting it so you can always write answer in your own words but don't write your own provision where we do mistake is we don't write full provision that's a that's a problem if you write complete answer complete points whatever the definition says suppose definition has 10 points if you write all the 10 points in your own way of presentation but all the 10 points you covered 99.99 percent you will get full marks getting it and one more thing people who are valuing your papers first of all understand they are not teaching background people who are valuing your papers they are not from teaching background they may be ca but not from teaching background getting it do you remember foundation questions do you remember ca foundation questions by looking at the answer can you figure out is it right or wrong ca foundation no if at all i gave you ca foundation question paper and answer sheets how do you value based on suggested answer so you will see suggested answer and see here if it is not matching you will strike off correct exactly what happens in ca final as well those who are valuing your paper have qualified at least five years before getting the point five years before 
before invoice came into picture before this audit report format changed before many topics in audit subject came into picture so they qualified long ago so literally speaking they don't have this knowledge whoever is valuing they will definitely not have a basic idea also first of all and that person is valuing your paper so which means a normal layman is valuing your paper who can read and understand something he is evaluating your paper so in such a case understand what should be the level of presentation correct so remember your paper is being valued not by the person who knows the subject by the person who don't have any idea on the subject by he just looks at the scheme of valuation suggested answer and looks at your answer compares both if at all both are conveying a similar meaning he'll award the marks if at all they are conveying different meanings he'll right away strike off the chances are more than 50% that he'll strike off the answer if at all your answer is not match so you need to really work more so that 99% you will reproduce the terminology not just audit any other subject also the same so that's unmodified opinion now another one is what modified opinion you know you see there is a clear logic behind the word modified unmodified suppose management prepared financials company prepared financials i verified them i felt they don't require any modification i felt the financial statements don't require any modification they are excellent they are showing true and fair view they don't require any modification what do you mean by they don't require any modification so what do you mean by that they are free from material misstatements so since they don't require any modification i will exactly agree with them i will exactly agree with them i will absolutely agree with them to issue to the public so i will also not modify my opinion able to understand suppose i verified the financial statements i discovered many mistakes i discovered many mistakes will i straight away give opinion no first i should tell the management these are the mistakes that we identified please rectify so we should ask the management please modify the financial statements because they are containing many misstatements if they modified everything did again properly okay sir before issue to the public we will rectify everything they went and rectified and everything they showed again with proper clarity now again i'll give unmodified opinion suppose management disagreed with me no sir it is not possible once it is finalized it is finalized so board of directors have already gone out abroad and all so it is impossible to rectify you now it is impossible to approve once again it this is final copy which we will send to public okay according to me the financial statements are containing many mistakes which require modification but company is not modifying i will modify my opinion since they are not modifying the financial statements which require modification i am modifying my opinion able to understand the word behind modified opinion and unmodified opinion that's it now again this modified opinion ss705 classifies into three types one is okay uh, qualified opinion adverse opinion disclaimer of opinion so modified uh, i mean uh, qualified opinion adverse opinion and disclaimer of opinion so different types of modified opinion so which modified opinion we have to give which modified opinion we have to give so here they may ask you a question in exam directly okay so which type of i mean which type of modified opinion the auditor shall give what are the factors the auditor will consider or they may ask you a question write about the factors in choosing different types of modified opinion this question directly they ask now whether should i give qualified opinion or adverse opinion or disclaimer opinion it depends on the following so what are they saying the decision regarding which type of modified opinion is appropriate it depends on nature of the matter giving rise to the modification nature of the matter and judgment about pervasiveness of the effect or possible effect judgment about the pervasiveness of the effect or possible effect now you see nature of the matter the nature of matter is again two types 
whether the financial statements are misstated, I mean, whatever the misstatements you identified, are they material? Or you are unable to obtain audit evidence for material items. So, one is, you discovered evidence, you saw the evidence, you found the evidence, you verified everything, you discovered a mistake. So, that is material mistake you discovered. That might be one reason why you want to modify. Second nature of modification, second reason why I am I modifying is, I didn't get the evidence. I didn't get the evidence. When I did not get the evidence, when I did not verify something, getting it, inability to obtain evidence. So, that is another reason. So, this, this point, I mentioned it in a tabular format here. Getting it? So, this case you strike off not required. This case you strike off not required. Now, you see, like, uh, so first one, suppose I conducted the audit, I conducted the audit. Let us assume I am talking about inventory. Let us assume I am talking about inventory valuation. So, closing stock of the inventory is somewhere around some 10 crore. So, regarding that I am talking about. So, first question they are asking, have you obtained sufficient appropriate evidence? Have you obtained sufficient appropriate evidence? Yes, 10 crore worth of closing stock is there. NRV computation I have seen. Physical I have went and verified. I saw the inspection. I saw the records of the inventory. Physical verification I surprisingly did. They were matching completely. Management is also physically verifying. Internal controls, everything is fine. I got all the possible evidences related to inventory. Sufficient appropriate evidence, fine. So, are there any material misstatements? Is material misstatement exist? No. The, is the material misstatement exist means? No. In this example, I don't have any material misstatement. So, is there any pervasive? The question itself do not arise. When I did not discover a mistake, is it a big mistake or small mistake? That question itself do not arise. Okay. You can straight away give unqualified opinion on inventory. You can straight away give unqualified opinion on inventory. If at all, your opinion is unqualified on every other aspect of the financial statements. As a whole, if it is unqualified, then as a whole it is unqualified. Able to understand? All of you. Clear? See, first, we should frame our conclusion on each and individual item of the financials. First, we should have a conclusion on each and individual item of the financials. Each and every assertion. Then, after getting conclusion on every assertion, then we will form overall conclusion. Then what we will do? We will form overall conclusion. Getting it? Next. Case 2. Yes, I verified inventory. I have verified. I verified controls. Everything was absolute. Absolutely fine. Now, NRV workings are also there. Cost is 10 crore. NRV is 12 crore. Company valued at 10 crore. But somewhere I have got a doubt regarding the person who did valuation of the inventory. So, what I did is, what I did is, I called my own valuationer. I called my own valuationer. So, using my own expert, using the work of auditor's expert, SA620. Very good. So, I called my own expert and I asked him to evaluate the once again inventory and give me a valuation report. He gave me a valuation report of 8 crore. He gave me a valuation report of 8 crore. And I also asked him, see management also has an expert. He is also qualified like you. He is also a competent person like you, but he gave 11 crore. What is your answer on this? I asked my expert itself. He clear cut, I mean, with a clear cut discussion, with a clear cut presentation, he showed me the assumption used by the management expert, the formula used by the management expert is not correct. My expert proved me clearly, logically, that the formula used by him is absolutely correct. So, finally, I decided my expert amount, valuation amount is correct, NRV. And I asked management, please rectify the inventory value. Management denied. They, were, they don't want to rectify. They want to show 10 crores value only in the balance sheet. But according to me, what is the value? 8 crore. Do I have evidence that it is 8 crore? Yes, valuation report is there. Now, management is not rectifying. Now, tell me, is the financial statements materially misstated regarding the inventory? Yes, it is material misstatement. Do the financial statements contain material misstatements? Yes. Now, what is the total balance sheet value? 100 crore. The total assets value is how much? 100 crore. Now, how much mistake is there? Inventory, 2 crore mistake. Remaining items are proven fair. Fixed assets, other current assets, other assets and all, everything is proven fair. Now, 2 crore worth of mistake you found, right? Which is material, no doubt. But because of this, can you say entire balance sheet is misleading? Can you say entire balance sheet is misleading? So, is it pervasive? No. 
okay so give your opinion give positive opinion only but whatever the material mistake is there that alone you point out that alone you put it as a condition give a conditional opinion give a conditional opinion and that's called qualified opinion qualified opinion is nothing but conditional positive opinion qualified opinion is nothing but conditional positive opinion able to understand so give a qualification only on that not on the entire financial statements don't qualify entire financials qualify only that item which contains material statement able to understand all of you next now say inventory inventory and value balance sheet total 100 crore inventory value itself is 25 crore inventory portion is how much 25 percentage the inventory portion is 25 percentage now uh, as on 31st march as on 31st march um, let us assume the inventory lying in the go down is 25 crore now on 31st march itself there is some incident happened relating relating to some short circuit on 31st march itself and uh, that became so big by 2nd april entire inventory was smashed entire inventory was completely destroyed by 2nd april as on 31st march it started but on 2nd April, it was completely destroyed. As on 31st March, more or less 25 crore worth of inventory is lying. But the situation present as on 31st March itself, that inventory will destroy. Management is trying to take all the precautions. Or, or nobody is aware of this. Only after the inventory was completely destroyed, everyone became aware of that. Getting it? Now, I asked management, anyhow, substance over form. Inventory is not there as on 31st March itself because condition also exists. You can't claim the benefit of subsequent event, non-adjusting event. No, you can't do all that. So, substance over form, 31st March itself, entire inventory was completely about to damage. So, I requested management to write off the entire inventory. But management said, as on 31st March, since it is physically present, 2nd April only did not present, I will consider it as a non-adjusting event and I will only disclose in the financial statements and they, they made a disclosure. So what they said, 31st March inventory, balance sheet 25 crore they showed. Somewhere in the notes to accounts, important non-adjusting events. Important non-adjusting events in that particular paragraph, in the notes to accounts, they clearly mentioned entire inventory was destroyed later on. And the company do not have any fire insurance, no stock insurance, able to understand. So the company do not have any stock insurance. So they clearly mentioned that. But I know very well. The incidence is present even as on 31st March itself. So, company financial statements are showing misleading picture. Now, 25 crore is a material amount. And it is not just material. It's 25 crore. 25% of the asset item in the balance sheet. It may be one item. But it is representing substantial portion. Now, is it pervasive? Because of this 25 crore present in the balance sheet, company position is shown as solvent. Company position is shown as solvent. Actually, if, the, if I remove this 25 crore, company become insolvent. So, company insolvency, going concern is affected completely, but they are showing it as solvent. So, is it misleading? The, is, is, is the balance sheet misleading the entire public completely? Yes. Able to understand. Now, the effect is pervasive. Now, the effect is pervasive. Since the financial statements are giving a misleading picture, when since the financial statements are giving a misleading picture, I will straight away tell to the shareholders in my audit report, do not believe the financial statements. What will I tell? Do not believe the financial statements. The financial statements are not showing true and fair view. The financial statements are not showing true and fair view. And that's called adverse opinion. Able to understand, all of you. Getting it? I just took a hypothetical example for better understanding. Getting it? In reality, this example may not be there able to understand like uh, in reality what kind of mistakes you will find is suppose there is a company it may not be consolidating one of its subsidy it may not be consolidating one of the subsidy and that subsidy is going to be a material subsidy if a company while preparing consolidated financial statements if it is not consolidating important subsidy company then the consolidated balance sheet is showing a misleading picture able to understand so non consolidation means what you are not accounting all the subsidiary company related assets it's a pervasive because every item will impact generally the moment we think of pervasive people think many items in the balance sheet affects no 
it may be single item but that may be a very big or it may be multiple items all the effect of all multiple items can be very big you see the pervasive definition here what is pervasive effect pervasive effect on the financial statements are those in auditor's judgment they are not confined to specific item it is not something similar it is not a one or two items it is not something one or two or it's so confined it may be one item it may be one item it represents substantial portion or we will also call this situation as pervasive if it is if at all management made a misrepresentation related to disclosure which are fundamental to the user's understanding example company has to follow accrual system they didn't follow but they are showing it as accrual system fundamental disclosures they made wrong some some disclosure which is fundamental for the user in order to understand the financial statements it is fundamental to the user company prepared financials using world accounting standards but the notes to account says ndas notes to accounts the point says what we prepared financials using ndas but actually they prepared using normal accounting standards something which is fundamental for understanding if at all the company uses the word ndas i will open ndas requirement and i'll compare here both will not be matching so user will not understand the financial statements able to understand if a company in the financial statements made a disclosure which is fundamentally confusing the users of the financial statements that's also called as a pervasive effect able to understand so that's pervasive so here we will give adverse opinion now until now we have seen only situation about evidence is available evidence is available what if what if evidence is not available so if evidence is not available evidence is not available only two situations are enough first situation not required we generally we don't focus on immaterial items we generally don't focus on immaterial item if an item is immaterial not at all a material item in the financial statements we may not verify that generally in audit we don't verify immaterial items we only concerned with material items or more importantly trivial items they are also called as what trivial trivial items trivial means i mean more than trivial they are above trivial trivial means something that we can ignore something that we can ignore triviality level generally in audits especially uh, in above medium sized concerns or in big fours so they use materiality levels triviality level performance level overall materiality if they find a mistake which is trivial in nature they ignore sometimes multiple trivial mistakes getting it together may become a material mistake trivial means immaterial nothing but triviality means what immaterial able to understand now suppose the company has a inventory value let us assume out of 100 crore again 10 crore worth of inventory is there again 10 crore worth of inventory is there the company want to uh, i mean the auditor want to verify this inventory the breakup of the inventory as below 10 crore three parts inventory in hand some 5 crore inventory with third party some 3 crore inventory in transit some 2 crore in transit means here we already took the control of the inventory so we it is our own transport operator so inventory is in our control so it is in transit but still in our control only getting it so but not in the border it is not in hand so it is shown as in transit with respect to in hand inventory we have all the records we have done physical verification with respect to in hand in transit inventory the trans transporter gave evidence everything is fine now with respect to inventory lying with third party we wanted to go for external confirmation we wanted to go for external confirmation here the inventory lying with the third party is sold to third party on sale or return basis is sold to third party on sale or return basis since third party has not given acceptance ownership is not transferred still the company the until third party gives his acceptance it is our inventory right but our inventory lying with the third party but since ownership is with us i will show in my balance sheet as asset correct so inventory with the third party three crore value is there i want evidence for this i asked the management they showed me records everything i want to get a confirmation from third party because i am not believing them i don't have trust on these records i want third party evidence somehow i didn't get third party evidence i was not at all given his phone number his address nothing 
management is completely hiding details about the third party in this case 3 crore worth of inventory i don't know what happened can i say management is cheating me or can i say financial statements are misrepresenting can i say that no i can't how can i say this 3 crore is not there so management showed some amount uh, inventory with third party 3 crore and when i asked them it is with third party show me the proof they are not showing just because they didn't, they didn't show me the proof, can I say they are not existing? No. If you want to prove, if you want to prove that they are not existing, you must give a proof for that. You must give a proof that they are not existing. Able to understand? If you want to say that they are right, you must have proof. If you want to say that they are wrong, you must have proof. Here the answer is, I don't know. For a material item, for a Material item, 3 crore worth of inventory, we did not get evidence. We are unable to get evidence. Now tell me, whereas rest of the items I did audit, I verified everything, I got evidence. Until this moment, until this inventory verification, except this, everywhere else I got evidence, except this. Now, since 3 crore worth of item, out of total 100 crore balance sheet, I did not get evidence. No doubt, 3 crore is a material item, no doubt about it. But I did not get evidence for this. Can I withdraw from the audit because of this? Can I withdraw from the audit? I am unable to give opinion. Can I? No. Majority of the items in the balance sheet, you have evidence. Do one thing. Give opinion on the overall balance sheet. Put an exception to this. This alone, you didn't get evidence. Just mention that. Can I do so? There also, we can give qualified opinion. There also, we can give which opinion? Qualified opinion. Look, qualified opinion can be given in two situations. One, evidence is available. Misstatement is proved. It is material but not pervasive. Second scenario, evidence is not available and the item is material. What if, what if tomorrow if it is wrong? What if tomorrow if it is misstatement but not identified by me? Since I don't have evidence, I did not discover mistake. First of all, is it a misstatement? I don't know. Getting it? What if tomorrow it is actually a fraud? It's a misstatement. Possible effect is there or not? That's why the word possible effect is used. Here the word possible effect is used for evidence non-availability. Able to understand. If you look at the qualified opinion definition, no. Second part of the definition. If auditor is unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence and concluded that the possible effect of possible effect of Undetected misstatement. Undetected misstatement means what? First of all, is there a misstatement? No. Why? I didn't detect. I did not detect. Undetected means unidentified. Possible effect of unidentified mistake. Possibility is there? No. Mistake is there. Not identified by me. But possibility is there for this. Because why am I saying? Why am I talking about possibility? Evidence is not available. If you show me, if at all you give me a confirmation from third party, I will not be thinking about all this. If third party showed me, if third party gave me confirmation, I, I went there, I saw the inventory, I am happy. You are saying inventory is with the third party and you are not giving me information. What if tomorrow if it is wrong? People will question me. Yes or no. So, if possible effect of undetected misstatement, if it is material, then also give qualified opinion. If you discover right now material misstatement, give qualified opinion. If you did not discover any mistake, but possibility is there because you did not discover any evidence, able to understand. But the possibility of the mistake is going to be material. If at all discover tomorrow, then also treat the same way. Give qualified opinion, able to understand. Suppose if the possible effect is not just material, but also pervasive, then don't give opinion. Then don't give opinion disclaimer getting it entire financial statements you did not get evidence major portion of the financial statements you did not get evidence at all what if tomorrow entire portion which i have not verified what if they are completely wrong they are completely misleading if they are completely misleading how can you accept that everything else is fine there is only, there is no such thing called everything getting it major items of the financials you did not get evidence when you did not get evidence on the major item of the balance sheet, major item of the PNL, how can you give opinion first of all? If I have to give opinion, 
majority of the cases i must need evidence major item of the balance sheet major item of the pnl if i have confidence i'll give opinion if i don't have confidence on the major item of the financial statements how can i give opinion i will not give opinion disclaimer of opinion it's not disclaimer opinion it's disclaimer of opinion able to understand so what are the different cases different opinions we covered easy <laughs> So, in the previous session, we discussed about different circumstances in which we give different opinions. Like we spoke about, when do we give qualified opinion? Adverse and disclaimer. Getting it? Now, let's look at a diagrammatic representation of the same. If you observe, actually, in the book, this point will not be there. This I have added just for the sake of clarification. Just a minute. Yes, so this you can find in SA 705. This you can find in SA 705. You can see the page number is 24 in the smart notes. Okay, <clears throat> so if you observe the opinion that we give depends upon two primary factors. One, have we obtained sufficient appropriate evidence? <clears throat> have we obtained sufficient appropriate? Another one, we have not obtained sufficient appropriate evidence. One, suppose if you see where we obtained sufficient appropriate evidence, we have got the evidence. What are the opinions that we can give when, when we have got the opinion predominantly as a whole? Either we can give unqualified or qualified, a worst scenario, adverse opinion. When the evidence is obtained, when the evidence is obtained, maximum possible worst opinion can be adverse. Disclaimer of opinion arises only when the evidence is not obtained. Getting the point? Only when the information is not available, absence of information, only then we give disclaimer of opinion. Otherwise, we don't give disclaimer of opinion. Able to understand? Now, you see, you see here, evidence not obtained, right? In, inside this also, we have given three cases. But actually, this case number one is not there anywhere in the study material or anywhere. Just for the sake of uniformity, I have added. When do we bother? If for a material item when we don't have evidence, that will bother us. Or in respect of an immaterial item, there is no evidence. First of all, if it is immaterial, we don't even verify. Correct. So, sufficient appropriate evidence not obtained for immaterial item. It's not immaterial. We don't even think about that. Able to understand. Suppose, now again you see, how many unqualified opinions we give in one situation. That's why you see unqualified opinion definition is one pair. Qualified opinion we give in two situations. You see here one situation, here one situation. One situation where evidence is available, another one where evidence is not available. So the qualified opinion definition has two parts. Adverse opinion is only in one scenario. So the adverse opinion definition is one paragraph. Disclaimer of opinion is only in one scenario. So disclaimer of opinion paragraph definition is one. In MCQ, in, uh, in your MCQ book, there is a question in CA final MCQ booklet. They give two options. Which of the, I mean, what is the above opinion? They'll ask. Two, two points they'll be giving. Two points is obviously qualified opinion. So, I'm just telling you for easy reference. Now, so, let's look at the definitions. Let's look at the definitions of, uh, you know, unqualified first. Then I'll come back to qualified opinion. So, unqualified opinion means what? When auditor concludes that, when auditor concludes that, financial statements are free from material misstatements and they are prepared in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework, then he shall express an unmodified opinion, which is also called as unqualified, which is also called as clean opinion. Correct? Huh? Now, what is modified opinion then? When we give modified opinion, the auditor will give modified opinion. The auditor will give Modified opinion in two situations. One situation is what? One situation where, where we give modified opinion is evidence is obtained. Another situation where we give modified opinion is evidence is not obtained. When evidence is obtained, financial statements are containing material misstatements. Then we give qualified opinion. And financial, we did not obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. And the item is material. And the item is material. Able to understand. For a material item, we don't have evidence. Then also we give modified opinion. 
Now, which type of modified opinion is appropriate? It depends upon pervasiveness. Are you getting the point? Now, you see, there is a question which is asked on this. The decision regarding which type of modified opinion depends on various circumstances or factors. What are they? Four marks question. In exam, you will get this as a four marks question. This itself can be asked as a four marks question. The, the opinion, the decision regarding the type of opinion depends on certain factors. What are they? It depends upon nature of the matter. That giving rise to the modification. What is the nature of the matter giving rise to the modification? Is it because, is it because a material misstatement is there? Or is it because you are unable to get the evidence? What is the reason? See, material misstatement. Misstatement word I can use only if I have evidence. Correct? If I do not have evidence, how can I say it's wrong? How can I say it's right? Right or wrong, I cannot discuss if there is no evidence. If there is no information. So, misstatement means evidence is available. Or you are unable to obtain evidence for a material item of the financials. So, what is the nature of the matter? Is it because of misstatement or is it because of unable to obtain evidence? Some reason. It is because of the misstatement. Okay, there is a mistake I found. Now, then look at pervasiveness. Look at the pervasiveness. Suppose there is a misstatement. And the item is not pervasive. Which opinion I will give? Qualified opinion. Misstatement I found. Misstatement is clearly there. Mistake is there, I have a proof. And it is pervasive also. Which opinion I will give? Adverse. I don't know whether there is a misstatement or not. I am unable to get evidence. I am unable to get evidence for a material item. But it is not pervasive. Okay, to that extent I can give exception and give opinion. Which opinion I will give again? Qualify. I am unable to obtain evidence. It's material and it is so substantial. I cannot Talk about the overall financials to unfairness. Disclaimer. You see, that's why here we have used side headings very clearly. We have used uh, side headings very clearly. When evidence is obtained, when evidence is obtained, material misstatement exists. We are talking about material misstatement exists or not. We are talking about misstatement because evidence is there. So I can talk whether it is right or wrong, I can decide. When evidence is not obtained, you see here the wordings, I didn't use the word MMS. I didn't use the word MMS. I specifically used the word is it material. Are you getting the point? Suppose I have not obtained evidence. Yes, it's a material item. But it's not pervasive. Which opinion? Qualified. I have not obtained evidence. I have not obtained evidence. Now, is that item material? Yes. Is that item pervasive? Yes. Substantial portion in the balance sheet. When it is substantial portion in the balance sheet for which you don't have evidence, you should not talk on that balance sheet. You are not, you don't have that you know, fitment to talk about the opinion on the balance sheet. So, disclaim your opinion. Don't give your opinion. Are you getting the point? Suppose, have, have you got the evidence? Yes, I got the evidence. Sufficient, appropriate evidence. Obtain. Is there a material misstatement existing? No. When there is no material mistake at all, will the question of pervasiveness arise? No. So, obviously, unqualified. Now, material misstatement, have you found? Yes. Is it pervasive? No, it's not pervasive. It's 2 crore worth of inventory out of 100 crore. It's not pervasive. I'll give qualified opinion. Have you found a mistake? Yes. There is a pending litigation? Yes. The investments cannot meet the recognition criteria? Yes. But the company showed it in the balance sheet? Yes. The made amount is 25 crore which is pervasive, substantial. Pervasive. So, mention that it is not true and fair. It is not correct for the company to show like that. Yes or no? People are mi being misguided. People think 25 crore worth of investment is there. People think company position is very good. Don't, mis don't mislead the people. So, it's pervasive. Say that it is not correct. Are you getting the point? So, adverse means saying that it is wrong. Disclaimer means I don't know. Able to understand. All of you. Now, now let's look at the, this particular thing. So, different types of modified opinion depends upon nature of the matter giving rise to the modification. Is it because of material misstatement or are you giving, are you modifying because you are unable to get the evidence? Which is the reason? Then, okay, once you understood because of the mistake or not able to get the evidence, then you decide about pervasiveness, auditor's, eff, auditor's judgment about pervasiveness of the effect. Effect means evidence is there. Possible effect means evidence is not there. When I don't have information, I will talk about possibility of mistake. When I don't have evidence, I will talk about possibility of mistake. I am not talking that's wrong or right. I am talking about possibility of wrong. Are you getting the point? So, what is the pervasiveness of the effect or possible effect? 
able to understand the word possible effect effect understood the difference exactly next now you see uh, what is pervasive what is pervasive pervasiveness means what pervasiveness on the financial statements of those they are those in auditor's judgment they are not limited to specific item they are not limited to specific item they are not confined to a specific multiple items on the balance sheet affected sir in our example investments one item only no if so confined if at all it is one item only if it is only one item it represents substantial portion it represents what substantial portion generally pervasive means in auditor's judgment they, the mistakes or the unavailability of evidence whatever it is they are not confined to a specific element specific account balance specific item they are not confined to specific it's not one specific item the multiple items affected that's why i'm calling it as pervasive or sometimes it may be confined to a specific item it may be confined to only one item of the financial statement which represent or could represent substantial portion of the financials then also we will call it as pervasive so one scenario pervasive means multiple items affected then also pervasive second scenario one item only affected but which is a substantial portion then also we call it as pervasive or pervasive can be in relation to disclosures it can be in relation to disclosures which are fundamental to the users suppose if i made a wrong disclosure related to going concern if i made a wrong disclosure about method of accounting if i made a wrong disclosure about some fundamental accounting policies then also the auditor may consider that as pervasive able to understand so pervasive can be of three incidents got got clarity so pervasiveness means it's pervasive means talking about effect on the financials we are talking about effect on the financial statements which may not be confined to one element or if so confined which is substantial portion or it may be related to disclosures which are fundamental to the users that's it pervasive are you clear now we'll understand what is qualified opinion i told in our diagram also we have seen qualified opinion we given two scenarios we given two scenarios one scenario is what i have got sufficient appropriate evidence and i conclude that there is a material there is a misstatement and the misstatement is material but not pervasive suppose if i am unable to get the evidence i am unable to get uh, get the evidence and i concluded and i concluded the possible effect of undetected misstatement the possible effect of uh, undetected misstatement could be material but not pervasive suppose in respect of some particular uh, investment made in startup 2 crore worth of investment company is not providing me any documents at all can i say that investment is bogus investment no can i say the investment is right i don't know but there is a possibility that that may be wrong there is a possibility of that may be wrong correct ah management might have misleadingly presented there is a possibility only so that's why i talk about possible effect we don't really talk about actual effect we are talking about what possible effect what if management has done wrong and i have not discovered it undetected what is the possibility of misstatement possibility of misstatement undetected what is the possibility of misstatement undetected the possibility of misstatement which is undetected by me that could be a material one but not pervasive i'll give qualified suppose in the first part of the definition no here if i remove that but not and replace with the end it becomes adverse opinion if the second part of the qualified opinion definition if i replace this but not word and replace with end disclaimer of opinion definition comes out so able to understand so logically drafted the definition so confident all of you now let's look at now let's look at different wordings now we'll look at different wordings of how uh, you know a qualified opinion wordings will come how disclaimer of opinion wordings will come how you know uh, adverse opinion what they will test is in exam no see directly i can show it from pronouncement but it takes little time better i'll discuss orally here when we give unqualified opinion no first paragraph is what opinion para the first paragraph is what opinion para if you look at opinion para no i'll show tata motors itself it has two paragraphs correct huh? opinion paragraph is having two paragraphs inside the two sub paragraphs this actually first part is called as this first part is called as this first part is called as introductory para introductory introduction to the opinion getting it no need to write this is not given in the book but i'm just telling you for your understanding the second part in the opinion para is actual opinion of the auditor it is actual opinion of the auditor so what auditor is talking about here you see here in our opinion in our opinion 
to the best of our information according to the explanation given to us and based on uh, you know based on other auditor that that is something about you know other joint operation something so what are they saying the aforesaid the aforesaid financial statements give information required by act i think i have clearly documented uh, you know opinions separately i think so i think so just a minute uh, yeah opinion draftings i think i have clearly mentioned fine it's good suppose if you look at unqualified opinion if you look at unqualified opinion opinion paragraph you see the side heading is simply opinion suppose if i open qualified opinion pair if i open if i open qualified opinion pair the side heading is clearly qualified opinion same way if i open adverse opinion if i open adverse opinion pair the side heading is clearly adverse opinion this is the presentation requirement for audit report and we open disclaimer and the side heading is clearly disclaimer of opinion and now you see how the wordings will vary how in an mcq it can be tested how in an mcq it can be tested now you see unqualified opinion what auditor is giving he is try to be saying in our opinion to the best of our information according to the explanation given to us the aforesaid stand alone financials give information required by the act in the manner so required whatever the losses that information is given and giving true and fair view giving true and fair view in a fair presentation framework this end after whatever is there no this end giving true and fair view will come in fair presentation framework in compliance framework my audit report will stop only up to this in the manner so required is there no only there it will stop in case of compliance framework in case of fair presentation framework my opinion paragraph will have additional wordings called and giving true and fair view are you getting the point all of you now you see uh, quali you know for every opinion you express you need to talk about what is the basis okay i know you are giving your opinion remember you know one student uh, some 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 students ask me sir what if auditor gave qualified opinion what are the consequences what consequence nothing you give adverse opinion no consequence nothing what happens to the company directors defend in directors report they need to talk about qualifications made by auditor and what is their take on the qualifications and remarks made by the auditor what what you are giving is just an opinion understand it's not a fact you are giving opinion opinion can be differentiated and if some another auditor appointed he might have given unqualified opinion since you are appointed you have given adverse opinion if you once again do the audit you may get different opinion who knows it's just an opinion understand so opinion will not affect the company but in a in case of adverse opinion in case of disclaimer of opinion it it questions about corporate governance of the company it questions about corporate governance fundamentals roots of the company and that's why it will impact in the stock it will impact the regulatory action able to understand so now uh, now what is the basis for the opinion what is the basis so i gave unqualified opinion what is the basis for me because i did audit what is the basis if you ask me how you gave unqualified opinion i i have audited man i have gathered evidence i have gone through all the books of accounts and financial statements i am independent of the company are you will you yes or no so we conducted what is the basis for audit is we conducted audit in accordance with the standards on auditing okay our responsibilities under those standards so as per standards we have so many responsibilities they are further described in auditor responsibility for audit of financial statement section of our report in the same audit report there is another side heading called auditors responsibilities for audit of financial statements which is also called as auditor responsibility paragraph auditor responsibility for audit of financial statements in that section i spoke about what are my responsibilities so what are our responsibilities our objective is to obtain reasonable assurance whether financials are free from material misstatement whether due to fraud or error reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance but not absolute assurance we talk about entire ca inter nature objective scope of audit related content here getting it in ca inter you have a chapter called first chapter nature objective and scope of audit inside that you talk about inherent limitations you talk about professional judgment you talk about various responsibilities all that will come here that's it so auditor's responsibility for audit of financial statement section contains basic responsibilities of the auditor getting it now so in unqualified opinion when you are giving unqualified opinion you know they are asking what is the basis for opinion they are asking what is the basis for opinion so the basis for opinion is very simple we do audit as per standards 
as per standards we have responsibilities what are our responsibilities below we have a para auditor responsibility section there we we have covered we are independent of the company look we are independent of the company as per code of ethics and we have fulfilled all other ethical responsibilities as per the requirement of code of ethics and you know we believe that the evidence obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis whatever evidence we got it is sufficient only after we got sufficient evidence only after we got appropriate evidence only after thorough examination only after we were satisfied we are giving this opinion you are affirming this able to understand all of you now now you see a uh, qualified opinion qualified opinion also cited in this what qualified opinion it is also having two parts now first part you see same if you observe in our opinion to the best of our information and according to the explanation given to us uh, the aforesaid financial statements give true and fair view in conformity with the gap in india means they gave a positive opinion they are saying the aforesaid financial statements are true and fair except except for the effects of the matter described in basis for qualified opinion section of our report in our report there is another section called basis for qualified opinion except the matter inside that referred except that matter the aforesaid financial statements are true and fair view the inventory of the company is 10 crore uh, cost is cost is 10 crore nrv is 8 crore uh, but company valued at cost only 2 crore worth of overstatement happened now i need to tell the reason no when i gave qualified opinion i cannot say we have conducted audit as per standards on auditing i you, you qualify you are saying some matter is there you need to specifically talk about that or not that's why you see basis for qualified opinion is having two points here basis for qualified opinion is having again two paragraphs here one paragraph is what general responsibility para general basis para this is common in every report whether you give unqualified qualified or adverse this is common able to understand what is the basis for your opinion we conducted our audit as per standards this para is common in addition to that in an, if you, since you have given qualified opinion since you have given adverse opinion specific reason will be there no specific basis will be there no that basis you should talk suppose you see here what this spoke about the company's inventories are carried in the balance sheet at 10 crore management had not stated inventories at lower of cost or nrv 8 or 10 whichever is lower but stated them solely at cost which is 10 crore which is a deviation departure from accounting standard prescribed under company act the company records indicate that had management stated inventories at lower of cost or nrv if at all management stated inventory at lower of cost or nrv 8 or 10 whichever is lower an amount of 2 crore would have been required to write down the inventory to their nrv and the sales would have been increased the cost of sales would have been increased by 2 crore profit would have been decreased by so and so shareholder fund would have been decreased by so and so tax would have been increased by so and so like this you need to clearly mention which means whenever you modify your opinion quantification should also be done what should also be done quantification is also required if you do not quantify that is wrong unless it is impracticable to quantify unless it is impracticable to quantify you must always quantify you know uh, that's why we have a question i have we have a question in question bank in question bank we have given certain certain additional topics certain additional concepts which we discuss in regular class clearly this question was asked in many exams this question was asked in many exams may 22 attempt there is a question from this in may 22 question in may 22 we have a question about uh, this point this fifth point was asked as a three marks question three or four i'm not exactly sure but three or four this this question also has been asked description of auditor's responsibility section this question is also asked so these two have been asked in previous exams now you see suppose no if material misstatements in financial statements are there if there is a material misstatement of financials that are related to specific amounts suppose for, for a particular amount there is a material misstatement the auditor shall include in the basis for opinion section a description and quantification of the financial effect what we have seen in the institute book pronouncement they described what is the mistake they also gave a quantification unless it is impracticable 
unless it is impracticable suppose no you are unable to quantify you are unable to quantify in such a case if it is not practicable to quantify the effect no the auditor shall state mention that you are unable to quantify mention that you are unable to quantify whether you give a qualified opinion or adverse opinion this rule is common if you give adverse opinion if possible quantify if you are unable to quantify exactly what items are affected then mention that you are unable to quantify but in our example just now we have seen qualified opinion pronouncement illustration what they said inventory only be stated materially 2 crore is a deviation so there is a clear effect only 2 or 3 items only affected clearly so I can quantify easily are you getting the point now we'll see adverse opinion how it has been given so here also you see in adverse opinion same you know one intro, intro para is there then again opinion remember adverse opinion is also opinion qualified opinion is also an opinion unqualified opinion is also opinion but disclaimer is not opinion disclaimer of opinion means I am denying to give opinion so it is not an opinion logically so you see adverse opinion wording in our opinion to the best of our information according to the explanation given to us according to the explanation given to us the accompanying financial statements do not give the accompanying financial statements do not give true and fair view the straight away said do not give true and fair view this is called adverse opinion why they are not giving true and fair view because because of the significance of the matter because of the significance of the matter discussed in basis for adverse opinion section of our report in our report there is a section called basis for our ad basis for adverse opinion section inside that we discussed a matter because of its significance because of its significance the efforts and financials are not uh, true and uh, fair now you see adverse opinion here you see as explained in note number so and so of the company the group has not consolidated one subsidiary company which was acquired during the year because it was not determining because it has not yet determined fair values of certain material assets and liabilities as at acquisition date so in so reason some subsidiary was acquired by this company during the year fair values were not determined therefore the company ignored that subsidiary company in the consolidation process are you getting it now the investment is therefore accounted on cost basis in the consolidated financials. The investment made in the subsidiary is shown as a cost. Subsidiary company, how should we account it as per NDAS line by line consolidation method? Yes or no? Line by line consolidation method, but they did not do that. They showed it as investment that to at cost, not at fair value. Under the accounting principles accepted in India, group has consolidated the subsidiary and accounted for provisional amounts. So not based on actual amounts, but based on provisional amounts. Now tell me. Here, the mistake is clearly explained. Description of the qualification they gave. Now, they should quantify, you know. Now, tell me, because of this non-consolidation, because of this non-consolidation, if a tall company consolidated, if a tall company consolidated, what items in the balance sheet and P&L will affect every item? Every item will affect SRO, every line item in the P&L, every line item in the balance sheet, asset, liability, income, expense, everything will affect, no. Now tell me, is it possible for me to quantify? So what they said, the effect on the consolidated financials for the failure has not been determined. So they stated the fact that the effect could not be determined because multiple items will affect, many elements will affect. Now tell me, Parve is the first part of the definition. They are not confined to specific element. Multiple elements will affect satisfied or not adverse opinion they gave are you getting the point here consolidation they didn't do I have a proof entity was acquired consolidation has not done I am giving audit report on consolidated financials whether it is true and fair when you did not consolidate one subsidiary how can I say consolidated balance sheet is true and fair it is not true and fair because you didn't consolidate one subsidiary every asset is understated every liability is understated are you getting the point now, again, general pair, I told, right, in every basis for opinion, in every basis pair, the general pair, we conduct our audit as per standards, our responsibilities are so and so. This is common, able to understand. All of you. Now, you see, in uh, adverse opinion, in our opinion, it starts again. In our opinion, uh, I mean, in our opinion, to the best of our information and according to the explanation given to us because of the significance of matter. Qualified opinion, in our opinion, to the best of our information and according to the explanation given to us except it uses the word except for the effect of the matter except for the effect of the matter given in the basis for qualified opinion section 
you see unqualified opinion no because no accept in our opinion to the best of our information according to the explanation straight away the aforesaid financial statements are prepared in accordance with the act in the manner so required and give true and fair view straight away we talk there is no exception no because yes or no now you see a disclaimer of opinion disclaimer of opinion it starts straight away with we do not express it starts straight away with the, it is not in our opinion to the best of our information according to the explanation given to us no opinion it's not like that you see straight away it started with the, we do not express opinion are you getting the point and moreover you see in unqualified opinion we clearly mentioned in the first point we have audited in the qualified opinion first part we have audited yes or no in the adverse opinion in the first part of the audit report we have audited whereas in disclaimer we didn't audit that's why we are giving disclaimer we didn't verify anything we didn't verify major items of the financial statements we were not giving access we were not having access major evidence is not available where have you verified audit means what verification audited means what verified disclaimer you are giving because you have not verified when you have not verified how can you say we have audited so it started with the, we were engaged to audit it started with the, we were engaged to audit we have not audited we were engaged to audit and we do not express an opinion on the accompanying consolidated financials of the of the group because of the significance of the matter discussed in basis for disclaimer of opinion section of our report we have not been able to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence to provide a basis for an opinion and you see basis for disclaimer that standard para we do audit as per standards and auditing that and all was not there are you getting it if you give opinion i want to know what is the basis here you didn't give opinion what is the point of giving basis there is no basis at all first of all you didn't give opinion what is the basis then the question of basis will not arise but still in order to follow that you need to give reason no why you didn't give opinion basis for rejection of opinion basis for declining of the opinion basis for disclaimer of the opinion you should talk about that you are talking this is not basis for opinion this is basis for disclaimer of opinion understand are you getting the point so what is the basis the group investment a in the group investment in its joint venture is carried at balance sheet at so and so amount which represents 90% only one item investments one item but which represent a substantial portion then second part of the pervasive satisfied or not that's it are you getting it so every item is clear cut represented with the practical example are you clear so have you understood the wordings all of you so in examination in an mcq if they want to make it if, if they want to make the paper little tough they'll give you this kind of wordings as options a b c d and ask you a uh, question is the following which of the i mean uh, they may ask you which of the following is a correct statement or which of the following is incorrect statement they'll give you three correct statements one incorrect statement they'll give you three opinion paragraph wordings correctly one opinion paragraph wording incorrectly you need to pick up that incorrect one able to understand so it's not that easy only if you observe like this specifically you answer all of them entire standards related questions why students cannot score is because they are unable to understand the standards rest of the chapters they are able to understand but the standards is what they are unable to understand all of you so with this four types of opinions we have covered four types of opinions we have covered along with the definitions along with the wordings along with the examples clear next now uh, here so whenever there is a material misstatement in the financial statements you need to qualify if you are any sorry you need to quantify actually it's actually quantify qualify plus quantify both suppose if you are unable to qualify you are unable to quantify mention that you are unable to quantify suppose if the mistake is non disclosure misstatement is because of a non disclosure what you will do this itself can be asked as a 3 marks or 4 marks question you are you are appointed as an auditor of a company as part of your audit you have conducted the audit and uh, you have arrived at a conclusion there is a material misstatement by way of non disclosure of contingent liability what is the suitable what action you i mean what is the reporting requirement as per sci 705 in this case they'll ask you this question means you need to write this point if at all financial statements are not disclosing something which is material is it a material misstatement or not misstatement definition disclosure is also one type of misstatement what is required as per framework what you reported i didn't report anything but as per requirement i have to report is it a misstatement or not so non disclosure is also a misstatement now when there is a non disclosure if there is a material misstatement that relates to non disclosure of information which is required to be disclosed the auditor shall 
discuss the non disclosure with the top management nature describe the nature of omitted information describe in order to put what is the nature of the omitted information unless prohibited by law include the omitted disclosure if it is practicable to do so and the auditor had obtained evidence about the omitted you got evidence no you have information about the omitted information no yes or no you describe that in basis for qualified opinion basis for adverse opinion section what is that information you discuss clearly during the year company has a case pending against getting it where the amount involved is this much the 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 case is pending at so and so forum we have obtained sufficient appropriate evidence regarding the same however since the same element is not presented in the financial statements we are modifying our report in this format mention that are you getting that same way <coughs> whenever an auditor is disclaiming the opinion whenever auditor is disclaiming the opinion auditor responsibility for audit of financial statement generally in audit report one of the lengthy paragraph is report on legal and regulatory requirement that is care all that will come there 43 points we will talk about that is one lengthy para second lengthiest para second lengthiest para in actual real life audit report is auditor responsibility section what is it auditor responsibility section suppose you see tata motors no what is auditor responsibility section you see so much this book you see it started here it started here and ends here almost almost two pages you see what are auditor responsibilities our objective is to obtain reasonable assurance uh, whether financials are free from material misstatement whether due to fraud or fraud or error reasonable assurance means what misstatement can arise from fraud or error and when they are considered materially as part of audit we exercise professional judgment and skepticism we do risk assessment process we understand internal controls we look at accounting policies we verify you know uh, material uncertainty related to going concern and uh, we evaluate overall presentation and structure of the financial statements getting it and uh, we also obtain sufficient appropriate information regarding joint operations in this case that specific point came we communicated with the top management of the company about all this we also provide those charge with governance about some ethical requirement related things from the matters communicated with top management some matters are determined as key audit matter so many responsibilities you have under standards all that you are briefly describing now tell me people look at all this when you give opinion if you do not give opinion at all what is the use of your document audit report that's why you see when give disclaimer of opinion no when we gave disclaimer of opinion auditor responsibility para is just a few lines where we gave disclaimer of opinion auditor responsibility section auditor responsibility section is just a few lines but you see when we gave adverse opinion when we gave adverse opinion similar to 700 when we when we gave uh, you know unqualified opinion auditor responsibility para is same 700 format nothing but unqualified opinion format unqualified opinion you see auditor responsibility so much it is there are you getting it tata motors also gave same so when you give unqualified opinion qualified opinion adverse opinion auditor responsibility section will have complete description whereas when you give disclaimer of opinion auditor responsibility section will say our you just mention our responsibility is to conduct audit of the group consolidated financials and issue audit report however because of the matter described in so and so section of the report we were not able to obtain evidence uh, you know to give opinion we are independent of the group and we have fulfilled our ethical responsibilities but we didn't do the audit and we are not giving opinion you just mention the fact this question was asked in may 22 examination write about description of auditor's responsibilities relating to audit of financial statement section in a case when auditor has given a disclaimer of opinion are you getting it and this question bank we prepared we prepared this in 2021 that time itself we mentioned this as a separate question getting it in may 22 the question came exactly like this many felt may 22 attempt was toughest attempt for audit why because these kinds of questions have asked have, have been asked getting it so when auditor expresses disclaimer of opinion due to non availability of evidence the auditor shall amend the auditor shall amend description of auditor responsibility section and you mentioned that a statement that auditor is responsible for conducting audit a statement that because of the matter described you are not able to get evidence and a statement about your independence and ethical responsibilities you see disclaimer of opinion illustration our responsibility is to conduct audit our response you know uh, however because of the matter described we have not given opinion we are independent these statements only you know you need to talk you need to talk about these statements and that's what in reality also this book able to understand all of you so that's about different types of opinions that's about different types of opinions 
uh, their definitions, their wordings in the auditor's report, all that. Clear? Most of the observations I made. Now, we'll discuss further, further paragraphs in the audit report. So, now we have completed, now we have completed almost a uh, few key elements. So, we have completed now the title, addressee, opinion para, basis for opinion para. So, in opinion, basis for opinion in different four types of various opinions we have covered. Getting it? Now, then we need to discuss material uncertainty, but I'll come back to that later. Okay, then uh, I'll key audit matters, I'll come back to it later. Emphasis of matter para, other matter para. Now, we will discuss these two. Emphasis of matter para and other matter paragraph. Now, you see. So, SA 706. So, SA 706, emphasis of matter paragraph. You see the definition. It's a paragraph included in auditor's report, which refers to a matter appropriately. You look at this word, appropriately. Getting it? Presented or disclosed in the financial statements, which in the auditor's judgment are of such importance that is fundamental to the users for understanding of the financial statements. Which is fundamental to the users for understanding of the financial statements. Now, see, you just observe, Tata Motors, this is uh, standalone financials. This is standalone financials. You just observe Tata Motors financial statements. The balance sheet started somewhere in 244 page. 244 page. Getting it? So, and you see, this is PNL. This is cash flow. This is SOC, statement of changes. This is notes and the notes keeps on going. Almost some, you know, almost some 40, 50 pages. Some companies 100 pages, some companies 120, 130 pages. Who has the patience to read entire 120 pages of the financial statements? First of all, who will understand by reading them? We CA students only don't understand. Logically, yes or no? So, who will read all these points? But tell me, in this, in this entire this notes, definitely some important points were there, right? Not every point everybody is expected to read. But the auditor has to read, no? The auditor is signing the financial statements. No. One of the responsibility of auditor is auditor before signing, he has to compulsorily read the entire financial statements. Only after that he should sign the audit report. Correct? Huh? So I must read the entire financials. When I am reading, somewhere in the note point, somewhere in the note, in the notes to accounts, some 35th point I felt. 35th point I read. As part of reading all the points, some 35th point, you know, caught my attention. It, it caught my attention. I felt it is very important. It is talking about company's future. It is talking about company's one of the important contingent liability. Now tell me, should I highlight this to the shareholder? Should I show this? Should I highlight this to the shareholder? Yes or no? This is an important point. Everybody should come and see this. This is one of the company's forecasted plan. Getting it? Some, for, some company future plan is being discussed here, which is very important before you take a decision further. So what I can do? I will highlight that. Highlighting means what? Go to the notes and notes and highlight with highlighter. No. Because notes I can't touch. No. I have to highlight only through audit report. In financial statements, I can't put my pen or anything. Nothing. Getting it? I can't highlight anything. I can't use anything. So, the only way I can highlight is in audit report. Okay, which paragraph you can use? Highlighted para, emphasize means what? Highlight. Now, what am I doing now here? You see, when I, when I use this, I am emphasizing it. Are you getting the point? Emphasis of matter paragraph is a paragraph which is used for emphasizing some points which are presented or disclosed in financial statements. An item, an information presented or disclosed in financial statement, you want to draw user's attention there. You want to draw user's attention there. Highlight it under emphasis of matter para. Are you getting the point? Tell me. Can I use this emphasis of matter paragraph as a substitute for qualified opinion? Like it's actually containing material mistake. If it is containing material mistake, don't show your intelligence. Qualify. Getting it? Don't put it as a highlighter. Qualify. Qualifying means what? Saying that it is not true. The emphasis means what? Hey, please look at that. Correct? Huh? So, emphasis is relatively not at all a serious wording. Whereas qualifying means it's a serious wording. We are saying that it is wrong. Look at that is different. It is wrong. Both are different. Correct? An emphasis of matter paragraph cannot be used. 
an emphasis of matter paragraph cannot be used when there is a material misstatement in that item. Suppose that note number 35, when I read, I discovered a material misstatement in that. When I discovered a material misstatement, I must issue qualified opinion. I must qualify and mention the reason in basis for qualified opinion clearly. Don't cleverly use emphasis of matter paragraph. Emphasis of matter you can use when, when the item is appropriately presented. When the item is appropriately presented in the financials, appropriately disclosed in the financials, it is not inappropriate, it is appropriate and it is true and fair, no material misstatement. Then why, why you want to highlight? It's important. I want everybody to read this. Okay, highlight it under emphasis of matter paragraph and that's why there is a condition like this in emphasis. Okay, an emphasis matter paragraph can be used only when the auditor is not required to modify the opinion in accordance with 705 as a result of the matter. Whatever the matter you are talking about, no, on that you don't want to qualify. You are not required to qualify. It's not you don't want to qualify. You are not required to qualify. As per standard, you are not required to qualify that. You are not required to qualify means it is true and fair. Only a matter or an item presented or disclosed in the financial statements which is true and fair, which you think important for the user, which you think important for the user for better understanding of the financial statement, then highlight it. Are you getting the point? All of you. Same way, when the matter is not determined to be a key audit matter. If the same you are going to talk about once again in key audit matter, better don't talk about that once again in emphasis of matter because anyhow when you are talking when, when you are talking about this in the key audit matter, you are already referring there. Why again refer here? In key audit matter, when we talk about any financial statement item, no. We discuss about how we audited, what are all the things that we have seen. Everything we discuss in key audit matter. When you discuss so detailed in key audit matter about the same particular item, why you again emphasize it? Why are you doing twice? Duplication, no. Are you getting the point? So, don't repeat duplication. That is what the second condition objective. So, conditions for using emphasis. The auditor shall emphasis, shall use an emphasis of matter paragraph provided. The auditor is not required to modify. There is no obligation to modify for you on that matter or the same matter is not being a key audit matter. If you determine that as a key audit matter and communicating under SA 701, why are you communicating again under 706 already in the audit report, already in the audit report, you are already giving key audit matter, then after all you are coming to emphasis, able to understand. All of you, clear? Now, now here there is one more question. Suppose you see the audit report format, see the audit report format. Title, Addressee, Opinion, Basis for Opinion. Title, Addressee, Opinion, Basis for Opinion. And uh, then the next one is Material Uncertainty. Of course, this will come very rare. Very rare. We'll discuss that situation. Then, Key Audit Matter, Emphasis, Other Matter. Now, what is the order of these paragraphs? First, should I present Key Audit Matter, then Emphasis, then Other Matter, or any other order? Depends upon the significance as per your thought process. In a, in a company, in a company, if I feel emphasis should come because that is more important, then I will put emphasis at first, then key audit matter. State Bank of India audit report did the same. Getting the point? If I think key audit matter should come at first because it is important, see, in these three also, I am talking about some additional information. In all these three para, auditor is talking about some different, different aspects. According to you, which is most important, keep that at first, then remaining at next. By default, irrespective of all this, standard number will follow. Which comes first? 701. Then only 706. So let us follow 701, 706. Before this, 570 comes. So before that, which is very logical and accepted in standard also. Are you getting the point? So, but actually, it is based upon the importance. It is based upon the importance. It is given in the uh, explanatory material in the, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in the essay 701 or uh, this one, emphasis of matter paragraph, they gave this. In emphasis of matter paragraph, I think uh, they clearly mentioned. In one of the standards, they clearly mentioned. You see here. Placement of emphasis of matter paragraph. If this question comes, no, that's it, gone. Placement of emphasis of matter paragraph and other matter paragraph in audit report. This is given in the 
explanatory material in the pronouncement. There will be a main standard, no? To that standard, explanatory material will be given inside that A16. That is talking about placement of e emphasis of matter para other matter paragraph. The placement of emphasis of matter para other matter paragraph in the audit report depends upon nature of the information to be communicated and auditor's judgment as to importance of such information to the users. It depends upon the auditor's significance. It depends upon the auditor's judgment. Judgment is what auditor decision about significance of that matter to the users. When emphasis matter paragraph related to applicable framework, this is an example they give. Suppose when a key audit matter section is presented in audit report, an emphasis of matter paragraph may be presented either directly before or after the key audit matter. You can either present above the key audit matter or below the key audit matter based on the judgment as to which is important. Whether emphasis of matter paragraph information is important or key audit matter information which is important according to you, accordingly you can present. The auditor may add further context to the heading emphasis of matter, emphasis of matter, subsequent heading, subsequent event. See, emphasis of matter means, suppose, no, I will show you air in the audit report. So, air India, yeah. You see, in air India, they have emphasized so many points. They have emphasized so many points. One of the points they emphasized is note number 29 in the notes to accounts which is talking about some possible uncertainties about COVID-19 situation. This is actually Air India's 2021 audit report. Okay. Note number 26, which is talking about some penal charges on delayed payment of guarantee fee. So and so penal charges. Another note number 49 is talking about deferred tax. Another note number is talking about like this. Suppose, no, I can give here emphasis of matter COVID-19. Emphasis of matter paragraph. Okay, penal charges, emphasis of matter paragraph, deferred tax, etc. Like this, I can specifically use side heading also. This is also permitted. That's what the actual pronouncement says. Able to understand. But Air India has used which one standard presentation? They just highlighted one side heading emphasis. They just presented the points. Now tell me, they are talking about note number 29, note number 26, note number 14, note number 46 like this. Is it because are they containing material mistakes? No. They are just highlighting. Because you have to read them, you have to see them, getting it. I know you will not read the entire balance sheet, PNL, notes to accounts completely. At least read these points, which is important before you take a decision. So, we are not qualifying, you know. We are just highlighting. We are not qualifying. How should we tell the people that we are not qualifying them? At the end of the matter, at the end of the matter, we have to mention clearly that our opinion is not modified on the same. Actually, here presentation mistake, it should come left. Okay. In Air India, presentation mistake. So, it actually should come in the left alignment. It is not a point. It is not a, it looks like continuation, no? It's actually not continuation. It's a separate reporting. It's a separate reporting. At the end of the emphasis of matter, you should clearly mention our mat, our opinion is not modified in respect of the above matters. On all the above matters, we don't have any objection. You need to mention this. This is what the disclosure you read now in the book. So, manner of presentation of emphasis of matter. What is the manner of presentation of emphasis of matter? One of the important questions. Write about many times asked in final and inter. In both the cases it was asked. So, what is the manner? Include a paragraph. Include the paragraph within a separate section of the auditor's report. As a separate section, SRO in the Air India, do they mention as a separate side heading or not? Emphasis of matter. Other matter paragraph is a separate section. Yes or no. Include the paragraph within a separate section of the audit report with an appropriate heading which includes the term emphasis of matter. Air India, side heading, emphasis of matter, term what used or not. And express the matter being highlighted. Express the matter being emphasized and give reference to such matter. In Air India, note number 29, note number 26, note number like that, yes or no. State that. The opinion is not modified in respect of the matter. Also state that your opinion is not modified. Air India did that or not? Sorry. Are you getting the point? Now, an emphasis of matter paragraph, please make a note. It is not a substitute for modified opinion. If at all the matter is containing material misstatement, you must give qualified opinion. You cannot escape by emphasizing it. It is not a substitute for disclosure in financials. It is not a substitute for 570 material uncertainty reporting. It is not a substitute. It is just an additional item which you want to give, you can give. You cannot use this as a substitute for other sections of the audit report. If you decide it as a key audit matter, give it as a key audit matter. If there is a material misstatement, qualify. 
if you want to if, if at all as per the standard on that matter there is a modification that you are you have to give then modify you cannot use it as a substitute para this similar concept is also there in key audit matter key audit matter is not a substitute for modified opinion key audit matter is not a substitute for sa 570 key audit matter is not a substitute for disclosure key audit matter is not a separate opinion four wordings were there are you getting it able to recollect what you read that's it now so with this we have completed emphasis of matter paragraph now you see emphasis of matter paragraph definition now once again you will understand the importance of this word appropriate I can emphasize only when an item is appropriately presented or disclosed in the financials. Appropriately presented or disclosed means no material misstatement. That's it. So, this is explicitly discussed in the form of condition again. Two times it is discussed indirectly. Clear all of you. Then coming to other matter paragraph. Then coming to other matter paragraph. Just two minutes gap. Okay. I will just stop and record it as a next video. The next one continuation is same SA 706 other matter paragraph. You see other matter paragraph definition. It is also a paragraph which is included in auditor's report in a separate section. Correct? Huh? It is also included in a separate section that refers to some matter. It refers to some matter other than those presented or disclosed in financials. Suppose if you want to refer about something which is presented or disclosed in financials, emphasis is there. If you want to talk about something which is presented or disclosed in financials, you emphasize it. You have used emphasis of matter. But what if you want to talk about some other matter which is not there in the financial statements? Then what is that matter? For whom it is important? It is important in auditor's judgment. It is relevant for users for understanding of the audit. For understanding of the auditor's responsibilities or for understanding of the auditor's report. If you think this matter is important for the users to understand about your audit, auditor's responsibilities, auditor's report. Three aspects. The audit, auditor responsibilities, audit report. Now, if you want to talk about the audit example, you want to talk about joint auditors. Suppose you are one of the joint auditors. Getting the point. And all the joint auditors together, together gave this report. So, you want to explain that to the shareholders clearly. See, you are reading audit report, don't think only one person gave this report. All 12 of us, State Bank of India is having 12 joint auditors. State Bank of India is having 12 joint auditors. All 12 joint auditors put together gave this opinion. Me along with other joint auditors were decided about this opinion. This is not a unanimous opinion by myself. So, this is about audit. Are you getting the point? Auditors report. What does it mean? You have seen in joint audit there is a provision. If any joint auditor is disagreeing with remaining, have you seen it? You have seen this point. A joint auditor is not bound by majority. Yes or no? If a joint auditor disagrees with other joint auditors in a particular opinion, the disagreeing joint auditor can give a separate audit report, correct? In such a case, the, the company will have two audit reports or three audit reports. Don't know, who knows? In such a case, company will have multiple audit reports. In such a case, in the other matter paragraph section of each auditor's report, they should talk about other auditor's report. We should tell that this is not the only audit report on the company. There is another audit report on this company. Are you getting the point? So, which means for audit, I gave an example. For auditor's report, I gave an example. Getting the point? Now, auditor's responsibilities, what does it mean? Now, look at the State Bank of India example where I am going to continue SA 600 from here. Getting it. SA 706 is directly linked with SA 600. SA 600 is what? Using the work of other auditor. Getting it? No. So, State Bank of India, if you look at, State Bank of India has, uh, first of all, it has so many subsidiary companies, associate companies like that, which means State Bank of India is preparing standalone financials. State Bank of India is preparing consolidated financials. Standalone financials means, first of all, you know, State Bank of India uh, is having two set of auditors, two different set of auditors. One, principal auditors. One is principal auditors and another one is branch auditors. I am talking about State Bank of India Limited, only SBI Limited I am talking about. Are you getting the point? I am not talking about SBI Group. I am talking about SBI Limited Company. 
getting it so it has appointed principal auditor and they also have branch auditor the state bank of india is having 25000 branches across india the state bank of india is having 25000 branches across india out of them 16000 branches they were not subjected to audit as per rbi guidelines they were not subjected to audit means no audit is required for them only for 9000 branches approximately the state bank of india has appointed branch auditors able to understand see there is a there is an empanelment with rbi bank i mean uh, rbi empanelments auditors empanelment with rbi there are four categories or five five categories the firms will be divided into four or five categories depending upon the category you belong to you are eligible for that type of audit suppose if you belong to category 3 you are eligible for branch audit of a bank if you belong to category 1 you are eligible to become a principal auditor in our in banks terminology they don't use the word principal auditor they use the word csa central statutory auditor they use the word central statutory auditor and for branch auditors they refer simply statutory auditor statutory auditor means branch auditor central statutory auditor means principal auditor but in auditing standard they don't use that terminology in auditing standard what they use principal auditor other auditor what do we use other auditor other auditor means what branch auditor principal auditor means what central statutory auditor in the context of banks even in the context of insurance companies for insurance companies also there is a separate divisional auditor public sector insurance companies i'm talking about i'm not talking about private sector insurance companies even banks also i'm not talking about private sector banks for private sector banks there is no branch audit you take Kotak Mahindra, you take Indusin, you take ICSA, any of these banks, they don't have branch audit. Why? Because in, in private sector banks, accounting is completely centralized. There is no branch level accounting. Whereas in public sector banks, branch level accounts manager will be there. You go and visit any state bank of India branch, there will be accounts manager inside that. Because accounts are maintained separately at branch, of course, accessible centrally. Understand, maintaining centralized accounting system is different. Accessing accounting book centralizedly is different. In state bank, core banking solution, accounts can be accessed centrally from anywhere. But I'm talking about maintenance of records. Accounting means is it only software? Huh? It's about the background supporting documents, everything. Are you getting the point? So in private sector banks, there is no separate branch-wise accounting which they do. They prepare everything in the consolidated. Able to understand? Now, so 9,000 branches were audited by branch auditors. Now, principal auditors, no, state bank of India principal, they have appointed 12 joint auditors. How many joint auditors they have? 12 before 2020-21 sorry before 21-22 they are having uh, 14 joint auditors from 21-22 they are having 12 joint auditors because as per banks uh, appointment uh, guidelines issued in 2021 by RBI the branch the state a bank cannot have maximum more than 12 earlier the maximum number is 14 later it was reduced to 12 so the maximum number of joint auditors a bank can have is maximum 12 that is why state bank of india has used the maximum number you can see the state bank of india auditors report so i'm closing all this uh, you know disclaimer all this you see the state bank of india audit report at the end of the audit report you will see it is signed by so many these are all disclosures in consolidated financials It's okay, I'll come back to standalone and show. Like there is exactly 12 auditors for them. In Reliance also, there will be clear, Reliance is having two joint auditors. Punjab National Bank is having five joint auditors. Depends. Each company. Remember, under companies, a joint audit is not compulsory. But in rotation of auditors, one of the provision, in one of the point in rotation of auditors, they spoke about joint audit concept. Like there is a question on this. In MCQ, which of the following statement is true? Companies Act do not talk about joint audit. Joint audit is not mandatory about Companies Act. Or there is a legal footnote about joint audit in the Companies Act. Yes, that is true. In rotation of auditors, uh, they give one provision. I, when I come to company audit, if possible, I'll there I'll discuss. In rotation of auditors, at last of the rotation of auditors provision, if possible, members may resolve, the audit team and engagement partner may be rotated at such intervals. Have you seen this? 
in rotation of auditors there is a point note point the members of the company may resolve that subject to do getting it the engagement partner and the engagement team can be rotated at such intervals what does it mean you appointed auditor for 5 years 5 years same partner is coming no i don't want every year partner should change like this members can resolve or members may also resolve that audit can be conducted by more than one auditor what do you mean by audit can be conducted by more than one auditor multiple auditors means joint auditors if one or more auditors are appointed for the same financial year for the same scope of work under the same statute then we call it as what joint audit correct huh? now you see so so these 12 these 12 auditors these 12 joint auditors who are principal auditors they have to do audit of entire sbi limited but 69000 branches of sbi limited 16000 branches of sbi limited they were not audited and these were audited by other auditors now other auditors will do all the audit of the books of accounts of 9000 branches and they will forward the audit reports to main auditors main auditors will purely look at the audit report and form the opinion on the overall state bank of india how this process happens is what sas 600 is talking about now let me first finish 706 requirement why 706 says what 706 says then i will talk about sa 600 what 706 says now you see state bank of india 12 auditors no they gave opinion on the financial statements branch auditors also gave 9000 audit reports but do we issue them to public suppose as a shareholder i want to know sbi limited is a listed listed share which is traded in stock market i want to see audit report the moment i open audit i see 9000 reports who will read all this Yes or no? I am asking for SBI company as a whole one report. SBI Limited and its branches all put together one enterprise or not? For one enterprise, how many audit reports should be there? One audit report only should be there. So the principal auditors have to prepare an audit report by using their work and by using other auditors' reports. So what principal auditors do? The principal auditors take all the reports of the branch auditors. at the bank overall head office level they will prepare one single audit report after taking into observation all the branch auditors report everything and then they give opinion but now tell me if something goes wrong tomorrow in the branch in one of the branch i am not the one who acted for that branch audit the branch audit is performed by another auditor i am not the one who is involved which means for the branch audit which is performed by branch auditor who is also a chartered accountant who is also having cop who is also governed by code of ethics who is an independent external auditor i am also independent external auditor only thing is his scope is branch my scope is entire company that's the only difference yes or no tell me for the branch he verified that right like how you believe my audit report i believe his audit report and gave my opinion tomorrow if something fraudulently happened people are coming and questioning me because i signed the report ultimately my report only visible to the public how should i tell the public that i am not responsible for them other matter paragraph in other matter paragraph i will specifically talk about auditors responsibilities so and so branches were audited by branch auditors to the extent of these branches the audit reports were forwarded to us and our report is purely based upon these branch auditors report we formed our report on the overall financial statements purely based upon branch auditors report indirectly what are we conveying to the public look 16000 branches 25000 branches were there 16000 branches no audit 9000 branches audited by other auditors these audit these audit reports are given to us based on these audit reports only we have our overall opinion if something goes wrong in these audit reports don't come and question us you question us i will answer but i am not responsible i am not held held liable for this are you getting the point this point we are giving in other matter paragraph you see other matter paragraph of the state bank of india you see they clearly mentioned incorporated in these financials in these financials this is also included what is included we did not audit 8591 branches 8591 branches which are included in stand alone financial statements whose total assets are 21 lakh crore whose total revenue is 1.2 lakh crore okay and the financial statements of these branches have been audited by branch auditors whose reports have been whose reports have been furnished to us 
and in our opinion in so far as it relates to these amounts is purely based on the reports of the branch auditor i gave my opinion in this audit report which you are reading is based on the branch auditor's report which means if something happens in the branch tomorrow related to this auditor's negligence i am not the auditor for them you don't think about my negligence it is about the branch auditor negligence are you getting the point so tomorrow if any investigation authority want to see all this they will see all this and they will go with the respect to branch are you getting the point that's why you see sa7 sa600 sa600 if you look at first point in sa600 wherever you see auditor should mention clearly clearly the division of responsibility it is clearly mentioned in the sa600 starting itself it is mentioned have you read sa600 Yes or no? This is starting itself. It is mentioned in the introduction of the standard itself. It is mentioned. The principal auditor should state clearly the division of responsibility for the financial information of the entity by indicating the extent to which financial information of components audited by other auditors, which are included in the financial information of the entity. Are you getting it? And number of divisions, branches, and other components audited. Now tell me, we clearly mentioned in State Bank of India. we did not audit 8591 branches which are audited by other auditors whose financial information comprises total assets of 21 lakh crore total revenue of 1.2 lakh crore which is included in the financial statements of the entire company whose reports were forwarded yes or no so this clearly mentioned by auditor are you getting the point all of you now now again you see now see i am the auditor these 12 no these 12 joint auditors were auditors of state bank of india limited they were auditors for state bank of india limited 12 joint auditors for that let us assume okay now the state bank of india is preparing the state bank of india is preparing two sets of financials one is stand alone another one is consolidated financials consolidated financials means what sbi limited a balance sheet plus subsidiary companies associate companies joint ventures correct ah this is what consolidated financial statements means what is stand alone head office of sbi plus all branches correct principal auditor means what your auditor for head office are you getting it for branches who are the auditor branch auditors now you see sa600 there are three important definitions of sa600 if you do not understand those three there is no point of reading sa600 three definitions were given in sa600 what are the definitions principal auditor other auditor component yes or no these three definitions were given now you see component definition it starts with five letters five words division branch subsidiary associate any other entity yes or no any other entity whose whose financial information is included in the financial information audited by principal auditor that's the definition right component definition who is other auditor definition of other auditor other auditor is an auditor who is conducting audit of financial statement financial information of a component which is included in financial information audited by principal auditor who is principal auditor principal auditor is an auditor appointed for conducting audit of financial information of the entity they use the word entity which includes one or more of the components related financial information audited by other auditors now you see component definition five points were there branch is a component division is a component subsidiary is a component associate is a component any other entity not branch any other entity means separate entity is also a component now division branch subsidiary joint venture associate these are all components definitions no in components it is covered no now these two are components from stand alone financials point of view these three are components from consolidated financials point of view in component definition they spoke component means what from consolidated financials point of view subsidiary is a component associate is a component from stand alone financials point of view what is a component branch is a component are you getting the point understood uh, slightly now see in consolidated financials consolidated financials means what like reliance itself you take reliance itself you take you will understand even more concretely this one so that see initial understanding is very important for further standards understanding getting it if if audit report is understood thoroughly this audit report related standards if you understood thoroughly remaining standards when you read you feel like very flexible you understand the impact really 
you don't feel like mere reading nothing is there mere reading you understand the impact of every line yeah consolidated financials this is the consolidated financial statements of reliance company you see here reliance company consolidated financials no actually reliance reliance company consolidated financial statements is a result of is a result of you see here 24 subsidiaries 24 subsidiaries three joint ventures what about associates ah uh, three associates this is audited by the reliance main auditor himself whereas whereas 299 subsidiaries 100 and uh, 102 associates 32 joint ventures of reliance these were audited by other auditors means not the reliance industries limited auditor i am talking about ril limited reliance industries limited company reliance industries limited is having approximately 299 subsidiaries plus 24 one or two associates plus three um 32 joint ventures plus three here three on you know are uh, three joint ventures so totally how many uh almost your uh 323 325, 328, 428, 423, 4, 463 companies plus Reliance Company, which means 464 companies total. Reliance Consolidated Financial Statement is a result of consolidation of 464 companies. Understand? But if you look at individually these companies, are all these companies audited by same audit firm? No. Only Reliance Industries Limited. 24 subsidiaries, 3 associates, 3 joint ventures. Only these were audited by same audit firm. Remaining companies were audited by other auditors. They have given their audit report on the standalone financial statements of these 400 plus companies. Now those audit reports we received. Now consolidated financial statements means what? Reliance asset, Reliance fixed asset and these remaining 465 companies. Total asset, we will put it in consolidation. Correct? Same way, all the liabilities of consolidated balance sheet liabilities, it's a result of 460 companies, correct? Huh? But on consolidated financials, who is giving audit report? Reliance Industries Limited Auditor is giving audit report. Now, he is the only one signing the entire consolidated balance sheet, consolidated p &L, right? But people like you and me think what? Hey, one auditor did 460 companies consolidated. Huh? We may misinterpret this or no. So, in other matter paragraph, in the audit report on consolidated financials, Reliance Industries Auditor has to clearly mention we did not audit, we did not audit the financial information of 299 subsidiaries, 102 associates, 32 joint ventures, whose financial whose total asset is 5 lakh 81,000 crore, whose total revenue is 2.02 lakh crore, whose cash flow is 2,000 crore. We didn't audit this. These were audited by other auditors. Which financial statements, other reports have been given to us by management? The consolidated financials includes groups share of so and so. So they gave us the reports and separate financials. Management only consolidated. We were only appointed for the main company and few other companies. For these, we are not responsible, but we are only acting as a mediator. That's it. Are you getting the point? So, this is a requirement of SA 600, read with the SA 706, are you getting the point? Now, when you are using the work of other auditor, first point in the standard says, you are not responsible for the components, you are not responsible for the components, component means what? Consolidation point of view, subsidiary associate joint venture, standalone point of view, branches, in State Bank of India, branches you, are, you have not audited, right? Mention that in the audit report, that's it, same way in consolidated financials, these 400 plus companies, you didn't already know, mention that. Why I have to mention that? These information is also there in the total balance sheet. The total balance sheet contain amounts belonging to these 400 plus companies. But I didn't audit, so I need to mention this. So that's a requirement of SS 706, read with 600. That is what the meaning of auditor responsibility word which is used in other matter paragraph definition. Getting the point? Now, now let's look at the SA 600 straight away. You see, the standards start with the principal auditor would not be responsible in respect of work belonging to other auditors. With respect to other auditors' work, you are not responsible. But 
you are using their reports you are getting their work only you are ultimately using their work and as part of your overall work now in such a case you need to have some coordination so that mistake will not happen so principal auditor so who is a principal auditor there are three definitions this is first definition second definition third definition numbering was went wrong okay principal auditor means first he is the auditor with responsibility for reporting on the financial information of an entity you are reporting on the entity financial information which includes which includes financial information of one or more components audited by another auditor same way other auditor means what he is the auditor other than principal auditor with responsibility for reporting on the financial information of a component which is included in the financial information audited by principal auditor so now what is component it's a division or branch from stand alone point of view subsidiary joint venture associate enterprise or any other entity from consolidation point of view whose financial information is included in financial statements audited by principal auditor so cleverly drafted definitions were getting it now now acceptance as principal auditor may 22 exam uh, may 22 or december 21 sorry december 21 december 21 exam this question was asked nobody predicted this again acceptance as a principal auditor see first of all generally if at all you got an appointment request from a company sir you want to be the principal auditor of our company can you accept that appointment can you accept that position of principal auditor you need to check certain factors can you accept one materiality of the portion of the financial statements which you are going to audit what is the materiality of financial statements you are going to audit you are only auditing very 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 minor portion don't take principal audit rule you should have reasonable portion of financial information in your audit purview getting it what is the degree of knowledge regarding the business how far you know the business okay of the company you are acting as not a branch or a principal means you are you are the auditor for all the segments of the company all the businesses handled by the company how far you are having the business knowledge think about it and what is the risk of mms what is the risk involved with respect to components audited by other auditor okay other some components are audited by other auditor what is the risk involved in that if at all that is only significant what you are doing is not significant better don't accept principal auditor designation performance of additional procedures as given out in this standard can you perform additional works which are required for principal auditor as per this standard if you are able to perform all those actions all those procedures take it as a principal auditor role otherwise don't take now what are the additional procedures that are requested under this standard principal auditors procedure this can be straight away come as a four marks question able to understand write about principal auditors procedures as per sa 600 so they'll ask you this question very clearly now the principal auditor should perform safi uh, should perform procedures to get sufficient appropriate evidence that work of other auditor is adequate for the purpose of auditor's purpose you need to clearly tell other auditors how his work is going to be impacted i know he is giving audit report on the branch only but that will not go to public outside so i don't know how he will prepare the report how he will audit when he will give this report all that tell me when i am the principal auditor when i can give my report only after branch auditor gave the audit report i can give principal auditor's report only when come subsidiary company audit report is given only when i can give consolidated financials related report correct you have seen this in consolidated financial statements also five reporting requirements is there in consolidation at the last topic is five reporting requirements were there in consolidated financial statements audit chapter okay there i'll come now so at planning stage at the planning of the audit itself i should tell the other auditor how his work is going to be used i need to explain him what is the importance of his work and make arrangements for coordination generally i am not responsible for his opinion his work but minimum precaution i should take i should tell him see this is a company for this caro is applicable this is not nbfc for the 143 checklist is applicable you please work on this i will work on this you give report on this so that my report will become easy i need to coordinate to so that my work will become easy i know i am not responsible for his work he is not responsible for my work but if we coordinate with each other it will be much more harmonious right in in the overall working process now i need to inform what are the areas requiring special consideration during the year company has started new business so i should tell them the company has started new business in so and so area so this area it is risky this area it is risky so i need to tell what are all special focuses they need to take same way reporting i need to report the other auditors what are the reporting requirements applicable for this company for this company whether caro is applicable whether so and so requirement is applicable Pre branch auditor is not aware of i should tell him what are the requirements even though he is aware of 
to have a unanimity getting it i need to tell him these are the requirements applicable if you give reporting on all caro at branch level i will consolidate caro at the consolidated level able to understand again i'm talking consolidated means not consolidated financials stand alone overall combining next the principal auditor might discuss with other auditor procedures applied and review a written summary so i will just take a written summary of i will ask him please write a summary of what are all the works you did getting it and what are the key findings so i will ask a questionnaire or checklist i will take a questionnaire or checklist and get information from the other auditor the principal auditor if at all wants he can wish the visit the other auditor and to what extent these procedures affect it depends upon the circumstances it depends upon the knowledge of the competence of the other auditor if i think the other auditor is also knowledgeable competent enough i may not be this much i may not be too much coordinating with him i know he is a chartered accountant he is also having cop he is also liable for same code of ethics governor he is governed by same laws and regulations so i may not coordinate much with him if at all the branch audit is performed by other than a member of the institute then i need to coordinate more able to understand these are the points which are given specifically in the standard itself are you clear next coordination between principal and other auditor how they should coordinate getting it they should work like a fish and water not fish and fisherman yeah please amma that's what i told now see can you accept as a principal auditor is the question can i accept as a principal auditor but this is a question for this i want to see tell me if i want to act as a principal auditor i should have the predominant role or branches should have a predominant role i must have the predominant role i must have the predominant authority same way if what i am auditing the portion of the financial statements or the portion of the branches which i am auditing if they are not that risky but the other branches audited by the other auditors were having high risk is it advisable for me to accept principal auditor role i know i am not responsible for his work but i want to see substance over form tomorrow if any issue comes everyone will first point of contact me only are you getting the point so i must always see what is the significance of my audit level okay you appointed me principal i am not responsible for his work but tomorrow people will blame me able to understand what work you did then why are you principal auditor major work is done by branch auditor then what is what is your role i will get substance over form questions that's what the point meaning getting it next coordination between principal auditor how they should coordinate with each other so see the other auditor must know how his work is going to be used by principal auditor as a branch auditor i must know how my work is going to help him my work is going to help him very simple i will give an audit report he will take that audit report if i give a qualified opinion he may or may not give qualified opinion now there is a point here in ss 600 where many confuses sir if branch audit report contains qualified opinion or adverse opinion overall audit report should also contain qualified report qualified opinion or adverse opinion this is the question straight example branch auditor gave one of the branch branch auditor gave adverse opinion on the financial statements of the branch what principal auditor should do i should consider i should consider what is the reason why the branch auditor gave adverse opinion what is the element information what is its materiality for overall entity if i feel as a whole entity point of view it is material pervasive then i will also give adverse opinion in the basis for adverse opinion section i clearly mentioned because the branch auditor gave adverse opinion because of so and so reason and since we also feel it is material and pervasive at entity level we also gave adverse opinion you getting the point suppose i felt are state bank of india having 25000 branches one branch auditor gave adverse opinion that that branch financial statements are not true and fair but that one branch is in the entire sb 0.5 percentage in the operations in the entire sb operations that branch operation is 0.5 percentage not even material getting the point then should i give adverse opinion i will ignore that so this is reporting requirement this is what given at the last report reporting requirement of principal auditor so the principal auditor should consider whether the subject of the modification is such nature and significance that requires modification of principal auditor report look at its significance of the matter getting it 
the principal auditor should document how he dealt with the qualifications or adverse marks contained in other auditor report you should document them now so as an other auditor he should bring to the principal auditor's attention any findings that is to be dealt at head office level same way principal auditor should also advise other auditor what matters and all and if at all principal auditor finds something severe related to branch then he should communicate it to the branch auditor so they should work coordinated you know in a mutually coordinated environment now if if other auditors have significant findings if other auditors branch auditors or component auditors found something very significant they the principal auditor may consider it is appropriate to discuss with other auditor and the management principal auditor if at all he want to he may conduct a supplementary test a supplementary test means what he already tested no i will also go and test that's called supplementing the test whatever test he performed i am supplementing it and i will document what are the doc this is actually separate separate segment ma this is actually a separate segment this is actually g documentation by principal auditor what you need to document write about documentation by principal auditor as per sa 600 four marks question straight away can come what components audited by other auditors i need to write 8591 branches were audited by branch auditors their significance 21 lakh crore of assets 1.2 lakh crore worth of revenue names of the other auditors this i will document in the documentation conclusions reached that individual component why any if you if you think any of the component is immaterial why it is immaterial logic you need to document the procedures performed and conclusions reached by principal auditor what are all the other procedures you need to document correspondence made with component auditor correspondence made with management all that you should document so this is the this these are the things principal auditor should document clear that's it so almost all the standard has been major part of the standard has been completed what if i am unable to use other auditor work i need to modify my opinion if other auditors were appointed and their audit report is not given to me or by the time i prepare my audit report their audit report is not ready ultimately i end up not using other auditors work in such a case i will give a qualified opinion or disclaimer disclaimer means what see if other auditor gives audit report i understand whether the financial statements of the branch is true and fair or not this fellow has not given me audit report so branch related information true and fair or not i don't know obviously which opinion i'll give disclaimer or qualified here it is non availability of evidence understand are you getting the point that's it with this sa 600 and 706 both put together completed confident got an idea see through marathon you don't you will get an understanding thoroughly you need to read it later on you need to read each and everything now i'm giving you overall comprehensive structure and explaining you few concepts at brief okay yeah then he won't give he'll give one modified that's it next ha are you clear about 706 also now now when do we give other matter paragraph the auditor shall include in other matter paragraph if it is not prohibited by law and if it is determined as a key audit matter also we don't give other matter simple logic if you are already talking about that under key audit matter why will you talk about it under other matter paragraph able to understand don't worry i understand so what is the difference between emphasis other key audit matter going concern i'll come to that one by one right now you know the difference between emphasis and other matter after we discuss key audit you will understand difference between three clearly now what is the manner of presentation the presentation shall be auditor shall include this paragraph within a separate section correct ah huh? other matter paragraph should also be kept as a separate side heading should we add it as part of emphasis ah huh? do we add it as part of opinion para no we will give it as a separate section with a heading which contains the word other matter yes or no you see reliance audit report everyone is giving other matter heading correct yes or no whatever standard says they are following next so finally communicate with the top management whenever you decided to use emphasis of matter paragraph or other matter paragraph wordings what is the draft other matter paragraph wordings draft emphasis of matter paragraph wordings please communicate with the top management and take their permission and then use nothing but sometimes you no know, auditors might use an offensive language whatever you are highlighting in omp whatever you are highlighting in em emphasis of matter you are just giving information are you objecting anything so that's why at the end of other matter per also you should mention this representation our opinion is not modified you should mention this in other matter paragraph end emphasis of matter paragraph end also you see sbi auditors they may, they mention this our opinion is not modified in respect of the above matters with respect to other matter paragraph 
even in emphasis also they gave this word this able to understand all of you so this is with respect to 706 so we have completed 700 705 705 also pervasiveness we completed all that we have completed and we un we completed uh, 600 also now 299 joint audit very simple the process of appointing two or more individuals or two or more firms or a combination of individuals and firms is known as joint audit first of all understand ca act related provision you know a member a member who has obtained the cop can practice either as an individual or as a firm he, he, he can either practice as an individual or firm individual means you will have a membership number firm means you will have membership number plus firm registration number getting it now this firm can be two types again sole proprietary firm or partnership firm if your firm is having partners multiple partners then it's a partnership firm if your firm is having only one person then it is a sole proprietary firm able to understand only under ci act individual is also having firm recognition able to understand anyhow i'll come to ethics chapter there i will discuss about all this what is the importance of having individual practice what is the importance of having practice in the name of the firm getting it now so responsibility of joint auditor joint auditor will have a divisible responsibility individual separate responsibility when the work is divided among joint auditors on a suitable basis each joint auditor is responsible only for the work performed by them how responsibility can be divided it can be divided based on items of assets and liabilities you do assets i'll do liabilities or income or expenditure you do audit of income i do audit of expenditure geographical areas you do north region i'll do south region identify you do, you do branch here branch b branches you audit i'll do branch B remaining branches audit or period you do for first six months i'll do for the next six months anyway they can divide the work now there are some areas where joint auditors cannot divide the responsibility in these areas joint auditors will have a joint responsibility combined responsibility where division cannot be possible example where the work is not divided because of some reason or decision is taken by all of them together or information is brought to the notice of all all of them knows that information on that all of them will have is equal responsibility for verifying disclosure requirements of financials for verifying whether financial statements are prepared as per applicable framework all joint suppose sba sba is having 12 joint auditors all 12 of them have signed the standalone financial statements all 12 of them has to read entire 120 pages getting it and for ensuring audit report complies obviously you know single audit report you are giving 12 of you so all 12 of you are responsible to ensure that audit report is as per the law that's it each joint auditor is entitled to rely on the work performed by another nothing but since state bank of india is having 12 when i am i am also one of the 12 auditors example when i am working i should only focus on my work i will not worry about how he is doing getting it what if he do wrong okay let him do wrong he is only punishable no not you right so by default you believe his work whatever he says at the end of the audit take it it's okay well, all of you sit together and give opinion tomorrow if something goes wrong and that belongs to his area he is only answerable why are you uh, worrying able to understand next now audit reporting in case of joint auditor generally all the joint auditors arrive common conclusion express common opinion through a single audit report however a joint auditor is not bound by no joint auditor is bound by majority's opinion if there is a difference of opinion among the joint auditor then the disagreeing auditor can express his own opinion by a separate report in such a case each joint auditor shall refer about other auditors report in their audit report cross referencing the audit report under other matter paragraph you see other matter paragraph definition other matter paragraph is a paragraph included in the audit report that refers to an information uh, which is not presented or disclosed in the financial statements which in the auditor's judgment is of important for understanding of the audit auditor responsibility audit report audit report means this example are you getting it now what are the special considerations this is an important question in this in this standard four marks question when joint auditors were appointed what are the special considerations the engagement partner key engagement team shall be involved in the planning all joint auditors team members should be involved in planning all joint auditors put together shall establish the overall audit strategy all joint auditors shall discuss and develop a joint audit plan for this actually there is a breakup a b c d points is also there now this itself can be asked as a, another separate four marks question which you will find in the main material getting it in the smart notes i didn't give 
in the main material you will find so all the joint auditors you are appointed as a joint auditor among another joint auditor what are the uh, precautions that you should take while developing a joint audit plan this is the question they ask but many students will write this this answer many students will write this answer when the question is about the third point they are writing remaining points as the answer and losing marks but actual question is the third point inside that four five sub points were there that is what tested for three to four marks question able to understand all of you next so with that essay 299 is also done so again i'll come back to the audit report able to understand how to draft the audit report now so we completed emphasis of matter paragraph other matter paragraph now let me discuss um, material and a key audit matter after that i will cover material uncertainty now let's discuss key audit matter just two minutes gap okay uh, i will save it as a separate file just a minute yes so we'll start sa 701 which is key audit matter like the standard heading is communicating key audit matter in the independent auditors report okay whereas if you see sa 706 the standard heading is emphasis of matter paragraph and other matter paragraph in the independent auditors report sa 705 modifications to the opinion in the independent auditors report sa 700 forming of an opinion and reporting on the financial statements that's it okay now 701 uh, key audit matter you see key audit matter definition what is a key audit matter i bet many don't understand the standard key audit matter they just read they think they understand but i'll show you now exactly how it is this is a matter which in the auditor's judgment or of most significant in the audit of financial statements of current period and these are selected from the matters communicated with the, those charged with the governance you see tata motors they have used key audit matters they have used key audit matters they have used key audit matter like same the definition is copy pasted key audit matters are those matters that in auditors professional judgment were of most significant in our audit of financial statements of the current period these were addressed in the context of our audit of stand alone financial statements as a whole and forming opinion thereon we do not provide separate opinion on these matters what are they saying in the second line these matters were addressed in the context of our audit in our audit we already verified them like wha what is the purpose of communicating key audit matter there is a point here what is the purpose of communicating key audit matter which has been asked many times in exams in ca inter and final so what is the purpose of communicating key audit matter the purpose of communicating key audit matter is to enhance communicative value of the auditor's report by providing greater transparency about the audit it is to enhance communicative value how they are enhancing communicative value i'll discuss it provides additional information to the users for understanding the entity and areas of important matters in auditor's judgment what are the important areas in auditor's point of view in this organization users will understand and remember communicating key audit matter is not a substitute for disclosure not a substitute for modified not a separate opinion and not a substitute for 570 material uncertainty related to going concern reporting getting it key audit matter is not a substitute now exactly we see you know in united states because it is called as critical audit matter in pcob framework it is called as critical audit matter in da in denmark in shell in, in united kingdom in united in uh, european union in all these cases also key audit matter definition is same the wording source same exact presentation everything is same opinion basis for opinion all these will all these will also appear in european union audit reports uh, denmark company audit reports uk audit reports in all the audit reports it is common audit is universally same subject understand just like how india is is universally same in india it is also exactly similar to international accounting standard except uh, carbon carbon yes or no no description of key audit matter you see what are they giving what are they giving what is the key audit matter they mention how the matter was addressed in the audit they mention first you you look at the presentation how they did then you understand exactly the standard okay 
Now what they said during the year, company has transferred passenger vehicles undertaking to its step down subsidiary Tata Motor Passenger Vehicle Limited. Okay. Um, now uh, this company has filed with the NCLT a scheme with the registrar and received all regulatory approvals, uh, you know, uh, which is effective from 2022 January. Accordingly, the assets and liabilities of passenger vehicle has been transferred to so-and-so step-down subsidiary, immediate subsidiary. The company has accounted for this transfer in accordance with generally accepted account principles and has recognized the excess of consideration to capital reserve. So, no, you, know, you know that, right? So, no, excess of, you know, uh, the carrying, excess of consideration received over and above carrying value, we call it as what? Capital reserve. Lesser is goodwill. Sir, so, no. The transfer of PV undertaking has significant measurement and disclosure impacts on the company's standalone financials. This involves identification of assets, liabilities to be transferred as part of the scheme and disclosure of revenue, all this. Accordingly, we have identified this transfer, which is a significant transaction during the year, which is a significant transaction or significant event during the year, okay, which is significant, complex, unusual, non-routine, getting it and material to the financial statements and that it is fundamental for the users and therefore management considered this as a key audit matter. Sorry, auditors have considered this as a key audit matter. This is not a usual transaction. This is unusual. This is non-routine. This is complex. This is significant. One of my entire divisions, yes, it's like a demerger. It's not demerger. It's like a demerger. Able to understand. So, it's a very significant transaction that happened during the year. Since this happened during the year. We auditors focused on this aspect more. Key audit matters are those which caught auditors' attention. Correct? Significant audit attention. If auditor is having significant attention on any particular matter, then it is key audit matter. This is one of the explanation for key audit matter. So here, since this is a transfer of assets and liabilities to a step-down subsidiary by a process of demerger, it's a significant transaction happened during the year. Major focus of the auditors is on this element also. This is a key audit matter. This is audited by them already. Financial statements, reporting, measurement, accounting, recognition, disclosures, everything is done. Everything is verified by the auditor. Do you see what auditors have verified? They did. They, 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 they have done compliance procedure. They have done substantive procedure. Substantive procedure means test of details, compliance procedure. So, they read the minutes of the board meetings for this. They read the NCLT order. They verified so and so uh, undertaking completeness. They evaluated accounting treatment. They verified uh, uh, disclosure, disclosures related to discontinuing operations. They analyzed the accounting treatment for disclosure as per NDAS. They evaluated company's income, tax impact, all that. This is what we do, no? Whenever a transaction like this happened, this is what they did. Now tell me, what are they saying? They told about the issue and they told about what they did. Now, is there anything else because of this key audit matter? Is there anything else discussed in the key audit matter? Nothing. Now tell me, as a shareholder who is from a non-commerce background, can I understand this? Tell me. CS students only don't understand what is key audit matter. Logically. And CS who qualified five years before will never read this. Because they have qualified already. Why they will read? Logically correct or not? So, so this key audit matter is simply, we, we are doing audit. See, suppose Tata Motors auditor. Suppose I am the Tata Motors auditor. I have done the audit of purchases. I did audit of sales. I did audit of other income. I verify employee benefit expenses. I verify depreciation. I verify fixed assets. I verify inventory. So many matters I audited. Correct? Among these many matters, during the year, there is, there is a demerger which happened, which according to me is a significant, which according to me is important. My major attention has been given on this. Of course, remaining also I gave attention, but here I give significant attention. It is significant, impacted me, getting it. So, I felt discussing with the shareholders. Dear shareholders, this transaction happened, no? See, this is how I audited that. Are you getting the point? I am just exhibiting my audit skills here. That's it, ah. Am I talking anything else here? You know, the purpose of introducing key audit matter is good, but, but the problem is people don't understand. It's as simple as like democracy. Getting it? People don't understand democracy, no? Logically. So, exactly like that. So, in a company, no, you can't run a company on democracy. You can't run any organization on democracy, but you can run a country on democracy. That's the beauty of democracy principle. Fine, anyhow. Can I, can I, you say you see in companies, is it is election of board of directors or directors through voting process? You say it is yes, sir. but actual logically you say the actual process. 
Like you and me, are we standing in the director's race and then influencing people, promoting, offering schemes? So vote for us, I will become it. No, there is a very standard procedure. Okay, so democracy is not there everywhere except in the country election. Next, so the auditors were simply saying, the auditors were simply saying, what is key audit matter according to them? What is most significant according to their understanding, according to their judgment? And what they have performed in the audit, they are just explaining. By this, they are providing transparency about the audit that was performed. How they do audit? They are exhibiting to the outsiders, nothing but. By the way, can I discuss about my entire 100 days audit procedures here? 100 days I did a Tata Motors audit, me and my team, almost some 25 people of us went as a team, uh, different, different locations, manufacturing plants we visited, so much of, so many matters we evaluated, so many things we verified, should I, can I talk about all the matters in the audit report? No. So what I can talk about, take some two or three important matters and talk about, that's enough. People will understand, you just give a clue, that's enough. Are you getting the point? So key audit matter is just key audit matter is just a brief overview about how we do audit by taking some examples when you take some examples and explain no that example should be very important example no that way this example able to understand so apart from this key audit matter has no use logically till date i couldn't discover what is the use of key audit matter to a normal shareholder getting the point forget about shareholder think about investors think about stock market analyst also to which which analyst will think about this which analyst want to know how you do audit? You have to do audit as per standards and auditing, so and so processes you need to do, that's it. Whether you explain me here or not, it doesn't make any difference in my decision making. Through key audit matter, there is no impact on my decision making at all. Getting it? For this, big, big conferences happened in international accounting bodies. No, sometimes no, people were very foolish. I don't know, uh, heights of uh, high uh, foolishness, I feel like. When they discuss all the key audit matters, do they forget that shareholders are not CA students or commerce students or CPS? Shareholders are not, all of them are CFA, CPA, CA, CMA or whatever, right? They are majority, predominantly 99% of the shareholders, they don't even understand what is fair value measurement. 50% of the CA students don't understand that. <laughs> Logically correct or not? Uh, then tell me, some of you tell me what exactly fair value? Sir, entry price, exit price, no, not that. Exactly how it is impacted in reality, 50% don't understand, including myself. Okay, sometimes I understand, sometimes I don't understand. It depends on the occasion also. Okay, uh, they say fair value, uh, okay, I agree. Sometimes I convince it's fair value, that is also matches. Next. Now, applicability of key audit matter to which companies? This is important question. This is important question. You see here, purpose of key audit matter can be asked as a four marks question. Definition of key audit matter can be tested in uh, a MCQ one mark question. Getting it? So key audit matters or in auditor's judgment were of most significant in audit of financial statements of current period, which means you cannot refer about the previous audit periods. Getting it? And these will be selected from matters communicated with the top management. Tell me, when we are doing audit for 100 days, every time do we communicate with the top management? Only when it is important issue, we communicate. Obviously, key audit matters will be selected from which matters? Those which are communicated with the top management. Only if it is important, you communicate with them. Only from those important elements, you select the key audit matter. That's what the logical definition. Getting it? Now, applicability. It applies to complete set of GPFS. See, why Tata Motors auditors have given this key audit matter? You know, because it is mandatory. Otherwise, even the Tata Motors auditor also don't understand why he is giving this. Why he gave this? Because guidance note says like this. Guidance note says it is to be given like this. You see, you don't find key audit matter in unlisted public company audit reports or private company audit reports. Most of you, some of you have done articles. Yes or no? You have, you have given audit report. Have you prepared audit report? Copy paste from last year. Yes or no? Yes. Next. So, listed entities, it is applicable. Circumstances when auditor decided to communicate key audit matter. Suppose if an auditor himself decided to communicate, then he can communicate. For listed entities, compulsory. Whether you decide or not, it is compulsory. Whereas for other entities, your, your, your choice or if it is required by law or regulation. In India, there is no or regulation which requires key audit matter, but the standard itself requires. The standard itself mandates key audit matter. When the standard itself is brought, they made it mandatory for all listed entities. Must ensure for every listed entity, auditor should select some important matters and explain shareholders how he do audit. Getting it? Because you want to provide insights to the shareholders how audit happens. 
So by reading this Tata Motors passenger vehicle demerger, by reading that one can understand okay, there is a demerger happen, audit is verified these points, okay, something convincing like that. So people will get some idea. Anyhow, in the notes to accounts, company would have explained this as part of discontinuing operations disclosure requirement. How auditors verified if they get a doubt? No, one example is there, no, that's it. Based on this example, they will construct. Next. Now, what are the factors? How do you determine something is a key audit matter? Key audit matter judgment, key audit matter definition is so judgmental. What is key audit matter according to you may not be key audit matter according to me. Okay, so how do auditors take key audit matter? Take those matters where there is a high risk of MMS involved. Wherever you think high risk, take that matter as key audit matter. How you resolved in audit? And take the matter where significant management judgment is involved. In 2019-20, Reliance have selected changes in estimated useful life of plant and machinery. Change in estimated useful life of plant and machinery is selected as a key audit matter. That time, they uh, yes, they changed the useful life from 3, 0, 30 years to 50 years, which is a significant change. So, it's a significant judgment. Depreciation has affected 4 lakh crore worth of plant and machinery. The plant and machinery value is almost 3 or 4, I'm not exactly remember. Some lakhs of crore plant and machinery, useful life has been revised. Imagine how much depreciation would have been impacted. How much deferred tax adjustment would have been impacted. Correct? Huh? So, uh, including accounting estimates, uh, where there is an estimation uncertainty, high estimation uncertainty, this word you will hear in SA 540. There, where there is a high estimation uncertainty. And it, a key audit matter can be selected from significant event happened in the company or significant transaction happened in the company. Here, Tata Motors, demerged. no, it's an example of significant event or transaction. That's it. So, these are the factors which will assist the auditor in selecting the key audit matter. Now, uh, there are some, some cases where key audit matter shall not be communicated. By the way, there is a prohibition on key audit matter. There is a prohibition. SCA 705 prohibits communicating key audit matter when auditor disclaims the opinion. In the audit report, key audit matter side heading itself should not come. In the audit report, key audit matter side heading itself should not come. Why? Because you are not giving opinion itself, which means you didn't do audit. When you did not do audit, where is the question of important audit matter? Logical, correct? Next, suppose you are giving normal opinion, some unqualified or qualified adverse, some opinion you are giving, it's not disclaimer, you are giving opinion, proper opinion, even though you are giving opinion, there are some issues which are so sensitive in nature, don't communicate it in key audit matter. Suppose as part of discussions with the management, company is planning for issuing right shares, company is planning for uh, sweat equity shares, company is planning for e-sops in next year. Getting it? You got to know because of the privilege you have, you got to know about this prior basis. Can you discuss it under key audit matter about the future plans of the company? No. So, if, if law regulation prohibits disclosure of any particular matter, don't disclose it under key audit. Remaining matters you discuss. If auditor determines that the matter should not be communicated because of the adverse consequences, it will bring adverse consequences. If you communicate that specifically, explicitly, don't discuss. Matter is highly confidential. Matter is sensitive. At the interest of the company, don't communicate those matters in key audit. Remaining, if any, any other important matter is that which is not prohibited by law, which is not sensitive, which is which do not bring adverse consequences, any important matter is that communicate. How do you communicate key audit matter? What is key audit matter? How you addressed in the audit? That's it. Are you clear? In every company, you see two column approach only they follow, even foreign companies. Even in outside media companies also they follow two column approach. Even in United States also they follow two column approach. What is the matter and how it is communicated? able to understand. Next. So, with this 701 is also done. Next. Material uncertainty related to going concern. Just two minutes.
yes next one sa 570 where the standard heading is going concern so till now we have completed 700 701 705 706 600 299 okay almost six standards we have completed now the seventh one which is 570 So, SA 570, see, it's about going concern. Like in the financial statements, management of every company represent that. The financial statements of the entity are prepared using going concern assumption. How they represent in the financial statements? Management of every company represents that. The financial statements are prepared using going concern assumption. Now, tell me, what is your responsibility as an auditor? You have to give opinion whether the financial statements are showing true and fair view. Now, one of the points which financial statements are exhibiting is the company prepared financials on going concern. You need to give opinion whether the company can use going concern assumption. What is the object of this standard? You need to give, you need to verify whether the company can use going concern assumption. You see, the object of the auditors or the object of the auditors or to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence regarding appropriateness of management's use of going concern basis of accounting in preparation of financials whether management has management has used going concern basis no for preparing the financial statements what is your objective get evidence whether is it appropriate first of all is it fine can the management use going concern assumption is it fine or not you need to get evidence in silicon valley bank case auditors have not given evidence i think probably they did not get the evidence that's why weeks after they gave audit report company have uh, you know like what became insolvent anyway now what does it mean see it is because of the going concern assumption we follow historical cost approach it is because of the going concern assumption we follow historical cost suppose you take reliance industries limited you take fixed assets you take plant and machinery where is something around 4 lakh crore some almost 4 lakh crore worth of plant and machinery is there. If at all the company is sold right now immediately today, it will not fetch that much. Obviously, no. Because for a, for a Reliance refinery, for a refinery plant and machinery, who are there? Buyers. Who? Which buyer will buy? You and me, can we go and buy the refinery plant? We don't even know what is the process exactly. Correct? Huh? So, there will not be an open market, open demand for these kinds of machines which are customized. Getting it? You see, Ford company, when they closed their plant and machinery in India, they sold it for mere 700 crore to, Tata, to somebody. So Tata only has acquired, I think so. They were in talk, I think they acquired. The Ford plant, I think they acquired for 700 crore. To construct this plant and machinery, the company invested more than 10,000 crore. The investment in plant and machinery minus accumulated depreciation might have come close to some 5 to 6,000 crore. But when it is sold in reality, it fetched only 700 crore. That's why you have impairment concept. What is impairment concept? What is impairment loss? Recoverable value minus carrying value is equal to impairment loss. Getting it? What is recoverable value? Higher of, higher of NRV. If I sell right now, how much I will get? Or if I use the asset for a certain period of time, generate cash flows, discount it to the present value, what is the value? Whichever is higher. Now tell me, Recoverable value, whichever is higher, we are saying you know, in that one of the element is what? Using for certain number of years and generating cash flow. First of all, you want to use for certain number of years. Means first of all, you should exit that, that many number of years. Correct? Huh? Logically, only if my company exists for that many years, I can project the cash flows and I can discount them to the present value and calculate recoverable value correctly. What if my company cannot continue? Then NRV is only my recoverable value. And NRV for most of the plant and machinery is nothing but factories. Getting the point. Plant means what? Planted to the earth. Getting the point. It's a, it's a planted to earth. It's a machinery planted to the earth. That's why it's called plant and machinery. Getting it. So, plant and machinery which are customized, which cannot be used by any other industry or any other company, first of all. Forget about uh, different industry. One Mahindra plant can be used only for manufacturing Mahindra cars. Though the car outer structure is similar in almost all the cars, but the molds, dyes which they use is different completely. The chassis is different completely. Though a Mahindra plant is ready for sale, Tata Motors cannot acquire that. Even if they acquire, they need to do a lot of customization, re-customization, for which they need to incur massive expenditure. So imagine such a big, big project like this. NRVs will be bare minimum. 
it is equal to you know it will be equal to piecemeal distributed value if you if you sell each and every if each and every mission for iron and steel rate whatever the rate you will fetch that is only its nrv not more than that are you getting the point to why best example you can just imagine you constructed house you want to sell immediately you will have you will hardly fetch less than whatever you constructed value for a constructed house there will not be much value for the land only you will get the value for the house whatever is constructed definitely some amount of depreciation will be there immediately after you want to sell because it is your customized it is not my it is not buyer specific it is seller specific because seller has constructed as per his specifications getting it so obviously it will not have any open market value so going concern basis whether company can use or not it depends upon future sustainability of the company how far this company can sustain in the future so this is what the standard emphasizes on getting it auditor has to check whether company can sustain in the future like what will the company i mean what will there be any way to find whether company can sustain in future or not yes there are indicators there are indicators you can find various indicators whether company can sustain in future or not i think i have not given the indicators list here so in my main metal it will be there in my main metal indicators list will be there there are various indicators operating indicators financial indicators and other indicators there are various indicators which cast significant doubt on entity's ability to continue as a going concern getting it there are some indicators operating indicators suppose important managerial person has lost labor difficulties shortage of raw material supplies in the market getting it shortage of raw material supplies in the market almost now you see some industrial items will become costly suddenly in one particular uh, you know uh, particular time example uh, in the last entire 2022 chips were shortage the uh, what integrated circuits uh, you know semiconductor chips were completely of shortage because of the taiwan because of the restrictions on taiwan and uh, i mean a war possibility between china and taiwan getting it because taiwan is a major manufacturer of the chips getting it so big, which is used for almost in every mobile and car almost in all the displays this is what used which is which is in shortage and that's why the car waiting periods have increased to 6 months 1 year 2 years just because of one touch screen which is not available for this the background software background hardware is not available for that is only many car sales have been stopped halted like anything and that is one of the reason why ford was closed also already underperforming so it was closed so various operations difficulties operating indicators same as financial indicators financial indicators means what like negative net worth ratio negative net worth adverse financial ratios yes or no liquidity ratios are not satisfied able to understand so uh, operating losses continuously you see tata motors is having operating losses continuously very recently only they are recovering from the operating losses only after in the past 3 years they are aggressively marketing they are aggressively campaigning with so and so parameters and somehow they are capturing the market share getting it now only tata motor is recovering they have not even entered into profit zone they were still in the loss zone only but the earlier the loss used to be 25000 crores and now the loss is somewhere around 2000 3000 crore getting the point so there are financial indicators you can see how far financially companies honoring the payments one of the indicator for going concern is default that's why in caro we need to give what are the defaults made by the company to banks and financial institutions or any other lender so that's an indicator that company are a company is defaulting tomorrow will they repay to all the liabilities or not if at all what if they don't repay they will initiate insolvency proceedings against the company court will order for liquidation going concern is missing so you need to talk you need to verify whether company's use of going concern basis is appropriate tata motors have prepared financial statements using going concern what will i check you know as on 31st march balance sheet reporting day they used going concern assumption and prepared the financial statements on historical cost what i will do i will give audit report no on the date on which i am giving audit report 10th july let us assume 10th july i am giving audit report on 10th july i will verify whether whatever the liability is outstanding as on 31st march in the tata motors balance sheet will the company pay as and when they become due i will ask cash flow forecast i will see cash reserves i will see alternative finances available to the company i will see borrowing facilities available to the company and based on that i will estimate liquidity position in the company is there any crisis in the company regarding liquidity we will check that and accordingly we will decide you know air india 
Air India, you see, they are the one who have used this material uncertainty related to going concern pair. Air India has used material uncertainty related to going concern. What is that Air India situation, you know? They have 7,000 crore loss. They have, the company has incurred 70 million means nothing but 70,000 million means 7,000 crore. 10 million is equal to 1 crore, right? 70,000 by 10 is equal to 7,000 crore, right? Correct. So, Air India has incurred a net loss of 7,000 crore during the 31st March 2021. The company current liabilities exceeded its current assets. Current liabilities minus current assets is equal to 57,000 crore. What? Current assets should be higher than current assets. Tell me, in your pocket 10,000 is there how much you can spend? But company spent 20,000. How? Are you getting it? Borrowings. Now, I have only borrowing, no asset. Now, how the lender will be, keep silent? Air India should have been closed, no, by then itself. Then why it was not closed? Because of the government support, in spite of these events or conditions, in spite of 50,000 crore loss, in spite of 7,000 crore loss, uh, you know, see, accumulated losses is 77,000 crore. The accumulated loss of Air India is 77. Reserves and surplus is equal to minus. There is no reserve, no surplus. Getting it? So, in spite of these events, uh, which may cast doubt on the company's ability, obviously when I see this kind of profile, how company is continuing, I got a doubt in spite of these events. Management is of the opinion that going concern is still fine. Management is thinking it is fine. Why? Because of the support of government of India. Ah, okay. That's the reason. Because government is infusing capital, infusing grants, giving loans continuously. That's why Air India is withstanding. Otherwise, would have shut down long back. Able to understand. Now, very recently, Tata has acquired some 400 Boeings and all they ordered. So, we are, they are reviving Air India and they are discontinuing Vistara brand all that. So, now it's a different story. Getting it? So, but this is the position of Air India. You see, actually Air India going concern is, going concern is affected. Now, auditors have used this material uncertainty related to going concern para. Right? Now, when this paragraph will come, why auditors have used it? Okay, government is supporting, no sir. Uh, Air India, though it is having losses, government is supporting, all that is fine. No, then why going concern you highlighted here? What is the reason behind why are you highlighting here? Company going concern is fine. No, as long as government of India is support is there, company will happily flourish. What's wrong? Okay, let it be having accumulated losses. Let it be having net liability position. Let it be having net loss. What's wrong? My question here is, until when government of India will support? Will government of India support next 10 years? There is no guarantee. As long as government of India supports, as and when you need money, you, have, you want to pay salary, yeah, go and stand outside the ministry. They will give money, they will give check and you come back and pay salaries. And you want to pay electricity bill, okay, go to the ministry, they will come and give bill, okay. You want to pay fuel bill, ministry will give a check, you pay. So suddenly ministry, ministry, the finance ministry stops. What will you do? My question to the management of Air India is, what if government withdraw the support? Huh, then we need to question. That is what management replied. Now tell me, is management uncertain? about how long government of india supports so even though right now government of india is supporting you are honoring all the payments all the borrowings everything no default but how long the support will be there i am talking as on balance sheet date next one year will government support huh? do you tell me no uncertain so there is a material uncertainty there is a material uncertainty related to going concern fine there is a going concern is fine right now at this moment it is fine but what if in the next 12 months 24 months considering the size of the company going concern assessment is should not be made for 12 months it should be made for 24 36 months this is a very big company how can i check only for the next 12 months standard says minimum 12 months the assessment about going concern must be made for how many months sir? minimum 12 months or such other higher period as decided by the auditor for this company, I will think about next to 24 months or 36 months. This is not a small company to just think about next to 12 months. I need to be very long term. So next to 36 months, I'll see. Next to 3 years, are you confident that government will support? Uncertain. So, since there is a material uncertainty related to going concern, getting the point? Okay, fine. I, I, I spoke to the management. I understood that there is a material uncertainty. I asked management, okay, please explain all the situation in the notes. Management explained in note number 53 clearly. The management of Air India explained this uncertain situation very clearly in the note number 53. They clearly presented entirely. If government stops withdrawing, obviously we will also have to liquidate the company to repay all the liabilities, otherwise in ordinary course of business. 
so they represented everything honestly in note number 53 now tell me management is facing losses they disclosed government of india is supporting they disclosed when the government will withdraw the support they don't know uncertain that also they disclosed now tell me financial statements are disclosing everything true and fairly honestly correct which opinion i should give unqualified opinion i should give but what aid india gave you know qualified opinion but here they qualified not going concern point not that point they qualified on some fair value assets some non reconciliation some dry, some lease related assets they didn't qualify about this one which means our concept holds true with respect to government of india support uncertainty about the government of india support they presented everything in note number 53 of the financial statements of air india which is true and fair we also want to give which opinion on that aspect unqualified so here also they gave unqualified only no on that aspect in qualified opinion they spoke about different issues not about the issue we discussed which with respect to our issue they, they said everything is true and fair no tell me in this have they covered anything about this is note number 46 this is note number 35 this is about note number 44 are you getting it so in qualified opinion basis for qualified opinion they didn't talk about note number 53 which means with respect to note number 53 going concern point what is the opinion auditors have taken logically correct or not look see in sa 501 in sa 505 at so many places you will have this word uh, you have to take an appropriate action as per sa 705 you have to give qualified suppose in sa 7 in sa 501 pending litigations if the company has not given complete list of pending litigations auditor has to qualify the opinion qualify means what on what that aspect like that under multiple standards under multiple circumstances you qualify on so many things if you want to qualify if the list of qualifications becomes so big and you think it is pervasive as a whole then you give adverse opinion. otherwise you give a qualified opinion which means if in the basis for qualified opinion para in basis for qualified opinion para list of items where you qualified does not include any note number 53 like that on note number 53 what is the opinion in the in the in the basis for qualified opinion list note number 53 is not there which means on note number 53 what is your opinion unqualified that is what the standard says so air india has presented confidently everything correctly so auditor should give with respect to note number 53 which opinion unqualified which means you see in the basis for qualified opinion para they didn't talk about note number 53 they didn't talk about note number 53 in the opinion para also nowhere they didn't explain about note number 53 but this created a big confusion again are companies facing such a severe crisis it is very important and company disclosed everything in the financial statements note number 53 honestly should be highlighted or not should be highlighted is it important point air india presented in note number 53 about their you know dying financial situation getting it as an auditor do you have a moral responsibility to highlight that issue or not i can't modify i can't comment negatively on that because they presented everything honestly how can i say negatively about that so i have to highlight it which paragraph i'll use but this is not an ordinary item to emphasize like any other matter you see in emphasis already i'm highlighting so many if i highlight here somewhere or first point itself you know note number 53 if i put no these many points where the user will not even read that first point already so many points are highlighting tell me highlighting going concern issue and highlighting remaining issues are the same no going concern issue is a very big issue right obviously which require a separate highlighting correct and that's why this paragraph this is also an emphasis paragraph only but a specific emphasis para it is a specific highlighter para with where we only talk about one issue uncertainty about going concern where we only talk about uncertainty about going concern then why are you highlighting here see company honestly disclosed everything logically speaking i can't talk on that also because they disclosed it already in the financial statements in note number 53 everything they spoke when they honestly spoke everything like that how come i comment um, my auditor as, as as per sa 200 my objective is whether financial statements are showing true and fair view that's it and i saw note number 53 clearly explaining the company position fairly truly they are not hiding anything they are not misleading anything so obviously which opinion i should give on that aspect unqualified 
But again, I have a conflict here. Okay, I'll give unqualified because my objective of audit is that only. As per the auditing standard, I can do only that. But this is something very important. I want to highlight. If SEA 570, this discussion, if it is not there, I would have highlighted under emphasis only. But in SEA 570, they added this point clearly. Since it's a going concern issue, highlight it separately. And at the end of the matter, at the end of the matter, mention that, mention that your opinion is not modified. By the way, see, I'm not objecting on the above matter. Why should I object? Company disclosed everything correctly, man. Why should I object? Able to understand the logic behind presentation of going concern. Now tell me, I'll ask this question. Material uncertainty related to going concern. This section in the audit report will come in which scenario? On the going concern aspect, auditor has given a qualified opinion. Auditor has given an adverse opinion. Auditor has given unqualified opinion. When this para will come in the audit report? Unqualified opinion. Suppose no. Company is not talking about note number 53 in the financial statements correctly. Or they are partially discussing the issue. They are not fully discussing. Or they are not at all discussing. Hey, when such a severe situation is being faced, company is not discussing. Directly I will give what? Adverse opinion. Directly I will give what? Adverse opinion. And naturally when I give adverse opinion, I need to talk about the reason, right? In the basis for adverse opinion, I will clearly mention this issue. Now tell me. Since I mentioned already in basis for adverse opinion, once again should I mention this side heading? This side heading is an emphasis of matter. This is like an emphasis. When you can emphasize anything only when it is appropriately presented. Here, material uncertainty point in the financial side is present at all. Company is facing material uncertainty and not presented in the financials correctly. You have to modify the opinion. You have to qualify the opinion. You have to give adverse opinion. Correct. That's it. So, ongoing concern, material uncertainty. If the financial statements are clearly discussing, then auditor can only highlight under this section. If the financial statements are not at all disclosing it correctly, this section will not come in audit report. Straight away, you will qualify that. Straight away, you will object it in the opinion para itself. Are you getting it? That's it. So, that's about going concern, predominant standard. Now, now, when I, when, whenever we analyze about companies going concern, no? whenever we analyze about companies going concern, we come across these situations. We come across these situations. Okay, fine. So whenever we analyze going concern, we generally come across three situations. We, we, we can interpret maximum three scenarios. After I evaluate going concern of, let us assume um, Indigo Airlines or Mahindra Motors or Maruti Suzuki or Hyundai, whatever. I analyze this going concern situation, company selling fabulously the cars, financial position is very stable, cash reserves are so many crores. Obviously, going concern is appropriate. Whether the use of going concern assumption by the management, is it appropriate? Yes, it is appropriate. It is appropriate. Now tell me, management used going concern assumption, which is also correct. And uh, I also satisfied with respect to that. Tell me, with respect to this aspect, which opinion I will give? Uh, I don't have anything to object. Unqualified opinion. Getting it? Suppose, I felt going concern is inappropriate. A company cannot continue. Here in India, there is no government support at all. How come you use, use going concern assumption when the position is like this? You already passed six months salaries you didn't pay, passed six months EMIs you didn't pay, already everybody is striking against the company. Now still you are using going concern which is inappropriate. Now financials are prepared using going concern but I felt it is inappropriate. Now tell me, are financial statements misleading or not? Which opinion straight away I will give? Let's mention the reasons in basis for adverse opinion. Correct. What if going concern is appropriate? Fine, it is appropriate and government of India is supporting, that's why it is appropriate, otherwise uncertain. But material uncertainty exists, going concern is appropriate, but material uncertainty is existing. Now what I need to check is, what I need to check is, are financial statements disclosing this fact? Are financial statements disclosing this fact clearly? The answer is yes. Yes, financial statements are disclosing this fact. Financial statements are disclosing this fact clearly. No, no hiding, no hide and seek game, nothing. They are clearly disclosing. They are facing a trouble. The trouble is honestly spoke out in the financial statements. Now, which opinion you will give? 
unqualified in respect of that matter plus plus it's a going concern issue material uncertainty company explained in the financials highlight it no yes under which para ah very good material uncertainty related to going concern highlight draw the attention to the note point presented in the financial statements under material uncertainty related to going concern para suppose financial statement not disclosing it accurately not disclosing it is completely material uncertainty is there company position is not at all good financials are also not talking about that clearly which opinion will give depending upon the situation qualified or adverse opinion material uncertainty para in this case will it come no that's it. because you are already given qualified opinion you are already qualified in the opinion para you will already talk about that basis for opinion para you will again don't talk about that why should again you should talk about here so you will not be talking about that same duplicate multiple times getting the point so this is the reporting requirement for going concern this is also this is clearly covered here so reporting reporting requirements if going concern assumption is appropriate appropriate but material uncertainty exists suppose financials are disclosing the fact what auditor shall give or if the financials are disclosing the fact auditor will give unqualified opinion and you also include in a separate section side heading called management i'm sorry material uncertainty related to going concern draw attention of the readers to the specific note point note number 53 suppose if the financials are not disclosing financials are misleading auditor will express a qualified or adverse generally since it's a going concern we try to take adverse itself because it is pervasive getting it and the basis for opinion section will contain the reasons about that uncertainty you mean you will discuss about that uncertain situation very clearly in basis for opinion are you getting the point suppose no going concern assumption itself is inappropriate it is not material uncertainty it's, it's right then company has, has to close no other option it's already decided but still financial statements are prepared using going concern accounting but in auditor's judgment uh, this basis of accounting is inappropriate then auditor will straight away express uh, adverse opinion getting it now now we always see we always see they, they may ask a question on this also four marks question write about write about adequacy of disclosures in financial statements when any events or conditions were identified actually the standard is you know the standard is prepared in a particular structure first what is the objective of the auditor the objective of the auditor is to obtain sufficient and appropriate evidence about appropriateness of use of going concern basis of accounting for preparation and presentation of financial statements and conclude and conclude based on the evidence whether a material uncertainty exists so obtain evidence for this purpose and see whether is there any material uncertainty and if so report as per this standard report as required under this standard now you see first you know first of all it is whose responsibility to do continuous assessment about going concern management responsibility management has to do every year primarily preliminarily they have to do going concern assessment as part of that they have to look at nature and condition of the business what are the events and conditions of external factors what is the operational forecast what are the significant events and transactions happened during the year they need to identify all this which may cast significant doubt on the entity's ability to continue as a going concern so management has to identify any event or condition any event or situation any event or symptom getting it so management has to identify any events or conditions that cast a doubt on the going concern if audit auditor has to verify whether management has done this assessment suppose no if management has not performed this assessment without performing going concern assessment how come you use going concern basis see whether i can continue in future or not i need to assess it only if i assess and decide that i will continue then i will use that assumption you did not do that assessment at all how come you used going concern basis so if management has not performed the assessment the auditor shall discuss with management on what basis going concern of accounting is used getting it suppose and further you will also see 
for how long management the assist for what number of months how many number of years management did if it is less than 12 months no i will request management to extend to 12 months suppose some cases if estimation more than 12 months is required you know i will do request management for that extended period if according to the air india i need to estimate for 24 months going concern no i will ask management to do for 24 months suppose if management is not ready to extend its assessment process management is primarily responsible to do going concern assessment and then only they need to use suppose they didn't do that assessment at all they are unwilling to do the assessment or they did assessment for less than 12 months i am asking them to do for 18 months and they are not willing to extend their assessments from 6 months to 18 months then also i will give modified opinion in the auditor's report able to understand next suppose you no know, uh, I will try to see whether any indicators found, financial indicators, I will try to see, I will I'll observe cash flow, I will observe profit and loss account, I will observe trend analysis, I will observe reasonableness test, I will observe ratio analysis. If I find anything negative, if I find any financial indicator, if I find any operating indicator, if I find any other indicator, then I will do a detailed audit for season. If I find any indicators if the auditor identifies any circumstances that cast significant doubt then the auditor will perform the following procedure first risk assessment procedure will perform risk assessment means what in that we will check whether management has conducted preliminary examination that is risk assessment related to going concern if in the examination they may ask you a question write about risk assessment procedure related to going concern this answer you have to write what a what a right audit procedure they'll ask you this question right audit procedure if the auditor identified circumstances that indicate significant events or conditions that cast significant doubt on the entity's abilities related to going concern if you identified any event what procedure you follow then this answer you have to write able to understand all of you how you do mistakes i'm just telling you able to understand now is there a first when i identify any indicator no first i will see whether management has a policy of risk assessment related to going concern i will i will check and i will ask management plans for future actions i will ask management future i mean cash flow how the cash flow is prepared based on reliable data or not whether supporting documents and assumptions i will see and uh, finally i will take a representation declaration that uh, whatever management future plans were there whatever proposals were there management is going to implement it for sure i will take a declaration from the management representation before taking representation do these verifications then take representation representation cannot be substituted for your work getting the point all of you suppose you know they may ask you this question okay they will ask you a question like this you are you have been appointed as an auditor of a company and as part of the audit uh, you are requested for the financial statements approval by the management but the management of the company is not approving and significantly delaying the financial statements uh, evaluate in light of sf 70 this question comes what will you do this answer you have to write okay if there is a significant delay if there is a significant delay in approval of the financial statements by management or those charged with governance after the date of financial statements after 31st march you need to approve no but management is not approving there is a delay in the approval of the financial statements only when you approve i can give audit report no otherwise how can i give audit report so the auditor shall inquire what are the reasons for the delay suppose if the auditor believes that the delay could be related to events related to conditions symptoms indicators relating to going concern the auditor shall perform above procedures as necessary and consider the conclusion regarding material uncertainty are you getting the point suppose you concluded there is a material uncertainty then what auditor has to check whether man uh, whether financial statements adequately disclose these situations adequately about material uncertainty and what are the management plans to mitigate with them suppose no if management has no plans no you know management alternatives no remedies were there no remedies were there so if the disclosure clearly that management clearly that material uncertainty exists that it may be unable to realize its assets and liabilities for this ilfs audit report is there in ilfs they clearly mentioned the situation so in ilfs the auditors clearly mentioned that management is facing the situation already minus position is there and the company cannot realize its assets and liabilities in ordinary course of business right now 
but management is trying for refinancing options but the position on refinancing is not sure we are trying for getting additional loans and reviving the company but we are not sure they clearly mentioned that so they they, they may give a question separately on this itself i told right this itself write about adequacy of disclosures in the financial statements when events or conditions have been identified remember this is only 70 percent of the original notes getting it if you take SA 570 you'll have 100 percent this is around 60 to 70 percent of the original notes smart notes is 60 to 70 percent minimum this is what you are expected to write in exam minimum to secure 50 to 70 percent mark out of four marks if a four marks question comes if you write this matter correctly completely at least a two two and a half mark will be getting if you write my main notes whatever i have given matter four out of four getting it people say no auditing they will not give full marks if you write full answer they will give full marks correct uh? the point is we never write full answer complete answer and you expert complete marks next are you clear in going concern there is this sentence uh, if auditor I, if, if auditor identified any event or condition that may cast a significant doubt on entity's ability to continue as a going concern the sentence itself 90 percent students don't know how come they get full marks only one sentence uh, correct uh? this is what everywhere it is used Correct, everywhere you see original standard, this is the same sentence. The auditor, if identifies any event or condition that may cast significant doubt on the entity's ability to continue as a going concern, the auditor has to perform the following procedures. This is what the sentence, the sentence itself you don't reproduce. You Many ask me, sir, can I write in my own words? Whatever literature they give, that itself we are unable to reproduce. How come you invent your own terminology? I am Telugu medium background. So, I don't have that much English skills to invent my own terminology. Whatever is given, from that I will try to produce 50-70 percent. I don't have that much skill set to write my own literature. Able to understand? It's a, just an excuse. It is just an excuse. It is just that they are denying their failure. Getting it? If they are unable to, they are reading, can I write in my own words? Tell me, for this sentence, what is your own word? For every sentence you question, how will you write in your own language? You can't, you can't figure out the words. Because all these words are obviously mandatory. For this, there is no substitute also. Correct? Huh? Like, if, if auditor identifies any indicators that questions entity's ability to continue as a going concern, this is one language. Correct? Huh? This much at least you should bring, no? How students will write, no many? If auditor identifies any going concern problems, Logically, correct? Huh? This is what student write. And what is given in the suggested answer? What is given in what you are writing? And the person valuing the paper don't know anything about the subject. Looks at the suggested answer. Looks at your answer. What is this problematic answer? And obviously strikes off. Able to understand how? Obviously people who are valuing paper, they don't know anything. Please remember that. They are just a CS, but they don't know anything. If I give you CA Foundation statistics paper, how do you how do you find student has written alternative answer? You yourself left statistics as a choice. Correct, huh? If I give you CA Foundation statistics paper, you are a C, you are a CA final student, no? You qualified CA Foundation, no? Which means you studied CA Foundation, no? I give you statistics mathematics paper, I value and give me. Student wrote alternative answer, I figure out. Tell me, you also don't know. First of all, you don't even remember the chapter names in mathematics. Do you qualified CA foundation? Correct? Huh? Exactly. They are also CAs. Qualified long back. What is the requirement for valuation? You know, should have completed four years post qualification. Means indirectly, institute is asking those who forget the subject. I want a fresher. I want a fresh mind to value the paper. So that only you independently examine the correct answer versus the actual answer. And only you can give correct mark. If you recently qualify, you will have bias. Get it? Because you will have own language. You, know? you will also see own language. Own language, own language, full marks. Getting it? So, institute is cleverly selecting valuationers only those who have completed four years of post qualification. You should not be in teaching. That's one disqualification. If I am teaching, no, I can figure out what student wrote, no, at least. So, I should not be in teaching. I should be in practice. Or I should be in member. Employment also, no problem. Member should have completed post qualification, should not be engaged in any teaching activity. This itself is one of the biggest blunders in the valuation. And this is also advantage. How you know? You write additional point, no. He will not understand that is additional point. Suppose you wrote additional point which is wrong. That I don't have that ability to figure out it is wrong. 
that's the main problem ha ah, correct no obviously if you wrote additional suppose a student i am valuing statistics paper or mathematics student wrote an additional formula whatever he wrote i will figure out based on the answer whatever he wrote additionally i don't know whether it's right or wrong i feel it is irrelevant that's it correct ah? so this is one advantage so uh, one way it is an advantage one way it is not an advantage so uh, what is my approach of pre paper presentation you know once upon a time used, it used to work but now um, they are verifying so seriously earlier what i used to do you know in my final i qualified with this technique only first 40 marks of paper perfect answers i'll write perfect you can't even put red pen in, the, in any of this only 40 marks thereafter you can't see my answer you can't even read my answer but earlier no there was a defect in valuation earlier it's not defect i can say it's a loophole okay if i write first 40 marks means approximately 10 pages of my answer 10 to 4 uh, sorry uh, 30 to 40 pages uh, 20 to 25 pages of my answer approximately sorry 10 to 15 pages of my answer i wrote perfectly beautiful handwriting neatly presented everything underlined everything as my pages turn my answer also deteriorates as the pages turns my quality of answer also deteriorates so after 40 marks my own language comes because i don't know anything about that I hardly know 65 marks of the paper. 40 marks perfectly, you know, some 30, 40 marks average, you know. Average means you can't even compare with the suggested answer. Okay. But this 40 marks will capture the attention of the examiner. Remember, the person valuing the paper, every day he will be valuing some 40 to 50 papers. Every day. Now, institute is putting limit also. Earlier, people used to do 200 papers valuation. I don't know. Okay. Now, there is a limit. 30. Institute will give only 30. You, you can unlock papers only for 30 or 40. Like that, there is a limit. If it is, if your paper comes in the first in my day, I am energetic. First paper years, I will verify carefully. Getting it, I will put value, I will value properly. Remember, valuing correct answer is easy rather than a wrong answer. Because you know, if the answer is matching, you know, almost, it is easy for me to tick and go, proceed further. If at all you are giving wrong alternative answers, you no, know, it, it will be irritating for me. Who are valuing the paper, it will be irritated because it is not matching. Hey, what this fellow wrote? What, what is the answer here? Is this alternative answer? I will have to check alternative answer also because institute scheme of valuation will have alternative answer also. Your answer will not match with any of the five alternative answers they gave. Getting it? So obviously, this fellow will get irritated. Second question he comes in your paper, he will lose the opinion. Imagine he is already frustrated with your first answer itself. Second answer, double frustration. So, first 40 marks, right? those answers i mean answer those questions where you are 100 percent sure at least the first two questions are 10 out of 10 i mean i'm talking about practical papers if it is 12 12 marks papers no first two questions write like that after that you start your intelligence you apply your intelligence maybe maybe if if i continuously value three questions or 40 marks of your paper correctly no easily no maybe i'll get an opinion that okay fine this is also uh, even though fifth question you did little wrong i excuse naturally eh, nalla i mean he did very well getting it so normally we'll be getting that kind of clarity we will be satisfied generally because four or five questions continuously you wrote right sixth question even if it is little wrong i will not feel that so i will give three out of four marks my second level examiner will be there after i value the paper he will also verify whether i valued correctly or not getting it so he will also see first five questions only he will not see full hundred percent he will only say randomly. So, if that question, no, fifth question, whatever you wrote, where I gave marks, no, he will definitely not verify. Then you are escaped. Getting it? This loophole is still there now. So, 40 marks of the paper, initial 40 marks, be perfect. Next to 40 marks, write average answers. And you will end up scoring 55 plus easily. But for scoring 55 plus easily, 35 to 40 marks of the paper must be perfect. You see, suggested, you see, uh, opinion of the valuationers, they will give you in the student journals. In student journals, what are the valuation or comments they will give? I have seen many comments where 90% of the answers which students are writing, they are not right. In the first question or second question itself, they are doing mistakes. So, this is the problem. That's why I always tell, two-third of the syllabus you prepare. Correctly, you prepare two-third of the syllabus. One-third of the syllabus, 100% damn sure, no no question at all. Any way you twist the question, I'll answer. One third of the syllabus. 100% perfect. Another one third of the syllabus. Above average. Another one third of the syllabus. Whether you read it or not, for your info, it is your choice. Two third of the syllabus, if I read and present 75, 75 to 80 marks of the paper with the first 40 marks, 100% accuracy. Another 30 to 40 marks with moderate accuracy. Easy to score 55 plus, 60 plus. 
it is a strategy it's just a mind game getting the point that's it but how many of you like say, some of you might have been earlier also you might, you might have written first question f or wrong yes sir that's where we are doing mistakes so the first question should be the best question and also one more important thing now we have questions you no know, 1a 1b 1c 1d 2a 2b 2c 2d 3a 3b 3c like this now sir i started with the 3b first can i go immediately 4a yes you can in the paper they will tell you not to go but you can go because we all did the same that rule is there from long back now many students suggested answers also i have seen they have they wrote 3a 4b 5a again 3c nothing wrong all parts of the questions means don't understand within 3 sub a sub b suppose 3a itself is one question no inside that answer should be at one place suppose correct no that is what intention no that is what intention it's not all part of a answer all part of i mean all parts of a question should be under one place that is what the rule no all parts of a question means question means what 3a is a different question 3b is a different question 3c is a different question all parts of a question means that one question only no that is what the requirement but people are misinterpreting 3a 3b 3c means all three question number 3 sub a that is one separate question again which is having six marks 3b which is a separate question having four marks all parts of that particular question should be at one place that is what the actual rule is so you can very much happily follow your own order getting it as long as question number is clear they will put if you don't write question number nothing can be done there are some students who write question number in the left side of the margin and in institute no at the end of the day papers will be punched they will be you know like tied up they use thread and you know stitch the papers completely at the end of the day at the time whatever the left margin you wrote will go off so what will you do that's why question number should be on the top and the bottom like you should you should always put question number question number 3a don't be hurry for putting this also if you don't have time nothing can be done so some students know sir i don't have time sir to put are what are you doing all in the first ranker is not tensed like you <laughs> promise he is not tensed like you some students will come and say me sir hall ticket number i wrote sir but i forgot bubbled bubble on yourself what silly mistakes sir i wrote wrong hall ticket wrong hall ticket number what are you man that you wrote in the fourth exam not in the first exam see these kinds of mistakes people are doing when they message me like this i don't know i feel I, what happened to this generation i feel like this so 3a and 3a okay i'll speak about presentation also gradually getting it and at the end of the answer you please you please confirm the examiner that your answer is over by indicating like this some indication don't be too extra decorative on this just a simple thing is enough getting it many students don't even put this i feel in the next page answer is there when i turn the question paper question started another question again examiner will upset again he has to go back and put the mark so give an indication that your answer is complete getting it how many of you are doing these kinds of presentation presentation means not beautiful handwriting it's about legibility it's about understandability it's not about beautiful handwriting getting it that's it okay take care we'll continue in the next session sf 570 confident all of you okay in the next session no uh, we will be discussing we will be discussing a small comparison between all the four material uncertainty versus key audit matter versus emphasis versus other matter paragraph okay we'll do a small comparison and directly we'll start with care okay once it is done immediately we'll start with standards that's it we are going better than the flow whatever i expected better than the speed which i expected you're all convenient right with the space i'm going yeah take care yes in the previous session we have completed even that 570 aspect also so 701 is completed 570 is also completed which means even this fifth paragraph of going concern is also completed right now we need to have we need to discuss other information standard which is sa 720 now by the way before that you will be getting in question examinations like this also so what are the uh, contents of basis for opinion paragraph briefly explain a four marks question might come what are the contents of basis for opinion paragraph or previously i showed in question back in what scenarios i mean what are what are that i mean how basis for opinion paragraph will modify in case if the auditor want to give modified opinion like if the if he identified a material misstatement what to do if at all the misstatement identified is by way of non disclosure what to do so anyway that can be asked as a question same way how auditor responsibility section will modify 
even auditor has expressed disclaimer of opinion that will also come there is another question in the same in the same essay 700 uh, this location of description of auditor's responsibilities paragraph where where in the i mean where can be give i mean where auditor can give the auditor responsibilities for audit of financial statements section where he can locate so it can be located within the body of the audit report or it can be given as an appendix or it can be given in a website that link can be published whatever is accepted by the gap means generally accepted auditing practices getting it in india we give within the body of the audit report we have seen tata motors inside tata motors auditor responsibilities inside the audit report only they didn't give auditor responsibility as an annex share correct huh? they gave it as part of the audit report inside main audit report itself so that question also can come able to understand same way, so this is how, this is what the question I told. Where the order, location of description of auditor responsibility, where in the where where auditor responsibilities can be located? It can be located within the audit report, or it can be given as an appendix, or it can be uh, given in the appropriate authority website or any other particular site where you can give a reference in the auditor report about that particular authority or website. That's it. So this itself can be asked as a four marks question. Then. Then other information para. So very simple. This other information paragraph is very simple to understand. Like um, if you look at this is Reliance Company Auditor's Report, and you see it's a very simple thing. Now this is an annual report. Now you see in this annual report, the primary purpose of sending this annual report is one object to one. Every listed company has to send annual report to the shareholders which will contain corporate governance reports which will contain various other reports as required by the listing arrangements. Two, financial statements and notice for calling AGM. Annual report is the document through which we call people for attending AGM. You might have heard about sending notice to the people. Notice is sent through actually annual report because in this annual report the primary purpose is to send notice. Getting it? You see here, attending 45th AGM, that notice link everything is given here. Next, now you see in this annual report, we are providing other information also. We are providing other information. What is other information? Informa information included in the annual report other than financial statements and auditor report there on. That's the definition. Information included in annual report other than financial statements and audit report. So in this annual report, financial statements were where only this segment. Correct? Huh? Only this segment is financial statements. Now, inform information included in annual report. See, so much of information. Company stakeholder information. So and so COVID research board. You know, some management discussion analysis. Various information they are giving. <laughs> information included in annual report. Other than this financial statements, we call it as other information. Now, what is the objective of the standard? Very simple. See, you are sending this annual report to the shareholder. Where? In addition to the financial statements and audit report, you are also giving some other information where also you speak once again financial statements, financial metrics. Example, Reliance is talking about here, you know, uh, what is the revenue? 7,92,750 crore. Is this financial statements? Is this page financial statement part of the financial statement? No. Is this page audited by the auditor? Is this page signed by the auditor, attested by the auditor? No. Are you getting it? But in the same report, our financial statements which I audited, the audit report was also sent. Now, here what is the number? And what is the number given inside the consolidated profit and loss account? Example, suppose if you see consolidated P&L, somewhere around, uh, you know, uh, 380 means almost 190. So, this is, this is standalone financials. You see here, consolidated... Uh, Consolidated profit and loss account, you will find here, you will find here, you will find here, what is the turnover? 7,92,756. So, this is the value of sales and services. Yes or no? Now, is this matching with the other information? Example, one example I showed. Same way, board of directors report contains some financial highlights. Management discussion and analysis reports contain certain financial highlights. Various parts of this annual report contain some financial highlights. Now, what are the financial highlights that we are presenting in the annual report and are they matching with the audit report? I mean, are they matching with the financial statements where we expressed opinion, the numbers, are they matching or not, we need to check. 
if at all the annual report highlight no first page highlights key highlights if at all it shows some 9 lakh crore here it shows 7.9 lakh crore shareholder when he gone through the entire report immediately will get a doubt which is correct auditor signed that this is correct and management is saying 9 lakh crore is their financial you know turnover which is correct so people have confusion able to understand to avoid that confusion there is a responsibility casted on you mr auditor getting it you have to check annual report other information what is the objective of checking in order to provide opinion on other information no you are not responsible to give opinion on other information then what is that your responsibility is to read other information identify whether the other information is conflicting with the financial statements if so react according the report accordingly are you getting the point what is the report very simple two consequences one one the information given in the other information financial information whatever non financial information given in the other information is not conflicting he is matching with the financial statements that is one possibility in that case happy nothing to be done are you getting it only one one standard reporting we have to give what is the standard reporting standard reporting means i think in this consolidated thing whether it might come or not i'm not sure generally in consolidated thing we don't give other information only in the stand alone we'll give so in the stand alone you see how we present this paper if you understand the presentation the standard is done nothing else you see this is the stand alone financials related audit report ah this one this is other information paper this is other information other than financial statements and auditor report there on this is a recommended side heading to be used for sa 720 requirement in every audit report getting it now what is sf 720 objective if you look at if you look at our book itself directly 720 objective i'll co i'll combine both you see you'll understand very easily 720 what is the responsibility of the auditor what is the objective of the auditor the objective of the auditor having read the other information having read the other information what is other information by the way other information is financial information or non financial information it is included in an entity's annual report but other than financial sender auditor's report so in the reliance annual report from 297th page onwards financial statements will start except those from 297 onwards except that rest of the 296 pages is other information nothing but are you getting the point now what is the response what is the objective auditor has to consider first auditor have to read auditor have to read the other information and whether there is a material inconsistency what is it called as inconsistency departure deviation between other information and the financial statements then now okay you identified material difference between them what you have to do so respond appropriately when auditor identify inconsistency okay i will respond what will i respond i'll talk to the management first i'll report to the management that other information is containing a difference amount compared to financial statements can i directly say other information is wrong or can i directly say financial statement is wrong no if i find inconsistency it may give me a new knowledge getting it maybe the other information is correct but not the financial statements when i understood about the company when i understood about the company my understanding went wrong only after reading the remaining part of the annual report i got to know so many new things about the company getting the point so when i identify any inconsistency i need to do audit procedures what audit procedures i'll talk to the management i'll ask them which one is correct getting it so accordingly i'll decide whether other information is correct or financial statements amount is correct suppose i concluded that financial statements is only correct other information only wrongly given by the management i will ask management to rectify other information because it is misleading what if management don't want to rectify what will you do which opinion you will give no nothing it will not affect your opinion at all you will give you will give that particular fact that other information is containing inconsistency it, it is not correct what is given in the financial statements is only correct so you have to mention that fact in the auditors sorry other matter paragraph you have to report in the other matter paragraph in other matter paragraph i spoke no audit auditor responsibility audit report audit report this is related to audit report requirement disclosure requirement 
able to understand. So in the other matter paragraph, we mentioned to the shareholders, dear shareholders, in the annual report, there is another information called management discussion and analysis. There is an information given in the board of directors financial highlights, which contains a material departure. This is not correct. We have verified the books of accounts and financial statements. Whatever the values given in the financial statements were best, were true and fair to the best of our knowledge and belief. Are you getting the point? Suppose upon investigation, you discover a material misstatement, not in other information, but in financial statements, what to do? If the material misstatement exists in financial statements, we will ask management to rectify that because it's a mistake in financials. If management rectified, just perform the procedures, whether they rectified, document it, fine. If they have not rectified, we will give modified opinion. We will give modified opinion. If at all I have already given the audit report, I'll take back the report and give modified report. Able to understand. That's it. This is what the main standard is. Are you clear? Now, the standard is asking one reporting requirement. So this is the reporting requirement. If my if material misstatement exists in other information, unmodified opinion, and you must give report, you know, information in the about that MMS. In other information in the other matter paragraph, OMB, other matter paragraph. We generally give it in other matter paragraph this information. And the or else we can also mention it in other information. We have other information dedicated pair of it. There you can mention. MMS in financial statements. We give modified opinion and reasons behind modified opinion will be given basis for modified opinion pair of. Next if you see. Now, yes, this is very important. This can be tested as MCQ. Here, here. The auditor's responsibility under this standard, what is your responsibility? You have to read other information and see whether other information and audit financial statements are the matching with each other. If there is an inconsistency between them, respond to it and report finally as per the SCA. This is what the objective of the auditor. Correct? Huh? Now, what is standard responsibility do not include? By the way, are we giving any assurance on other information? Are we liable for giving any assurance? No, your liability is just because your financials are part of other information, you have to read it just for the sake of more convenient information to the users. Apart from that, there is no other requirement. Are you getting the point? So, it is not an assurance engagement on the other information or it is not an obligation for the auditor to obtain assurance about other information. My objective is not to see whether other information is true and fair. I am not looking for, I am reading other information to see whether the financial statements amounts are they conflicting with other information. That's what I want to see. But I don't want to check, I don't want to give opinion on other information. I don't want to verify whether other information is right or wrong. No, that is not my objective. My objective is to protect my audit, simply. This standard does not apply for preliminary announcements of financial information, securities offering. This is obviously, this SCA 720, entire all auditing standards apply in the context of audit of general purpose financial statements engagements only. If at all, you are talking about prospectus or any announcements by the company, like quarter results like that, that and all, the standard do not apply. Are you able to understand? All of you? That's it. Now, if you see a disclosure requirement here, sometimes they may ask you a disclosure requirement. Like, what are the points the auditor has to mention in the other information para? Like, they may ask you this question. As part of the, you are appointed as an auditor for a listed company. The company is decided to give annual report for so and so year. Annual report contains various informations along with which your financial statements and audit report is also included. As an auditor, what are the points you consider and what are the points you will mention in the other information para in the audit report? State the points that you will mention in the auditor's report for other information. Getting it? So, first, uh, presentation of other information para. Include that within a separate section of the audit report with an appropriate heading containing the term other information or any other suitable heading. So, Reliance have used some other suitable heading. What heading? They use the definition itself. Other information means what? Information other than financial statements and audit report thereon. That's it. So, what is auditor? Company board of director is responsible for other information that we know. Other information comprises annual report but does not include financial statements and our audit report thereon. 
and our opinion on stand alone financial statements does not cover other information and we do not provide any form of assurance conclusion on other information we are giving facts in connection with our audit our responsibility is to read other information consider whether that information is materially inconsistent with the financial statements or our knowledge obtained in the audit or appears otherwise to be materially misstated if based on the work we perform we conclude that there is a misstatement of other information we are required to report that fact if at all after verifying the other information if we conclude that other information is inconsistent with the financial statements we have to bring that fact to your attention that is what our objective as per the standard we are telling that so we have nothing to report in this regard finally reliance audit has mentioned nothing is there to report in this regard which means in other information what is the uh, uh, takes taken by the what is the stand taken by the auditor positive are you getting the point so this is what exactly 720 is about with this objective with this understanding read essay 720 once again thoroughly you will understand are you getting the point all of you next see big see in a revision class we cannot discuss 100% of every content i can discuss 20 to 25% of every content and that's what i'm doing because if you look at uh, the audit report chapter we take 32 hours in real class in actual regular class it is 32 hours because the the issues were so many the concepts were so many getting it so in a revision class i can ha hardly allocate 5 to 6 hours 6 hours maximum i can say 6 6 and a half hours beyond that i cannot allocate 20 to 25 percent of the time i can allocate getting it next so what is annual report they have given what is misstatement of other information definition they have given these are relevant for mcqs what is the audit procedure for other information straight away a four marks question can come what is the audit procedure for other information generally what will you do now then you need to verify the other information now what if there is a material inconsistency what if the misstatement is in other information what to do what what will you do if the misstatement is in the financial statements generally this question they will not be asking much they will be asking this question what auditor will do if auditor identifies misstatement not in the financials but in the other information they both are not matching upon investigation we concluded that mistake is not in the financials but in the other information then what we will do we will request management to correct it if management agree to correct it we will just check whether correction is made request if the management is refusing auditor shall communicate to top management Finally, suppose suppose if other information is identified before date of audit report, again here subsequent to the SA 560 similar terminology will come here. Sometimes, no? <laughs> sir, first you have audit report, sir. Then only we will prepare annual report. Which means other information is not ready on the date on, on which I am giving the audit report. So, I need to get a declaration from the management. What declaration? Not, declaration means representation, nothing but remember. Written representation is also called as what? A declaration from the management. So, I need to get a representation, declaration from the management that, okay, I will give you audit report now. But you don't finalize other information before my consent, without my consent. You finalize other information, give it to me before issuing to the public. Are you getting the point? On this condition, I will give audit report before finalization of other information. So, regarding that, MM, you know, suppose if other information mistake, we identified after date of audit report. Why you identified after date of audit report? By the time I am giving audit report, other information is not ready. And that is the reason I identified after the date of audit report. Able to understand. All of you. So, with this, 720 is also done. Main discussion. Are you confident? Next. So now you see, we are able to understand how, we, you know, we are able to report everything. See, other information, pair, no? you can either give it here or you can give it after responsibilities of auditor. Anywhere you can place. But it is always preferable to give it as part immediately after other matter, para. Even you see in many companies, other matter paragraph will also be given after, sorry, after auditor responsibility section. In many of the real audit reports also, after audit responsibility section, OMP they will be giving, which is not correct logically. In many listed company audits also, there are mistakes. Audit reports I am talking about, getting it. It has to be given because there is a clear guidance. I have showed you in the pronouncement book also. Other matter paragraph, emphasis of matter paragraph, key audit matter paragraph, all this should come in the order of priority. Yes or no? Now, when you talk about responsibilities of management, which is a general para, 
management is responsible for providing us for, for preparation of financial statements so as to i mean as per applicable framework they are responsible for designing and implementation of internal controls so as to uh, prevent fraud and error in the financial statements management is responsible to give us access to the books of accounts management is responsible to uh, provide us all the additional information which we request for all the preconditions to audit have you remember in ca into there is an op there is a chapter nature objective and scope of audit inside that there is a question call what are the responsibilities of management what are the preconditions to audit what is premise to audit all this is covered in sa 200 able to understand so that only next what are auditor responsibilities what are auditor responsibilities you have to talk about professional skepticism you have to talk about what are your responsibilities that you are responsible to do risk assessment you are responsible to do internal control evaluation you are responsible to verify accounting policies you are responsible to verify going concern correct you are responsible to verify overall presentation structure of the financial statements this question also can be asked in examination i'll show you this question can be asked directly what are the auditor responsibilities what are auditor responsibility section cells i mean shall speak about so auditor responsibility section shall contain that you are responsible for risk assessment you are responsible for internal control you are responsible for accounting policies verification appropriateness you are responsible for going concerns assumption usage by management is it appropriate or not you are responsible to check overall presentation structure so this question itself can be asked as a four marks question able to understand Next. Then finally, the report on legal and regulatory requirements. The report on legal and regulatory requirement. Like before this, before this, there are few more standards in this chapter. That is 610 and 620. Getting it? One is using the work of internal auditor. Second one, using the work of an auditor's expert. Using the work of an auditor's expert. Let me finish those two and then go to the report on legal and regulatory requirement. With that, this chapter will be completed. Can I? Okay, 7, 10 also I will be discussing. 710, if you look at, it, it is actually talking about comparative information where we are having two different types of comparative information. One is corresponding figures, another one is comparative financial statements. Comparative financial statement is not there in India. Able to understand, first and foremost thing, because in this standard nobody understands what is that. Okay, corresponding figures means we can at least visualize. Suppose you see, the Reliance, you know, Air India, Air India financial statements, you see, we are giving comparative figures or else uh, I mean Reliance itself will see. Uh, you see this is comparative figure. So where we are giving current year figures, where we are giving current year figures and our audit report deals only with the current year figures, our audit report does not deal with the prior period figures which are presented only for comparison purpose. They are corresponding figures. Are you getting the point? Our schedule 3, whatever, the approach is actually what? Corresponding figures. Even our auditing standard requirement is also what? You have to give opinion only of the current period figures. You will not give opinion on the corresponding figures. Now, now what is comparative financial statements? You see the definition of comparative financial statements. Comparative financial statements means what? The, this is amounts of the prior period included for comparison with the financial statements of current period are referred in auditor's opinion. If audited, they are also referred in auditor's opinion. Means prior period figures are also covered as part of your auditor's opinion. In which framework we are doing, in which framework in India, we are giving opinion on prior, prior period figures. Able to understand? This situation will apply. Suppose a partnership firm appointed you. A partnership firm appointed you as an auditor. Voluntary audit. The partnership firm is asking, sir, last three years we prepared books, but we have not audited. Can you please audit last three years books and give a comparative balance sheet? You agreed. Getting the point. You agreed and you did audit of last three years and presented as a comparative information where you give opinion on the, all the three years figures. That's a special assignment. Are you getting the point? So, comparative financial statements you don't find anywhere in India. Only in case of special assignments like this example, what I told, you will find. Otherwise, you will not be finding. Are you clear? Next. Now, what is corresponding figures? Corresponding figures are comparative information 
Corresponding figures are comparative information where amounts and disclosures for prior period are included as an integral part of the current period financials and are intended to be read only in relation to current period. The prior period figures are the figures are presented just for comparison sake, which has to be read only in relation to current period. Example, when a shareholder sees what is the sales today, like in this year, 4.6 lakh crore, okay, immediately, what is last year's sales, if at all he got a doubt, okay, 2.76, okay, company is performing better, just for that reason. Are you getting the point? So, corresponding figures are intended to be read only in conjunction with the current period figures. Now, what is the approach? What is the audit approach? The audit reporting differs between these two approaches in the below way. For corresponding figures, our opinion refers only to current period. Whereas in comparative, our opinion refers to each period. In which framework each period we are referring? Show me. Able to understand. So comparative financial statements is not there in India. Then you might immediately get a doubt. Then why this is there, sir? International auditing standard copy-pasted. In some other country, this framework could have been there. Able to understand? Remember, just because it is there in India, yes, or auditing standard doesn't mean it is specific to our country. 99% of the time, 99% of the cases, they try to eliminate. Sometimes they will forget, obviously. Able to understand? <coughs> Audit procedure for comparative information. And this is the only standard which took a lot of time for me to understand. Why? Because... Compared to financial statements, means that why, they, why they gave this? Like it is not that I have not seen any framework regarding this. So only one situation is special purpose frame, special, I mean not, special audit assignments will be there, no? For partnership firms, some companies will be doing once again audit. Example, suppose if a company is revising the financial statements, 130, 131, revision of financial statements, where company is doing, once again requesting the auditor to do audit of the previous year also. Able to understand. Suppose if uh, NCLT appointed you as an auditor for conducting audit of a particular company for the past three years, example, getting the point, maybe the, there you, you have to follow the approach of comparative financial statements where you are giving opinion on the, all the prior period figures also. Not only current period opinion, you are also giving opinion on prior period figures. Now, so what is the audit procedure for comparative information? This itself can be ask her as a side question write about audit procedure for comparative information so see that comparative information agree with the amounts and disclosures of the prior period accounting policies are consistent changes in the accounting policies are disclosed correctly suppose if auditor identifies any misstatement perform the procedures to grab to gather the evidence if the auditor had audited the prior period financials also he should follow 560 subsequent event procedure and audit reporting how you have to report for corresponding figures? You shall not refer the corresponding figures in your opinion. Auditor's opinion shall not refer. Except. Except means doesn't mean we will refer about. Getting it? Except means here there are some situations where I talk about prior period figures in my audit report. But not in opinion paragraph. But in other matter paragraph. Where do I talk about? Other matter paragraph. Not in opinion paragraph. Generally my opinion does not refer. Here, audit opinion shall not refer, means interpretation is what you know, audit report shall not refer. Your audit report shall not talk about corresponding figures, except audit report of the prior period contains modified opinion. This point you might have seen in SA 510. Initial audit engagement, opening balances, predecessor audit report concept. Where you have seen, if the predecessor audit report contains a modified opinion, what is the nature behind the modified opinion? reason behind the modified opinion whether that reason is present in the current period and if the reason is present in current period and it is material in the current period then the current auditor shall also modify the opinion and in the other matter paragraph you need to mention the fact that prior period financial statements were audited by predecessor auditor and this is the opinion expressed by him will you so that is one case or if you identified a prior period item Material misstatement existing in prior period means in the current year, what does is what is that item is? Prior period item. Able to understand. If a material misstatement exists in current period, when you identify, very simple, suppose as on 31st March of the last year, some, some trade receivables were there. Now in the current year, when you apply cutoff procedures, you discovered that so and so trade receivable is false. It is fake. Getting the point, it's a bogus. So it's an error or omission in the prior period information. 
and which is discovered in the current year. So, what is this item is exactly prior period item. So, whatever the debtor's value last year we presented is incorrect. So, it's a prior period item. Be able to understand. Now, immediately we get, sir, last year auditor has not discovered. No, what is his responsibility? Nothing. He do audit on sample basis. Be able to understand. This item he might have not selected. This, this item, this particular fraud, this particular error we discovered upon our investigation of finding deviations. If prior period financials were not audited, then we should get sufficient appropriate evidence that opening balances are free from material misstatements. When prior period financials were not audited, we should get evidence that opening balances are free. How do we get evidence that opening balances are free from material misstatement? How do we know that opening balances are true and fair? We have to do last year audit. Simple. Without that, it is not possible. Able to understand. That's it. So, only in these three scenarios, you will be referring about corresponding figures in the audit report. Generally, your audit report will not be referring about corresponding figures. But in these three scenarios, you will be referring about corresponding figures in the audit report. Able to understand. Now, there is some additional common reporting requirement. This is condition. This is when, this is condition. When the audit report of the current period will talk about prior period figures in which circumstances this is. Now, what you need to report in the audit report? If the prior period financials were audited by predecessor auditor, mention that, state that the financial statements of prior period were audited by predecessor auditor. He gave an unmodified opinion. The date of audit report of the prior period auditor is so and so. The prior period financials were not audited. Mention that prior period financial statements, corresponding figures, comparative information is unaudited. Mention that fact, that's it. But remember, just because you are mentioning the fact that the prior period figures, opening balances were not audited, doesn't mean you are exempted from getting evidence about opening balances. You should continue to get sufficient appropriate evidence regarding opening balances as given under SA 510. Are you getting the point? So that's what this, they, they will say. This itself can be tested as an MCQ. Which of the following statement is correct? Which of the following statement is not correct? They will give you like this. Prior period financial statements were not audited and resultantly the auditor is not responsible to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence about opening balances. Like this they will give four options. You need to select the right option. Able to understand. That's it. With this 710 is mainly done. Compared to financial statements related discussion ignore. Corresponding figures only important from exam point of view. Getting it? Compared to financial statements, definition alone you keep, keep remember. That's it. Next we have uh, another standard. Uh, let us finish 260 also here itself. 260, communications to those charged with the governance. So what is this standard? See so the standard has specifically brought so that you and the top management of the company. By the way, who is those charged with governance in a company? See, generally, in case if it is a partnership firm which appointed me as an auditor, partners themselves are those charged with governance because they are the one who take the complete accountability and responsibility for the company. Governance means accountability plus authority, both. Both if they are, there, so if they are, here, if they are with a particular person, then we call him as those charged with governance. In a listed entity, audit committee comes under those charged with governance. In a listed entity, audit committee will come under those charged with governance. If audit committee is not responding, then I will go to board of directors, then I will go to chairman of the company or anybody else who is the supreme authority. Oh, this, from audit committee, any management beyond upper Above the audit committee, audit committee and above the audit committee, all of them will form part of those charged with the governance. Remaining part of the management of the company, we will refer them as simply management, able to understand. But remember, management is a wider term. Management includes those charged with governance because it may be top management, middle management, lower level management. But when I specifically say those charged with governance, only the audit committee and above level able to understand. So, communication with those charged with governance, what you have to communicate? First, you have to communicate when you are going to start the audit. You need to tell for how many days approximately you are going to do the audit. You need to communicate what are the significant issues you are facing in audit. Yes or no? So, you need to communicate, you need to have a proper communication between you and the management so that, so that you will take decisions in a better way. You will take conclusions about audit in a better way. That's what you see, they have given here. Auditor has to communicate planned scope and timing of audit. Auditor has to communicate responsibilities of the auditor. Auditor has to communicate significant findings from the audit. What are the significant issues you found? Now examples of what are the significant findings? This itself can be asked as a four marks question. 
the auditor's view about significant qualitative aspects of entity's accounting practices, circumstances that affect the form and content of the audit report, any other significant matters which are important for the auditor and written representation auditor is asking what are all the representations you want, communicate management they will give you and significant difficulties if any encountered, significant difficulties sometimes in exam they will ask you what are the significant difficulties that is given in the pronouncements getting the point what are significant it, it was asked it was asked once earlier getting it in old scheme it was asked what are the significant difficulties that are to be communicated by the auditor to those charged with the governance see you think like many have this doubt should we read entire pronouncement book for auditing subject the answer is yes the answer is yes but it is impractical getting it it is impractical you are actually supposed to read entire pronouncement book just best example May 22 attempt, one question came from the SA um, 200 or somewhere, pro professional judgment question it came, which is actually taken from pronouncement, it is not there in the, any of the page in the ICA main, main study material, getting it. In every attempt, I can see one pronouncement related question, even in the last attempt, November 22 attempt also, SA uh, 220 related question came, SA 220 related question came, which is actually there in the pronouncement. So definitely one or two questions, five to ten marks questions will come definitely from the depth of the pronouncement. Now tell me, for the ten marks will you risk reading entire pronouncement? Obviously not. Getting it. So what we need to do, we have to be conservative. We have to be conservative in our reading. And we have to be clever in our reading. What we are reading, what we are not reading, everything. Definitely there is a chance that we will ignore so much of syllabus. From there questions will come. But that is not our primary agenda. Our primary agenda is whatever that we read from the different question comes, can we answer or not? That is what our objective, able to understand. Like I, I, I always notice, sir, like 100% syllabus, like people especially asking me revision, sir, why, why, you, why don't you cover 100% syllabus in the revision? What is the point of covering? Actually, for you, according to you, I, you think, if at all I cover all the chapters, you think I'm covering 100%. No, I'm only covering 50% because pronouncement I'm not covering, no. Logically speaking, an institute has every right you know, for you, guidance note on CARO applicable. Guidance note on CARO is 500 pages. Who will read? It's applicable. You can see. Guidance note on CARO is applicable in the exam notification. You can see that. For you, guidance note on IFC is applicable. You are advised to read. And for you, may, you know, these standards, no, I will not be explaining. Right now, I will tell you the standards which I will not be covering in marathon. Uh, 240. And uh, 500, 330, 530, 520. These standards I will not be covering in this class. Getting the point. And 315 and uh, we have 300. These two also I will not be covering because these are covered in our second priority chapters. 315 is nothing but risk assessment chapter. 300 is nothing but audit strategy chapter able to understand and you know for all these standards the institute book says what you know refer CA inter material and in CA inter material it is no SA 200 like you are all discussing SA 200 no like some two pages no SA 200 is actually 20 pages getting it as per ICA requirement I will show you the ICA book itself straight away so you will understand better in ICA book we have a chapter called you know, uh, audit strategy or uh, standards overview, risk assessment, where second chapter? Yes, here you see, students are also advised to refer all these standards. Audit strategy planning, anyhow we are having, a, you know, you see, this is a mistake actually here. Audit strategy planning program is discussed in CA intermediate, please refer that they said, but anyhow we have that equal corresponding chapter in CA final, chapter 2 only. So no need. Audit documentation, audit evidence discussed in chapter 3 of CA intermediate course where which is covering all these standards. Actually you see your CA final main material, you will not find, you know, you will not find any of these standards. You will not find any of these standards content in main material of CA final. You see any chapter you will not find. Because they were all covered in CA inter and institute is expecting you to read. CA inter entire documentation chapter is applicable for its syllabus. So, for examiner, for paper setter, these resources will be given additionally. 
you can set from any of this the question you can select provided you follow this weightage this is what instruction given to him so he will go to audit documentation chapter and he will ask one question what are the significant matters that shall be documented by the auditor that's an SA 500 question what are the write about audit summary memorandum it's a SA 500 question sorry uh, 230 question audit summary memorandum means it's a documentation related 230 question are you getting it what are the significant matters to be documented that's also 230 question only able to understand now write about nature and timing and extent of test of controls it's a 330 question which is covered in single inter able to understand so for all this they are asking again 240 standard 240 standard also they are asking you to refer fraud chapter in ca into which is of some 15 pages this audit documentation chapter is of 50 pages getting it audit sampling is of 20 15 to 20 pages discussion only sa 530 i don't know how many of you are reading sampling chapter thinking that that it is only one or two pages getting it you know there is an mcq which i have seen in mtp of ca final which of the following is not a factor which of the following is not a factor for uh, determining sample size in case of test of details i think every one of you have read sampling right at least you have gone through the standard right based on standards book which you bought yes or no like this question is this is the question which of the following is not a factor for determining sample size in case of test of details which is a question came in mtp one of your paper now risk of material misstatement tolerable material misstatement expected material misstatement projected material misstatement four options were given which one you select huh why Ah, so guessing is different the answer is different the answer can be projected misstatement are you getting the point answer is projected misstatement why projected misstatement why not expected tolerable risk because all these three are factors for determining sample size for test of details now what is tolerable misstatement nothing but performance materiality performance materiality is also called as tolerable misstatement getting it entire sa 320 is also you need to read from ca inter because in ca inter audit planning chapter only covers sa 320 discussion i think uh, in the last attempt sa 320 question came by the way i uh, forgot in the last attempt sa 320 question came sa 320 that to which question you know in depth question so they have asked you then november 22 paper only i think it is november 22 paper just for your clarification i'll show you so that what is the syllabus that you prepared and what you are supposed to prepare you will understand okay should i show you shall i okay yeah just a minute huh. this is the november 22 question paper this is november 22 question paper This is actually SA 220 question. This is actually SA 220 question. This one is materiality question. 99% they cannot answer this. Okay, what are the factors that may affect identification of appropriate benchmark? What are the factors that are relevant for identifying benchmark? Probably you will find this question to some extent in some books. Getting it? But for me, I clearly tell to refer CA inter book because I give CA inter book directly. For a few chapters, wherever institute tells me a protocol, I follow that simple logic. If institute book says refer CA inter material for so and so standard, I only refer that. I will not find shortcut. Getting it. Next. Now, what benchmark should be adopted? Suppose the manufacturer and sale of air conditioners is having regular profits. If they are having regular profits, you can adopt PBD benchmark. If the profit is volatile, Losses in the previous two financial years due to pandemic. If the profit is volatile, then we should take some other revenue as a benchmark or some other as a benchmark. Like this, in SA 320 pronouncement book, in the explanatory material, what if the benchmark is volatile? They have given an example. That example is tested as a 5 marks question. I will show you right now, that one also. You show me, you will not find this any in any book. I told this in my class also. 
This I told in class because SA three two one day explain it from pronouncement book for CA final student. I explain SA three two one day from pronouncement book. I told this in twenty twenty one itself. This way the question can be constructed, and it came in number twenty two. Pronouncement books I'll show you three twenty. Yeah, so this is three twenty related question. So the question is about the question is about determining materiality. This is explanatory material. Determining materiality involves exercising professional judgment. The factors that may affect identifying benchmark. This question, you know, where you will find this answer only in CA inter material audit planning chapter. You will not find this answer in anywhere in the final material. Are you getting it? Next. Now you see here. Profit before tax from continuing operation is often used for profit-oriented entities as a benchmark. When profit before tax is volatile, other benchmarks may be more appropriate, like gross profit or total revenue. This line is tested as a five marks question for you. Getting it? So tell me. So you don't expect how a question can come. Generally, we think this this particular short notes material is useful. We we always look for shortcuts. Okay, if the paper comes very tough, then only we will waste our attempt getting it. So that's why when you are preparing itself, you should prepare for the worst. It is always better to work one more month extra instead of six more months waiting. So I believe in working one more month extra. I believe in working three more months extra rather than wasting my six months of earning. Logically, right? So this itself is an example. November attempt paper itself is an example. But but one one advantage in November is like this only twenty marks only there in the entire paper. Some complicated questions. Rest of the entire seventy marks of the descriptive paper is easy. They are straight questions, straight or easy questions. That's actually good. But sometimes it will not be. May attempt it is not so. December twenty one attempt it is not so. Able to understand. So be prepared for the worst always. Next. So, using the work of using the work of internal auditor SA six ten, SA six ten. Here, here can can a statutory auditor use the work of internal auditor? The standard gives a guidance. Yes, you can definitely use the stat auditor, the external auditor can use the work of internal auditor without any problem. How the external auditor can use the work of internal auditor? The standard guides in two ways. The standard gives guidance in two particular ways. So the internal auditor's work can be used in two types. One is type one, another one is type two. Type one using the work which is performed by internal auditor. Internal audit function. The standard uses the word internal audit function. Using the work which is performed by internal audit function, or using internal audit function to provide to provide direct assistance under direction, supervision, review of external auditor. Another one is what direct assistance. One is he will perform the work, and I will use that workings. Another one is direct assistance. Direct assistance means what? Suppose I am shortage of manpower in my team. I will ask interlocutors, please. Some three of you, please come and be join in my team for next forty days. We will finish the audit fast. So next forty days, you are not employee of the company. You are my employee. Able to understand? We will enter into a written uh, declarations like this and take the team members into our team and like how I give work to my article, how I give work to my manager. I same way I will allocate work to him also as part of my team and I will direct him how to do. I'll supervise what he is doing. I'll review whatever he did. Able to understand? So that is type two. Now, uh, in this, what are the questions that can be expected in exam? So, first of all, what do you mean by direct assistance? Direct assistance means the use of internal auditors to perform procedures under the direction, supervision, and review of external auditor. Next, what is internal audit function? It is a function of an entity that performs assurance and consulting activities designed to evaluate and improve effectiveness of governance, risk management, internal controls. Three objectives for internal audit is always governance, risk management, internal controls. You will see this these wording similarly in internal audit chapter also. 
we have a chapter no internal operational management audit inside that also you will find all this now this question was asked many a times again what points you will consider what points you will consider before you decide to take the assistance of internal auditor what points you will consider i will consider independence and objectivity of the internal audit function only if the internal audit function is independent and objective unbiased only then their work i will use otherwise i cannot take up their work i cannot use their work the level of competence of the internal audit function whether they follow a systematic and disciplined approach including quality control only if they follow a systematic approach i will take their help otherwise i will not be taking i will not be risking able to understand you know actually the standard starts with a notion the standard it starts with a statement like sa 600 started no what sa 600 started with the auditor is not responsible in respect of branches components audited by other auditor here the auditor is continue to be responsible even after using the work of internal auditor there is no division of responsibility able to understand so if you want to use you use it but doesn't mean tomorrow if something go wrong you cannot blame internal auditor you are only see you are giving the opinion you are signing the audit report your opinion is what ultimately matters to the public you are only 100% binding able to understand so same way to what extent to what extent the work of internal audit function can be used this itself can be asked for four marks question what is the nature and the extent of internal audit functions work that can be used by external auditor to what extent i will use you know uh, there are certain areas where i can use the work of internal auditor for testing operating effectiveness of controls controls testing we call it as substantive procedures where limited judgment is involved limited judgment there is no significant judgment involved and inventory counting physical inventory counting physical assets counting in all these cases i can use their workings a compliance with regulatory requirements like gst compliance gst reconciliation tds reconciliation employee state insurance provident fund reconciliations in all these cases interlocutors have already worked upon why should i work on all the reconciliations again and again i take their workings verify their workings that's it getting it and review of financial information of subsidiaries which are not uh, significant this is in respect of cfs audit when you are doing cfs audit you need to review the financial information of the subsidiary companies getting the point if at all the subsidiary is not a material subsidiary that that review work can be given to internal auditor and you can use his work able to understand again you need to keep in mind that auditor shall auditor shall make all judgments and further to prevent undue use of the internal audit function use less of the function you perform more work directly don't think because internal auditor has already performed so many works you are continuously using his work management itself is getting a doubt that what this fellow is doing then don't be like that so when you are using internal audit function try to use as as less as possible you have to perform as much as possible the work able to understand next and also see even after using internal audit function no is it is it appearing like external auditor is sufficiently involved in audit like are you doing audit even after taking the help of internal auditor or is it looking like external auditor is doing nothing everywhere he is copying just internal auditor working so what is that so you know you should keep that in mind and communicate to top management what work you are going to use for the internal auditor of the internal auditor that's it now what is the manner in which you need to you work this is not that important but you have to communicate with internal auditors read the report of internal auditor evaluate whether they have a properly planned working procedure so whether they have obtained sufficient appropriate evidence to draw the conclusions reasonably by the internal auditor so all that then direct assistance direct assistance i will not be using prohibition when it, when it is prohibited when there are threats to their objectivity the team members whom i am asking no they never work independently so i will not take them into my team or they lack competence obviously one of the important reason why i want assistance is because they are competent people if they are not competent i will not be taking assistance suppose you decided that you want to take assistance direct assistance you decided to take some companies internal audit department is having 100 people out of them some three people only you requested all the three of three of them are competent they are they are independent everything is fine so they are now a part of your team for next 40 days now we now you need to allocate work to them right while allocating the following works don't allocate you allocate any work don't allocate the following what are the works significant judgment related works don't allocate because remember though they are part of your team for now they are not permanent your team members they are anyhow organizations staff only at the end of the day remember keep that in mind significant judgment related works don't give them high risk works don't give them areas where these people have already worked on don't give them are you getting it 
Now there is another point in the standard actual D point. Now which works I can allocate to direct assistance people, which work I cannot allocate. I need to decide now that decision making process don't delegate. Able to understand? So like this four points for there totally. So this itself can be given as a question. Are you clear? So this is SA 610. Confident. Next. SA 620. It appears as if you have never read these standards. You have gone through, right? Yes or no? Huh. SA 620. Using the work of an auditor's expert. Using the work of an auditor's expert. In this, how examiner can twist the questions? How many, how students do mistakes in this chapter, you know? Suppose, no. In exam, now first of all, in this, in this particular chapter, there are two types of questions. Evaluate the factors for need of an expert. Evaluate the factors for need of an auditor's expert. Both are different. Getting the point. First of all, do you need an expert? The question is different. When you need auditors expert specifically, that question is different. Able to understand? So, factors for determining. This is the first point that you discuss in the standard. First of all, what are the factors that you discuss, that you keep in mind? First of all, do you need an expert or not? Same way, when to use auditors expert, what are the considerations? Considerations, factors, all are same only. Getting it? So, what are the factors? When you are deciding whether to hire an auditor's expert or not. So the answer is different. When to use an expert, the answer is different. First of all, do I need an expert? Depends upon my exposure in that audit area. From how many years I am doing audit of that entity. What is my understanding of the business? Getting the point? By the way, first of all, who is an expert? In accounts and audit, who is expert? Obviously, CS. Which means, anybody who is expert in accounts and audit is an expert according to us. Logically correct or not? That's what the definition of the standard. The standard says, first of all, what is an expert? Who is an expert? Expert means a person having specialized skill or talent in any field other than accounting and auditing. Now, experts are two types. Management expert, auditor's expert. Management expert means what? If the expert work is used by management for preparation and presentation of financial statements, then we call him as a management expert. Who is auditor's expert? If the expert's assistance is used by auditor for obtaining the sufficient and appropriate evidence, then we call him as auditor's expert. Now, why an auditor's expert can be two ways, two types, internal or external expert. Internal means within my firm only he is working, or my network firm. Getting it? Auditor external expert means he does not belong to me. I don't know him at all. Able to understand. I specifically hired this. He is not belonging to my firm quality control policies. Able to understand. Now, so first of all, now there is the standard gives one more clarification. You have ultimate responsibility, even though you are using the work of auditor's expert, your, your responsibility will not be reduced just by using the work of auditor's expert. Same reporting, same responsibility for SA 610 also. Same responsibility for SA 220 also. You are using the work of article assistance. You are taking the help of your managers. But ultimately for the opinion, you are only responsible. You see entire SA220, engage one partner is responsible, engage one partner is responsible, engage one partner is responsible. It starts with, every side heading starts with engage one partner. You see SQC, firm has to establish, firm has to establish, firm has to establish. Yes or no? I will show you the observations. Now, what are the cases when we need an expert? An auditor's expert may be needed in one or more of the following for understanding the, you know, uh, entity, for understanding the entity and its environment, for understanding the entity and its environment, for identifying risk of MMS, for assessing response to the SSL risk at financial statement level, performing further audit procedures to respond to auditors, all this look similar, no? evaluating sufficient appropriate evidence. Actually, you do this only in audit. What will you do in audit? First, I understand the entity. Yes or no? Then I will try to identify and assess risk of MMS. Then I will plan my audit procedures, further audit procedures. Further audit procedures is called response to SSA risk. This is what 330 standard. What is 330 standard? Response to SSA risk. Response to SSA risk means what? In CA interview, you discuss this question. What are audit procedures? Risk assessment procedures, further audit procedures. Further audit procedures means what? Compliance procedures, substantive procedures. Substantive procedures means what? Test of details, analytical procedures. Yes or no? 
Now risk assessment procedures includes what? Inquiry and inspection, observation, risk assess, I mean sorry, analytical procedure. Again, that analytical procedure what you will find in substantive procedure. That is substantive analytical procedure. Risk related analytical procedure is different. Substantive analytical procedure is different. Substantive analytical procedure means on the actual transactions I will apply analytical procedure. I will analytic analytically analyze whether they are logically correct or not. Repairs and maintenance account of last year and current year, there is a huge fluctuation. In the last 5 years when I see repairs and maintenance, every time it is 1 to 1.2 crore range. Suddenly this year 5 crores is a repairs and maintenance. What happened? I will, de I will dig into it. Getting it? I will go through entire repairs and maintenance account. I will say month wise breakup. Suddenly somewhere in the September month I found there is a huge amount. I will say date wise breakup in September month. In on a particular date some 2 crores worth of repair has been done. What 2 crores worth of repair when I open and saw? It is actually a purchase of a spare part. Purchase of a spare part which is eligible for capitalization. Which meet the recognition criteria for asset capitalization. But management accidentally charged it to repairs and maintenance account. How I discovered this error? By doing analytical review of repairs and maintenance by using trend analysis. Yes or no? That's it. That is substantive analytical procedure. Right now what I told is substantive analytical procedure. At the time of planning, at the time of risk assessment, whatever analysis I apply, that is simple analytical procedure. Able to understand. When I actually do the audit, in depth when I am verifying, in order to uh, find whether they are true, true and fair, that is called a substantive analytical procedure. So this entire discussion you had in CA Inter as part of documentation and evidence chapter, that is what 330. Getting it? So once you need to you need to design response. As part of response, what will you do? You decide further audit procedure to respond to the assessed risk. So I found a risk in inventory. So I planned in my audit. So inventory counting I need to take. That is a further audit procedure. Test of details, inventory counting. Able to understand. And finally, after counting, after doing further audit procedure, you will get evidence, no? Evaluate the evidence. So these are actually nothing but steps in audit. These are nothing but steps in audit. So expert can be used in any stage of audit. That's what this means. The uh, expert assistance may be required to understand the business, to assess the risk, to respond to the risk, to design a further audit procedure, to evaluate the evidence. In any of these areas, I may require the help of an expert. Theoretical answer they gave. Getting it? Now, there is another reason. There is another factor which auditor has to look into. First, first of all, do I need an expert or not? It depends on my understanding of the field. It depends upon my understanding of the field. I am doing audit of a very big structural engineering company. I am doing audit of a civil engineering company. I am doing audit of a nuclear energy company. I am doing audit of an atomic research company. Able to understand. In all these cases, I will not have an idea. I know purchase of raw materials, sale of raw materials in CPT final also. I don't know atomic nuclear energy, how they work exactly. Are you getting the point? So, when in an atomic energy, capitalization will appear. Suppose I am appointed as an auditor for DRDO. Defense Research Organization, what, how, how do you know when to capitalize a mission? They invented a new mission, a new you know, a weapon. So when the weapon becomes a materialized stage, when you capitalize this weapon, you need to know, right? In DRDO balance sheet, you see so many weapons will be there, which are owned by the Indian government. Correct? Huh? So to audit these kinds of entities, you don't understand, first of all, what is their business? First of all, they don't do business. But they are having separate legal entity. Financial statements are prepared. It's a, it's a Section 8 company able to understand. So you are appointed as an auditor, you have to do audit. So I don't understand anything about defense, so you need an expert there. So how far you are understanding other field? So an auditor who is not an expert in relevant field other than accounts and auditing, so the understanding may be obtained through by experience in auditing those entities. Suppose first time I am doing DRDO audit, I will be having you. Now, suppose if I am doing audit of the DRDO from past 5 years, 6 year I may not require expert. In the past 2 years I may require expert. So, educational professional development in that particular field. Example, ICI has released a guidance note on audit of DRDO. Or discussion with other auditors who have performed. Suppose the moment I got DRDO, I consult all my friends circle. Hey, anyone have you done defense company audit? So, tell me. Are you getting it? So, it depends on all these factors. You will decide, okay, I need expert in this case now. Okay, you decided you need expert. Now, do you want to hire an expert separately? Management already employed an expert. You know what? Management already employed one expert for preparing the financials. Why can't you use management expert? Why can't you use management expert? The following shall also be considered. 
whether management expertise employed by the entity or third party whether what is the management's control over their expert management expert how the management expert competence and capabilities management expert are they are they are they liable for same professional standards like i am liable if all the cases the answer is yes management expert is competent he is independent management is having very 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 less significant influence getting it and management expert is also chartered accountant getting it he is also having cop only thing is i didn't hire them management hired him that's the only difference apart from that there is no difference at all he is honest independent credible capable competent now can i use management expert work here itself yes if you decided to use management work itself directly this standard itself do not apply this is one of the factor you need to check whether auditor's expert requirement is there or not so first part is whether expert work is required or not second part is do you need auditor's expert both are different able to understand so this is one factor you need to identify what are the factors for determining need of an auditor's expert for marks question what are the factors that determine need of an expert for marks question both are both for both answers are completely different are you getting it they look similar but they are not same are you getting it next uh, so now can i refer about uh, so in, in this standard they talk about so much actually this standard we discuss almost 1 hour 45 minutes it's not possible here getting it already 15 minutes gone So, once I decided to use my own expert, I will have to enter agreement with him. I will have to enter agreement with him. I will have to explain him what is the nature of work, what is his scope, what are the objectives. And I need to discuss, because I am hiring, what is my role, what is your role, what is my responsibility, what is your responsibility. And I need to explain him by what time I am expecting the report, yes or no. And I need to explain, I need to explain that, hey, I am liable for confidentiality. You should also maintain confidentiality. I need to tell the auditor expert that confidentiality requirement, able to understand. Then, once the expert has performed the work, you have to verify that work also. Don't directly blindly believe. Take that work. His working papers will be there. Verify the working papers. Check the adequacy of the expert's work. Adequacy of the expert's work you need to check. So that answer is given. Suppose if you think the auditor's expert work is not adequate, he worked on it. After you checked his workings, you felt that still somehow you are not convinced with the work. Discuss with him. Ask him to extend the work. Ask him to do once again entire process. If even after that you discussed that, you decided that no, no, somehow expert work cannot be used. And you are unable to get sufficient appropriate evidence. You know, you have to modify the opinion as accordingly. Able to understand? Next. Now, can I report, can I refer expert's name in the auditor's report? Generally, after using expert work, example, example, some oil reserves valuation in an oil company, refinery company, oil reserves will be there, crude oil reserves will be there. The reserves valuation is performed by expert, oil, you know, some auditor's expert. He gave a report and valuation report he gave. This valuation report is more or less similar to management's valuation report. 10% deviation is accepted as an industry standard. So what I understood is, after taking expert's valuation report, I concluded that the value of NRV taken by the company management for valuation of inventory in the financial statement is correct, reliable. This is what I felt. Now tell me, after taking, after utilizing expert report, what opinion I felt, unmodified opinion, correct? On inventory. Now, when I am giving unmodified opinion, in the basis for opinion paragraph, should I, is there any need that I need to talk about expert work? Is there any need? No need. Suppose, management valuation is different, expert valuation is different, the difference amount is very significant and I insisted on management, please put expert's value. Don't put your value. Expert is very credible person, industry leading, for all big, big oil refinery companies, he's only deciding factor and why are you? So I believe that expert value is correct according to me. Management valuation is incorrect. But what management replied? Sorry sir, we approved already the financials. We can't change it. So management kept continued with the same value. But according to me, the value is incorrect. So which opinion I will give? Modified opinion. Now when I am giving modified opinion, I need to tell people that I have used work of an expert. According to him, the value was this, this much. And I believe that this value is correct. That is why we have given modified opinion. Like that I need to give reason to the people you know, in the basis for qualified opinion, basis for adverse opinion section. In order to make the people understand the nature of qualification, nature of modification. Getting it? You can refer expert name. But remember, such a kind of reference about expert in audit report does not in any way reduce your responsibility. You are only 100% responsible. So that is what this entire discussion is. Are you clear? All of you. That's it. SS620 is also done. 
now we will have to discuss legal and regulatory requirements you know what how almost we have discussed 12 standards we have covered 12 auditing standards big big standards are too in the ca final uh, whatever the standards specifically applicable in ca final 12 we have completed okay next so uh, shall we take a break and continue this this okay fine take a break and get back so the pending part uh, in audit report topic is uh, report on legal and regulatory requirements see this report on legal and regulatory requirements is like this is the last part of the audit report inside the audit report this is the last content where we give descriptive content now after that it is just a signature of the auditor place of the signature date of the audit report and UD number signature of the auditor he just have to sign as per the COP signature whatever the COP in at the time of applying for COP whatever the final signature specimen signature you submitted to the Institute that should be what you have to use then place of signature place means usually the city where the audit report is signed generally we keep auditors head office will be there no so that city name or the client whatever the company in respect of which we are signing audit report right so that company registered office city name we will sign any of these two you can use next date of the auditors report what is the date that you should mention in the audit report data now that point is clearly given the date of the audit report shall be only on or after obtaining sufficient appropriate evidence and on or after approval by competent authority actually if you look at the original text the date of the audited report shall not be earlier than the date on which sufficient appropriate evidence is obtained and the, those with recognized authority have asserted that they have taken the responsibility for the financial statements that's actually original statement but what is the meaning of it nothing but can you sign audit report before audit is completed so obviously audit completed means what I need to get sufficient appropriate evidence only on or after obtaining evidence and not only that tell me approval of financial statements means what it is an approval by board of directors stating that this is the final set of financial statements which we will send to the public now only on those financials you should give opinion correct so now tell me your audit report cannot be finalized unless financials are approved correct so it shall be on or after approval date are you getting the point generally we keep the approval date itself what is the date financial statements were approved by the management same date we will use for audit report also why we use same date i will discuss in sa 560 getting the point now that is date of the audit report and you didn't number everyone knows it's a 16 character alphanumeric code it's a 16 character alphanumeric code where six digits of your membership number will appear first two digits and the remaining next almost eight digits will be alpha new i mean they're just random numbers generated for every document with effect from first july 2019 every attestation every certificate every report which contains opinion or not doesn't matter any document whatever you are giving which is a certification attestation or where you are giving a sort of assurance it must be having UDIN. UDIN number is like a digital signature. It is like a, a digital signature. Getting the point? Suppose my signature is there. This is my signature, official signature. Getting it? So, very simple. I, I have specifically chosen this because I need to sign earlier. No, I used to do, do tax audits, company audits. No. So, all the things we need to sign at a time. Almost uh, I used to sign on one particular day 1500 pages. If at all I sign like this, no. If at all I sign like this, no, I need to go for treatment for the finger. Yes or no? So I should make my signature as simple as such. So, so very simple. Getting it? So I made specifically consciously this signature. Now tell me, anybody can forge my signature. Correct? So UDIN number will prevent me that. So if I just, if, if only my signature is there on an assurance document, attested, attested document, that if somebody told me that you signed, getting it, I can easily deny. I did not sign. Now forgery case and all, again I have to go. Why all that? UDIN number is there. Where is my UDIN number? Tell me. UDIN number is a proof that I signed it. Obviously, yes or no? UDIN number is a proof that I signed. So, whenever I sign any document, UDIN portal will be there. In the UDIN portal, I need to generate a UDIN number for that document, giving the document details in the UDIN number, UDIN portal, and generate a number. That number I will type it on the report. So, that number is the ultimate evidence that I am the one who signed the report. Are you getting the point? If UDIN number is there, the document is invalid. Simple. 
So banks and all, everybody they will check. Really, the same auditor signed or it's a duplicate signature. So everybody can check it. So that is the purpose of union. Now, so now what else is pending is only the twelfth section of the auditor report. So report on legal and regulatory requirements. The actual is report on other legal and regulatory requirements. Other legal and regulatory requirements. The standard uses the word other reporting requirements. What is the standard uses the word? Other reporting responsibilities or other reporting requirements. Remember, other other matter paragraph is different. Other information paragraph is different. Other reporting requirements paragraph is different. Where all the three starts with the word other. Able to understand? So, other reporting requirements means reporting on legal and regulatory requirements. Now, dear auditor, you are appointed as an auditor under a particular law. Under the law. Do you have any requirement to report on certain incidents? Do you have any responsibility to report on certain aspects of the enterprise? If so, report all those under this side heading of the audit report, under this section of the audit report. Like that, under Companies Act, we have three reporting requirements. 143 subsection 1, 143 subsection 3, 143 subsection 11. 143 subsection 3, there are some list of items which auditor has to check and affirm it. We call them as affirmations. We call them as checklist items. Getting it? And here approximately 16 items were there. Approximately 16 items were there. Inside that only the key point we will discuss which is regarding the Havala transaction discussion. Getting it? Next one. And 143 subsection 11 where central government was given the power by the Companies Act to issue any notification in this regard where auditor has to talk about any points requested by central government. Accordingly, CARO 2020 has been released. Yes or no? Where we are having 21 aspects in respect of which auditor has to give information about. Are you getting the point? Now, 143 subsection 1. So, duty to inquire. You need to inquire six matters. You need to inquire six matters about the company and then comment if there is a negative thing. If you identify something wrong with respect to these six inquiries, then only you should report in audit report. Otherwise, no need. Able to understand. So now totally, how many items you are supposed to report? 22 plus 21. Totally, 43 items we are supposed to specifically, explicitly comment in the audit report. In the audit report. Now let's look at the Tata Motors audit report. Exactly how they reported. You see, here, here there is a report on other legal and regulatory requirements. Now, CARO is a right company's auditor report order 2020. So, it is coming under which paragraph? Report on legal and regulated requirements. CARO is not a separate document. It's part of audit report. This is the proof. So, CARO is given as part of audit report. Now, how it is given? It is given as an annexure. Annexure is not a separate document. It's part of the main document. Yes or no? In examination, main booklet is given. You want additional pages. Will you take additional sheets or not? Additional sheets, separate booklet, main book. It's, it's part of main overall valuation. Obviously. So, annexure means it's something attachment. Where I feel the page is not sufficient to fill, I will use annexure so that I can describe it in detail. Correct? Huh? All of you. So, so, CARA is part of this. Now, 143 subsection 3 checklist items. You see A, B, C, D, E, F. All that will come here. This is Havala related funding. Funding party, ultimate beneficiary, that reporting. Getting it? And later, thereafter, this is regarding remuneration paid to director reporting, which is a 197 requirement. I will discuss all that. Don't worry. Getting it? Have you got an idea how it appears in audit report? Now, the CARA has been given as a separate document here. Now, the CARA has been given as a separate document here. It is given as an NX job. Not only that, in 143 subsection 3 checklist, 16 items, I, I mean, sorry, 16 items I told, right? One of the items is IFC. The auditor has to express his opinion on operating existence, sorry, adequacy and uh, operating effectiveness of internal financial controls over financial reporting. That is given as a separate report, uh, which is an extension to audit report. Uh, it is NXRB, nothing but it is what? Uh, NXRB, you can see this. NXRB is what? IFC report. This is IFC report. This is a requirement as per the guidance note on IFC. There is a guidance note on IFC as per that auditor has to give a separate report like this, detailed report like this, though it is part of 143 checklist. So you see here, uh, in 143.3, they will say here, 
refer an exture b they will refer like they will refer an exture b you see here with respect to adequacy of internal financial controls refer an exture b so this is how the reporting comes now let's discuss the actual part now what is the duty of the auditor to report on certain matters 143 subsection 3 inside this key points i will discuss not every point i will discuss key points i will discuss then i will start with caro getting it now 143 subsection 3 we have you see a b c d e f g h i j below the j point we have another six points below j point we have six points inside that six fourth point is you know, inside that we are having the three points able to understand so let us ignore that uh, inside that sub point okay now here six matters were there no here how many matters were there here how many matters were there six items and uh, above how many matters were there nine items total it will come to 15 items actually not 16 it is how many effectively it will how many 15 items are you getting the point it is effectively 15 items now in these 15 items this fourth point onwards is newly added. Fourth point onwards is newly added. Fourth one, fifth one, sixth one. Audit trial concept, dividend concept and the fourth one is newly added in 2021 onwards. Getting it? Now, now inside this, another important point is I point. This is regarding whether the company has adequate internal financial control with respect to financial statements in place and are they operating effectively this we don't give simply like this three lines in the actual audit report in actual audit report how do we give we gave it as an annexure b we gave a detailed report what is our responsibility who is responsible for these controls what is my responsibility what is my opinion what are the limitations i will talk very detailed about this in the actual audit report are you getting the point now this i point 143 subsection 3 clause i 143 subsection 3 clause i do not apply it will not apply for the following companies one person company auditor is exempted from reporting on this small company auditor is exempted from reporting on this i hope everyone knows that small company criteria is 4 and 40 crore it has been revised getting it capital criteria 4 crores Turnover criteria 40 crore. Now, small company means any company whose turnover is less than or equal to 40 crore, it's a small company. Getting it? And any other private limited company, any other private limited means other than these two. Other than these two companies, any other private company where turnover is not exceeding 50 crore and it's both the conditions must be satisfied loans and borrowings are not exceeding 25 crore then these private companies auditors are exempted from reporting on 143 subsection 3 clause i where nxrp will not come that's it getting the point now further further whether the remuneration paid by the company to the directors is it in accordance with the provisions of the act or not we need to check so this is a requirement under 197 197 reporting getting it which is applicable for public companies this shall also be given as part of report on legal and regulatory requirements only under report on legal and regulatory requirements this also shall be given now you see tata motors they gave it example how they presented clearly if you observe 143 subsection 3 Oh, sorry, 143 11 is given as first point. 143 subsection 3 is given as second point. Inside that, you see, part A is there. Inside that, sub points. Now, part B is what? Director's remuneration point. You see, part B. You see here, part B is given as uh, director's uh, remuneration. No, no, not that. Sorry. I think uh, they gave it as part C. They gave it as what? Part C, they gave it as director's remuneration point. That is given as part of a report on legal and regulatory requirement. They gave a positive comment here. Yes, the Tata Motors have paid remuneration to the directors which is in accordance with section 197 and the schedule 5, whatever, all that. Next. Next. So, that is one important point. That is IFC point which I have completed. Next. Now, there is a newly added point in 2021. Regarding three types of uh, transactions, regarding uh, three types of transactions, this is what predominantly happening outside nowadays. Why many entities, uh, financial institutions, uh, big big companies are defaulting, getting it? In order to uh, have, in order to monitor that, there was an additional responsibility casted upon the auditor. So, what auditor has to do? Very simple. Look at this transaction. 
you know there will be a funding party there will be a funding party there will be an intermediary there will be an intermediary there will be something called ultimate beneficiary there will be something called ultimate beneficiary okay now i am talking about j sub point 4 okay inside that sub clause 1 sub sub clause 1 are you getting the point so there is sub sub clause 2 there is another clause which is 3 so this is inside 143 sub section 3 clause j sub clause 4 sub sub clause 1 getting it so 1 2 3 3 inside this it is is getting it regarding these three points I'm talking. Inside that first point I'm talking because everybody don't understand many don't understand this at all okay so there will be a funding party there will be a funding party there is something called intermediary there is something called ultimate beneficiary you see the sentence here whether I mean you see from his no funds have been advanced loaned invested by a company to or invested in any other person including it may be foreign entity that that intermediary which may be foreign entity or indian entity directly or indirectly lend or invest in other persons or entities identified by the funding party so the ultimate person to whom this investment has to go this loan has to go is ultimate beneficiary the ultimate beneficiary is decided by funding party whom who, who will inform to whom funding party will inform intermediary that i will give you loan or i will invest in your company you give a loan to another company you invest to another company or on behalf of other companies or no give to somebody guarantee i will tell intermediary give guarantee to somebody on behalf of that in, in the, i mean that ultimate beneficiary are you getting it now tell me whenever a company has given loan advance investments made whenever a company made loans or advances and investments not normally what is the company responsibility they need to make it as per the company act provision obviously we will check whether they made as per company law provision further they have a disclosure requirement right loans the advances and all these transactions now this is a specific disclosure requirement in schedule 3 this is a specific disclosure requirement in a schedule 3 whatever the loans granted by the company during the year investments made by the company during the year advances given by the company during the year to an intermediary where the intermediary will transfer it to ultimate beneficiary or intermediary will give guarantee to a third party on behalf of the beneficiary getting the point so these types of transactions the company shall disclose specifically explicitly in the notes to accounts so company disclosed i am doing audit of tata motors the tata motors have done these kinds of transactions they disclosed it now i need to get a declaration from management what i need to get a declaration from management give dear management give me a declaration other than as disclosed in notes to accounts other than as presented or disclosed in the financial statements no funds were loaned no funds were invested no funds were advanced to an intermediary with including a foreign entity with an understanding in writing or otherwise that the intermediary shall lend or advance or invest in a party identified by the ultimate funding party or give guarantee on behalf of the ultimate beneficiary to somebody else so i need to get a declaration that i know during the year you have given some funds to intermediary that intermediary has given funds to so and so directly or indirectly you disclosed all that in notes apart from that is there any other transaction i asked management said no sir give a declaration for that that is what this first point whether management has represented whether management has represented to the best of its knowledge and belief other than disclosed in notes other than disclosed in notes no means what no transactions were there whatever is disclosed in notes only that there is no other transactions like that management shall represent which means you should get representation that's it this point is talking about get a written representation sa 580 that's it are you getting the point so you need to get a written representation from the company that wherever the company has acted as funding party where the transfer funds to intermediary where the intermediary will transfer funds to beneficiary all those transactions should be disclosed in the financial statements and company disclosed other than what they disclose is there anything else i asked company management said no give a declaration that it is no that's it
Are you clear? It is not prohibiting anything. It is not prohibiting anything or it is not permitting anything. This section is not talking about prohibition of the transaction, permission of the transaction, nothing such. If you do the transaction, disclose in notes. Whatever you disclose is that final. Suppose you disclosed 10 transactions like this. I am having a doubt that you are having 11th transaction, 12th transaction. Give me a declaration that there are no such transactions. Of course, I will carry out my audit procedure. I will observe your funds flow. I will observe your capital sources. I will observe your investments, where you are making it. Everything I will observe. Everything I will audit. In addition to that, get give me a declaration. Are you getting the point? That is the first declaration. Second declaration I need to take is, okay, first declaration, I am asking you because you are a funding party. Second declaration, have you acted as intermediary? Second declaration I need to take from the company is, have you acted as an intermediary? Suppose this company acted as an intermediary where they received funds, funds from some company, where this company, I am the auditor of intermediary, this company acted as an intermediary and they transferred that funds to another beneficiary at the dictation of the funding party. Now, all these transactions, wherever you acted as intermediary, they shall also be disclosed in notes to accounts. They shall also be disclosed in notes. Company also disclosed. Let us assume Tata Passenger Vehicle Limited. Company disclosed in the notes to accounts. Very clearly they disclosed. Other than what they disclose, is there any other transaction where you acted as intermediary? I asked the board of directors of Tata Passenger Vehicle Company. They said no other transactions, sir. 100% be disclosed. Uh, give me a declaration for that. That is the second declaration, representation, whether management has represented. Are you getting the point? Next, third one. Third one, okay, you are getting representation. Is your job done? Huh? No. You need to verify, you know, whether all the whatever representations given by management, are they correct or not? You should also check, no? So what I will do? I will check company bank statement. I will check company, you know, funds flow analysis. I will check where the company invested, where the company has, you know, how the company got sources of funds. So I will evaluate cash flow statement. I will evaluate funds flow statement. I will evaluate what are the company investment strategies, everything. I will evaluate where they invested. I will look into their, their requirements. I will look into that investment company, what they are doing. Company invested in another company, you know, what they, where they diverted, I will look at their cash flow. Able to understand. So, I will do all my procedures. When I do my audit procedures, if I get any evidence, if I get any evidence, which is conflicting the above declarations given by the management, which is conflicting with the above declarations given by the management, then I need to talk about that here. Based on the audit procedures that you considered reasonable and appropriate, Nothing has come to your notice that caused them to believe that representations given under clause number 1 to contains material misstatement. What clause number 1 to management gave representation? Dear auditor, other than whatever disclosed in notes, there are no loans, there are no advances we gave. Whatever we executed, we disclosed honestly. Nothing is omitted. That is what management gave declaration in point number 1, point number 2. But based on my procedure, I found that declarations given by management is containing material misstatement. Nothing but what declaration given by management is false then I need to talk about that in the third point are you getting the point so this is what the funding party ultimate beneficiary intermediary reporting requirement it is not about permitting the entity it is not about prohibiting it is not about rule nothing it is about a disclosure requirement where auditors shall get a representation are you clear all of you what an idea later on you read getting it and then there is another requirement whether the dividend declared by the company is paid during the year, whether dividend declared by the company is paid during the year, okay, which is in compliance of section 123. Now, there is another requirement. See, uh, when a company declares a dividend, actually, you know, uh, let me be a little more clear. You are having chapters by company audit and audit report. Now, audit report, inside the audit report, I am covering various standards which are not there in your IC metal also. Getting it because they are all have to be read in relation with auditing report. Yeah, audit reporting. Now company audit, no. The sections that we have in company audit is right from section 123 to section 130, sorry, to section 148. These are the sections we are having in the syllabus. Under company audit chapter, we are having these sections in the syllabus. 123 section 2, almost I can say 137. 123 section 2, 137. Getting it? These are all covered in my CA Inter Company Law Marathon. This is nothing but company accounts chapter. This is nothing but what? Accounts of companies chapter in corporate law CA Inter. Why I am asking people to refer that marathon is because in MTPs you say dividend calculation they will ask. 
in one of the RTP I have seen for May 22 or November 22 or December 21 RTP I have seen where they are asking you to calculate what is the average rate of dividend. In the CA final book illustration, forget about the average rate of dividend. In the CA final book, dividend concept is discussed only briefly. But RTP question is so depth. Which means you are expected in-depth knowledge on these topics also. CSR provisions, NFRA provision, dividend provisions. In all these provisions, you are supposed to have a you know above moderate clarity. Whereas in ICI book final book, no, CA final material, no, they only give basic information. They have not given clear cut full in-depth picture. Getting it? That's why again I don't ask you to read the entire CFI inter material of accounts of companies. Better watch my marathon, which is for two hours on the chapter. Getting it? I, am, I only took that particular topic. Okay, you can just go through the YouTube channel. So you can just type CA Ram Harsha Company Law Marathon. Getting the point. November 22 attempt to be uploaded. In that some 10 to 12 hours video will be there. Inside that some four hours is taken by me. So dividend timestamp will be there. Accounts of companies timestamp will be there. You just go through that. That will be enough. Clear? All of you. Next. So the don't miss this. Don't miss this. So there I spoke about dividend provisions completely. Why? Whether dividend declared by the company is it paid within the as per the provisions of 123. Dividend declared by the company shall be paid within 30 days. Within five days, company shall transfer to a separate bank account. Then it shall be transferred to the shareholder. If at all within 30 days it cannot be paid, within next seven days it should be transferred to unpaid dividend special account. What is that entire IEPF provision? All that I clearly explained. Are you getting it? Next. Now this is regarding with effect from 1st April 22-23, which means now we are going to complete the financial year 22-23. This reporting requirement will apply from 20 to 23 financially related audit reports. So practically I cannot show you this report case. Why? Because this audit trial condition is applicable from which financial year onwards? 20 to 23 onwards. Which means 20 to 23 financial year should complete. All that audit report should come. Only then we can see in real audit report this point. So what is this point? It is saying 20 to 23 onwards, every company must maintain accounting software in such a way that audit trial feature is available. What is audit trial feature? When the end, when the transaction is entered, when the transaction is modified, when the transaction, what is the final version of the transaction? We can see entire trial. Are you getting the point? Trial means what? Where they evaluate in depth, able to understand. Now you see, in uh, uh, suppose you open suppose you see in uh, youtube or in uh, facebook or anywhere if you put a comment and edit the comment edit history will be visible what is the original comment made by you what is the second comment what is the third comment unless you delete the entire comment correct uh, so edit history is visible no that is nothing but audit trial that is nothing but what audit trial so same way in companies no at the time of entering the transaction nobody will do the fraud after transaction got entered the books of accounts people manipulate Manipulate the records, able to understand. Because most of the transactions are happening in the front end. Frauds will happen in the back end records. Getting it? So, what is in the front end? What happened ultimately in the back end? We want to see what are the changes made during the year. And that changes are visible through audit trial feature. So, that is what this concept is about. Are you clear? Next. Confident. Getting an idea? Next. Now this is 143 important points. Now in CARO, in CARO also I will be covering some 10 to 15 clauses only which are important. Okay, some which are very easy I will not cover. Where you can read and understand simply I will not cover. Okay, next. Just one minute gap. So now let's continue. 143 subsection 11 requirement, CARO, where we have to re report on 21 various aspects. 
getting it in caro like in caro i always have this uh, favorite question everybody you know they remember all the 21 clauses how to remember all the 21 clauses in which attempt they asked this in which attempt they asked you to report up 20 what are the 21 clauses for this there will be a cheat code also how to remember 21 clauses salman khan hit uh, so and so like this cheat codes yes or no have you seen this mnemonic codes some kind of stupid codes how to remember all the 21 clauses where f letter will be remembered and uh, you know inventory point all these initial letters they will they will, they will identify and they will make some code out of it and they will spend one hour on how to understand that code ignoring actual caro yes or no this is not what expected in exam what they will expect you look at uh, november paper or may attempt paper in one of the paper they asked you reporting requirement about revaluation and disclosure of vinami transactions this is what they asked in exam student only knows what is the heading of the caro but doesn't know inside the matter but what is tested in exam is inside matter. Getting the point. They asked in May attempt or November attempt. Somewhere in the last two, three attempts, one question was right about reporting requirement of the auditor in relation to revaluation of fixed assets and binami transactions disclosures as per CARO 2020. This is what they asked in exam for four or five marks question. How will you write? When you read only the heading, only when you read the side headings like this, how will you write the inside matter? So that is what you need to understand. Are you getting the point? So let us discuss briefly what auditor has to report. Remember, all these are reporting requirements by auditor. Auditor has to report on all these matters. Getting it? Now, so fixed asset register. Whether the company is maintaining proper records. We are asking, the company's act is asking, dear auditor, you have verified, you went to the company. Tell me whether the company is maintaining proper records of fixed assets regarding quantity of PPE, situation of PPU, where the asset is installed, how many assets the company has, details about the full fledged assets like that. A fixed asset register, is it maintained by the company? I know. You gave opinion about financial statements are true and fair, which means the fixed assets value is true and fair. I am not talking about that. I am talking about the register maintained by the company. company. Fixed asset register is an internal control document. Yes or no? Are you getting it? So is the company maintaining register? The CARO is asking. You need to check and report. Yes, company is maintaining proper fixed asset register. You see the Tata Motors audit report. They have given a positive comment here. The company has maintained proper records showing Full, full particulars including quantitative details and situation of the property, plant and equipment. Next. Now, second question. Companies Act is asking. The central government is asking the auditor. Dear auditor, you went to the company. Is the company physically verifying? Is the company whether the fixed assets are physically verified by management at reasonable interval? Whether fixed assets are physically verified by the management at reasonable interval. Tata Motors verified fixed assets once in three years. What is that? Over a period of three years, they will physically verify. Because look at the size of the company, size of number of assets. Sir. Having considering the internal controls. In big, big companies, you can't take one asset outside without authorization. Because there will be complete security protocol will be there. Physical, physical access controls will be there. So it is impossible for anybody to take an asset outside the company premises able to understand unless there is an express authorization getting it so now these tata motors and all they will be having a regular physical verification program you you go to tata motors you go to infosys you go to tcs any company you go today somewhere at some location of tcs fixed assets physical verification is going on getting it now every day every year it will be kept on going now like so this podium is verified today again this podium will be physically verified by the management after three years able to understand so in the meantime what they'll be doing they will be verifying so many other assets physically and then coming here are you getting the point like that tata motors is having a physical verification plan over a period of three years according to the auditor's point of view it is reasonable okay uh, here they will mention having regard you know the periodicity of physical verification is reasonable having regard to size and nature of the assets. Looking at the nature of the assets and size of the company, this three years program is reasonable. That is what the CARO is asking whether the fixed assets are physically verified by the management at reasonable interval. Do you think it is reasonable? Suppose this is the only room I have fixed assets. What is reasonable interval? Every day I have to count. Are you getting the point? What's wrong? If the, if the uh, fixed assets are spread across multiple locations, multiple units, uh, multiple geographical locations, so many assets were there, then in such a case, re and look at the controls. See, when the assets are located at so many levels, control systems will also be implemented. Able to understand. Next. Now, there is another requirement. Now, you, you saw physical verification reports, right? In the reports, have you found any material discrepancy? 
Have you found any material discrepancy? Like in physical verification, you will find excess or shortage. Okay. In management physical count records, no, I found excess and shortage. For all that, explanations are given by management. Resolving documents were there. See how they were dealt in the books of accounts. This is what, if any discrepancies were no, noticed, how the same were dealt in the books of accounts. Are you getting the point? Next, what is the third reporting requirement? Third reporting requirement inside fixed assets, the first clause, inside first clause, sub point 3 is immovable property. Whether the title of immovable property is it in the name of the company. Companies having immovable property, you know, in the property, plant and equipment, they showed immovable property, land and buildings, so and so. This land and buildings is two types, leasehold, freehold. Freehold means my own purchased. Leasehold means financial lease, not operating lease, correct? Huh? So, whether the land and buildings are in the name of the company, immovable property are in the name of the company, if the company land and buildings, they are not in the name of the company, provide the details. What is the property where it is not registered in the name of the company? What is the carrying value in the fixed assets? What, who, in whose name it is held? Why it is not held in the name of the company? Auditor has to give specifically reasons. You see, in Tata Motors, there is one situation, I think so. Okay, so the title deeds of immobile properties disclosed in the standalone financials are held in the name of the company other than immobile property where the company is the lessee and the lease agreement are executed in favor of the lessee. Are you getting the point? Next, revaluation. Like this is what uh, companies having some fixed assets, getting it. Where uh, uh, I mean, company has taken some finance in these assets regarding that exception they have given. In Reliance, you know, they will show you some 75 crore or 80 crore worth of property is not yet registered in the name of the company. As on 31st March, it is not registered. Registration proceeding is pending. It is going on. As on 31st March, it is not in the name of the company. They will give you exception clearly. Next, revaluation. They are asking you revaluation related reporting. Now, dear auditor, you have seen the company. You know what, what the company has done related to fixed assets. Now, during the year, company revalued its PBE. Getting it, including right of use assets, nothing but lease assets. Lease assets can also be revalued. Lease assets also impairment standard apply, correct? So, in respect of lease assets as well as own assets or intangible assets, whether company has done revaluation, if so, if at all company did, who did the revaluation? Is it by registered value or who did the revaluation? Come, we want to know. If, if the revaluation is done, it should be by registered value, correct? So, if at all other than registered value performs, you need to qualify here. The company has went for revaluation of certain property, plant and equipment and intangible assets and the valuation was performed by other than registered value. You need to mention that clearly. And what is the amount of the change? If the change is 10% or more in the aggregate of net carrying value of each class of property, plant and equipment, what is the change in revaluation? 10% or more in aggregate of the net carrying value of each class of property, plant and equipment. So what does it mean exactly? Suppose, you know, property, plant and equipment means a big head. So, buildings, plant and machinery, furniture, like that it is there, no? Suppose I will take buildings. Building is one class. Plant and machinery is one class. Furniture is one class. Now, inside this plant and machinery, so many will be there. But we need to see aggregate only. We cannot see, uh, we cannot see aggregate means not entire BBA. Aggregate means each class related aggregated figure. Are you getting the point? Now, plant and machinery was revalued during the year. Before revaluation, what is the value? After revaluation, total value of plant and machinery check out. What is the percentage variation? If the percentage variation is 10% or more, auditor has to specify that. Are you getting the point? That's about fixed assets major part. Now, disclosure of any binami transaction. Whether any proceedings were initiated against the company or pending against the company under the binami transactions act and rules. If so, whether the company disclosed them in the financial statements. This is a schedule 3 requirement. Any binami transactions initiated or pending against the company, they shall be disclosed in the schedule 3. Now, auditor has to check, is it done or not? If any binami transaction proceedings are initiated against the company or pending against the company, company has to disclose. I will check disclosure in the notes. Yes, company disclosed. We will say that it is disclosed. Are you getting the point? Understood fixed assets point. What? Fine. Next, inventory. Inventory. What is the two points were asked in inventory? One is physical verification. Another one is working capital loan related. This working capital loan related was asked for 5 marks question in May 22 or December 21 attempt. Getting it. In one of the attempt in the past three, they have, they have specifically tested on this. They have specifically tested on this. Now, only the second point is tested. That was a practical question they tested. They gave a balance sheet. They gave uh, stock statements filed with the bank. 
that both they have you have to compare and write a reporting requirement on this this is a question which is asked in exam and this is how mcq questions also be framed are you getting it now you see what is actual reporting requirement first one is they are asking whether physical verification of inventory has been conducted at reasonable interval by the management so you need to check whether management is doing physical verif physical verification of inventory see inventory physical verification frequency is more frequency than fixed assets because fixed assets are stable constant there will not be inflow outflow inflow outflow whereas inventory continuous movement may be there that's why more frequently we need to verify ideally inventory shall be verified once in a year must even in sa 501 there is a condition auditor must attend physical inventory counting performed by the management if at all physical inventory counting is impracticable or company is not performing physical inventory counting or you are not allowed to do physical inventory counting you have to modify the opinion as per sa 501 yes or no what is sa 501 specific considerations for selected items one of the selected item is inventory with inventory what you need to understand existence and condition of inventory what you need to understand the existence and condition of inventory you need to get evidence i'll discuss when i come when i start the actual standard next now if any discrepancy of 10 percent or more if any discrepancy of 10 percent or more in fixed assets no physical verification no they use the word material discrepancy here they use the 10 percent or more simple here they quantified there they did not quantify that's the only difference are you getting the point? So, in fixed assets also, material means what? 10% logic you can apply happily. Able to understand. So, if any 10% or more in aggregate class of each class of inventory, each class of inventory means what? There are three classes of inventory. Raw material, work in progress and finished goods. There are three classes of inventories. In respect of each class, in physical verification, we found shortage or excess. That excess or shortage is 10% or more of that particular class. Then auditor has to uh, check whether how they were dealt in the books of accounts, how they were dealt in the books of accounts. Generally, nowadays, companies are following integrated enterprise ERP softwares where this kind of discrepancy will not come at all. Very, very, very rare. Are you getting it? Next, working capital. What is this point? Whether during any point of time during the year, the company has been sanctioned working capital limits in excess of 5 crore rupees working capital limit in excess of 5 crore rupee remember it is about sanctioned limit it is not company how much withdrawn sanctioned limit and drawing power both are different drawing power means how much company withdraw how much company can withdraw sanctioned limit means how much company is eligible for sanction sanctioned limit will be given based on your repayment capacity drawing power will be fixed based on the security value are you getting the point? Suppose, I know you can repay 10 crore. I will give sanction limit for 10 crore. But you gave me security. First you have to give me security. Only then I will disperse the loan. You gave me security. 7 crores value of security. I will give 30-40% margin. Balance amount all I will give you as a loan. So I will give you only 5 crore worth of loan for dispersal. So sanction limit is 10 crore. But drawing power is 5 crore for you. Are you getting the point? So here what is important? Sanction limit. In exam they will twist like this in MCQ. Drawing power is this much. Sanction limit is this much. Company argued that since the drawing power is less than 5 crore this reporting requirement will not apply accordingly financial statement they didn't disclose this they will argue like this you have to modify the opinion first of all this is a requirement in schedule 3 this is a requirement in schedule 3 like what is what is it here if the company got sanctioned limit for working capital loan aggregately from all banks and FIs put together for more than 5 crore if the company has got working capital sanction Suppose I have a sanction of working capital loan from ICIC for 2 crore, from HDFC from some 2 crore, from Kotak Mahindra Bank from some 2 crore. Now all put together how much is sanctioned on my name, on my company name more than 5 crore. How much I withdrawn doesn't matter. How much is sanctioned only? Important. Yes, then this clause apply. Now what is reporting requirement? What auditor has to report? The second one what auditor has to report? Whether quarterly returns I can also say periodical returns is most accurate word rather than quarterly return. I can use the word periodical returns. Whether quarterly returns or statements filed by the company with those banks and FIs are in agreement with the books of accounts of the company. If not, give the details. Many of you might have done stock projections. 
some of you might have done stock statements stock audit projections for submitting to the bank after submitting that stock audit report after submitting that stock statements signed by the chartered accountant the bank will fix the drawing power what many companies are doing you know example tata motors as per books of accounts no as per books of accounts on a 30th september second quarter ending as on second quarter ending tata motor books of accounts is showing 1000 crore worth of stock but our accountants will do 1200 crore reporting getting it why our accountant will give a report like this and sign it also of course yeah, that is not valid but he will give 1200 crore certification now tata motor management will go and submit to the bank see we have 1200 crore worth of stock security given 1200 crore worth of stock now tata motor will give drawing power 1000 crore some 20 percent margin actual stock is what as per books 1000 getting it logically how much drawing power you should get 800 but by giving false documents you are getting 200 crore excess drawing power if you repay it is fine what if tomorrow you do not repay if investigation is carried out the stock statements submitted by you were wrong fraud able to understand it's a financial fraud it's a willful defaulter concept will apply again here are you getting the point now you see Tata Motors auditor gave a smooth comment you see this you see this almost all the banks were given under exception okay now the, you see according to the information explanation given to us based on our examination of records of the company the company has been sanctioned working capital limit in excess of 5 crore rupees in aggregate from banks and FIs on the basis of security of current assets means the clause is applicable now auditor has to give his opinion in our opinion the quarterly returns quarterly statements filed by the company with those banks and FIs are in agreement with the books of accounts it's a positive comment yes or no now except they use the exception in exception one or two should be there all the banks are listed here you see except except quarterly statements filed for 30 june first quarter filed for 30 september second quarter filed for third september 31st december third quarter fourth quarter they will they will give a test last getting it so all the three quarters related stock statements filed with the state bank of india hdfc bank cd bank bank of america icici standard chartered union bank kotak mahindra bank bank of baroda almost all the banks came no all the private sector banks yes or no because many companies take loans from private sector banks only getting it where differences were noted between books and books of accounts for the respective quarters and the amounts reported in the statement almost for all the three quarters with all the banks whatever stock statements you filed they were having difference with books of accounts which means you should give negative report on this what auditors cleverly did everything is magic except they used exception which is actually wrong morally wrong getting it now the differences were 689 crore 490 crore 758 crore okay and uh, here there is some other amounts uh, uh, like 44 crore so various differences getting it now you know what is the twist these statements were subsequently rectified after 31st March and submitted to the respective bank. First you did mistake, then you rectified the mistake. So auditors are cleverly giving positive opinion here where they need to qualify. Instead of qualifying, they just mentioned, a actually they need to give an adverse remark on this. But they gave a qualified remark. Yes or no? They said everything is fine except this. Actually everything is not fine predominantly. Are you getting the point? That's it. So, in, in examination for May 22 or December 21 paper, they gave exactly the same question. What is the reporting requirement of the auditor? What is the disclosure requirement in the financial? So, one is two marks, another one is three marks. Five marks question is actually. So, first of all, every company shall disclose in the financial statements as per Schedule 3. If the company got a sanctioned limit for more than 5 crore, the company has to give a reconciliation statement. What is the stock value as per books of accounts? What is the stock value as per the statements filed? What is the difference? What is the reason behind the difference? This has to be disclosed by the company in the financial statements. The same has to be verified by the auditor and reporting CARO. Are you getting the point? This question is tested in May 22 or December 21. Are you getting it? All of you. That's it. Next. Are you clear? Next. Another half an hour, 40 minutes, we'll close this chapter. Okay? Just one minute.
getting now you are getting now what you read and what is expected correct huh? it's like a misstatement definition what is expected from you what is reported in your mind correct huh? so investment guarantee security loan regarding this point so see by the way this point is not applicable this point is not applicable to the company whose principal business is to give loans like which companies uh, lending companies like nbfcs getting it nbfc audit also chapter also there is a reporting requirement on this getting it like uh, there is a company called investment credit company icc this point is do not apply, do not applicable mutual finance this point do not apply because they are all companies which where principal business is lending for them this point do not apply only for those companies whose principal business is not lending but are lending getting the point lending to whom intra corporate loans like that okay now whether the company during the year has provided loans or provided advances in the nature of loans stood guarantee or provided security to any other entity if so if so see these side headings are added by me for convenience sake okay all so we need to go break up how much is given to related party how much is given to unrelated party actually related party means not all the related parties only three are covered okay subsidiaries joint ventures and associates how much of the loan is given by the company during the year to subsidiary joint venture and associates and what is the outstanding amount at the year end getting it see what is the reporting requirement the auditor has to report the auditor has to report what is the aggregate amount during the year given and what is the balance outstanding at the balance sheet date with respect to loans advances given security all the two subsidiary joint venture and associates same way what is the aggregate amount given during the year what is balance outstanding to other people other than subsidiary joint venture and associates if the company has given any loan if the company has given any advance if the company made any investment if the company has given any guarantee to how much is given to subsidiary associate joint venture and what is outstanding amount as on 31st march how much is given to others other than subsidiary other than joint venture other than associate what is outstanding with them as on 31st march look at the tata motors reporting requirement they clearly mentioned they clearly mentioned so tata motors how much loans are given how much advances in the nature of loans are given guarantee point is not there because tata motors have not given any guarantee that's why guarantee list is not given okay now what is the aggregate amount given to subsidiaries how much 110 crores others how much 18 crores what is outstanding amount to subsidiaries as on 31st march 619 crores to others how much is outstanding 32 how much advance in the nature of loan is given 61 crore advance in the nature of loan means what you know example i gave a supplier advance the previous supply the raw material in time now it will turn into a loan are you getting the point you see in normally credit period will be allowed no to a customer suppose i sold goods to customer 60 days credit period after 60 days we will put a clause 2% interest will be charged per month after 60 days after 61st day onwards it's an actually advance in the nature of loan are you getting the point next next now so okay company has given loans and advances to subsidiary joint venture associates and to others like that it is fine good okay we have we, we, we have to show the breakup now what are the terms and conditions based on which these loans were given auditor has to check terms and conditions are they reasonable to the company's interest or not reasonable means what not prejudicial not prejudicial means not harmful not unfavorable favorable terms reasonable terms are you getting the point suppose company articles of association says whenever a company is giving loan they have to charge 12 percent simple interest suppose i gave a loan to one subsidy where interest rate is four percent only this is prejudicial against the company are you getting the point next step now third point okay you gave loan to subsidiary terms and conditions are good are they repaying regularly third point the third condition are they repaying regularly whether the repayment of principal is it regular regular means what within due date regular means what within due date you fix the installment schedule you fix the repayment schedule as per the repayment schedule on so and so date every month they need to pay either interest they need to pay either principal or both getting it is are they repaying regularly as per the repayment schedule next suppose if any of them have not repaid and if the repayment is overdue for more than 90 days similar to banking norms they took 90 days now banking norm they took yes or no whether reasonable steps have been taken by the company for recovery what steps company has taken to recover suppose company gave employee advances which is outstanding for more than 90 days he has to pay but it's overdue for more than 90 days he left more over this employee left long back this company three months back so but some amount is still pending from the employee what company steps is taking so, suppose if this kind of advance is there no we need to tell yeah company has appointed recovery agent so the recovery agent is recovering the money like that we will give a disclosure able to understand finally suppose 
whether whether any loan or advance which is due in the current year which is fallen due in the current year has it been renewed has it been extended or a fresh loan is granted to settle the overdue of existing loan whether the company has entered into rescheduling arrangement with any of the borrowers to whom the company lent money getting the point how much again this point is not applicable this clause is not applicable for uh, you know companies whose principal business is to give loans getting it now the the, the auditor has to specifically check whether the company has renewed any loan application renewed means what suppose there is a due date has already fallen due the, the other party has not paid already loan agreement expired but what we did you know we renewed this agreement with fresh terms and conditions that's called renewal or loan agreement is still valid due date is today but he did not pay we extended him the credit period so that is extension fresh loan is granted what we did is cleverly close this loan okay i'll give funds to you repay me and then again i'll give you funds to you able to understand so that is now what is the total amount of these renewed loans what is the total amount of these renewed loans what is their percentage to the total loans given by the company during their company again during their 1000 crore loan out of them 10 crore loan is renewed loans which means 1% is the renewed loans are you getting the point next one did the company give any demand loans or any loan was given where there is no repayment period is specified or a loan is given demand loan or call loan we call it as loans given at call and short notice in banking terminology they call it as loans given at call and money at call and short notice able to understand so in a company if the company has granted any loans and advances which are repayable on demand when i demand the other party has to pay or i did not specify any term of repayment there is no repayment tenure just like that i gave a loan loan agreement ended no re repayment clause is empty are you getting the point so if any that kind of loan is there what is the total amount of these kinds of loans what is their percentage to the total loans company has granted during the year totally 1000 crore like this 100 crore so 10% of the total loans given by the company during the year are repayable on demand or repayable without any tenure are you getting the point next what is the total amount of loans out of this granted to promoters and related parties how much is granted to promoters and related parties auditor has to specify clear next fourth fifth points are very easy sixth point is very easy next one seventh point statutory dues what is it statutory dues statutory dues means what any dues payable because of a statutory authority compulsion getting it because of a compulsory requirement under any law or regulation for the time being in force if you have to pay any dues that is called a statutory due example uh, provident fund income esi income tax service tax any other statutory due gst customs duty property taxes getting it provident fund gratuity fund um, pay funded gratuities in case of getting it all these are statutory dues now what is the requirement related to statutory dues the caro Seventh clause requires statutory dues shall be classified into two types. One is undisputed due, another one is disputed due. On this, there is an RTP question. I'll I'll show you once. You will understand better how questions will be twisted. Okay. Undisputed due and disputed due. First of all, what is a disputed due? Suppose I have to pay tax every year, and this year also I paid tax. But income tax department has sent me 144 best judgment assessment notice. Inside that notice, they are asking me to pay another 10 crore income tax. Based on their records, I have paid lesser tax by 10 crore. As per their records, their information, their sources. So they sent me a demand notice against me for 10 crores. Now, why should I pay? Just because income tax demand, should I pay? So I went for appeal. So I went to CIT appeals against the assessing officer who raised a demand notice under 144 against me. Now the case is pending before Commissioner of Income Tax Appeals, you know, section and in that forum. Okay. Now this due is called disputed due because there is a due from the there is a demand due against me by the statute authority but i did not agree to it i raised a dispute on this this is called a disputed due yes or no now what is disputed due reporting requirement for the auditor very simple you if any dues if any dues which are not deposited on account of any dispute due not deposited means what demand money you did not pay but you deposited for filing appeal some security deposit that is different that is called security deposit. See, if you have to file an appeal, 20% of the demand notice you have to pay deposit. 
If you want to go IT, IT, again, IT, IT, 100% of the deposit you have to, 100% of the demand have to be deposited and then go with IT, IT. If you want the case, you will get refund along with the interest. If you lose the case, the amount will be settled by the department. Simple. Are you getting the point? So that is, that deposit is different. Here it is what? Any due not deposited. Why you have not deposited? Because you didn't agree. Getting it. Now what auditor has to, what is the amount in the dispute? Forum where the dispute is pending. You see Tata Motors clearly presented that. See, these are the disputed cases. These are the disputed use of Tata Motors. These are the disputed under income tax law. Under income tax law, they have some these many disputes belonging to these many assessment years. CID, IT, IT, High Court, Ex Central Excise at High Court, SESTAT. Okay. And here finance, service tax, same way, some GST. Okay. GST appellate tribunal, appellate authority. So, in, these are the dues which are pending against the Tata Motors, where the cases are pending belonging to various finance layers at various forums. Forums means what? Supreme Court, High Court and the Tribunal, respect to Authority Tribunal and the Commissioners, all that, able to understand. So, this is just a disclosure requirement. Auditor, you are not supposed to give, will the company win the case or lose the case, nothing. You just have to give information. Seventh clause, subpoint to disputed dues, auditor has to just give information. Now, here, there is one point. Here, there will be no point in actual book. Mere representation before an authority does not constitute dispute. Have you seen this point? Suppose, no, assessing officer has a called for books of accounts. Getting it? There is a 142 notice given by the assessing officer or 143 subsection 2 notice given by the assessing officer under income tax law where they called for scrutiny and company, they appointed me because as a representative. So, I went and representing the depart department on behalf of the company. Is there any dispute here? Only when the demand is finalized, issued against me, dispute starts. Just because I am representing to the department does not constitute a dispute. Are you getting the point? Now, now, what is undisputed? Undisputed means what? Every one of us know, provident fund we have to deduct every month from the employee and our contribution, employer contribution shall be paid by next month, 10th or 20th date. ESI, same. Uh, TDS, every month we have to deduct TDS and pay by next month, 7th. And we have to uh, pay GST by next month, 20th. Like that, every month there are some taxes, duties, uh, you know, statutory payments which we have to pay voluntarily before due date. Are you getting the point? Now, regarding these dues which you have to pay periodically, voluntarily, those dues are called as undisputed. Tell me, you are every month deducting TDS and paying to the department. Is it because of department notice? You are voluntarily paying so that you will not receive a notice. Correct? So, provenance on ESI, tax, all this you are paying every month voluntarily. These dues are called as undisputed. It's a due for you. And moreover, there is no dispute on this. This is a due. Voluntarily, you have to figure out and pay to the department. Now, what is the auditor's question here? Whether the company is depo depositing with the respective authorities undisputed statutory dues regularly. What is the question? Whether the company is depositing with the respective statutory authorities the undisputed dues regularly. Regularly means what? Within the due date. Suppose, if not, suppose with a with, uh, GST department, we did not pay one month related GST return. Per particular month, we didn't pay GST amount correctly. What is the arrears? What is the arrears? Which are outstanding as on last day means 31st March for a period of already six months crossed. Suppose I saw the balance sheet of the company, liability side, 31st March, GST payable, some 10 crore is there. When I look at the breakup, no, some 1 crore amount is there which is due in August month. March month came already, 6 months crossed, 1 crore worth of GST which the company has to pay in August month, still they have not paid, already this is an arrear which is outstanding for more than 6 months, that 1 crore I have to report here, are you getting the point, this 1 crore we have to report here, are you clear, that's it, now on this no, there is a question asked in MT, sorry RTP, I will show you, this is how case study questions and all will come, this is how practical questions will come, I will see whether it is there or not. I think in, the, in my regular class also I spoke about this. You see this. This is the question which is asked for uh, November 22 RTP. Now, while auditing with respect to complaints with Karu, Mr. Om Prakash for reporting purpose observed the following. What is it? Okay, pair of three, clause number seven means disputed use related one. Provident fund 1.5 lakh is undisputed. 
Okay, originally when it is payable 24th September, when it is paid 27th March, which means as on 31st March, is it outstanding? No. First of all, without that, let us read the entire question and then we will come back. So, some amounts, so they have given some dues, so and so due date, actual payment date, all that they have given. Also, a representation was made to GST department for penalty waiver for 1 lakh. It's a representation. A representation to the department do not constitute a dispute. So, accordingly, will that require any reporting under CARO? No. Okay. What total amount of the statutory dues need to be reported by auditor under the CARO? What is the total amount shall be reported? This is what they asked. Correct? Huh? Now, you see. This is relating to disputed due. This is income tax demand for assessment year 1920, 18th October. Is, the, is it paid? Not paid. Moreover, whether this is pending against the forum or not, they have not given information. They have not given information. So, since it is not pending against the forum, I will consider this as still undisputed only. There is a demand against the company. Company did not go for dispute yet. See, dispute means what? You, you, you gave a demand notice and I went and filed a case against you. Then it is called disputed due. Are you getting the point? Dispute means there must be forum. Where it is pending? Commissioner, Edna, IT and yeah, high quota, where it is pending, you must give that information. So this is undisputed due. That's why you see here itself they gave undisputed dues already. All these points are undisputed dues. They just gave the heading. You need not misinterpret also. Suppose if at all they gave here, it is pending at forum, then this heading we need to ignore, this point we need to consider. I am just telling you how a different way a question can be tested. Now, so next, customs duty some 65 lakhs is pending which is outstanding on 20th September and paid on 10th April. GST 2.45 lakh, 23rd October it was originally due and 24th April. Now, disputed dues information we need to give but that information they have not given. All the information given was undisputed due. If the company paid within the, uh, is the company paid regularly or not? Not regular. We just have to mention not regular. How much amount to be reported for not regular? That is not, that is not, I mean, that is not discussed in CARO. What is the second point? What is the extent of outstanding areas? As on last day, for more than six months already, that has to be reported. So as on 31st March, whatever dues were outstanding, for more than six months, we should report, correct? Now, this is paid in 27th March itself. So it is not outstanding as on 31st March. Now, 24th April it is paid means 31st March 2022 it is outstanding. Now should I report it in clause 7 undisputed to second point is a question. Where, where we need to report only if it is outstanding by 31st March for more than 6 months. It is it is originally due on when? Ah, 23rd October to 31st March what is the duration? Less than 6 months. It is not extra areas outstanding for more than 6 months. So this also will not come. Are you getting the point? This also will not come. Now you see. Customs duty, G65 lakhs, which is outstanding as on 20 September, paid on 10th April, which means as on 31st March, it is outstanding for more than 6 months. Are you getting it? So, this has to be reported. Next one, income tax demand, 55, uh, sorry, uh, 55,000 rupees. Yes or no, 55,000 rupees demand notice against the company on 18th October. Company not yet filed a dispute. As on 31st March, it is outstanding, but less than six months so reporting will not come the answer is 65000 accordingly the answer is 65000 this is how see you can you imagine this in depth question like this will be tested on caro this is only will come in exam this is how mcqs will be framed so you have to be very particular when you are reading every line you have to be very particular are you clear you know we have various chapters right we have various chapters right like we have chapters like uh, you know company audit audit report standards Audit committee, okay, ethics, peer review and quality review, bank audit, bank audit, from these chapters, the level of expertise is high. From you, the institute is expecting higher level of expertise. Are you getting the point? Whereas these chapters, insurance audit, NBFC audit, uh, I am internal management operation audit, due diligence, investigation, forensic audit, getting it. From all these three, institute is expecting you moderate or less than moderate ex expertise. You need not be expert in all these chapters. That's why the information given in these chapters is not in depth. Are you getting it? By the way, again, one more, one more chapter, CFS audit. CFS audit, risk assessment and internal control. So these are all the list, automated environment. 
in all these chapters expectation from you is very high you need to be perfect that's why mcqs of these chapters were also tough whereas all these chapters you see you will find basic level mcqs only getting it even the discussion in the book is also very basic level they don't do advanced discussions very basic level discussions only because that is what expected from you even physical laws is there right physical law is also moderate expectation only not high level so who will remember all the class numbers correct huh? next so are you clear all of you next one more important clause default in repayment of dues default in repayment of dues whether the company has defaulted in repayment of borrowings of loan borrowings of loan to an fi bank or debenture holder or government if so lender wise default like what are the points you need to give what is the nature of borrowing working capital loan who is the name of the lender you know kotak mahindra bank amount not paid on due date 10 crore interest or principal it's a both delay number of days 60 days it's already delay remarks so a company is uh, uh, you know searching for alternative funds and then will repay in the next one or two months after balance sheet date this is what we need to report next we is the company declared as a willful defaulter by any bank tata motors they said no the company has not been declared as a willful defaulter by any bank next i think willful defaulter concept and all come in money laundering no in money laundering provisions and all willful defaulter concept all that will come binami transactions money laundering in all these cases willful defaulter concept comes willful defaulter means what i have money but i am not paying are you getting the point or i submitted to the bank fraudulent documents and obtained a loan then i defaulted then also i will be treated as what willful defaulter next now next one have you applied for any term loans for the purpose for which the loans were obtained for what purpose you obtained the term loan for what purpose you applied getting it so nothing but for what purpose you got this loan and for what purpose you utilized this loan if not so the caro is asking whether the loan term loans are applied for the same purpose for which they were raised if not the amount of loan so diverted purpose for which it is used shall be reported able to understand see this is what uh, like i told no uh, 143 subsection 3 management representation points funding party intermediary beneficiary abg shipping yard case which is the latest case on the 2022 fraud it's a fraud happened in 2022 year abg shipping yard case where they diverted funds they raised loans they raised money and diverted the funds are you getting it whether any short term loan applied for long term purpose have you taken any short term loan and are applying for long term purpose this will be a severe liquidity crisis this will bring severe liquidity crisis have you taken any loan to meet subsidiary company needs have you taken any loan to meet any subsidiary company needs so you have taken a loan and transfer into subsidiary companies so all those you have to report and next one you have taken a loan for which you pledged securities what you pledged securities whose securities remember my own securities i cannot pledge 77 company is prohibited to pledge its own securities company is prohibited to buy its own securities whose securities i pledged with the bank i have shares in my subsidiary companies no that's an investment no it has a market value you no know, i pledged this. this is what adani did this is what edenberg report highlighted getting it what adani is doing they are accepting big big mega projects naturally the share price went up in the stock market and those shares they kept with the bank and uh, kept it secured and brought a loan again that loan used and buy another company again get a government project on the name of that company again that company share prices increases again those shares kept with the bank and get a loan think of this this is a big chain of transactions they did of course they didn't any they didn't do any default here we need to report if there is a default here we need to report if there is a default what edenberg report highlighted is if this is a kind of uh, stock manipulation you do why they use the word stock manipulation is you are investing in one small company which where there is no operations at all getting a government project and suddenly the company's market price is increasing and increased market value shares your security you are keeping as secured with the bank and getting loan again buying another company and getting a project on the name if you are keep on going like this suddenly one day if something went wrong what happens to all the shares what happens to the lenders what happens to the economy this is what they questioned they didn't question adani did fraud they didn't say adani did all that it is a kind of manipulation of books sir. are you getting the point this is a manipulation of stock prices why suddenly within 2 years 2 lakh crore to 20 lakh crore market capitalization happens able to understand this is what the question 
Next, so whether company has raised any loans on pledge of securities held in subsidiary associate joint venture, you have a subsidiary associate joint venture inside them, you have shares, getting it. Have you taken any loan against these shares? If there is a default, auditor has to report what happens if I default in respect of shares I pledged in a company. No, what happens is I will lose my holding company position. If I default, bank will assume the right. Correct? Huh? Next, 10th one, end use of funds raised. Whether the company has raised any funds from IPO, FPO, for what purpose it is raised, for what purpose it is utilized. Section 34, 35 of the Companies Act clearly says, if funds are raised for one purpose as mentioned in the prospectus document of the company, were utilized for some other purpose, civil liability will attract. If it is an intentional fraudulent purpose, then criminal liability will attract. For 447 punishment will apply. Yes or no? If not, Details of the default, delay, subsequent rectification shall be reported. Default means what? I raised for expansion purpose. I paid for salary. That's a default. Or I raised for expansion in the next year. Getting it. But I have not utilized yet. Funds were idle. That's delay. Suppose I paid salaries, no? Yes or no? I defaulted, no? In the utilization. Later I got money from some customer. And I went and invested in the original project. Whatever the purpose. Subsequent rectification. That is called as what? Subsequent rectification. Even if you rectify subsequently, auditor has to report. Primarily you defaulted. First understand. Just because you subsequently rectify, doesn't mean you didn't default. Clear? Hey, what? You all read no? Care, oh? You are getting that out, right? Next. Preferential allotment. Whether company has made any preferential allotment or private placement of shares during the year. If so, section 42 provisions we need to check and for what purpose amount is raised, for what purpose amount is utilized. Example, Reliance has done private placement from Facebook. Reliance has got private placement from various foreign companies. In Geo, they sold 10% stake to Facebook and then got ownership. You know that? There's, there, there is a deal happened between Reliance and Facebook in 2021. 10% stake has been sold. 44,000 crore they received. Getting it? So, this is called private placement. We call it as what? Private placement. Yes, bank went for private placement before it became default. Now, if not, provide the details of amount involved in non-compliance. Next. Reporting of frauds. Reporting of frauds. Whether any fraud by the company, <coughs> whether any fraud on the company, any fraud committed by the company means it may be on the employees or it may be on the outsiders. Any fraud committed on the company means this is also this is also uh, uh, by, uh, by third parties on the company or by officers or employees on the company. So a company may do fraud on outsiders or employees or a, or employee may do fraud on the company or outsider may do fraud on the company. Now, what is auditor reporting requirement? Whether any fraud by the company, whether there any fraud on the company, notice not reported, which means we need to only look at the frauds identified by the management already. Getting the point? Frauds which are identified by the management already, you need not identify any fraud. This is, this is our list of frauds identified by the management already. So, that list we need to report. If yes, nature and amount of fraud, Tata Motors have reported this. Tata Motors have reported this. You see here. During the course of our examination, according to the explanation given to us, we have been informed about three incidents estimated for an amount of 15 crore involving three employees who in collusion with certain vendors processed payments with inadequate documentation. It's a purchase fraud. Procurements fraud. The services of these employees were terminated. What you need to tell here? So, what is the nature of the fraud? Amount involved has to be indicated. Nature of the fraud, procurements related, they mentioned. Amount involved, 15. What action they have taken also reported? Yes or no? Next. Whether any report under 143 subsection 12 is filed by the auditors in ADT 4, there is a, there is a section 143 subsection 12 where if the fraud is less than 1 crore, if the fraud is more than or equal to 1 crore, if the fraud is less than 1 crore, more than or equal to 1 crore, this has to be reported to central government within 16 days. ADT 4 form has to be filed. Whether have you informed to, now by the way, this is a fraud discovered by the auditor, not by the company. Getting the point? The section starts with, if the auditor has reason to believe that an amount of fraud for more than or equal to 1 crore has been committed or suspected to be committed, even suspected fraud is covered in this. 
Are you getting? If you suspect that there is a fraud for more than one crore, and you have a reason to believe that there is a fraud, possibility of fraud, you can report to central government about the suspiciousness you have identified. Before reporting to central government, within the 60 days, first no, you have to report to management. Give them 45 days time for investigation. Get back the report. Within the next 15 days, you file with the central government. That's how 60 days logic came. Be able to understand. If it is less than 1 crore, you have to report to audit committee. You have to report to audit committee or board of directors as the case may be. Getting the point? So, and uh, board of directors has to report in their report. Board of directors report what is the fraud amount, what is the amount involved, I mean, what is the fraud amount, who are the parties, what is the nature of the fraud and what action company has taken against them. That has to be reported. In CARO, we only report about this type of fraud. But the guidance note says, this also you report. That's why in some MCQs, the answer is, even if the fraud is less than 1 crore, it has to be reported in CARO. Like that, an answer came in MCQ. Getting the point? Because it is as per guidance note requirement. Are you clear? Hey, there's a marathon. Fine, right? I am, I am having fundamental assumption and right to assume that you are already aware of all this. I am here only to revise that whatever you know. Getting it? If at all you don't know the provision at all and looking at me with a blank mind, I am not responsible for that. Correct? Huh? Next. Whistleblower complaints. Auditor has to check. Auditor has to check uh, whether the auditor has considered here, they are not asking you to list whistleblower complaints received. If you have to list 10-15 pages, it will go. In every company, whistleblower complaints will be so high. Getting the point? Have you considered the complaints received by the company during the year? As part of your risk assessment process and planning of the audit, this is what this requirement is. When you are planning the audit, you want to identify risky areas in the company. You know? How to identify risky areas? One of the source is whistleblower complaints. Look at the whistleblower complaints. Some production people, one of the staff complained on the production manager that he is doing this kind of manipulation. Okay, consider that. And while you are doing audit of purchases and production, no, put more number of resources there. Verify more number of samples. Are you getting the point? Next. Nidhi company discussion I will do in uh, uh, NBFC. But anyhow, here it is a very simple thing. Nidhi, Nidhi company has to maintain 1 is to 20. See, you have Nidhi rules in companies at no. I think you might have discussed what is 1 is to 20, 10 percent unencumbered deposit, all that. Yes or no? So, I am not covering this here. Related party transactions. Sir. Whether all transactions with related parties are complied with the provisions of the Companies Act and uh, they are disclosed in the financial statements as per applicable accounting standards. First, they are asking, uh, are they conducted as per the law? Second, they are asking, are they disclosed in the financial statements correctly? Are you getting two requirements? Next, uh, this 16th clause I will discuss in NBFC. Cash losses. This is important. Whether the company has incurred any cash losses in the financial year and the, in the immediately preceding financial year, if so, what is the amount of cash loss? How do you calculate cash loss? Identify profit after tax of the company. For that, add back non-cash expenditure. What is it? Non-cash expenditure. Non-cash expenditure means what? Depreciation. Provisions. All that. Getting it? You add back non-cash expenditure. You will get uh, some, some figure here. If this figure is still negative, then it is cash loss. Suppose profit after tax is already lost. That is not completely incurred in cash loss. You see operating cash flow. It's positive. Company profit after tax is negative. Whereas operating cash flow is positive. Which means company during the year cash profit generated. But because of depreciation, because of provisions, because of revaluations, even though I have an operating profit, it turned into loss. So, profit after law, profit after taxes, if it is lost, you cannot directly come and report. Calculate cash loss exactly. Now, if still, after adding back non-cash items, if still there is a loss, then that's a cash loss. So, if the company had a cash loss in the current year and in the previous year, both has to be reported. Suppose in current year it's a profit, last year it's a loss. Just report the last year one. Be able to understand. All of you. Next up. Whether there has been any resignation of auditors during the year, if so, uh, have you considered the issues and objections? Suppose the auditor of the, the existing company where I am doing audit, the original auditor resigned. I was appointed under casual vacancy. So, but I am the one who is giving ultimately the audit report because I filled the casual vacancy by process of appointment. In the EGM, extraordinary general meeting, I was appointed. Now, I am doing the audit. In my audit report, this reporting I need to do. Existing auditors have resigned and I have communicated with them as per clause 8 of part 1 of schedule, but communication with previous auditor, whatever objections they have raised, I have considered in my current year audit, able to understand. So, that is what they are asking here. 
Next, this is material uncertainty related to going concern. In CA inter, this question has been asked. In CA inter, this question has been asked. Now, what is, what is the question here? Auditor has to check whether the auditor is of the opinion, whether the auditor is of the opinion that company is capable of, company is capable of meeting its liabilities existing at balance sheet at nothing but I am signing balance sheet of Tata Motors as on 31st March. As on 31st March, Tata Motors balance sheet liability shows 1 lakh crore outside liabilities. So, are you, the caro is asking me, do you think, are you in the opinion of the Tata Motors as on 31st March, liability is 1 lakh crore, is there right? Will they repay? Will they repay as and when, as and when they become due within the next one year from balance sheet date? Out of this 1 lakh crore, some liabilities were due within the next one year only. Do you think, do you think according to the information you have, do you believe Tata Motors, whatever liabilities that were shown in the balance sheet, whatever will fall within next 31st March, next one year, from this 31st March to next 31st March, in between there will be dues, no, which means they are talking about which liability, current liabilities, yes or no, which is falling from the reporting date, any liability which falls due within 12 months is called as what, current liability, so they are indirectly asking Mr. Auditor, is Tata Motors, current liabilities which are outstanding as on 31st March, which are all falling within the next one year, will the Tata Motors honor it, do you have information for that, so indirectly we are testing going concern much before it is, affected. So, every auditor, earlier this reporting was not there, but after ILFS, after this DLF, getting it, after this housing finance companies continuously defaulted, immediately they brought this. And believe me, in the next five years, the CARO clauses will be 30 plus. Now it is 21, it will be 30 plus in the next five years. Getting it? Next. Because again, new new frauds are coming up, no? So, that's it. So, whenever new fraud comes, a reporting responsibility of the auditor will increase. So now, now you need to think about this, you know, as on 31st March, company is having liability, right? Whether the company will pay within the next one year. You need to question about this on which date, you know, audit report date. On which date you should test on, test this point? You should test this point on the date on which you are giving the audit report. Suppose, you know, suppose, you know, suppose I am signing 31st March 2023 balance sheet of Tata Motors. I am going to give audit report on 10th June 2023 on this date, on the date on which I am signing. Once I will look at Tata Motors balance sheet, once I will look at in between forecast, you know, pro projected information, uh, quarterly information that company is presenting, uh, financial ratios, uh, you know, bank, bank balances, liquidity analysis, all that I will do on 10th June I will do. As, as on 10th June, still do you believe, still do you believe liabilities that were there on 31st March, which are falling due within next 31st March, whatever liabilities falling due in between period, do you think Tata Motors will honor? Yes, it will honor. Then you, fall, you, you give positive opinion. If not, give negative opinion. Now, this entire research you should do on which date? Audit report date you should do. In, the, in examination, how they will question is? They will modify MCQ question they will give. You see here, on the date of auditor's report, on the date of auditor's report, getting the point, they will give ULTA. Here they will give balance sheet date, remaining they will give auditor's report date. Three dates I have used here, you see. Three, three places they used the dates concept. One is, one is, one is, date of auditor's report, one date. Date of balance sheet, another date. Here also one year from the date of balance sheet, three places date word is used. Able, don't mark up, very simple. As on 31st March, liability is there. Within the next one year, will, will the company honor it or not? Within next one year means, one year from the balance sheet date, whatever liabilities will do, nothing but current liabilities, will the company honor? You have to check this point on which date? Audit reported, that's it. Simple or not? Next. Then this is about CSR. Again, these points, if you want to class number 20, you cannot understand if you do not remember CSR provision at all. Those of you who understood this without understanding CSR provision, you are great. Okay. Next, this is 21st clause. See, uh, this 20th clause, please come back and read this after CSR provision. After CSR provisions, I told, right, CA Inter Marathon, I told you to watch. Please watch that and then only read this. Definitely, uh, MTP, in one of the MTP, I have seen MCQ on this. Getting it. I think I have seen an MCQ on this in, M in MTP. Getting it. So, CSR provision concept can also be tested in, you know, company. Moreover, remember, you have CSR provisions in your syllabus. 
in company audit company audit chapter uh, section 135 section is there for you entire 135 is dealing with csr provision you remember csr provision slightly what do you remember two percent of the net profit company has to spend there. apart from that what do you remember tell me ah, I think you have in corporate law ah. Ah, then huh Oh, in FR it is there, ah. then fine. You know, right? Unspent CSR money. Okay, now nah. uh, for it uh, for ongoing project, ongoing project cannot be more than three years. All that, ah, then fine. Very then you read this, okay? Next, twenty first clause. Twenty first clause is regarding. Twenty first clause is regarding whether there have been any qualifications or adverse remarks. By respective auditors in the CARO reports of companies which are included in CFS. Now, suppose you see Reliance Industries Limited. Reliance Industries CFS includes 466 companies. Correct. These 466 companies were audited by various auditors. These 466 companies were audited by various auditors. Now, what you need to give? Yes, sir. If yes means what? Okay, these 466 companies auditors, they have given CARO report on the respective companies, right? Inside CARO, 21 clauses they might have reported, right? Inside these clauses, some qualifications would have been there, right? You should give, you should summarize all those qualifications at one place and copy paste it here. If yes, indicate the details of companies and the paragraph numbers of the CARO report containing qualifications and remarks. You see, Tata Motors, they gave, they gave this, sir. In consolidated finances of Tata Motors, it will be even more depth. It will be even more in depth. So, uh, like I'll see, I'll, I'll show you consolidated itself. Very simple it is. You see here, see generally we all know that CARO do not apply on consolidated financial statements audit report. If you are giving audit report on CFS, CARO will not apply, but clause 21 will apply. But clause 21 will apply. Suppose this is an audit report given on consolidated financials of the Tata Motors. Inside that audit report, you know 21st clause reporting requirement they have given. Getting it? Like Tata, uh, Tata Motors consolidated financials includes various subsidiary companies of Tata Motors. I'm not talking about Tata Sun subsidiaries. I'm talking about Tata Motors subsidiaries. Now, these are the subsidiary companies of Tata Motors where different auditors have audited whose corporate identification number is given, what is the status of these companies have given, what are the CARO clauses where there is a qualification we have given. This is a requirement. This is the reporting requirement. And there are some other companies where there is no qualification at all. There are some more subsidiaries and joint ventures where there are no qualifications at all. Getting the point? So they have given full list of subsidiaries and associates and joint ventures owned by Tata Motors where they have given qualifications in CARO reports with respect to auditors and where there is no such kind of qualification in those companies. Clear? So that is what the reporting requirement. So that's it. Suppose if auditor is unable to express any opinion on the above, you shall indicate the fact that it is not, uh, you know, you just have to modify the opinion on those matters. That's it. So with this, the CARO important clauses were completed. Are you confident? All of you. Now with this, entire audit reporting chapter is completed. Are you clear? Major contents, have, we have been covered. Okay, that's it. So uh, in the next one, we will start standards. There are some standards. First, you need to have a standards overview. What are the standards that you are supposed to discuss as part of CA final specifically? 
and what are the standards we have already completed all that breakup we will see getting it that's it so until now we have completed the following audit reporting is done yes or no audit reporting is completed then we have completed uh, you know uh, nbfc audit insurance audit then consolidated financial statements audit peer review and quality review all these are important chapters guarantee question chapters getting it now we'll discuss about we'll discuss about audit you know this one standards and guidance notes already we have completed 12 standards generally whatever the standards we discuss no that many they will not be discussing in audit report chapter only four or five they will be discussing in audit report but we discussed 12 standards and we discussed caro 143 checklist also which is generally discussed as part of company audit getting it but that is not correct i showed you proof very clearly why it is important to learn along with audit report i showed literally speaking in company audit some important topics we covered getting it as per institute material caro and all is part of company audit getting it next up now we will have we will start with standards and guidance notes see like first of all the standards are collectively called as first of all engagement and quality control standards engagement and quality control standards now institute has issued various engagement standards and institute has issued one standard on quality control that is sqc that we know standard on quality control one that's the only standard which is available for sqc quality control this standard quality control primarily focuses on establishing policies and procedures for various aspects in the firm this sqc is applicable for the audit firm it may be sole proprietary firm or a partnership firm or individual practitioner to anybody it might be this sqc is applicable what this sqc is saying what is the objective of sqc it is to ensure that the engagements that you carry out, the engagements that you carry out shall be in compliance with the standards issued by the ICI. And in every engagement, you give a report. It may contain opinion, it may contain assurance, it may contain something else. The reports issued by you are appropriate. Getting it? I'll come to it. SQC, SA 220 comparison, I'll do and then I'll explain you very easy. Like some students continuously ask me, sir, what is the difference between engagement documentation and audit documentation? Getting it? Audit documentation word is used, documentation in respect of audit. Engagement documentation means it's a broader term. One type of engagement is audit. Engagement documentation can be assurance documentation, review documentation, audit documentation. Engagement documentation can be any of these three. Are you getting the point? Are I agreed, agreed upon to do certain procedures? Related documentation. Engagement documentation means I worked on an engagement, that documentation, that's it. If I worked on audit, then it's audit documentation. If I worked on review, then it's a review documentation. That's the only difference. So, SQC is applicable for the firms. It's not for the audit that we do. It's not just for the review. It is for the firm. The firm is accepting so many works. For all the works, there are some protocols which they need to follow, standard protocols. And that is what SQC is dealing. Are you clear? Now these engagements, we are having two types, getting it, assurance engagement and non-assurance engagement. We broadly divide into the works that we professionals perform are divided into two types, assurance engagement, non-assurance engagement. Assurance engagement, again we have subdivided into historical financial, non-historical financial. Assurance may be, we are providing assurance to people. It may be in respect of historical financial information or it may be it may be in respect of other than historical, actually they say other than historical financial information, other than historical financial information. On historical financial information, you may give reasonable assurance or you may give limited assurance. What is it? Limited assurance. Getting it? Reasonable assurance is called as audit. Limited assurance is called as review. What is it? Reasonable assurance is nothing but audit. Limited assurance is review. Audit for audit, we have for, for us, standards on auditing applies. For audit, standards on audit apply. For review, standards on review engagements will apply. Are you getting it? Now, if at all you are not talking about historical financial information, 
you want to give assurance on something else other than historical financial information it may be financial information or it may not be financial information i am providing assurance example i am providing assurance on service organizations controls getting it sa3402 what is it sa3402 not 402 sa i am talking about see standard on audit 402 is different standard on assurance 3402 or different getting it standard on assurance 3402 comes under this are you getting the point so so this this is called standard on assurance standard on assurance engagement which is referred as sae are you getting it whereas standards on auditing is referred as simply sa that's how we differentiate between that and this then non assurance in non assurance client will ask us to do something so a procedure he will be asking us to do we also agree upon that procedure and we do that procedure so that's why it's called agreed upon procedures for which we have standards on related services examples due diligence forensic audit fraud investigation all these comes under non assurance engagements all these comes under what non assurance engagements getting the point where client will ask us to do something and we will do it that's it as per the client requirement nothing else are you getting the point if it contains any sort of assurance then it may come under this aspect are you clear all of you that's it so this is a brief overview about engagement standards that we have total we are having 45 engagement standards but in the syllabus we are only having 35 engagement standards which are audit standards we don't have in the syllabus a review assurance related services standards which is removed getting it now what are the standards that we are having broadly 35 we are having just i list out briefly 230 and there is something in between 320 320 correct ah then 402 450 then 500 501 Five not one, five not five, five ten, five twenty, five thirty, five forty, five fifty, five sixty, five seventy, and five eighty. Then six hundred, six ten, six twenty. Then we have seven hundred, seven not one, seven not five, seven not six, seven ten, seven twenty. That's it. These are the standards that we have. Getting it now. Two hundred is a standard which is actually talking about basic objectives. getting it of overall objectives of an independent auditor and conduct of an audit in accordance with standards on auditing where uh, see some standards which are there in ce inter i'll give briefly right now brief overview itself i'll give right now only those standards i will discuss after break little depth getting it now 200 in 200 only you have learned already in ce inter the entire concepts of 200 what is an audit what are the objectives of an auditor what are the advantages of audit what are what is what are the principal aspects to be covered in audit what is the scope of audit what are the inherent limitations in an audit getting it you might have understood inherent limitations time and cost yes or no nature of financial reporting nature of audit procedures time and cost and other other factors are you getting the point next next uh, then we have professional skepticism professional judgment okay fundamental principles all that were discussed where in sa 200 you know last last item number 22 they ask it's a silly question fundamental principles what are fundamental principles a professional accountant has to follow what are the principles integrity objectivity independence ah that question five marks question at final level okay fine so So that was the question which is asked. No, it is there in ethics. It is there in ethics. If you see ethics, you know the first part of the ethics is fundamental principles of code of ethics. Okay, then so that is what given under two hundred. Are you clear? Basically, then two twenty. Sorry, two ten. What two ten says? Two ten is about agreeing on terms of audit engagement. What is it saying? Agreeing on terms of audit engagement. What is that as? What is that standard? It says very simple. the client is a company you say you will say that it's a company or you will say it's a partnership or whoever it is they don't know what is financial statements what is schedule 3 all that they don't know yes or no the person who is doing the business do you think he you know schedule 3 but what is a 200 says 
management is responsible for preparing financials management is responsible for implementing internal control management is responsible for providing access to information to the auditor so and so all that first of all the company which i incorporated is doing some iron ore business trading in iron ore getting it and the business the, the, that company director sir the one person is sir who is doing the business and his mother and grandmother these three people are directors in that company and shareholders in that company it's a private limited company getting the point the mother and grandmother doesn't know anything they are just names it you know what the shareholders it's a private limited company why three shareholders his astrologer told that three should be there in the company and that's why three people were there and his astrologer told that his whatever that grandmother if it is there it will bring good results in the business that's what he said so that's why grandmother also included in the ownership of the business that's the only reason why those two shareholders were there those two were appointed as director and all the three of them conduct the board meeting who will attend how will do for a private company's board meeting we just copy paste last year minutes and make documentation as or no while we find hand written we just keep retain documentation that's it in reality board meeting happens huh? there no there is no board itself and in fact their residential address itself is company address correct huh? for most of the private companies residential address is only company address are you getting the point so management responsibilities means don't expect what is there in the book in reality suddenly going there appoint after appointed uh, where is financial schedule 3 that fellow will be looking at you so what schedule 3 all that so you need to tell him that you are responsible for preparing financials see any contract you take any business contract you take who should tell terms and conditions to the buyer or receiver seller will buyer develop the terms and conditions or seller develop obviously whether you go to a railway station or bus station or any cab booking or any rapido bike booking terms and conditions decided by whom service provider same in an audit who is service provider auditor so engagement letter who has to give auditor are you getting the point terms of engagement who should decide auditor so we prepare an engagement letter and give it to the client so that he will understand what i am doing otherwise client will assume that auditor is there he will prepare accounts he will only do audit he will only file it data he will only pay tax yes or no so i should tell him look i am here only to do audit nothing else okay you have to prepare financials you have to prepare everything you have to file ros returns you have to file it returns all that i need to educate him so that and all i can do with the engagement letter so contents of engagement letter title will be there address it to the board of directors okay first one the scope and objective first one is scope and objective then responsibilities of the management then responsibilities of the auditor then reference to applicable financial reporting framework then reference to expected form and content of the audit report then place and place of the uh, place date and signature that's it this is contents of engagement letter are you getting the point now should i give this engagement letter suppose a private company appointed me for 5 years at a time getting it in one agm they appointed where my appointment is valid up to 44th agm they appointed me in the 39th agm where my appointment is valid up to conclusion of 44th agm getting it so for these five years every year should i give engagement letter no need since it's a recurring audit you need not give every year engagement letter unless there are the following circumstances the directors have changed management has changed owners have changed business is changed financial reporting framework has been changed are you getting the point or they misunderstood the terms then the misunderstood you tell once again clearly that's it you will not give one more engagement letter no correct huh? yes so that's two ten what if what if i ask i gave engagement letter they are asking me to change terms and conditions if at all the request is genuine feasible in law permitted in law not against law i'll agree if at all the changes which they requested is against to the law it is not or it is against my auditing principles they are asking me to compromise independence in such a way through changes of these terms and conditions i will not agree for the change suppose if management is not letting me to do audit without changes of terms and conditions i will deny getting the point i will deny means i will withdraw from the engagement where withdrawal is permitted suppose if withdrawal is not permitted suppose withdrawal from engagement is not permitted then i will give disclaimer of opinion what is the example of withdrawal not permitted suppose in listed company if you want to resign as an auditor once you completed 45 days after the end of a particular quarter 
you must give limited revenue report for that quarter and the next quarter correct which means even if you want to resign even if you want to withdraw is it possible because of the condition attached by sebi not possible so there since withdrawal is not possible what opinion you will give disclaimer or modified opinion that's it are you clear this 210 is completed understood or not then 230 this is again covered in ca inter see these are the standards where the ica book i showed no strategy chapter they are asking you to refer to ca inter book directly i am giving only a brief overview sa 230 what it says it, it is nothing but audit documentation the object of audit documentation is to serve as an evidence it is to serve as an evidence that the audit was properly planned and performed in accordance with the standards on auditing and conclusions reached by the auditor are appropriate based on the documentation. That is the object of the standard. Are you getting the point? Now the audit documentation can be done in either in the paper format or electronic format. In paper format or electronic, we divide the audit documentation files into two categories for each client, permanent file, current file. Getting the point? Permanent file means where permanent information is stored. A current audit file means every year we do audit, right? Every year we do gather workings, right? That files, that, that workings will be kept in the current audit file. Current audit file 2021, current audit file 2122, current audit file 2324, current audit file is maintained every year. Permanent audit file means maintained client wise. Are you getting the point? Now, the auditor has to prepare timely documentation. An audit documentation prepared after completion of audit is less effective than the documentation prepared while the audit is happening. Getting it? So, when you are doing the audit simultaneously, you should document the evidences that you gathered. Don't document at the end of the audit all at a time. And once audit is completed, within 60 days from the date of audit report, getting it? Assemble the documentation. You have gathered so many soft copies. You have gathered so many hard copies. You kept in the file just like that. Arrange them in a sequence. Numbering it. Getting it. So this assembly process is called as SM, I mean this arranging process is called as assembly of audit documentation, which is an administrative process. It is it an audit process? Is, does it an, are we doing any audit here? It's an administrative process. Does not include any additional audit procedures. Are you getting the point? And this assembly has to be completed within 60 days. And once you assemble, this file has to be kept in the storeroom. The software, whatever soft copies you have kept in the file should be locked clearly. And it should not be deleted. It should be retained for 7 years from the date of audit report or group audit report, whichever is later. Group audit means what? Joint audit. What is it? Joint audit. Or, or you can also consider in case if it is a holding company subsidiary company or the auditor of subsidiary company, then when a holding company auditor gave the audit report, look at that audit report. From that date, seven years. You will give definitely before audit report. Or you are a branch auditor, you gave audit report on 10th July. But overall audit report was came only on 20th, 20th July. Whichever is later, 20th July. From then, seven years. Are you clear? All of you. Then, what are the things that are to be documented? Audit processes performed shall be documented. Audit conclusions reached shall be documented. Planning, planning related things shall be documented. Audit summary discussions shall be documented. How auditor has arrived professional judgment shall be documented. Significant professional judgments shall be documented. This is asked in May 22 exams. Write about documentation of significant professional judgments. This is what asked in May 22. The testing was on this aspect. Are you getting it? So this much depth you can expect for sure. That's why I always tell, refer CA inter book for this. Don't refer any two pages document on SA 500. Never. SA 230, SA 500, two two pages means that's wrong. Because in CA inter it is 20 pages. 20, 30 pages was there. Getting it? And institute book clearly says refer that. Because there is a scope of asking from that. And that was proved in May 22 exams. Are you clear? Next, 240. Responsibilities of auditor in relation to fraud in an audit of financial statements. Responsibilities of auditor in relation to fraud in an audit of financial statements. Now, the standard says fraud means an intentional act by one or more. Yes or no? Uh, by one or more persons. Getting it. Uh, way which resulted in material misstatement in financial statement. The fraud can be. The fraud can be. 
like it says intentional act by one or more persons to deceive or to gain an undue advantage illegal advantage to him getting the point and the fraud is divided into two types fraudulent financial reporting misappropriation of assets fraudulent financial reporting is also called as manipulation of accounts it's also called as what manipulation of accounts misappropriation of assets means theft of assets okay pilferage cash theft all this comes under misappropriation that results in fraud that results in misstatement in financials so, sir how come if i steal inventory in a go down how does it affect financials very simple if you steal inventory books will not be updated with the steal no theft will you write in the general entry theft account data to so and so no right so books will not be updated with the theft so books will show higher balance stock whereas in go down reality lesser balance so balance sheet whatever closing stock value is it reflecting true and fair position of the reality no so it resulted in overstatement because of theft of inventory balance sheet is not recognizing that so it is overstating are you getting the point fraudulent financial reporting see misappropriation is done generally by low level staff it is not done by the high level sometimes top management will also be involved in misappropriation of funds through manipulation of accounts both they will be doing top management see obviously you know a security guard will not have access to accounting systems but a director of a company will have access to accounting system when he do a fraud he do a fraud in the you know actual assets and and manage the books of accounts also so that fraud cannot be detected now what is auditor responsibility auditor responsibility is to identify fraud risk factors what are fraud risk factors why people commit fraud because they have they gain some benefit incentive or because they are having pressure getting the point not only some benefit opportunity so only if there is an incentive or only if there is a pressure i cannot do there must be an opportunity where i can do the fraud not only these two i must have that mindset attitude so these three factors are called as fraud risk factors you need to study the company you need to study the people see whether any person is having this attitude see what are the opportunities are open for him to do fraud see do they have any pressure suppose the top management of the company is continuously having pressure from the holding company regarding expected earnings they are definitely possibility that they may manipulate records and their top management is having access to accounts they can manipulate the records there is an opportunity available pressure is there and look at their attitude what is their attitude what is their history of violations so indicators will be there what are the indicators of pressures in respect of financial reporting fraudulent financial reporting what are the pressures that you will identify in case of misappropriation of assets like that you will have a discussion there and what are the circumstances that indicate fraud circumstances that indicate fraud you know uh, accounting records not tallying with each other inventory records not tallying with each other like that we have given some examples there in the ca inter book you need to read that are you clear all of you so that is 240 then 260 we have already completed just first no first we'll highlight what are the standards we completed these are all we have completed correct now and even these standards also we have completed and 570 is completed 260 is completed 299 is completed only remaining or pending correct now 265 is covered in risk assessment chapter this is nothing but communicating significant communicating deficiencies in internal control to those charged with governance generally when auditor identified any significant deficiency he will communicate it with the top management which is a very small standard where we communicate how we communicate through a written letter called letter of weakness through a letter of weakness we communicate while we are communicating you should clearly explain which control has deviated what is the impact of the deviation all that you should clearly you have to specifically express to the management so that is what the 265 is all about next 300 we have an audit strategy chapter please read that only then you will understand 300 as per 300 planning of an audit of financial statement it simply says planning of an audit of financial statements so that actual chapter heading if you see audit strategy audit planning and program there are three terms strategy planning and program so what is program what is strategy all that we have covered it in ca inter marathon clearly if possible if possible you just look into it getting my previous marathon you look into it so you will understand that 300 is not a small standard it's a big standard again getting it 315 is risk assessment chapter 330 is again covered as part of uh, 330 standard no it has to be read along with uh, 230 and 
टू थर्टी थ्री थर्टी फाइव हंड्रेड और टू बी रेड टूगेदर यू नो वॉट इज द लिंक बिटवीन अगेन टू थ्री वन फाइव ऑल्सो सो ऑल दीज स्टैंडर्ड्स दीज फोर स्टैंडर्ड्स आर रिलेटेड टू ईच अदर सो हाउ आर द रिलेटेड टू ईच अदर वॉट आर ऑडिट प्रोसीजर्स फर्स्ट यू हेव टू डू रिस्क असेसमेंट प्रोसीजर यस आर नो बेस्ड ऑन द रिस्क असेसमेंट प्रोसीजर यू हेव टू प्लान फॉर द ऑडिट प्रोसीजर फर्दर ऑडिट प्रोसीजर मीन्स वॉट थ्री थर्टी फर्दर ऑडिट प्रोसीजर इज डिस्कस इन विच स्टैंडर्ड थ्री थर्टी compliance procedure substantive procedure are you getting it now by doing this procedure what you should get evidence whatever the evidence you gathered what you should do document related are you getting it first no you have to plan the audit do the risk assessment getting it based on that respond to the risk based on that gather the evidence whatever the evidence you gathered you have to document see these are all related are you getting it for these these four standards put together the content is covered in audit evidence and documentation chapter in ca inter getting it these four standards like that they, they basically discuss 300 basically discuss 315 in audit evidence standard and in depth they will discuss 230 330 and 500 the chapter name is what you know in ca inter documentation and evidence are you getting the point next 450 is about evaluating what is it evaluation of uh, evidences or evaluation of misstatements what is it evaluation of misstatements like in order to evaluate the mistake first you should identify the mistake in order to identify the mistake you should conduct audit procedure that is what sa 330 says now remember when you are identifying mistakes you are not identifying 100% of the mistakes you are only identifying sample mistakes how to evaluate the mistakes it depends upon the results of the sample it depends upon the results of the sample in audit sampling we have various topics example what is audit sampling there is a question how audit sampling what are the various approaches to audit sampling like statistical sampling non statistical sampling all that what are various methods of sampling ram simple random sampling stratified random sampling block sampling cluster sampling yes or no what are various techniques of sampling stratification value weighted selection monetary unit getting like this there were so many terminology and what are the factors that influence the auditor while choosing a sample design getting it there is a question what are the factors that influence the auditor while selecting a sample size while determining sample size in case of test of details in case of test of controls what factors will affect the auditor there is a question on that getting it then write about projection of misstatements there is a question write about evaluation of sample results there is a question evaluation of sample results has to be read along with uh, you know 450 evaluation of uh, misstatements getting the point see i am giving you connection only all this whatever i am going to highlight with the green color you have to compulsorily refer ca inter book for all this you have to refer ca inter book in in fact actually 450 is not covered in ca inter but 450 explicitly it is not covered the content of 450 is covered in sampling in ca inter sampling chapter 450 content evaluation of statements is covered are you getting the point all of you so these standards you have to refer see for 520 in ca inter we have analytical procedures chapter for audit for 530 we have a sampling chapter which is of 10 15 pages 15 pages around analytical is 10 pages chapter getting it and uh, i told right 230 like what are they 230 330 500 315 all these four standards related content is covered in depth in documentation and evidence risk assessment chapter in ca inter getting it these two chapters put together will have 100 pages content 100 pages literally imagine the content size so you are supposed to refer at least 120 to 130 pages in ca inter because if you want to cover this standards in true sense otherwise whether you discuss one page two page or if i discuss formalities at one hour there is no point at all because when a question comes they'll ask in depth or they will not touch at all generally they don't touch these standards you see in ca final they never ask these standards because the book says refer ca inter book the examiner who is setting up the paper don't have that much patience so he may not refer if at all he is having that much patience he will refer and then give a question so there is a probability are you getting it next 
So what are the standards that we are left? Again, by the way, 320 is also covered in CA inter only. 320 is also covered in CA inter only. Um, actually, I will cover, I, I know I covered in CA final students in standards class, regular class, but again, 320, I bet you will not understand. It's a very big standard. Begin the sense, it's not lengthy. It's very in-depth. Getting it? Look at performance materiality definition. 99.99% they don't understand performance materiality definition. 99.99% I mean it. What is performance materiality? It's a materiality level set by the auditor below the overall materiality for the financial statements as a whole where the probability of undetected misstatements, undetected misstatements exceeding the overall materiality will be low. And if possible, the performance materiality can also be set for specific class of account balances transactions. This is a definition of performance materiality. If you do not understand this definition, there is no point at all in the standard. In the entire standard, performance materiality is one important factor. Second one, what are the factors that helps in auditor deciding, see how materiality will be finalized? Materiality will be finalized based upon benchmarks of the company. For every company, they will have some benchmarks. For some companies, revenue is benchmark. For some companies, profit is benchmark. For some companies, capital is benchmark. There are various benchmarks. So, we apply a percentage on the benchmark to evaluate the materiality. Now, which benchmark I should apply? What are the benchmarks of the company? What are the factors in selecting the right benchmark I showed? November 22 question, that one only. November 22 attempt, attempt, what is the question? What are the factors affecting benchmark? Getting it? And which benchmark is suitable in which scenario? They, they tested that one line as a 5 marks question. Able to understand? So, that is one question, factors affecting the benchmark. Now, when revision of materiality happens, what are the cases where auditor will revise the materiality? That is one question. What are the factors that auditor shall consider while determining materiality? There is one question. Getting the point? All these topics are different. And what is performance materiality? One question. In performance materiality, they use the word undetected misstatement, uncorrected misstatement. In evaluation of misstatement, 450, they use the word undetected misstatement, uncorrected misstatement. In four, you see 450, the entire discussion revolves around these two terms. Undetected misstatement, uncorrected. Uncorrected means what? I have verified sample in that I discovered a mistake. It is actual mistake in the audit. It's an actual mistake I found. Now, based on that mistake, I project a misstatement, right? Based on one mistake. Suppose I say verified 100 samples, I found two mistakes. How many were there in the population? We have to project. What is it? We have to project. Now, suppose I discovered 10,000 rupees worth of mistake. In a sample which I verified, this is a mistake which I know, which is not corrected in the financial statements, uncorrected mistake. But there are so many mistakes which are not detected by me. Are you getting it? So, in this sample where I audited 10,000 mistake is there, how much is there in the population? We project. We project. Out of the projected value, detected misstatement, if I reduce undetected misstatement will come. Are you getting the point? Out of the projected misstatement, if I reduce, if I eliminate detected mistake, I will get undetected. Now, when I am projecting, anomaly should be excluded. What is it? Anomaly should be excluded. What is anomaly? There is a definition in sample which can be tested as an MCQ. Anomaly means a deviation or a misstatement that is demonstrably not representative of population. That's a definition. It's a deviation or misstatement that is demonstrably not representative of population. So, anomalous misstatement shall be excluded while projecting. While evaluating total misstatement, anomalous shall also be considered. That is 450. These are all points there in 450 standard. If at all you think you read 450 if without this knowledge, that means you didn't read 450. Are you getting it? That's why all this requires strong fundamental understanding in CA inter. We cover all this very fundamentally strongly in CA inter. Getting the point? Many don't cover in CA inter because they don't understand first point. Getting it? In CA inter all this is very important. We cover like this very in depth. In fact, I teach CA inter depth, in depth than CA final. CA final syllabus is very normal compared for me, according to me. CA inter syllabus is very dynamic for audit especially because they cover all these in depth, all the standards especially. Getting it? So, what I will tell you is, here you need to take risk. Because now you cannot sit and learn all this. 
because it will take time it will take time in c enter we spend 50 60 hours on all these standards audit sampling we explain 5 to 6 hours almost not 5 6 6 to 7 i think now analytical procedures is a 5 hours chapter audit documentation evidence is a 10 hours chapter risk assessment is an 8 hours chapter fraud is a 4 hours chapter all these standards were explained all together put together it will be somewhere around close to 50 hours getting the point so now if you are ready to invest 50 hours only read them if at all you are not ready don't read them just if you read something you will get a question if you are thinking like like that probability whatever the material you are following no in that some text is given no just to read that but i am telling you you will not remember getting it because all this terminology is there in the main standard only i am telling you able to understand now in the past examinations from the standards which are covered in ca inter like i will tell you exactly 200 210 230 then we have 240 then 330 then 500 then 450 520 530 these standards no you can straight away ignore at ca final historically if you see in the past any attempts you see maximum weightage that was tested is 10 marks only because in order to the test these con this content now what they need to do you know they need to open ca inter material and then test from the respective chapter unless they do that they cannot test this the paper setter 99 percent will not open ca inter material will only stick with the final material which is given to him getting the point 99 percent will only ask a question from that in the final ICA material you don't have any of this you see forget about them you don't have 501 505 510 also in the final audit material of ICA book it is not there for all of them CA final audit material what it says refer for announcement whatever it says we have to do that are you getting the point only then you are covering full syllabus otherwise you are not covering full syllabus if you think you are covering full syllabus whatever you are doing other than what ICA stated that means you are doing wrong obviously you are risking yourself are you getting it if you want to leave, leave it fully or don't leave it. Only these two segments. Either leave it fully or do not leave it. Because when you leave it, no, when you leave that these standards, whatever I listed here, I, I bet you have not studied more than 20% content. Getting it, more than 20% you have not covered in these standards. When the standard, these standards are having 100% content, you have not studied more than 20. And if at all you did not understand anomalous misstatement, projected misstatement, tolerable misstatement, tolerable deviation, projected deviation, anomalous deviation, audit sampling chapter you did not understand. Able to understand? In CA final, I don't think they will ask, write about stratified sampling. They may ask you, write about stratification. There is a possibility they will ask you, what is value weighted selection? These are the questions which are tested at CA inter level itself. First of all, understand, not at final. At CA inter level itself, they are testing all this. So when it comes to final, they may test way on this. Are you clear? So you can happily leave these standards. So then we are left with what are the standards that we need to, must and should refer. Because CA institute book says you have to refer pronouncement. You have to refer pronouncement. What are the standards? 501, 505, 510. And then 540, 550, 560, 580. Only these standards if we discuss now. And moreover, sorry, 402. Getting it? If we discuss, here itself I'll write. Getting it? So all these standards we need to discuss. Almost we are having totally 8 standards. 8 standards. Assuming we spend at least 15 to 20 minutes on an average. Okay. We can cover it within some 3 to 3 and a half hours. Maximum 3. Today itself will finish it off. Are you clear? So these standards and believe me, in these standards also you are going to learn so many things which you are not, which you're not aware of. It's not like you are not aware of, you know, but you didn't understand. That's the only difference. You did not understand. That's it. Getting it. So after we finish the revision class, sit peacefully, thoroughly read with understanding it. Understanding is not sentence, but the logics. Getting it, the concept. Okay, so we'll take break and get back and continue this. For a few standards, I will discuss directly from the CA inter standards material. Because even 501, 510, 505 and even 550, 
560, 580. For all these standards also, <coughs> the ICA book says refer CA interbook because they were covered little in depth. So to that extent, I have downloaded, you know, the CA inter material here. So you can also download that in our application, okay? So this is class plus in iOS, but in Play Store you will find rest of our CA and CMA application. Getting it? Or you can alternatively download in our website. So we have a website. So in that website you can download, but we will have to upload here. We just have to upload here. Okay, maybe today or tomorrow it will be done mostly. So all the resources related to auditing that we provide, we will provide soft copies here. Getting it? So you can download in this website completely. Getting it? Next. So this right now, if at all any of you want to download, you can download it in that app application. You just open that Play Store's REST application. Here there is a main menu. Okay. This is our staff account. Okay. So inside that CA final, inside that main material, these are the materials that we refer in our regular session. Which my, my module is having two modules. Module 1, 1, 2. If, if you see hard copy, you will find 1A also. 1A is nothing but split from 1. Because module 1 is 600 pages around. So we split into two parts and then give. That's the only difference. So question bank, standards CA intro and 200, 210, 230, 500, all that. Getting it. This itself will have some 90 pages. Only these standards will be 90 pages because we have given copy paste of CA into chapters. Getting it. And this is the order in which we have to read. Anyhow. So I hope that I already discussed at the beginning of the marathon itself. Okay. Now. So few standards like 501, 505, 510. Uh, 560 and even 580. For these five standards, first we will discuss from CA Inter material. Are you clear? All of you? Yes. So now let's start SCA 501, which is talking about audit evidence. Audit evidence, specific items for, specific considerations for selected items. Specific considerations for selected items. Now if you observe, See, it, it uses the word specific considerations for selected items. What are the selected items? Inventory is selected. Okay. Pending litigations. Pending litigations is selected. And segment information is selected. Now, what you need to consider for this? What is the specific consideration for this? With respect to inventory, you have to consider existence and condition. This is the consideration. What is the specific consideration related to inventory, existence and conditions? Okay. And whereas, whereas for pending litigations, what is the, you know, condition? What is the specific consideration for pending litigation? Completeness of, what is it? Completeness of disclosures. Completeness of disclosures in the financial statements is the consideration for pending litigations. Then for segment information, this is also regarding presentation and disclosure as per applicable financial reporting framework. This is the consideration that you need to check. What auditor has to check regarding segment information? What is the objective of auditor? The objective of auditor is to obtain reasonable assurance that the segment information has been presented and disclosed in the financial statements as per applicable financial reporting framework. Then, what is another objective of the auditor as per SF 501? The auditor objective is to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. Please remember, sufficient appropriate evidence, reasonable assurance, both are same. Getting it? Obtain sufficient appropriate evidence regarding completeness of disclosure of pending litigations. Are you getting it? Another objective, auditor has to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence regarding existence and condition of inventory. Are you getting it? Now, there is a question which has been asked on this in MTP. One question. Which of the following statement is true? When auditor is attending physical verification of inventory, the auditor has to verify which of the following. One, existence, valuation and condition of inventory. Option two, condition and valuation of inventory. Option three, existence and valuation of inventory. Option four, existence and condition of inventory. Option four. When I attend physical verification of inventory, my agenda is not about value of the inventory. My agenda is about whether physically inventory existing. If so existing, in what condition it is existing? 
what is the status of the inventory is it existing in a good condition or is it a deteriorated inventory if it is deteriorated inventory whether it is considered in the valuation correctly or not valuation is next step that we do after verification is completed while verification while in physical inventory verification the main agenda is confirming its existence confirming its condition are you getting the point and you see sa501 it only focuses on inventory counting you see in the entire point nowhere valuation principle is discussed are you getting the point so sa501 we are discussing only on existence and condition of the inventory are you clear so what auditor has to check here so what auditor what is your what is what auditor has to check first auditor the standard says attend the inventory counting performed by management attend the inventory counting performed by management okay you will attend what will you do i will evaluate management's instructions and how the management is doing the counting i will observe how management is counting i will inspect the inventory and i will perform test counting getting it i will also inspect and i will also do test counting what is test counting suppose management staff is you know they are just going into the go down there are so many racks which are arranged inside racks some items were there so one fellow of the management is counting that and shouting the other fellow is recording now at one of the rack somewhere in the fourth or fifth rack seventh row getting it 10 units were there that's what he shouted i will go and check whether really 10 units were there that's called test counting what is it called as test counting then i will reconcile physical inventory with the records so i has done test counting right so i will have to check whether the inventory physical records physical physical inventory is matching with the record as in the store same store record will also be available soft copy getting it then if at all inventory counting is carried at other than balance sheet date generally this is what happens most of the enterprises it will not be happening on the balance sheet date exactly it will be happening after balance sheet date if at all inventory counting happens other than balance sheet date what from the balance sheet date to the counting date what are the changes happened how they were recorded in the books of accounts that we need to check that's it are you getting the point so in exam they'll ask you this question you are attending the inventory counting performed by the management what are the points what are the points that you evaluate when the inventory counting is being performed by management and you have attended that what points you will evaluate only this b point they will ask you for only this b point they'll ask you for three marks are you getting the point or what are the points the auditor shall take into account when you are attending the <coughs> inventory counting performed by management then you will have to write and type this itself can be asked for four marks are you clear next this can be tested as mcq suppose no if at all attending physical inventory counting by the management is not possible for you whenever management is counting you are not able to attend what is the course of action you attend directly you perform audit procedures on inventory items you attend directly this we generally call it as surprise test this we generally call it as what surprise test suppose attending inventory counting itself became impracticable so inventory is located at one geographical location reaching there itself become a big very big task because of the floods or because of these weather conditions reaching to that location is not possible getting the point or the company is something like what i can say the oil oil digging getting it so drizzing companies drizzing corporation company drizzing companies okay uh, they they develop seaports all that getting it so uh, they are also having an oil oil offshore getting it so there some oil has been stored i have to go there but because of the weather condition is not good i could not go there inventory counting became impracticable in such a case what auditor has to do try to obtain evidence is there any alternative way through which you can obtain sufficient appropriate evidence so try performing alternative audit procedures and obtain evidence regarding existence of inventory condition of inventory are you getting it what is alternative procedure generally okay on so and so date i am unable to attend inventory whether the inventory is existing or not i am unable to uh, attend i will see subsequent date whether it is sold or not are you getting the point i will try to see alternate process subsequently is it sold or not i will try to check subsequent sales subsequent process after some number of days so if at all subsequently there was a so sale definitely it's a indicate it indicates that yes some inventory is already there so subsequent sale of inventory is an indication that inventory is already there in the go down able to understand so alternative evidence suppose if alternative evidence is not possible if alternative audit procedure is not possible somehow you are unable to get you know evidence regarding existence and condition of inventory we try to make which opinion modified opinion because we don't have evidence modified means which opinion qualified or disclaimer adverse will not come because i am not having evidence here. are you clear so that's what this entire question now next one 
what is your audit procedure if the inventory is in the custody of the third party generally we get written confirmation SA 505 procedure we follow generally we get external confirmation from the third party what if you have a doubt on the confirmation what if you have a doubt on the confirmation suppose uh, if exist doubts as to reliability of confirmation regarding the inventory what you will do you only attend directly to the third party premises or you will arrange another auditor to attend physical verification at the third party premises are you getting it and or you will get another auditor's report relating to inventory counting at third party and i will inspect the documents that what are the proofs that are available with us especially that inventory is lying with third party some e-way bill will be there no check e-way bill are you getting it transit copy will be there check the transit copy and get confirmation from third party if at all the inventory is pledged as collateral this generally will not apply because pledge is not possible in most of the inventories only except in gold are you clear next litigations and claims what auditor has to do what are the see here in litigations and claims what is our objective you know whether all the pending litigations claims against the company are they disclosed in the financial statements completely this is the objective of the verification now whether are they presented completely or not how do i check i need to try to identify i need to work to identify litigations for what i will do i will first check the legal expenses account legal expenses so in the company there will be a ledger right legal expenses ledger account will be there right? i will check on which date for what purpose legal expenses incurred for what purpose i will check unspecified account unspecified expenses account unspecified means there is no name for it, it maybe a bribe it may indicate a non-compliance which may indicate a litigation are you getting the point i'll talk to entity internal lawyers i'll talk to entity internal lawyers company is having external legal counsel also companies having external legal counsel in may 22 this question only asked this is the question that you know, has been asked in may 22 exam for five marks under what circumstances the auditor will talk to the external legal counsel under what circumstances the auditor will talk to external legal counsel for getting confirmation regarding pending litigations yes yeah why not one question this is getting it if the auditor thinks risk of mms regarding litigation is high or if auditor if if the audit procedures indicate that material litigation may exist getting it but not disclose it to the auditor or if you want to if he want to get a clear understanding about a pending litigation for all these reasons auditor may want to communicate with the external legal counsel getting it so one first one i'll inquire management what are the pending cases i'll look at the minutes of the meeting i'll review legal expenses account i'll communicate with external legal counsel suppose if at all management is refusing me to talk to external legal counsel they are putting restriction on my evidence obtaining source first no i will not take any way anytime serious action first i'll try alternative way available or not is there an alternative way to resolve i'll try to get evidence from alternate source if alternative source is not possible management refusal to access to external legal counsel is unreasonable or management is permitting but external legal counsel is not cooperating with me somehow i end up not gathering evidence i will give modified opinion what i will give modified opinion are you clear is it or not so that is pending litigations point then finally finally i will have to get a written representation that all the pending litigations and claims were disclosed by the management nothing has been omitted i need to get a declaration are you clear all of you now you see in sa 580 there is a question for you when the auditor shall obtain written representation it says two sentences whenever a standard requires the auditor to get a written representation in that time at that time auditor should get representation or whenever auditor feels it is necessary for him to get a representation now when a concerned standard requirements example sa 501 it is asking you to get written representation means it's not option for you you must get are you getting the point all of you next segment information whether the segment information presented by the company is it completely done as per framework or not we need to see for segment information we have some accounting standard so we need to check whether segment information is presented as per the standard or not we need to check are you getting the point now in standards you know how to identify segment primary segment secondary reportable segments so we have something now for that there is an asset test revenue test all that you perform based on which you will find reportable segments yes or no now standards has given certain methods right you check whether management followed the same methods or not and you also do test how many reportable segments based on your test you are getting do that 
do an analytical procedure last year how many segments reported and this year how many segments were reported and what is the deviation inquire and this is the audit procedure that we do are you getting the point all of you so that is regarding all this now there is another question what are the matters that you consider while attending the inventory counting what matters you consider while you are attending at inventory counting you will look at nature of inventory you look at work in progress stage of completion you look at controls related to the inventory whether instructions are there properly given for physical counting when they are counting physically whether entity is maintaining a perpetual inventory system getting it whether assistance of expert is needed in case of inventory counting all these points you should keep in mind before attending inventory counting this is a question where, where if you decided to plan to attend inventory counting what points will consider what points will keep in mind before attending inventory counting all these points you should keep in mind at the time so that you do better counting you do better understanding of the inventory counting performed by management clear with this sa501 is done understood or not all of you next sa505 external confirmation external confirmation now what is the procedure in external confirmation first of all see first of all external confirmation is also called as direct confirmation it's a written direct response it's a or uh, it's a direct written response to the auditor from the third party yes or no like how we do this external confirmation external confirmation we do in four steps how we obtain external confirmation it's in four steps first no step number one identify identify information in respect of which confirmation is required identify the information where you want confirmation trade receivable trade payable you know low bank borrowings bank balances of what for what purpose you want external confirmation first identify the information then step number 2 okay i want external confirmation for all of this no do you want external confirmation for all these items from all the parties no from few parties only i want so identify identify the conforming parties identify the conforming parties are you getting the point so which party from whom you want to get confirmation also you should identify we want to 100% external confirmation for all the transactions for all the balances step number 3 design the confirmation design the confirmation request this designing elements are two types positive and negative there are two designing elements positive way we can design and negative way then step number 4 send the confirmation what is it send the confirmation including follow up request what is it follow up request like i sent a confirmation the other party has not responded then i will have to send him a reminder after the specified time frame is expired are you getting the point so these are the four steps involved in external confirmation now this can be asked in what way you know what write about audit procedure for external confirmation the last you write audit procedure for external confirmation the auditor has to follow the following audit procedure for obtaining external confirmation one identify the identify the information financial information items in respect of which auditor is looking for external confirmation two identify the conforming parties from whom the external confirmation is sought a point number 3 auditor has to design the confirmation confirmation pattern depending upon the risks involved all that when a negative pattern is used when a positive pattern is used all that i will tell you okay next up. fourth one send the request including the follow up request wherever it is required are you clear now in the standard one important definition is exception what is the important definition in this standard is exception are you getting the point if you do not understand this there is no point in this standard because this word exception is used at multiple elements in the standard multiple places in the standard now exception means what exception means it's a different between it's a difference between information requested by the auditor information requested by the auditor to be conformed or contained in entity records versus information given by the third party what is exception it's a difference between information requested by the auditor from the conforming party or contained in the entity records tell me in my organization where i am doing audit entity records is saying 10 lakhs is the trade receivable i will also request from the other party what is trade receivable expecting that he will reply 10 lakhs so whatever i request or whatever I, whatever is there in the entity records is same and what he replied if there is a difference between them that's called exception what is it called as 
exception. Can I treat exception as misstatement? How come you say it's a misstatement? It's an exception. Exception means what generally my books of accounts and his books of accounts should tally with respect to the balance. But it didn't tally. That is what unusual. Generally, if it tally, it's usual thing. If it is not tallied, unusual. Unusual means exceptional. Exception. Now, when auditor identified exception, what we need to do? First, I need to identify whose books of accounts is wrong. Is it our organization whom I am doing audit is wrong or their books which is wrong? So for which what I will do? I will ask him statement of account. I will generate my own statement of account. I will reconcile both. And pending items will be there. He accounted something but I didn't account. Or I accounted something that he didn't account. Especially stock in transit, all these adjustments will come. Getting the point? I will see exactly risk and reward is correctly transferred or not. Only then we record the item. I will see whether our accounting record is correct. The substance over form we will check. Yes, our record, accounting records are correct. Third party books only wrong. Then I will close the issue, document it, and mention that our books of accounts are our books of accounts are correct. Even though there is an exception, even though the confirmation given by third party is incorrect, even though the confirmation given by third party does not match with our books of accounts, our books of accounts are only correct. Are you getting the point? Do you think third party whatever you give that is only right? Huh? Sometimes our organization only right. They are only wrong. They are only not maintaining proper records. So that is called exception. Whether an exception is a misstatement or not, the auditor has to perform additional audit procedures. Are you getting the point? All of you. Now, so that is exception definition. Getting it? Now, positive confirmation request means what? Negative confirmation request means what? Positive confirmation request is a request where the auditor requests the confirming party to confirm an information given in the confirmation request. Whether the third party agree or disagree, please mention that. Whereas a negative confirmation request, we send a request with such a kind of wordings where third party has an obligation to reply only when he disagree. If at all third party books of accounts and our books of accounts are telling, he will not have an obligation to reply. We will mention the wordings like that. We will frame the sentences like that. Please reply you disagree. Otherwise ignore. We mentioned this. Which means if the third party looks at that confirmation request and if it is matching, no. He will ignore it. He will not reply. But which is more persuasive audit evidence? Positive confirmation or negative? Which is more persuasive? Positive. Positive evidence is more persuasive. Why? Because communication is complete only when there is a reply. You might have said, studied in business communication. Somewhere. A communication process is complete only when there is a reply. I sent a negative confirmation. Third party has not at all seen the mail. Getting the point, three days gone, third party has not seen the mail at all, so he didn't reply. I was thinking like what, since three days is over, third party did not reply, I am thinking books of accounts are matching, that's why he didn't reply. In reality, they were not matching and the material misstatement is there in our books only. How do I know? So negative confirmation request is not a suggestible pattern of, you know, request. Then why this concept is there? We can use negative confirmation request in certain scenarios. Okay, especially a negative confirmation request can be used a negative confirmation request can be used if the all the following conditions are present. If all the following conditions are present in a particular situation, if all these conditions exist, I can use a negative confirmation request. What are the conditions? Very low chance of non-response from third party. The non-response from third party is lesser chance, which means third party is such a kind of guy, he replies for sure. In spite of it, he didn't reply means he saw the confirmation, he ignored consciously. Okay, only, so this is a third party, this is a buyer or a seller of our company who always replies for sure. If at all he didn't reply means, the only reason is he saw the confirmation letter, he saw the verdicts, that's why he ignored, because it is matching. Otherwise, there is no possibility of non-response from him. If at all something is disagreed, he would have responded for sure. If that is the kind of third party you have to him, Negative confirmation you can send, provided remaining three more conditions were there. You cannot just based on this non-response uh, probability, you cannot use negative. Four factors were there for using negative. All the four factors must present. Third factor, low exception rate. Low exception rate is expected. The, what is, dear auditor, you are sending confirmation to some party, right? What is the probability that you think exception will be there? Exception means difference will be there in your books and his books. A probability is very less. Last week only they confirmed balances already. This and this entity and that entity confirm every week balances. And in the last week, no transaction happened. Obviously, balance will match. 
to that kind of third party where exception possibility of differences is very 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 low to them i can use happily negative are you getting the point if i use a negative confirmation pattern my audit time will be saved why because the third party have to, i once i send a negative i ignore the audit procedure i'll i'll start another work but if i send a positive pattern i have to wait for the reply if at all the third party has not replied i need to send a follow up reply in a positive confirmation request it eats my time a negative confirmation request is faster process are you getting it but negative confirmation can be used only if these conditions are present are you getting the point or you want to get a confirmation for various items of population getting it large number of items were there but all of them are small similar account balances and transactions small similar items for them you can use negative because they are immaterial transactions they are immaterial transaction or if the auditor has assessed the risk as low if you think there is a low risk in a particular item there also you can use negative confirmation request so negative negative confirmation request can be used if the following four circumstances present the risk is low and the second one is what uh, uh, large number of small homogeneous immaterial items third one a um, very low exception rate getting it fourth one a low chance of non response from the third party if these four conditions present a negative confirmation request can be used but remember a positive confirmation request is always a superior method compared to a negative confirmation request are you clear all of you if say you read this standard right find that bit bit active no suppose now again i'll come back to the you know the, you know this one determine the information to be confirmed first identify the infer what information you may get confirmation for terms of the agreement you may you may get a confirmation regarding a contract you may get a confirmation regarding a transaction that happened and settled already some students think that confirmation can only be obtained for outstanding balances as on balance sheet date that is wrong external confirmation means what i want to confirm about certain things in the financial information that's it it may be closing balance or opening balance or it may be during the transaction who knows anything in respect of any item you can get confirmation which is relevant for the financial statements audit are you getting it next uh, you 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 want to confirm certain absence of the terms what do you mean by that suppose there is a loan given by the company to the other party or the company has taken a loan from other party where there is no interest element i asked the management where is interest no such thing interest free loan who will give interest free loan i want to confirm so i want to confirm absence of terms and conditions getting it so property title deeds held for third, i mean in, any inventory or any investment which is held with the third parties for all these cases i can get confirmation now then i need to select the confirming party Res response to confirmation request to provide more audit evidence when confirmation request are sent to the confirming party knowledgeable confirming party whom you believe they are knowledgeable you cannot send a confirmation request to the production manager you have to send confirmation request to accounts manager so you need to identify who is the accounts manager in the other company then you need to send only then you will get a reply correctly otherwise you cannot so the confirming party must be knowledgeable are you getting the point from the other party who is confirming this the other party who is confirming should be knowledgeable then design the request so now auditor has to design the request uh, you know which will affect the response rate positive confirmation request will have high response rate compared to a negative confirmation request further the wordings you are using that also plays an important role getting it by the way remember the other party is confirming you no know, sounds of balance does it put an obligation on the contract no it's just an accounting and audit related one just because third party confirmed and we also agreed and accepted later on if the confirmation was wrong and our books are also wrong getting it the actual amount is very big can the other party say hey, last time you agreed for 10 lakhs you no know, i will only pay 10 lakh can the can the can the third party make external confirmation as an obligatory point of the entity to settle the transaction no next so the following factors will be taken into account this itself can be take asked as four marks designing a suitable confirmation request is one of the important phase of an external confirmation what are the factors you keep in mind while designing an external confirmation four marks question are you getting the point what are the points will keep in mind what is the layout and presentation prior experience on the similar items what is the assertion being addressed is it inventory with third party is it trade receivable item is it borrowing what is the assertion getting it what is the method of communication are you sending it on mail are you sending it on registered post what and do you have a management express authorization yes of course on the management letter id only i am typing and sending it through the company mail id only so that he will not ignore my mail 
The third party is not ever a auditor as well. See, he is a buyer. Our company is a supplier. I am the auditor of the supplier. Third party, do you know auditor of the supplier? See, today companies are completely, you know, controls will be there. Unknown mail address, but all they get any mail, they don't even ignore. They don't. They respond directly going to the trash box. So I need to send from my company mail and mention that. Please reply to my mail ID. That is what. That is how direct direct confirmation is made. Earlier, no. When this mailing system is not popular, what they do? They do. You know, company letterhead will be there. No. On that auditor will type and sign and then send the letterhead in a registered post. Third party will reply. Are you getting the point? The ability of the intended conforming party. Okay, to provide requested, how far the other party has the ability to give this information? Whatever I'm asking for, accounts manager of the company do not have this right to respond. Getting it? So to whom I should ask? That also I should confirm. I should keep in mind while designing my request to address you whom I should keep. Getting it? In the conforming parties, in the company who whose name I should attach? So I should keep in mind that aspect also. Are you getting the point? Next. Then finally, sending the request, including follow-up request when applicable. Suppose management is refusing. The auditor to get an external confirmation. Ask management why are they refusing? Is the genuine? Is the reason genuine? Justified? Look at that. If there is a genuine reason, try to get evidence in alternative way. Generally, we get a uh, 31st March closing balance of inventory is there. So 31st March some debtors is there or trade payables is there. For that, I am unable to get confirmation. But I am doing audit in May or June month. By this time, it would have been settled. You no, know? I check. I will check subsequent payments and subsequent receipts whether the amount is settled or not. If the amount is settled in April month or May month, it's a proof that it is outstanding on 31st March, right? Ah, huh. so that's an alternative evidence. Try to get evidence from alternative sources. Suppose if management refusal is unreasonable, or if you are unable to obtain evidence from alternative sources, you have to consider action as per SS 705. The man, the uh, the standard will say the auditor shall consider implications as per 705. 705 implications means what? I am ending up with no evidence. No evidence means what? Qualified or disclaimer? Are you getting it? Suppose third party replied, there is no refusal, nothing. Third party replied, but I have a doubt on the reliability. I have a doubt on the reliability. Then I need to perform additional audit procedures to resolve this doubt. To resolve this, I need to perform additional work. Suppose, in spite of doing additional work, if I am unable to resolve, still I am having a doubt. Doubtful evidence means no evidence. No evidence means modified opinion. Qualified or disclaimer. That's it. Standard is over. Clear. All of you, S F I not very confident. You have to read it later. Next. Now there is another question here. This is a question which is there in SA 330. This question is actually belonging to 330. Okay. What are the factors that helps the auditor in determining external confirmation procedure as substantive audit procedure? How far I can use external confirmation as one of the substantive audit? Obviously, one of the substantive audit procedure is what external confirmation. What are various types of audit procedures you have seen in CA inter inquiry? Inspection, yes or no? External confirmation, analytical procedure, recalculation, reperformance, all that. So one of the substantive audit procedure is what? And I, and I mean external confirmation. What factors you keep in mind when you are deciding external confirmation as one of the substantive audit procedure? We know external confirmation provide reliable audit evidence for some assertions. But for some assertions, it will not. Example: See, when I ask a trade receivable balance, no, from debtor, sir, we are having outstanding amount this much. What is there in your books? Sir, he also confirms saying that ten lakhs. External confirmation here provided me regarding existence of balance. But did, did this external confirmation did not provide me evidence about this? Do not provide evidence about recoverability of the balance. When I send an external confirmation to a debtor, no. Sir, in our books, ten lakhs is there. In your books, how much is there? What is outstanding? He replied ten lakhs. Does it mean he will pay me ten lakhs? Is there a guarantee that he will pay me for sure ten lakhs, whatever he is spending from his end? No. So external confirmation provide you know evidence only for one sort of evidence, one sort of assertion, not for all the assertions. See, assertion is a word which is used at a broader level. Getting the point? Sometimes assertion means item of financial. Sometimes assertion means for an item inside that. See, with respect to debtors, what are all the things I need to verify? Whether the debtor is existing, whether the debtor is recoverable, valuation, whether the debtor is complete, all the debtors were accounted completeness, whether all the debtors that were uh, arisen up to 31st March were accounted cut off, 
Are you getting it? You know, whether the get-offs were presented with the net of bad debts, provision and data note, presentation and disclosure, and whether, whether the get-offs were present, disclosed in the notes to accounts as more than six months, less than six months, a disclosure. With respect to the debtors, I have multiple assertions to be tested. Which assertion I am testing? If I am testing only existence of debtors, external confirmation is suitable procedure. If I want to test recoverability of the debtors, valuation of debtors, external confirmation may not be correct analyte, correct audit procedure. Are you getting what I am telling? Getting it? So that's one. So the auditor may determine external confirmation may provide one purpose. It's, it's an opportunity to obtain audit evidence about other matters. It's just a one, one way to get information from the debtor. The conforming part is knowledge of the subject matter. How far the other party who is conforming have the knowledge of this matter, importance of this matter. That is also one of the important factors. Suppose in the organization, nobody have an idea about external confirmation. What is its impact? It is useless for me to perform external confirmation. Getting it? The ability of or willingness of the conforming party to respond. How far conforming party is willing to respond? If I send a confirmation to there is one company, defense company is there. They don't respond to anybody. One, we, we, we sell, we, we, we supply some goods or services and they, they pay. That's it. In between, no communication is permitted with them. Getting the point. That is a rule. We, when we enter into the contract, that's a rule made. Getting it. Because they don't want to refer, communicate with everybody. That you are dealing, whether it is your auditor, whether it is your accountant, doesn't matter. We deal only with the CEO of the company. Are you getting the point? So like this also some rules will be there. So how far? So all this. So these are all the points which will decide the auditor, which will enable the auditor to decide better whether shall I use external confirmation or not. Clear? Easy or not? Next. Then SF item, initial audit engagement, opening balances. Two minutes gap. Learning new points. Yes, next one. So, SA 510, initial audit engagement and opening balances. See, the standard particularly has to be followed whenever you accept an initial audit engagement. What is an initial audit engagement? If at all you are appointed for the first time as an auditor for that enterprise, then that's the first time you're doing audit of that entity. So, that's an initial audit engagement. Getting it? Or, you are the first auditor of that entity. I can say you are first auditor of the entity. They actually, the standard uses a different wordings. Initial audit engagement is an engagement in which prior period financial statements were audited by a predecessor auditor or prior period financial statements were not audited at all. Getting the point. In both these cases, in both these cases, you have not audited the last year closing balances. Somebody else have audited. Or the last year closing balances might be there or might not be there. Or if at all is there, they were not audited. Means the opening balances were unaudited. But remember, opening balances will directly impact closing balances. You are supposed to give opinion on the closing balances whether they are true and fair or not. Whether closing balances are true and fair, it depends upon true and fairness of the opening balance plus current year transactions true and fairness. If both are true and fair, closing balance will be true and fair. But opening balance you did not audit. Previously, somebody else have audited. Can you take that? Opinion and report. Yes, very much. Because he is also a chartered accountant. He has given the opinion that they are true and fair. You can take that. If at all, during the current year audit, if you find any circumstances that indicate opening balances for containing material misstatements, identify what is that misstatement. What is meant by opening balance containing material mistake? Nothing but prior period item. Nothing but what? Prior period item. Now, whenever you identify any prior period item, check whether company has adjusted it in the books of accounts correctly as applicable for prior period items or not, check it out. If the company has adjusted and correctly disclosed and accounted, everything is fine. You just do audit procedures to document that and that's it. Getting it? Suppose if prior period items were identified by the auditor, but they were not rectified or accounted or disclosed correctly by the management, you give modified opinion. 
Are you getting the point? And you should get sufficient appropriate evidence regarding whether opening balances are true and fair or not. For this, you need to do some specific audit procedures like you need to tally opening balances whether they are correct or not. Take last year audited financial statements. Take last year audited financial statements. Match that with the current year opening trial balance. Yes or no? If they are matching, then opening balances is true and fair. And try to perform audit procedures for opening balances. Cut off we have to do once again. Once again we have to perform cut off. Example, last year closing balance is the debtors. That itself is opening balance of debtors. Now see whether the debtor is paid this year or not. Now see whether the creditor which we showed in opening balance we paid to them correctly or not. Whatever inventory they said, opening balance. Whether are the sales made, FIFO method out of that inventory or not, check it out. Are you getting the point? If any purchases were made during the year, initial purchases, initial April month purchases, we should not use that goods. We should first uh, to sell the goods, you know, opening balance related goods we need to use and sell. See whether the entity did that correctly or not. All these subsequent transactions, if you verify, it will provide an evidence that opening balances is true and fair. Are you getting the point? So, that's what they mention here. So, opening balance, there is a definition for initial audit engagement where prior period financials were not audited or prior period financials were audited by predecessor auditor. By the way, in this standard, totally, in this standard, we totally confined to three elements. Okay, one is opening balances, another one is accounting policies, another one is predecessor auditor's report. What is this element in this standard? What we are, what is, what the standard is discussing regarding this? If predecessor auditor was a different auditor from different audit firm and he has done the audit of the previous year financial statements and what opinion he gave in the audit report that you need to check. Suppose if predecessor auditor has given a modified opinion, look at the reasons. What is the reason why he gave a modified opinion? If you believe that reason is existing in the current period also and material in current period and relevant in current period, current auditor shall also give what? Modified opinion. And the fact that previous year financial statements were audited by predecessor auditor, that fact has to be reported in other matter paragraph. This is what the standard says. Are you clear? All of you. Now, if prior period financial statements were not audited, you should also mention that fact in the other matter paragraph that prior period financial statements were not audited. That's a 710 requirement. That's a 710. 510 and 710 has to be read together closely. Getting the point. In, five, in, in 710 corresponding figures. When do the auditor of the current period refer about corresponding figures? Generally, we don't refer in our audit opinion corresponding figures except if the prior period financial statements contain a material misstatement or if the prior period financial statements were not audited or if the prior period financial statements were audited by another auditor and the other auditor has given a modified opinion. In these three circumstances, we refer about prior period financials in our current audit report. That is what 710 says. Are you getting it? So, what 710 says, what SA 510 says, 510 also says, disclosure is matching similarly. So, nothing, you know, said there is no problem. Now, accounting policies, what auditor has to check? If you observe, there is a definition for opening balance also. And the definition of opening balance includes accounting policies. The definition of opening balance includes what? Accounting policies. Nothing but opening balance includes not only the balance sheet numbers. Not only, generally whenever we think of opening balance, what do we think? It's a ledger balance. But not only that, accounting policies also be treated as opening balance. Even not only that, pending litigations and contingencies, commitments that we have showed in the notes to accounts, no, they will also be part of opening balances. You need to obtain evidence for all the opening balances. Are you getting the point? You need to see what is the status of contingency commitment that we showed in the last year closing balance or opening balance. What is the status in the current year? We need to check. We need to check accounting policies. Whatever accounting policies that were reflected in the opening balances, are they consistently applied in the current period and they followed in the current period? You need to check. If there is a change, normally change is possible. If there is a change, whether the change is on account of proper reason, whether the change is properly accounted, properly disclosed, auditor has to check. Whenever there is a change in accounting policy, 
because of that some accounting implications will arise whether that accounting implications were that were made second one whether the change is properly disclosed in the financial statements or not also you have to check out if at all there is a change in accounting policy but management did not account to the impact of change correctly they did not disclose fully the effect of the change correctly then auditor shall give modified opinion adverse or qualified because here i have an evidence that the effect is not correctly done i have an evidence so modified opinion qualified or adverse Suppose if management did not let me to verify accounting policies at all, then disclaimer will come. All of you. Then the third element is opening balances. Opening balances, what auditor has to check, determine whether prior period closing balances have been correctly brought forwarded to current period. Today it is automated systems, automatically will be brought forwarded. So you need not check this point in reality. Okay. Whether opening balances reflect application of accounting policies, you need to check. Obviously, whenever there is a change in accounting policy in the accounting software, you will find that. Perform one or more of the following. Inside that, the C point 1, 2. That's it. Okay. These are 1 and 2 sub points inside C. Whether audit procedures performed in the current period provide evidence for opening balance. What does it mean? In the current year bank statement, there is a receipt. From whom it is received? Debtor. When he has to pay, as on 31st March, he has to pay. So, current year, we received about from debtor who is outstanding as on 31st March. It's an evidence that debtor value is correct, no? Are you getting it? Then, performing specific audit procedure like opening trial balance, opening trial balance, I'll compare with the previous year approved balance sheet, audited balance sheet. Suppose, if auditor obtains, you know, because of this audit, current period, we do some procedures due to which I identify some prior period items. Misstatements that could materially affect the current period financials. Auditor shall perform additional procedures to determine the effect on the current year financials. If auditor concludes that material misstatement exists in current period financials, inform the management, top management to rectify them. Suppose, in spite of informing the top management, if management has not rectified the financials, we give modified opinion. That's it. Now, what is the audit conclusion? If auditor concludes opening balance contain material misstatements, the effect of the misstatement is not accounted correctly or not adequately presented or disclosed. Remember, opening balance containing material misstatement means obviously it's a prior period item. If prior period items were there which are not accounted properly, not disclosed properly, auditor shall give a qualified opinion or adverse opinion. Suppose if management is not giving information to you properly, then a qualified opinion or disclaimer of opinion. Suppose if you are having problem with consistency of accounting policies, qualified opinion or adverse opinion, I already spoke. Yes or no? That's it. Are you clear? 5, 10. All of you? Then. 2 minutes. You can use smart notes also, which will be, which will be similar to this. Presentation is similar to this. Now, student, many will ask me, Sir, how can I summarize from the main material? Only if I have a short notes, I can revise quickly. But if there is a main material, how can I revise quickly? It's just a reason. You see, how am I revising from the main material now? Have you seen it? Like I am using main material only in the entire past 4-5 hours onwards. How am I filtering the information? Correct, huh? If you have grip on the main material, you can filter it easily. Getting it? It is just an excuse. Chat books, color books, all this is just a marketing strategy. Nothing else. Honestly speaking, I feel very comfortable revising from main material rather than smart notes or colored notes. Because in main material, I know how to filter. If I have a doubt, I'll read full sentence. If I do not have a doubt, I'll read the highlighted point. That's it. Getting the point. So you must know how to filter the notes from the main material always. Don't assume if there is a main material, are this much matter only, I should read only the end. No, nothing such. You see, this is this itself is best example. This itself is best example. How I revised quickly, in spite I do not have any short reference here. Getting it? So, that skill set you should develop. You develop that skill not from any external factors, only by reading that thoroughly. If you read that thoroughly, you develop that skill naturally. Getting it? If you read, no. See, I have absolute command on my book. Because of which I can filter the information fast. Whatever the book that you are reading in regular class, main material, you must get command on that book. If you did not get command on that book, then something is wrong. If you get command on that book, you need not look for any short notes. Sir, in exam before, day before, I will have only one day. Within one day, how to revise from it? 
how to revise it i'll revise it you give me 3 hours time i'll revise entire book able to understand it all depends upon how you look at the things it's all like see every one of you have this skill the problem is you are not realizing that you have this skill you are not realizing you are misguided getting it everyone will have this skill you know how to filter this information whatever is you need but only thing is you never try that you think this will not work without trying that whether it is working or not most of the assumptions you see whatever you have in mind you have never tried it just somebody told you follow somebody what they told why they told for them somebody told you see that this is a chain correct huh? read always from main material that's what i recommend always i told right smart notes is just for the student satisfaction just for the satisfaction of student i eliminated certain points where i feel not even relevant at all and then i gave just for their satisfaction but it you will never get that clarity and command like how you get it when you read from a main material even if you read part of it only but read from main material correct huh? just best example when you want to watch a movie again but you don't want to watch the entire movie do you completely edit the movie into cuts and pieces and then watch the edited version or do you watch the movie with fast forward option that's intelligence the person stupid only will do entire editing process only a stupid will do entire editing and clips clips all that and then merge into a separate file and watch that merged file thinking that he is doing intelligent work but what is doing is you know stupid work correct and tell me obviously when you're fast forwarding you know you see fast forwarding means not watching at higher speed again don't confuse with that okay you are fast forwarding the cursor you are moving fast okay and somewhere suddenly you feel hey this point was important then obviously you'll stop and watch no will you get that feel in fast track material and uh, you want to say hey, where is the full point will, will it appear there so only that is possible that flexibility is there only in the main material all our day to day principles you apply in the education it will work very well you will learn very well okay we we only apply uh, you know see it's it's a mindset at the end of the day whether it is education it's an activity whether you're watching a movie it's an activity whether you're playing cricket it's an activity all these are activities only understand in all the activities you'll have a same mindset but you are applying a different mindset when it comes to education a hey, watch reading concentratingly do you go to a movie a be concentrated hey, take running notes the movie otherwise you will forget who said it's all it's all i'm telling you are you are functioning against the human system getting it by taking running notes focus on listening getting it for this you must have curiosity what is important for listening to the class is not concentration but curiosity how do you develop that curiosity getting it if you have that uh, you know hey, i have to be perfect in the subject then naturally that curiosity comes if you do not have that intention of becoming perfect or master in that subject you will never develop that curiosity no matter how interestingly i speak getting the point if you are sitting here hey, i just need 40 marks only not it further only i am coming here if you sit with that mindset i cannot change no matter how much efforts i put even if i take 100 hours if you having that mindset i cannot change getting it hey something is there in audit i need to learn why i am unable to learn this audit subject what happened behind this somehow i need to chase this and you know become master in that if you have this kind of courage you learn this because when i read this subject i have that kind of courage only when i get a new amendment i have that kind of courage only getting it L let's see people said right subject let me make it interesting with that courage only i read able to understand so it's all about the mindset just your mindset has to be changed next can i proceed 560 so sa 560 subsequent events better no relatively at a faster level only we are finishing with much clarity i hope you are comfortable right the speed okay because i need to again cover ethics i need to cover audit committee and if possible bank audit and fiscal laws okay now sa 560 subsequent events see for subsequent event you observe sa 550 related part and 560 a subsequent event for all of this you have an accounting standard already able to understand then why there is a specific auditing standard for these two items only 
the accounting standard requirement is different the auditing standard requirement is different now you know sa 550 related parties the trans the standard heading itself is related parties that's it related parties you have an accounting standard disclosure of related party transactions so disclosure of related party items some i some you know this thing, this thing is there in accounting the primary agenda is all the related party relationships and transactions must be accounted and disclosed in the notes to financial statements at one place so that people can understand the financial statements in a better way but whereas in auditing standard the primary objective of sa 550 is what you know identifying fraud risk factors what is it identifying fraud risk factors relating to related party relationships and transactions company you see sa 240 you see sa 240 one of the fraud risk factor one of the opportunity for doing fraudulent financial reporting is related party transactions one of the fraudulent most of the companies do tax frauds most of the companies do valuation frauds only through related party transactions have you yes or no most of the companies do valuation business valuation frauds through related party transactions tax frauds happens through related party transactions auditing standard focuses on those fraud risk factors auditing standard focuses on what fraud risk factors sa 550 is having two objectives primary objective is fraud risk factor secondary objective is whether the related party relationships and transactions are they disclosed as per applicable financial reporting framework that is secondary object must understand you look at sa 550 objective it is very clear getting it the primary objective of the auditor is to identify fraud risk factors in respect of related party relationships and transactions that were entered into by the company by the entity secondary objective is whether all the related party relationships and transactions as required by the applicable financial reporting framework were correctly accounted and disclosed that is sa 550 so i hope you understood how sa 550 is different from accounting standard now sa 560 we have something like india's 10 or as 4 so no even after reporting period even after reporting date what is that we all know accounting standard see as part of audit do we need to check whether all the accounting standards are complied or not we need to check obviously subsequent events we check no we verified subsequent events whether the company has accounted all the subsequent existing events correctly or not we check as part of accounting standards then what is auditing standard requirement what is the need of this i already checked as per accounting standard what if what if there were 12 subsequent events but you accounted only 10 but two subsequent events were not accounted by the company and these two events you found after you give audit report after you gave the audit report you found two events adjusting events which were not accounted in books that is what sa 560 deals with you see sa 560 subsequent event definition events identified by the auditor after the reporting date yes or no but on or before the date of auditor's report sorry subsequent events or the events identified events that are happened between the date of financial statements and the date of auditor report and the fact came to the knowledge of the auditor after the date of audit. that is the importance of sa 560 if i identify subsequent event after audit reported what to do that is why sa 560 are you getting it if at all i identify subsequent event well before audit report date i know how to deal with them as per accounting standard i have verified all this but what if if i identify any subsequent event after the audit report is given now i identified subsequent event which happened between balance sheet date and the audit report date which happened between balance sheet date and approval of the financial statement it happened between the time only but i didn't discover then i discovered after i gave my audit report to the company now what should i do that's what sa 560 says are you clear you see accounting standard definition and this you can understand the crux accounting standard subsequent event means what even occurring after the date of balance sheet but on or before the date of approval of the financial statements by the authority those who are having that okay that's it accounting standard definition stops there and what accounting standard says all the events that are happening between this has to be classified into existing non existing non existing if it is predominant disclose it existing has to be adjusted that's what accounting standard says so management identified so many subsequent events and adjusted them you also verified it you also understood that yes all the adjusting events were adjusted you gave audit report suddenly after few days you got to know there is two more events which were not rectified which were not adjusted 
but happened before audit report date happened before approval of financial statements date but i found them only after audit report date now what is the course of action i should take for which auditing standard gets you understood that is silent in accounting standard what auditor has to do if auditor identified any subsequent event not rectified by the management after audit report date accounting standard is not talking about that so auditing standard is there understood or not all of you now auditing standard subsequent event date of financial statements in accounting standard they call it as date of balance sheet getting it so events occurring after date of financial statements on or before date of auditor's report whereas here on or before date of approval approval of financial statements getting it any events happened between this any event happened between this is called as subsequent event are you getting it now you see the auditing standard uses the word you know audit report date whereas here they uses the word approval of financial statements date if at all these real dates were different no it will conflict that's why in reality what we keep these both dates are same whatever the date on which financial statements were approved the same date auditors will also keep what is the date of audit report as per ss 700 it should not be earlier than sufficient appropriate evidence and not earlier than approval date which means it can be on the date of approval or after the date of approval. Suppose company signed on 10th May approved, but you are giving audit report on 10th June. Example, company approved on 10th May, you are approving it on 10th June. Suppose between 10th May and 10th June, two events happened. Management will say, I will not rectify because as per accounting standard, I don't have obligation. Auditor will say it has to be rectified because auditing standard, it is rectifiable event. Understood? Now this conflict is then who are right? Auditor is right in his point of view. Accounting management is right in their point of view. So there is no, there is a doubt here. So that's why in order to avoid this kind of conflict, in reality, what people will follow? Date of audit report is equal to date of approval of the financial statements which is accepted. Are you getting the point? You see Reliance, you see Tata, for all of them, date of audit report is matching with the date of approval of the financial statements by the authority. It is matching. Are you clear? Now, now, between these events, there are 12 events happen. How many? 12 events. But management identified only 10. Auditor also verified them that time. He also identified only 10. All the 10 were rectified. But you know, after 10th June, auditor gave audit report, right? After 10th June, you know, somewhere nearby AGM, somewhere nearby AGM, auditor found some two events he got to know about two events with respect to a contingent liability as on 31st march conditions exist as on 31st march court case already declared but company did not get the information from the lawyer that is the reason company is not aware of the real liability which is a contingent liability company showed it as contingent but it's a real liability but company did not rectify auditor came to know about that after audit report is given now what to do this is the question are you getting the point? Now what auditor has to do? Now here, on which date I came to know, first I will see. I got to know on 10th August. I got to know this about, about this item on 10th August. What is 10th August here? Is it before, is it before the financial statements are issued to the people or after the financial statements are issued? Okay, you gave audit report, but you gave audit report to management, not to the shareholders. Did management send audit report, financial statements, annual report to already to the shareholders? No, not yet. Still it is in the hands of the management. Oh, do one thing. Financial statements were not yet uh, issued. What auditor has to do? Discuss with the management about this. And inquire how management is going to resolve this. If management agree to rectify the financial statements again, see whether it is rectified, do audit procedures and get documented. Give a new audit report. What is it? Give a new audit report. Are you getting the point? Second one, suppose management is not agreeing to rectify. Management decided, sir, already approved, sir, we cannot rectify. I will take back my audit report. I will tear it and throw off. Give a new audit report with a modified opinion. Because some subsequent events were there which were not rectified in the financials through which, due to which financials are misleading. Are you clear? This is one case. When this, this I can do when, when financials are not yet issued to public. What if financials are issued to the public? People are coming, planning for coming to AGM. Getting the point? 21 clear days were given, right? For what reason 21 clear days were given? Huh? Sorry? Ah, exactly. 
they have to go through all the financial statements take advisories all that and prepare for taking a decision and participating in the agm and participate in the resolution making process not for booking train ticket bus ticket getting the point fine somebody told me earlier for booking train tickets and all no so suddenly if i tell stakeholder to come tomorrow agm it will be very difficult for him no so 21 days before if i give it will be very easy for him to book, to book reservation ticket who told you somebody has told him okay <laughs> fine so if financial statements are already issued to the public if financial statements are already issued to the public then i will ask management how are you going to rectify this so management said no don't worry sir still 10 more days for the for the people to come agm anyhow we are sending mails we are sending annual report everything we already sent through mail only we didn't send anybody physical copy nobody said it is dmat format dmat means only through mails we will communicate to the people so no have you any anyway, have any of you received annual report physical format no it's only through the mail you will get and it is published in always so company told sir we publish everywhere in our official website everywhere about this event we publish we make revised financial statements we will distribute revised financial statements to all the shareholders once again getting it you also give audit report one more audit report with a highlight specifically mentioning about old audit report data mention old report date that contains what mistake mention that this new, new report this is called dual dating what is this called as dual dating have you seen this word yeah so in sa sa 560 there is a point called dual dating write about dual dating of the audit report getting it dating by audited to to be related to no not that okay fine so financial statements issued to the public so financial statements issued to the public means this procedure we need to follow suppose no management said sir what sir at this moment already issued financials why to create all this mess then auditor has to take appropriate action that's what the standard says what action auditor has to take nothing is given are here so what action auditor can do here you have a right to attend to gm general meeting you can read out at the general meeting ah uh, in the general meeting you stand out and read to the shareholders that there is a mistake in the financial statements and to that extent audit report also containing a mistake because i didn't highlight that in audit report so make a note regarding this like that i need to inform the shareholders in the audit general meeting suppose this third case is not covered in the standard that is my own case what if general meeting also over and now you found out nothing can be done obviously no the standard is silent so nothing can be done in the next year we will treat it as prior period item in the next year what do we treat it as prior period item that's it this is sa 560 are you clear now in sa 560 what questions that is possible the only question that is possible in exams is write audit procedure for subsequent event what is the audit procedure what auditor has to do to identify subsequent events i will have to first ask management getting it enquiry management top management discussing with the lawyers minutes of the meeting reading the entity latest, latest financials i will see whether any new commitments borrowings happened after 31st march i will see whether any sale or acquisition of assets happened after 31st march i will see whether any you know uh, incident happened by fire flood all that to identify significant non existing events and i will see any development regarding contingencies after 31st march what is the progress of the cases pending as on 31st march whether any unusual accounting adjustments were made after 31st march 31st march everything is fine after 31st march within 2 3 weeks some accounting adjustments were made which are affecting the previous closing balances so like this i will try to verify to know whether any subsequent events were there or not clear now you see this is a this is a procedure which you have to do for auditing subsequent events getting the point this procedure standard procedure now because of this you might discover subsequent events before audit report date only or even after audit report date or after date of audit report also you may discover clear what an idea that is what all that i, I spoke case 2 case 1 all that i spoke you read it you will understand okay just 2 minutes
or else no, I will save this as a different file. Next one, SA 580 written representation. Remember, written representation is something that we need to do at the end of the audit procedure of every item. That is not the main audit evidence, remember. See, what is written representation? It is taking a declaration from the company that for that particular item, the company board of directors believe that it is true. Suppose they appointed me as an auditor. First day I went to the management. Dear management, do you believe your financial statements are true and fair? Yes, they said true and fair. Give a declaration, declaration. Since management said everything is true and fair, audit report is true and fair. What is, what is the use of you doing audit? Because we are having doubt on the management only, we send you. You are asking them again, you are coming back and doing this. That is not the purpose of written representation. So written, now then why we need to get written representation? It's a proof that you communicated with management. It's a proof that you communicated with the management. Audit happened in a harmonized manner. Getting the point? You continuously interacted with the management in every aspect of the audit. Tomorrow if management blames, no, auditor has never visited us. He went and he just took all the books of accounts, financial statements and he only did the audit. He never contacted us. He never consulted us. If management is blaming, no. This will act as a proof. Written representation also gives me information. Remember, obviously management will give me additional information. And obviously that is what the main source of information in audit. What is the main important evidence in entire audit is management information. Obviously. Obviously, because no, tell me whom I should ask. You know, suppose I went to Infosys campus or I went to TCS campus, some, some 250 acres was there. Okay, or, or else I am appointed as an auditor for Amazon in Hyderabad. Getting it. To which cabin I should go? 15,000 cabins were there. To which cabin I should go? Whom I should ask? Obviously, I should ask management only. Whatever information I want, I should ask management. Whatever explanation I want, I want to ask management only. In fact, by discussing with predominantly with the management only, audit can be conducted. Are you getting the point? So management, by ignoring management, you cannot do audit at all. It's impossible. So whatever information you need for the audit, clarity you need for various items of the financial statements, only management can provide. Now whatever they are giving, to that you search for supporting evidences. Getting it? Management says, sir, where is purchase register? They showed purchase register. They accounted. Accounts register, they showed. Complete soft copy, like electronic copy. Accounts register, they showed. So for that, you need to search for proofs. Where is supplier invoice? Where is EV bill? Where is GRN? Where is purchase order? Getting it? So you will ask for proofs. That proofs gathering is your duty. And that is what main objective. Incidental objective is discussing with the management. And through discussing with the management, you do the audit. Once you completed the audit, okay, you felt whatever purchase orders were made in respect of which goods were received on or before 31st March, all these receipts were accounted in books of accounts as purchases. You convinced that they were completely accounted. Ask funds management or all purchases were accounted fully. They also said yes. Give me a declaration. So written representation is to support your audit evidence. Written representations, no, they say corroborative in nature. Corroborative means what? Supporting evidence. Corroboration means supporting evidence, additional evidence. That is not main evidence. Corroboration means supporting. Are you getting it? So written representation, you see the definition. Written representation is nothing but a statement provided by management to the auditor. For what? They are confirming certain matters which auditor is asking. Or the representations are supporting other information which auditor has got. So written representation is supporting my other audit evidence. Getting it? Written representation do not include financials and assertions therein and supporting risks. Financials and books of accounts, they are not representations. Inside financials, inside books, some item is there. Regarding that, you are asking management some explanation. That they give to a written representation. That is written representation. Are you clear? Representing means what? That there is something in the financials. On behalf of that, I am representing you. That's why written representation. Representation on behalf of financial statements on behalf of books of accounts. That's why written representation itself is not financial statement. Are you clear? Now, can I use written representation as audit evidence? Of course you can use, but that is not the main evidence. That is not sufficient appropriate evidence. That can only corroborate in nature. Getting it? Written representations are necessary. They provide some necessary information that auditor requires in connection with the audit. 
getting it similar to response when i make an inquiry written representation is also an audit evidence although written representation provide necessary evidence they do not provide sufficient appropriate evidence on their own are you getting it so for you sufficient appropriate evidence is required getting it external evidence is required wherever possible you need to seek for external evidence see external confirmation is different external evidence is different suppose when i purchase goods third party is giving bill no that is an external evidence electricity bill came no that's an external evidence because this is an evidence created by outsiders not you are you getting it next so what is the date and period for which you can get representation can i get representation for old year audits i need to get representation for the current period financial statements which i am doing audit can i get written representation after the date of audit report what is the use so written representation must be obtained on or before the date of audit report as near as practicable to the date of audit report when you are doing the audit you should get written representation but not later than after the date of audit report so the date shall be as near as but not later than date of audit report the written representation shall be for the financial statements and period referred in audit report whatever the period for which you are doing audit for that period you should get written representation logical or not next from whom from whom you should get representation whoever you think is knowledgeable person for that information suppose you want to talk about normal loss percentage okay production manager is suitable person for getting written representation about normal loss calculations all that you want to talk about inventory okay stores manager might be the corresponding person you want to talk about accounting policies the audit committee people might be the correct people or accounts manager might be the correct person to discuss about accounting policies that are followed by the company you want to talk about you want to know information or status on pending litigations company lawyers were correct person to give representation on that from whom you should get representation from the knowledgeable person in that field in that matter in that assertion is the right person so this itself can be asked as a four marks question okay fine so the auditor shall get written representation from the management from the management with appropriate responsibilities for financial statements and knowledge of the matter concerned written representations of those which are requested from people who are responsible for preparation and presentation of financial statements generally this is what generally from them only we take representation because we want confirmation of the management for financial statement item shall we wait for few minutes so from whom you should get written representation this this itself can be asked as a four marks question they'll give written representation definition and as an auditor from whom you will obtain written representation they will ask from whom we should get from the people from the knowledgeable from knowledgeable people we should get written representation getting it so our auditor shall request representation from the management with appropriate responsibility for financials generally it is requested from those responsible for preparation of financials these people vary depending upon the governance structure of the entity suppose it, it may be obtained from chief executive officer or cfo or equivalent person within the entities sometimes some other people are you know responsible for preparation of presentation of financials like example accountants of the company so due to responsibility for preparation and its responsibilities for conducting entity business management would be expected to have sufficient knowledge of the process followed for the preparation of financials so as an auditor you can expect that company top management is aware of how the financials are prepared and presented in some in, in some cases management may decide to aim to make inquiries of others who participate in financial statements and assertions there is including individuals who have specialized knowledge like actuary engineers internal counsel production manager all of them getting it now in some cases management may include in written representation qualifying language to the effect that representation representations are made to the best of its knowledge and belief this language itself is called as qualifying language like management when representing no they don't say it as a 100% fact they say that they know that to the best of our knowledge and belief all the pending litigations and claims were disclosed this is what they give that doesn't mean why are you using this qualifying language you can say 100% presented no sir we present 100% only that's what i'm telling with the, to, to the best of our efforts to the best of our knowledge we presented all the thing who knows some one person might be ignored getting it 
Suppose if auditor has a doubt as to reliability of audit evidence, if written representations are not consistent with other audit evidence, I got I got evidence. I mean simply I got a confirmation from third party it shows some balance and written representation shows some balance. Both are not matching. What auditor has to do? Try to resolve the issue by performing additional audit procedure or alternative audit procedure. If auditor is unable to resolve it, he will give a modified opinion. If written representation is not provided, I will discuss the discuss the matter with the management or next higher level of, level authority. And why are they not providing? I will recheck their integrity. Getting it? All these days, whatever they have done to me, I will recheck once again. Are they doing it honestly or not? And take appropriate action as per seven zero five. Clear? That's it. Written representation standard is completed. Next. Next is. Uh, 550. See, in the same application, there is something called Smart Notes Section 22, handwritten notes for a few topics. For SA 550 and 402, I recommend our students also to read the handwritten notes only directly. Okay, because I filtered that and read, I wrote. Which is very easy. There is a structure which I followed here, and I also made paragraph references for further reading. Getting this is reading basic reading, and you need to read from the pronouncement actually. Uh, 550 standard and 402 standard ICA book is asking directly you to read from the pronouncement. Directly from the pronouncement, you have to, and even for 540 also. But for 540, I give a material directly. Full fledged material I have clearly mentioned. Just a minute, I, it, it will not be opened. So for various standards I have given like this, but but I ask you to refer only 550 and uh, you know this one. For 550 and even for this one, which one? Uh, yeah, 402, only for these two you refer this notes, for other standards not required. For other standards refer our main material only. Getting it all smart notes. Now, SA 550. SA 550 related parties. What is the objective of this standard? First of all, who is a related party? If the applicable financial reporting frameworks defines related party, then follow that definition only. Obviously, in all the frameworks, related party is defined. In all the frameworks. Getting it? If Applicable financial reporting framework do not contain related party or contains a minimal requirement about related party, then follow auditing standard definition of related party. So, related party is not directly defined in auditing standard. They are asking you primarily to follow, stick to accounting standard. If there you think it is not correctly made, then come back to auditing. But in India, India is clearly defined who are related parties. Companies are clearly defined who are related parties. So, auditing standard definition we do not use at all. But in exam, they may be asking. Getting it? So, who is a related party? Who is a related party? The following persons. The following persons are treated as related parties. Any person or entity that has, that has control or significant influence over reporting entity. Suppose I am doing audit of the company, that is reporting entity. On that entity, if any other company has control or influence, means holding company or associate company which is influencing in this. That is related. Same way, any person in which our client has control or significant, means our company is a subsidiary and associate company will be there. No, they are related party and entities that are under common control now, my company is having sister concerns. Tata Motors is having TCS, Tata Chemicals, Tata Beverages, Tata Steel, Tata Power, 
you know there are so many tata sister companies were there all of them are related parties to each other because for all of them there is only a common parent tata sons are you clear so my holding company is my relative my subsidiary company is my relative somebody invested in me and influencing me is a relative see in somebody i invested in influencing the their relative and me and my sister companies who are all controlled by common parent we are all relatives getting the point abebo entities that are under common control of a state state means what government remember state means in dictionary meaning it's government getting it if at all entities that are under common control of a state no they are not treated as related party unless they engage in significant transaction this is something related to associated enterprise definition in income tax getting it now in income tax also who is an associated enterprise if significant transaction is made with them one of the criteria so we call them as associated enterprise see what is this definition very fundamental logic see in central pub see the public sector entities public sector enterprises of two types central public sector enterprises state public sector enterprises there are more than 700 plus public sector undertakings more than 700 700 government owned companies were there government owned companies i'm talking now tell me for all the central government owned companies common parent is government of india can i say all the 700 companies are related parties to each other exactly unless they engage in significant transaction that's why if at all this exception is not given this point says all the government companies are related parties to each other that is not correct fundamentally getting the point now what is an arms length price it is a price or it is a rate or it is a percentage whatever in the interest context it is percentage in the goods context it is price or rate getting it arms length price means not only price it may be rate of interest it may be anything else terms and conditions everything comes within the definition of arms length price getting the point arms length price is a price at which transaction is conducted between a willing seller and willing buyer who are unrelated independent and both are aiming for their own interest a seller want to always sell at a maximum price a buyer want to buy at always a lowest lowest price possible now what is the object of this standard this object of itself is important which is defined in paragraph 9 of ca 550 i have given paragraph references at most of the places even in the definition also i think i have given paragraph 10 definition getting it so these you have to read from the icia book only pronouncement book only you have to read preferably after finishing this you take this this pdf and refer read from the pronouncement book you will understand much more better okay primary objective what is the primary objective of this standard the primary objective of this standard is i'll use some different color to recognize whether any financial reporting sorry whether any fraud risk factor what is frf fraud risk factor that may okay that may cause risk of mms in related party relationships and transactions it is actually cosma okay cause c a u s e so to recognize the primary object of the standard is what to identify fraud risk factors which may result in risk of material misstatements in what related party relationships list related party transactions list are you getting the point and conclude whether the financial statements are true and fair with respect to related party relationships disclosure and accounting related party uh, transactions disclosure and accounting rp rp means what related party relations and related party transactions are you getting the point next what is secondary assurance we want to get assurance that the financials are prepared in compliance with applicable framework with respect to identification accounting and disclosure of related party relationships and the transactions with them many think this is primary objective whenever we think of sa 550 many will think it is just to check if accounting standard complies no accounting standard complies anyhow check whether this standard is there or not correct da whether this standard is there or not you are supposed to check all the accounting standards and as part of you anyhow you check it then why is the standard specifically drafted specifically it is drafted for fraud risk factors point of view clear all of you now audit procedure what is the audit procedure for related party transactions and relationships they'll ask you a question this is paragraph 
okay now write about audit procedures for identification and accounting and disclosure of related party relationships and transactions for marks question the last first you need to understand the entity related party relationships how do you understand acquire management what do you acquire what do you ask who are the list of related parties identified by the management and changes from compared to prior period last time we have 100 subsidiaries this time we have only one i mean 90 subsidiaries or this time we have 110 what are the changes happened getting it nature of the relationship is it subsidiary or associate or is it joint venture what exactly or is it a key managerial person who is I mean, what exactly any transaction centered if so type and purpose of them purchase of goods sale of goods loan given loan taken okay what is the purpose you just mentioned that yeah, your auditor has to ask all this and be alert when you are reviewing the records you see these are actually points one how what is the audit procedure first understanding of related party relationships and transactions by inquiry management and auditor has to be skeptical alert when reviewing the documents and records getting it and auditor has to be alert for identification of previously unidentified related parties getting it now so alert regarding this now look at the previous documents look at the following documents to identify previously unidentified related party relationships you do audit procedure not just to see you ask management who are the related parties Fine. will you leave with that you also want to identify is there any related party missed by the management is there any related party transaction that management did not account or management did not disclose separately yes or no so auditor has to check certain documents to identify related party relationships and transactions which are previously not identified by the management like what bank documents legal documents third party confirmations board meeting general meeting various other records able to understand you just have to check check investment register check share capital shareholding pattern getting it if the auditor identifies any transaction outside the normal course of business outside the normal course of business means generally we don't do such a size of such a quantum size of transaction generally we don't do transact in that particular month getting it so if any unusual transaction happened what is the nature of the transaction whether any related party involved to check out this is nothing but exceptional items what is this exceptional items look at all exceptional items what is the nature of exceptional item with whom it is done is it related party involved check out if so is it accounted and disclosed correctly check out able to understand next up suppose no auditor in the process of checking all these documents and inquiring identified some related parties which previously not identified by the management what should i do what should i do communicate this to the engagement team request management once again to identify all the related parties ask management why they have failed to identify where their internal control went wrong inquire why management failed to identify if the non disclosure of this related party is intentional based on your discussions with the management evaluate the implications fraud risk factor getting the point perform substantive procedures for the newly identified related party relationship and transaction and if you think any related party transaction is outside normal course of business it is a transaction with related party outside normal course of business whereas in the previously any transactions happened outside normal course of business this is all exceptional whereas here exceptional transactions made with related parties what is the rationale what is the necessity why are you selling at such a low price to this related party getting it i know you are selling goods to related party at a particular price why have you changed the price now why why there is a revision of the price all these days you are selling every month this much quantity suddenly this month why this much quantity has been sold to that particular related party what is the business rationale what is the need of the business terms of the transaction accounting and disclosure you have to check and finally get a written representation that management has accounted disclosed all the related party relationships and transactions to the best of their knowledge and belief nothing has been omitted to the auditor all the related party relationships transaction whatever they showed in the financials were shown to the auditor as well that's what that's what uh, with this the standard is over able to understand have you have you seen all these points earlier getting it so you need to understand so primary objective of the auditor is to identify fraud risk factor that may cause risk of material misstatement in related party relationships and the transactions and also secondary objective sufficient appropriate evidence whether management has accounted uh, disclosed properly all the related party relationships and transactions what is the audit procedure understanding of the related party relationships and transactions by inquiring the management maintaining alertness while reviewing the documents and if you identify any unidentified related party transaction communicate to your team 
Ask management once again to all the rival related party checking once again. See, there is something. I, I found this item, missing item. How many items missing really? Who knows? Once again, do. And ask manager why they did not discover this item. Is there any intention behind this? Identify and look at audit implications accordingly. And also try to figure out exceptional items happened in the company. What is the nature of the item? Whether related parties involved to check out. Are getting it? If at all any transaction made with the related party looks exceptional, what is the business rationale? What is the nature of transaction? And whether it is properly accounted, disclosed on it, you need to check. That's it. This is the main standard. Clear, all of you. Next. Again, I have to discuss SQC and 220. Okay, I need to discuss SQC and 220. Uh, let me discuss that and then go to 402. Okay, let me discuss that and go to 402. Can I? Huh? After that 540. After that 540. 540 I will tell you, but can you don't understand? Getting it? Because a bit difficult language again in that. But anyhow, I'll try my level best. Now this is SQC, standard on quality control or else I'll, I'll directly go with smart notes better. So this is SA220, the above is SQC, okay. Now, what's the difference between SQC and SA220? Many confused. SQ, SQC applicable for the audit firm. Getting it? You see here, very clearly it has been given. Quality control for firms that perform, it may perform audit, it may perform review, it may perform assurance or it may perform related services. These are the four types of engagements which are defined in engagement standards. So, heading is very simple. So, it's a quality control standard for firms that are performing audit and other uh, audit and review of historical financial statements, other assurance and related services engagements. So if you are performing related service engagement, other assurance service engagement, audit engagement, review engagement of historical financial statements, what kind of quality control practices you have to follow? What is the standard objective is very simple. See, in your firm, you are a partner, you may be permanent because it is your firm, you are permanent. But you are not alone doing the audit. You are hiring staff, hiring articles, you are hiring so many. Yes or no? Now, uh, you know, you, 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 want, you want them to do audit of sales, audit of purchases, audit of TDS, audit of GST in one particular manner. Getting it? So, uh, your staff went and doing audit of purchases, they verify so and so, so and so, so and so items. Another person, same purchases, he verifies so and so items which are not matching with the other person. There is no uniformity in your work. Establish that uniformity. Establish standard operating policies. Getting the point. Why have, why have, why have to establish, so even if a new article comes, junior article, even if I send him to do audit of a very big company, even if I send him to audit of a, audit of a company in which he needs to verify purchases, getting it, how he, what he has to verify in purchases, sir. These 11 points he has to verify, these 15 points he has to verify in every purchase voucher. Getting it? Whenever he selects any voucher, these 15 elements he need to verify. If I give a checklist like this, can I ensure quality of the audit or not? Okay, I will be having confidence that yes, all the 15 items he will verify. Not because I have trust on him, because I have trust on my checklist. So like this, you need to establish a written policies for everything in your firm. Getting it? So you need to establish policies and procedures. You see here, you need to establish... A Policies and procedures related to leadership responsibility. You need to establish policies and procedures for personnel. You need to establish policies and procedures for independence. You need to establish policies and procedures for acceptance and continuation of a client relationship. How to accept a client? 
how when to continue with an existing client so already we are having an existing client he is asking us to continue once again for next year can we continue or not what are the policies that my firm should take i am the main partner i am not there my second partner has to take a decision there is a policy document when can we say continue when we can agree for continuation of relationship suppose i am not their main partner a new a new client approach my second partner is calling every time and asking me should i accept it or not hey why are you asking me look at the policy document acceptance of new client there are some guidelines given if the guidelines are in that in those parameters if you fit in then you accept otherwise don't accept are you getting the point so establishing policies and procedures for leadership responsibilities for audit establishing policies and procedures for personal recruitment establishing policies and procedures for maintaining independence in mind and independence in appearance establishing policies and procedures for accepting clients continuing relationship with clients acts you know establishing policies and procedures for hr getting it establishing policies and procedures for monitoring of these quality control policies i established policies now i need to monitor the policies further down i should establish policies and procedures for this what what firms you do firms will do you know once audits are all completed there will be some dry months like april may where we don't have any works during these times whatever audits they perform would know already closed would know they take back those files and check their own quality review internal quality review we call it as that is called inspection what is it called as inspection as per sa 220 what is it called as inspection as per sa 220 getting it next next so finally we need to document the entire system of quality control these are the various aspects that are discussed in sqc now for all these aspects you are having so many sub points in exam any of that can be asked any of this sub point can be asked as a four marks question write about establishment of policies and procedures for human resource enhancing and engagement performance very good write about policies and procedures for monitoring three marks or four marks question you will have a detailed text in the main material are you getting the point sometimes they will ask this question what are the elements of system of quality control then you have to write only these main points any four able to understand this is asked many times four marks question what are the elements of system of quality control you have recently qualified as a chartered accountant and started obtained cob from the institute and started started practice as part of the practice you got to know that you have to implement quality control policies and practices as per sqc what are the elements of system of effective quality control four marks question you need to write this answer leo now coming to sa 220 what is this sa 220 you see here quality control this is also quality control standard for an audit of financial statements means it's about a particular engagement it's about a particular engagement you have accepted one audit of a client getting it how when you are doing audit of that particular client what quality control precautions you have to take i know your firm is already having so many quality control precaution list for a particular client what are the precautions you have to take what are the points that you should keep in mind remember engagement partner is ultimately responsible for the opinion he is expressing so that is what it actually says with that only it starts you know in a particular audit of financial statements who is having leadership responsibility engagement partner shall take responsibility for overall audit quality in respect of which he was assigned are you getting the point whereas sqc will says what in case of audit who is responsible who is having leadership in case of assurance who is having leadership in case of review who is having leadership in case of related services due diligence who is having leadership so and so who is having leadership so sqc will contain leadership points for so many types of works whereas here the standard straight away says for audit always who is responsible engagement partner who is engagement partner he is the one who is signing ultimately the audit report and financial statements of the client are you getting the point next up you see here so inspection is there there is something called inspection what is inspection it is in relation to a completed engagement completed engagement means what we already completed the audit okay procedures designed to provide evidence of compliance by engagement team with the firm quality control practices once audit is completed we take back our files we open our soft copies once again we check our audits whatever we performed whether have we done audit as per our firm quality control policies or not we ourselves check able to understand that process is called as what inspection it is one of the monitoring aspect of quality control it is one of the aspect of 
monitoring control. What is monitoring? It's a process comprising an ongoing consideration and evaluation of firm system of quality control, including periodic inspection of a selection of completed engagement. I don't know. Inspection is part of monitoring process uh, designed to enable the firm to obtain reasonable assurance that the quality control is operating effectively. Whatever policies and procedures firm has established, are they operating effectively or not? You must have a monitoring policy. What you will do as part of monitoring policy? You take complete engagement, inspect them whether they followed quality control policies or not. Whether in purchase audit of one of the company, purchases verification, do your team member follow purchase checklist that we, that we gave in our firm quality control manual? Yes, it is followed. Sales checklist is it followed from the quality control manual? Yes, it is followed. Now, after inspecting, I got a confidence that yes, our firm quality control policies are followed by our personnel when they are doing audits. Understood or not? So, this inspection monitoring is defined under SA 220. Not only that, in SA 2, SQC, there is a concept called who is an engagement partner, by the way? Remember, SQC, SA 220, you have to read simultaneously. Getting it? SQC. What? Who is an engagement partner? He is a partner of the firm or he may be another person in the firm who is a member of the institute and he is in full-time practice and responsible for the engagement and its performance and for the report that is issued on behalf of the firm and who, where required, has appropriate authority from a professional legal regulatory body. So, he is a partner of the firm or other member of the firm with COP. Are you getting the point? Generally, partner of the firm only, we call him as engagement partner. Are you getting the point? See, again, no. See, here other person in the firm, they use it, no? This is from the context of sole proprietary firm. In sole proprietor, partner word will not be there, no? That's why. So, in en engagement partner word can be used for sole proprietary firms, can also be used for partnership firms. Doesn't matter. Engagement partner, that person responsible for that yeah, audit engagement. We call him as what? Engagement partner. Are you clear? Now, there is something called engagement quality control review. What is this engagement quality control review? For listed entities, before I sign the audit report, see, my team, I will direct. I am an engagement partner. I took one team member. Okay, some three senior articles, two junior articles, one audit assistant who is a CA, one semi-qualified person I have recruited and all of them, we went and did an ITC company audit and we concluded we have documented everything. Finally, we have to give an audit report where we are giving unqualified opinion before I sign this report. Once I want to get a review. Okay. Because see, I know I may be biased to my team worked as per my direction. My team worked as per my instruction. So when I verify them, I don't find any mistake. First of all, is my instruction correct? Is my direction correct? So let me take an unbiased opinion. I will call my another partner. I will call my CEO who is a manager in my firm. Okay, who is also competent enough. Getting it? I will call him. Please, you review no once the entire work. How I planned, how I executed, how I concluded, how I took decision of opinion. Can you verify all this? And if you find something suspicious, just let me know. I will just ask him to review. And this process is called as engagement quality control review. Now, in respect of this audit, how qualitatively I did this audit? Yeah, we are reviewing before signing the audit report. This is called engagement quality control review. And the person whoever is reviewing, we call him as engagement quality control reviewer. What he need to do? He need to objectively evaluate. He need to objectively. Objectively means without any bias. Don't think that I am your partner. Think that I am an outsider objectively evaluate he has to objectively evaluate you see here he has to objectively evaluate the significant judgments engagement team made conclusions they reached in formulating the report whatever decisions we have taken while making this report whether our decisions are correct or not whatever judgments we made in this entire audit various places we took assumptions various places we took these many samples like that no you also evaluate if will you take these many samples or will you take additional sample? Do you say our samples, uh, sample checking is insufficient? So give me a review. That is called engagement quality control review. This must be done before the report is issued to the client. Are you getting the point? This is given in which requirement? I mean, the definitions were given in SU SQC. Every firm must establish policies and procedure for engagement quality control review. Now in audit, in audit SA 220 it says, before audit report is issued, able to understand, an engagement quality control review shall be performed on that audit. That is mentioned where 220. That is mentioned where 220, you see here. In engagement performance only, it will be mentioned. Performance of an audit means what? 
gathering evidence, conclusions and giving report. That is all performance of an audit. Planning of the audit, execution of audit, report, reporting on the audit is completely performance of an audit. It's all comes under performance of an audit. Now, who is responsible for entire direction, supervision, performance of the engagement, audit engagement, engagement partner is responsible. He shall only take full responsibility for the reviews performed as per firm policies or not. Ensure that members of the team have undertaken appropriate consultation. I should make sure that my team has coordinated with me, getting it, and only take two decisions with respect to various aspects. And for audit of listed entities, they may ask you this question. Oh, four marks. Write about engagement quality control review. This was asked in number 22, first question, I think, first or second question, or maybe in the May exam. I'm not sure exactly. Okay. In one of the question, important question, five marks question, they gave this. They gave this. I think in the last exam. May 22 of this exam, somewhere they give this question, 5 marks question, write about engagement quality control review, getting it. So, what is that? For audit of financial statements of listed entity and those of the other audit engagements, if any, for which the firm has determined that quality control review is required, generally for listed entity compulsory. For other audits, if firm determines, then we will do for other audits also engagement quality control review. Generally, the standard says listed entities is mandatory. For other audits, it's, it's firm's choice. If firm quality control policy says for every audit we do EQC review, then EQC review has to be done for every audit. In peer review, they will check whether this control, this control which the firm established followed or not. Getting it? The engagement partner shall determine engagement quality review is appointed, discuss matters arising during the audit and EQC review process with the engagement quality. So as a partner, I will have to discuss with him. Make sure that he is appointed for this engagement quality. Appointed means assigned. He is assigned. Who can be engagement quality control reviewer? First of all, the reviewer can be insider of the firm or an outsider of the firm. But who has knowledge of client business? Who has knowledge of accounting, auditing practices? Who has knowledge of firm's quality control policies? Getting it? Because you know, in EQC, what they will review? Whether when I am doing audit, have I followed? Did I follow? Getting it? Did I follow? Do I follow? Whether these. Uh, uh, you know, quality control policies are correctly implemented by me or not when I am doing audit. Whatever our firm established quality control policies, have we implemented that in our audit or not, they need to check. Getting it? And I shall not date the audit report until completion of the review. I shall not date the audit report until completion of the review. Who is an engagement quality control reviewer? He shall engagement quality control reviewer. What he shall do? He shall perform an objective evaluation of judgments made by the team, conclusions reached by the team while formulating report. And this involves discussion of significant matters with the partner. I will discuss all important points in the audit with the partner. Okay. Review financial statements of the company and also look at the audit report. Review some documentation, getting it, and uh, evaluate conclusions reached. Especially in case of listed entities, I will review firm's independence once again. The partner, the firm has accepted the audit. Okay. As a reviewer, I should also check whether independence policies were correctly followed or not. And I will also review conclusions that has taken place whenever there is a difference of opinion. Suppose if the partner and the firm quality control policies has a difference of opinion, firm quality control policy will prevail. If the partner is want to take one decision, in the same aspect, firm quality control policy says you should take this decision. Whenever there is a conflict, firm quality control policy only will prevail. Same way, when, when engagement quality control reviewer and partner has differences of opinion, firm quality control policies only will prevail. Firm quality control policies and procedures is ultimatum for audit firms. Their own policies and procedures, that is ultimatum. Whether audit documentation for the selected review reflects work performed in relation to the significant judgments and support conclusions. We simply, the reviewer has to check whatever the work you perform would know, whatever conclusions you reach would know, whether sufficient documentation is there or not, I just have to check. You called me to review your audit. I am reviewing. So show me the documentation. You you have you have concluded with respect to going concern, no material uncertainty. But you see here there is a material uncertainty. I will have to question like this, able to understand. If differences of opinion arise within engagement team and those consultants were applicable between the partner and quality control, within the team if difference of opinion arise or between the partner and reviewer difference of opinion arise, the engagement shall team follow the firm policies and processes for dealing with and resolving the differences of opinion. This itself can be asked as an MCQ. 
getting the point they'll give a statement in case of uh, difference of opinion arises between engagement quality control reviewer and the engagement partner the engagement partner decision will prevail false able to understand as per sa 220 in case of differences of opinion arise between the members of engagement team or if difference of opinion arise between the partner and engagement quality control review the firm quality control practices will prevail that's it and monitoring monitoring means what it's a it's an effective system of quality control see when when do i say my system is effective only when your system has a review mechanism only when your system has a review mechanism self introspection getting it so an effective system of quality control includes a monitoring process designed to provide the firm with reasonable assurance that policies and procedures of system of quality control are adequate operating effectively see checking quality control policies updating quality control policies is a continuous process in light of developments that are happening in the industry the engagement partner shall consider results of the firm's monitoring process as an evidence in the latest information circulated by the firm and if applicable network firms generally whenever a company whenever a partnership firm is a part of network firm quality control policies are designed by the network itself that's why all big four they'll have networks they only design quality control policies in ethics network guidelines were given in network guidelines they clearly say if firms formulated as a network for designing common quality control policies only then it is not network common quality control policy should be there common work methodology should be developed resource sharing should also be there then only we call them as what network are you getting it but again it's a debatable issue big debatable issue whether multiple firms fall under network or not just because of sharing quality control or sharing quality control is one of the important factors for calling them as a network there is a debatable issue for which we need to look at the ethics guidelines are you clear so this is regarding difference between sqc and sa 220 confident got an idea now you read slowly later on you understand see the, the, this audit uh, subject no this is not theory problem is see when i see you know policies and procedure i visualize all the documents because i have an exposure fortunate enough but some students they don't have an exposure in working in big forms when they don't have that exposure obviously no matter how much we discuss they will not understand so that's why in audit subject, if you want to understand the audit beautifully, you need to have exposure in industry. Getting it? I have seen all quality control policies and procedures. How leadership leadership responsibilities, you know, is implemented in a firm, I know. How independence is checked by the firm, I know. What documentation we collect for ensuring independence, I know. Exactly what they collect, I know. Getting the point. For all these points, I have a practical proof. I have a practical, you know, understanding of all these points. That's why I visualize better. Getting it? So many who worked in big firms will have this access. If at all you work in a very small and medium sized firms, you, know, you will not be having this access. Getting it? Tomorrow if at all you want to come into practice, you know, work for 2 or 3 years in a medium sized or above medium sized firm or big firm for 2 to 3 years. And you see the level of knowledge and exposure you get is completely different. In big four, no, you may not, you may not get work expertise, but you get exposure. What is important is exposure to things is important rather than expert in that. Once you get an exposure, later you become expert. Getting it? Auditing is not at all my favorite subject in my final. It's not that I don't like it. I like direct tax. More. Getting it? Audit, I just did formality and I got 59. Okay. So, and I don't even know what is audit report. When I qualified by CFNL, I don't obviously audit report. Like, how you know? How you don't know? Like see, same also, I also don't know anything about audit report. In our firm also audit report means last minute in the audit, before signing the financials, we just copy paste one the you know previous year and just we just modify the dates, we just modify the names, we just modify the CD place, all that and just take a print and for partner will sign and document it. That's the only thing I know. What is audit report means? But only now I know how important audit report is, how to do audit keeping in mind our reporting objective. Getting the point. Only now I know that. So, but one advantage which I have is since when I worked earlier, no, I got that knowledge, but I don't know that that is there in the book. But when I read this, I know that this is there in industry. I think that. So that helped me a lot. Because I had a work exposure first, later I read this complete material, then I think both of these both of these things and able to teach better. Able to understand. If at all I don't have that exposure, no, I cannot teach like this way. Next. So that's about SQC and SA220. Fine, all of you. So two minutes, we'll, we'll continue.
Yes. Let's start SCF 402. <coughs> so the standard, if you observe, audit considerations relating to an entity using service organization. It is also an important standard, of course. If this standard is seen by the paper setter, definitely he'll ask this question. If at all he notices this. If at all he didn't notice, you know, when he's setting up the paper, obviously he will not ask. It's all depends upon at the time of setting up the paper, whatever he sees. Okay, if it prompts him, generally this is one standard which prompts, getting it to test. So, auditor considerations relating to an entity using service organization. How many of you have read this standard before? No, not at all. I continue. Generally, people with half knowledge expect full knowledge, at, at least it will be happy. With no knowledge, expecting full knowledge is very difficult. Okay. Fine. So, audit considerations relating to an entity using service organization. Example, see today, most of the accounting softwares are used from outsourced. Getting it. Our entire accounting and financial reporting is completely dependent upon the software services which are provided by various accounting software rendering services companies. Getting it. And that itself, you know, entire accounting itself is outsourced, literally. I mean, it, we didn't outsource. We just insourced that software and using, we are only recording it. That may not come under the standard profile. Like, uh, See, in many, many enterprises, not every activity they only do within the enterprise. Some activities they outsource. Especially if any activity that is belonging to the financial statements or if any activity that affects significant class of transaction, if that is outsourced to a service organization, then an auditor has to be very careful about that. Example are uh, payroll. Payroll itself is one of the best examples. Like payroll processing. Payroll processing will be generally outsourced. Nowadays, many companies they don't have a HR department. They don't have a payroll department specifically. Why? Because payroll processing, recruiting, getting it, recruiting and grading the staff that itself is that itself uh, you know. That itself is a very big process which involves multiple people. And for them, the work will be there in a month for three to five days only. Now, for three to five days, well, why should I hire them and maintain entire month and every year fully I have to pay salaries, all this, yes or no? So, there are some companies which are exclusively providing payroll processing services. They maintain your attendance records, they maintain your employee leaves record. They maintain employee salary records. They maintain salary payment amount for that month, how much they should pay, that record. They only maintain tax deduction records. They only take care of tax planning, everything. Example, now many audit firms are providing this kind of service to various clients. Management, consultancy and other services. We call them as what? Management, consultancy and other services. Now tell me, if at all, company is only doing this entire payroll, attendance, everything, payroll, processing, salary, everything. No, they are only computing everything. Obviously, as part of my audit, I need to verify employee benefit cost. And for which I need to verify how the payroll controls are. But what happened? This company is not maintaining that. This company outsourced this activity to a CA firm. That is the point. Or some other payroll processing company. A payroll processing company is that to them they have outsourced. Now they are maintaining attendance record, they are maintaining leave record, they are maintaining employee sick leave, letters, everything, letters, all that. Documentation also they are only maintaining. Our company will hire the people and record it in the register of employees. The register access will be given to them and they will maintain attendance, everything. They just install some systems here. Getting it, attendance, biometric, face recognition, some software is implemented in our company. So every employee comes and takes attendance and come and work, that's it. I don't maintain payroll. I will just inform them what is, for whom I have hired, what is a pay to him per annum and I will just give that information offer letter to the rest about employees they will maintain. Are you getting the point? So they will maintain. Now the question is, 
if at all they are maintained within the company i must verify them obviously now they are maintained outside how should i verify if at all i want to verify that is a payroll processing company which has 300 plus clients like my company where i am doing audit if now see no, no my objective is very simple as part of an auditor i want to check whether controls related to payroll are operating effectively i want to check whether controls related to my payroll processes of this company are operating effectively so that i can ascertain whether employee cost is correctly accounted or not but the controls are not implemented in this company company is not doing that process that service organization is doing the process so i told my company okay don't worry i will go and check in the service organization how they are having controls related to payroll of our organization okay i'll go and check this payroll company is having 300 clients like that 300 company auditors also want to come and check this payroll company do they have to process the payroll or do they have to answer the auditors queries of all these 300 clients what they should do so what this payroll company came up with an idea which is that you don't send anybody you don't come we will appoint one assurance auditor i'm a payroll company right i appoint one assurance auditor getting it i will appoint one auditor for providing assurance on my see mr auditor of so and so client you are coming here for what reason you want to check whether my controls are operating effectively related to payroll you want to check whether controls were implemented correctly or not whatever the payroll controls in your organization where you are doing audit whatever controls they will implement whether those controls are implemented here or not you want to come and check and you want to check whether they are operating effectively or not also correct i'll do one thing like this 300 auditors were there 300 clients were there and they're all auditors are also coming getting the point just a minute so so like that all my 300 clients and their auditors are coming and asking so it is not correct for me to each and every auditor of every company who for whom i am doing payroll services i cannot answer so i'll do one thing i'll appoint one auditor who is here for providing assurance on the controls which are implemented in my organization and also he will give a report on operating effectiveness of my controls which are implemented in my organization i will appoint one assurance auditor as per 3402 standard as per 3402 standard i will appoint an auditor and he will give me a report now here there is a possibility of two types of reports okay type one i appointed an assurance auditor right i will ask him sir you come and verify whether we implemented controls or not just whether we implemented controls whether controls related to the payrolls are the existing or not you come and check and give a report this assurance auditor came checked all the controls everything yeah it is existing he is not talking about effectiveness of operation he is just talking about existence of controls and he gave a report that yes controls are existing now i took this type 1 report and i sent it to all my clients and they are all auditors have seen sir uh, you ok fine i understood controls are existing even in audit also we only see whether controls are existing or not but in our audit sir we also want to know whether controls are operating effectively now again these people all, all came back not every company auditor came back some company auditors know some payroll companies have some, some some companies for which i am doing payroll no some 10 company auditors out of 300 companies 10 company related auditors came back sir you gave type and report about existence of controls in your organization sir okay but uh, i am not convinced with this i want to know whether they are operating effectively also so again i, I went back to my assurance auditor yeah, they are asking uh, operating effectiveness of the controls which we implemented you only gave existence about that he asked me different fees for that because he has to test the controls now whether they are operating effectively what he gave earlier he just gave type 1 report which where it contains he just saw controls yeah controls were implemented and controls were existing and implemented only that he gave he is not talking in the report about operating effectiveness then i asked him these 10 company clients know their auditors are asking me operating effectiveness if you are a chartered accountant so if you give an assurance report about operating effectiveness i will give them so they will rely on this and then proceed their audit otherwise they are torturing me are you getting the point so i will tell you so he came to my organization where i am doing payroll services to various clients so he came and checked all the controls when whether they are operating effectively or not so they checked he this fellow has checked and he gave a type 2 report then this type 2 report i forwarded to those 10 clients also are you getting it now you understood the story now first of all 
I am the auditor of my company. Who has outsourced payroll processing to another company? The another company which is doing payroll services to me, right? We call that as service organization. My organization is there, right? Where I am doing audit, which outsourced this payroll to other company. This company is called as user entity. What is this company is called as user entity? I am the auditor of user entity, right? I am called as user auditor. Service organization, because I am asking about controls all that, they appointed an assurance auditor, right? 3402 auditor. We call him as service auditor. What do we call him as? Service auditor. So, who is a service auditor? Auditor appointed for uh, giving report on existence of the controls and operating effectiveness of the controls which are implemented at service organization. Are you getting it? So, service organization auditor is service auditor. User auditor means me. For me, 402 duty is there. For him, 3402 duty is there. Are you getting the point? What 402 is saying me? Hey, your company is outsourcing some activities. Get evidence for that. That is what said in 402. What evidence I want? Whether controls are existing there and operating effectively. Who gave that report? 3402 auditor of that company gave the report. Understood the link. Without referring to 3402, you cannot understand the start. Able to understand? All of you. So, this is the, so I am a user auditor. My, my entity, where I am doing audit is user entity. It outsourced payroll service to service organization and it has a service auditor who gave a type 1 report and type 2 report. Now, here one more twist is there, possibility. This service organization outsourced software maintenance to another service organization. I outsource payroll. The payroll will work on some software and that software is outsourced to another organization. That is called subservice organization. In that case, as a user auditor, I have to get assurance report from the original service organization about controls implementation and operating effectiveness. And I should also get subservice organization's assurance report. If at all subservice organization, whatever process they outsource from service organization is material to my audit. Able to understand. This is what the standard says. So, what are the important definitions in this standard? The standard introduction itself is so lengthy. Getting it? Now, service organization, it is nothing but it is nothing but a third party organization which is providing services to our client whom we are the auditor. The, our client is called as what? User entity which are third party organization that provides services to user entity which are Part of information systems relevant to do financial reporting. Now, service organization systems means what? These are policies and procedures designed, implemented, maintained by the service organization related to payroll to provide user entity the services covered by the service auditor. Are you getting the point? User entity. It's an entity that uses a service organization whose financial statements are being audited by user auditor. Who is user auditor? Auditor of the financial statements of user entity. Who is service auditor? He is an auditor who provides assurance report as given under 3402 on controls implemented by service organization at the request of the service organization only he is doing. Subservice organization means what? It is a service organization whose services are used by another service organization. Getting it to perform some of the services which are provided to user entity that are part of user entity's information systems relevant to do financial reporting. Understood the definitions? These are the key definitions in standard. In order to understand all these definitions, the story is important. Getting it? Next. Now, okay, I told why service organization will get an assurance audit report. So, they get two types of report. Type 1 report, type 2 report. What type 1 report? Type 1 report only contained regarding Assurance auditors report on existence of the systems and processes. Whereas type 2 report contains opinion about operating effectiveness of these systems. It also type 2 report contains existence part as well as effectiveness part also. Type 1, it's a report on description, design of controls at the service organization. Whereas type 2, you see. Okay. Uh, now, now what is meant by that? What is meant by that? So, in type 1 report, no, the, the, you know, there will be a description about, there will be a description about service organizations, systems, control objectives, related controls that have been designed and implemented at specific date. 
getting it and all this regarding type 1 report will be given by service organizations auditor we call him a service auditor whereas whereas in type 2 report we talk about description design and operating effectiveness getting it so we talk about description of service organization systems we talk about controls objectives we talk about controls that are implemented are you getting the points and in addition to that whether you know at, at a specified date is given right at a specified date what controls are implemented only type 1 report contains whether are these controls are there throughout the period are these controls are implemented throughout the period and how are they operating are they operating effectively throughout the specified period so if this point is also there then we call that as type 2 report getting it type 2 report will give more assurance compared to type 1 report type 1 report will give a limited assurance type 2 report will give more assurance able to understand now so what is type 1 report type 1 report is nothing but type 1 report is a report by service auditor what is conveying reasonable assurance which includes opinion on description of systems control objectives related controls and suitability he only talks about description of systems implemented whereas here he will talk about this do means what he will talk about all this in addition to that he will talk about operating effectiveness of controls and description of service auditors test of controls and results thereof he will also talk about he tested the controls and results also he will cover in type 2 report now there is another concept complementary user entity controls what is meant by this these are the controls implemented by user entity in service organization like sir uh, okay you are capturing attendance all that okay but sometimes no employee will come to the office or may not come to the office may directly go to my third party premises so they are on field only they are on work only but on site visit is there now when employee did not attend office your system is capturing as absent dear service organization because employee has not visited physically here your system is capturing it as absent so i will put a control there at the end of the day your staff has to call call our staff and enquire who are all on site and put attendance manually for them like this i implemented one control additionally there this is this control they don't do this process they don't do generally for all their clients but for my company they will do this process the service organization will do this additional process for myself for which i'll pay additional fee now tell me this is a control which i implemented in service organization right are you getting it is this complementary control to their controls or not but these controls are implemented by whom user entity that's why it's called complementary user entity control are you getting the point so these are the controls implemented by user entity where it is implemented in the service organization first of all who am i to implement a control in service organization that is their organization they will implement controls as per their choice but this, i am not implementing overall controls i am only implementing complementary controls are you getting the point to achieve control objectives what is my control objective here in this case i want to account people who are going on on site client to premises also their attendance should also be added only then salary will be calculated correctly and paid to them this is the control objective for which i asked them at the end of the day they need to call our office staff and inquire what are the people who are absent in their system it is recorded as absent are they really absent or are they visiting the client premises they need to get explicit confirmation this is the control which i added see first of all control means what it's a process control means what process any process is a control as soon as you enter into this class the closed the door has to be closed it's a process it's a control why so that the air conditioning will be effective are you getting the point this is control objective for everywhere you can understand what is control objective what is control getting it now first of all sir like entity will be taking so many ways service organizations help example for entity security guards were there that is also outsourced only now should i need to review their controls also how far these controls are relevant for financial reporting they are not relevant for financial reporting no so this company where i am doing audit has outsourced many processes has outsourced many processes should i need to review all the processes type one type two report all that depends upon how far they are affecting financial statements how far they are relevant for financial reporting so generally if services are affecting significant class of transaction if any services that i outsource to service organization if they are affecting significant class of transaction 
if they are if they are affecting process of the transaction if they are affecting accounting records if they are affecting events and conditions of the business if they are affecting financial reporting process estimates and disclosures then only those service organization controls i want a type 1 type 2 report otherwise i don't want type 1 type 2 reports this itself can be asked as a practical question as an organization your office your organization where you are doing audit is taking various service organizations uh, you know assistance uh, comment what are the what are the factors that you consider to decide whether service organization services are relevant for financial reporting or not depends upon whether services provided by them affecting significant class of transactions of mine no doubt in our example employee cost attendance is a significant class of transaction which is affecting my payroll cost getting it process of the transaction related accounting records every events and conditions financial reporting process you see in our example it affects all these items that's why we want type 1 type 2 report whereas security guard we hired you know so somebody will be sent as a security guard to our company to physically guard the premises getting it there it is no way affecting the financial statements are you getting the point except that i need every day three persons they are sending three persons that's it next so what is the object of sa402 now you need to understand what is the object of sa402 first what is the object why sa402 is there you need to obtain an understanding you need to obtain an understanding of nature significance of services provided by service organization what is the nature of service what is the importance of service and what is the effect on the user identities control which are relevant for audit and design and perform audit procedure responsive to those risks if auditor the auditor shall obtain an understanding of services provided by service organization so first understand what services company is taking enquire the user entity enquire our management about services that are used from service organization what is the nature of service by the service organization what is their significance we are using so many cases service organization services okay nature and materiality of transactions processed by service organization what is the interaction between the organization and the service organization if the interaction is too heavy getting it maybe it's an important transaction and what is the nature of relationship and terms and conditions between these people are they related parties or unrelated parties so yes a 550 also we need to consider here if auditor is unable to get evidence from the user entity getting it if the auditor is unable to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence from understanding of the user entity generally no we don't directly ask type and type to report first we try to understand nature of the service nature of the transaction how it is impacting the user entity and service or all that if at all we still have doubts then we will ask a type 1 report or if at all we want to know operating effectiveness because it is a significant class of transaction then we also ask for type 2 report or sometimes you know i will contact the service organization only through our organization i may visit the service organization or i may use another auditor so that he will go and visit service organization come back and report to me getting it now which report i have to use before i use type 1 or type 2 report the user auditor shall satisfy whether service auditor whoever service organization was appointed no is he also a professional person competent person if at all he is a chartered accountant member of the institute i'm happy because he is also governed by rules and regulations if at all he give a fake report no he is punishable so i can trust his report if at all the service organization auditor is some other professional so i need to check it getting it the adequacy of standards under t1 t2 report under which standards issue t1 t2 report generally if is a member of the institute i need not worry about all this if is not a member of the institute how he gave type 1 report using which standard he worked on are you getting it if the user auditor decided to use type 1 or type 2 report then he will evaluate whether the date of the report period covered under the report you know are they matching with our auditor's report and period of the financial statements or not and the sufficient appropriate evidence provided by report for understanding user entity controls so i need to get sufficient appropriate evidence about user entity service organization controls whether user entity has designed and implemented complementary user entity controls i need to ask whether our entity has implemented any complementary controls if complementary controls are implemented i need to test those controls whether they are operating effectively or not getting it because type one type two report will only cover service organizations own controls they will not cover our controls which we implemented there specifically in addition to their controls now when do we test controls you know whenever we use whenever we use type one report no then we want to test the operating effectiveness of controls suppose if at all they give type two report 
We did not test operating effectiveness of controls implemented by service organization. We just have to check which controls. Complementary controls, we just have to check. If type 2 report is there, get it. If it is not there, you perform test of controls. If type type 1, sorry, type 2 report is not there, we perform test of controls. Why are we testing the controls? To check whether controls are operating effectively or not. Or using another auditor to perform test. Now, can you use type 2 report as an audit evidence for operating effectiveness of controls and service? Very much. The user auditor shall evaluate. What is the date? What is the period covered by type 2 report? Getting it? And uh, is it appropriate for user auditor purpose? They gave uh, type 2 report is available for 1920 years, but I am doing audit of 2122. Getting the point? Test operating effectiveness of complementary controls. Why I need to test operating effectiveness of complementary controls? Because the user or service auditor, he will only test controls of the service organization. He will not test my controls which I implemented there. Then look at the time period covered by, look at the, look at the time period covered by test of controls. Getting it? So what service auditor is testing the controls? So for what period he covered the test of controls? Is that period sufficient for audit or not? Here it is called timing of test of controls. Timing of test of controls is defined in 330. Where it is defined? 330. What is nature of test of controls? Timing of test of controls? Extent of test of controls? All these three were spoken very in depth in 330 standard. Where I give a CA inter no material. Inside that you may find. That's it. If Type 1 report and type 2 report exclude subservice organization and that is also relevant for user auditor. So whatever procedures we have read in the above, no, they will also apply for SSO. Now, okay, I got type 1 or type 2 report. What is my audit reporting ultimately in my audit report? Generally, you know, you saw type 1 and type 2, you convince that controls are effective. So you decided with respect to the outsourced activities, every control is fine. You, you give which opinion? Unmodified opinion. Suppose... If type 1 report, after obtaining type 1 or type 2 report, you concluded that somehow controls were not affected. Somehow you are unable to get, you know, reliability on, you know, the payroll cost. What you need to do? You have to modify the opinion. Now, when you are modifying the opinion, can you refer about service organization's auditor's name? Here, SA620 logic will apply. Here, which logic will apply? SA620. The standard has given very in-depth, but I mentioned that it is similar to SA620 because the matter is like that. Suppose if you are modifying report after using type 1 or type 2 report, if you want to make the user understand what is the nature of the modification, you may refer about type 1, type 2 report in your modification basis for modified opinion section. Now, all this content is taken from these paragraphs of the pronouncement book under this particular standard. Getting it? Almost I spoke for 25 to 30 minutes on this. Getting it, 402 is over. Okay, but understand, the example, initial example, whatever I told is most important. Getting it, based on that you develop all this. Okay, if you read it slowly, thoroughly, with that example, sinking with that, you will understand better. Okay, so with this, SA402 is also completed. Then we will discuss 540. Fine, all of you? Two minutes gap. So, SA 540, auditing accounting estimates, including fair value accounting estimates and related disclosures. See, first of all, an estimate means what accounting estimate means? It's not accurate, it's not precise, it's an approximation. Accounting estimate is an approximation of monetary amount in absence of because precise means of measurement is not there. Precisely measuring is not possible. In the absence of precise measurement, we take an approximate course of action is an accounting estimate. Net realizable value is an accounting estimate. Warranty provision is an accounting estimate. Provision for patent doubtful debts is an accounting estimate. Depreciation is an accounting estimate. Provision for tax is an accounting estimate. Defer tax is an accounting estimate. All these are accounting estimates, no? logical. For accounting estimates, there is no specific standard exclusively dealing because this estimate concept is dealt under various standards. Suppose PPE deals with depreciation related estimate. Even occurring after reporting date may be dealing with provision for bad and doubtful debts related estimates. We have a separate standard for provisions contingencies that itself is an estimate. Now, auditor has to check whether management has Chosen right accounting estimate that is reasonable. That is reasonable. 
Now, see while estimating, no, definitely there is uncertainty. When we are when we are estimate an accounting item, definitely some sort of uncertainty is there. Suppose if the uncertainty is very high, significant estimation uncertainty, how management resolved that? How management resolved that significant estimation uncertainty is one of the important elements in this audit, in this particular standard. So, estimation uncertainty, there is a concept, estimation uncertainty. In every estimate, there is some uncertainty. What is the degree of uncertainty is what important. What is most important is what is the degree of uncertainty? What is the probability of uncertainty? Suppose you are saying the provision for warranty you have created 10 crore. What is that indirectly indicates in the next year? Whatever the total expenditure that I am going to incur because of the warranty claims that are there in this year but not reported. Getting the point? There are warranty claims. Some warranty products, whatever we sold, came under warranty clause and customer incurred that event. But he didn't report. So we are going to incur that expenditure in the next year. But that expenditure should be of the current year. We are creating provision for 10 crore. Is it only 10 crore? Is it not more than 10 crore? Is it not less than 10 crore? Definitely some uncertainty is there. What is the degree of uncertainty? Based on the past experience, 10% degree of uncertainty is there. And if this degree of uncertainty is acceptable, auditor will also ignore that and proceed further and document and close the work. If estimation uncertainty is very high, suppose first time company sold that kind of product, getting it? First time only company sold that product and the turnover from that product was very huge and there is a high chances that warranty claims will be high and many warranties were incurred already in the current year but customers did not came back and report. Maybe they will be coming in the next April or May month or June month, maybe even. But it is incurred in the current year. But I don't know what is accurate about. So we created a provision. High estimation uncertainty is there. Getting the point. Because it's a new product, you don't know. There is no past trend. There is no uh, nothing. You don't have any evidence. Are you getting the point? So there is a high estimation uncertainty here. What auditor has to do for this? Ask management how this kind of high degree of uncertainty they handled. What assumptions they took. What alternative course of actions they have. Why they, why they did not choose 12 crore provision? Why they choose 10 crore provision? Why they choose 8 crore provision, not 10 crore provision? Are you getting the point? Why and why not? We need to question and understand management's thought process and document whether it is reasonable or not. Are you getting the point? This is what we do in the center auditing stand. Only this work only we do. Now, tell me, how do you evaluate whether an accounting estimate chosen by the management is correct or not? First, you need to develop an estimate. Based on your knowledge and belief, you develop an estimate and compare your estimate with management estimate. You understand whether they are reasonable or unreasonable. If you think there is a huge difference between the estimate you calculated and the estimate what management made. See, management is making estimate for preparation of books of accounts and financials. You are making an estimate to evaluate management estimate. That's why you see auditor's point estimate. We call it as our auditor's range. It's an amount, range of amount derived from audit evidence for use in evaluating management's estimate. Audit evidence means what? I collected information from the management. Based on that information, I calculated my estimate. Why am I calculating my estimate to prepare accounting records? Huh? No, to evaluate how management estimate is correct or incorrect. What is management estimate? It is an estimate for recognition for disclosing the financial statements. This is an estimate made by the management. For the purpose of recognition in the books of accounts and financial statements, for the purpose of disclosing the financial statements. Now, why am I worried? Why am I verifying accounting estimates? While making these accounting estimates, there may be a possibility of management bias. Manage may, management may make accounting estimate in such a way that that is profitable for them, that is good for them, that may make window dressing. Are you getting the point? So, that you know. One of the inherent limitation of audit is nature of financial reporting. In SA 200, they will say nature of financial reporting or it is also referred as nature of accounting. Not the entire balance sheet PNL is based upon facts. The balance sheet PNL is based upon estimates. 
and these estimates can be manipulated are you getting the point management say this is our assumption how do i know whether management assumption is this how do i know ambition exactly comes for 10 years how do i know plant and missionary works for 30 years these are all estimates no these are all based upon industry expert reports all that no if management is biased towards showing higher profits getting it they manipulate accounting estimates in such a way to get this short term benefits so i need to look for management bias management bias means management is not neutral management is not neutral choose life of asset which is right which is correct not because depreciation should be lesser or depreciation should be higher or tax should be higher or tax should be lesser not with that objective maintain neutral attitude result will be whatever getting it what is estimation uncertainty estimation uncertainty is susceptibility susceptibility means possibility getting the point what is it possibility suspect is different suspect is different both are different getting it susceptibility of an accounting estimate and related disclosure to an inherent lack of precision in its measurement precision is not within the estimate getting the point there is a possibility that an accounting estimate is inherently lacking precision getting it inherent means what unavoidable you can't precisely mention that you can't precisely estimate it estimate itself is not precise that estimate making process should be precise at least if the process is also not precise then there is an estimation uncertainty able to get getting it and what is an outcome of an estimate because i have chosen 10 years useful life this much depreciation came because i chose 20 years useful life this much depreciation came because of 5% negative cases in warranty claims this much provision came whatever the outcome is there no amount whatever estimate i choose because of that some monetary outcome is there that is an outcome of an accounting estimate outcome is an actual monetary amount which resulted from decision resolution means what decision of underlying transaction addressed by accounting estimate so outcome of an estimate means result what is the auditor's objective in the standard to verify that outcome whether it is reasonable or not this outcome this amount is calculated based on estimate i want to see whether that estimate is reasonable or not for which i am developing my own estimate when i am developing an estimate there is an uncertainty how to address this uncertainty that is what the standard actually talks understood from the definition most of the standard i covered getting it now you see what is the auditor responsibility as per the standard what are the audit procedure first auditor has to do risk assessment process what is risk assessment process where and all as per our financial reporting framework there is a requirement for estimates first i want to see to this company these are all the standards applicable right as per various standards and gap principles where and all we want to calculate estimates just point it out look at the balance sheet uh, create creditors uh, this is not an estimate this is actual transaction debtors this is an actual transaction investments uh, inside the revaluation uh, estimate impairment estimate because impairment is based upon present value of discounted future projected cash flows this is an estimate uh, there is a possibility of estimate here getting it then depreciation revaluation is estimate depreciation is estimate impairment is estimate getting it cash and bank balance is actual only it is not estimate getting it inventory valuation again estimate you see balance sheet you will understand where and all estimates involved you see the list of assets list of liabilities you understand where and all estimates involved contingency is an estimate provision is an estimate so no look at the financial statements and applicable financial reporting framework you understand where and all estimates played then how management is identifying these transactions so that these transactions and events and conditions and account balance only contain estimates how management is identifying look at the management process manage sir whatever you follow we all follow the same process sir. management simply told whatever you follow we follow the same process we also need all the standards sir whenever we need any standard whenever somewhere we we get a some provision word warranty word gave we also look for warranties whatever we gave then we also make provision we follow industry gaps getting it the auditor shall inquire management what are the changes in circumstances that give rise to new estimates or need to revise existing estimates so i need to ask management last year you made 5% as but now this year you are making 7% why what is the reason behind the change i'll ask understand how management identifies first of all management is responsible now to identify these estimates auditor risk assessment no auditor is doing risk assessment that is that will help the auditor understand what are the changes in circumstances all that 
that will help the auditor understand where and all management has to make estimates so that i can compare where they made estimates where they have to make estimates i will compare and enquire what are the new type of transaction companies entering what are the terms of the transaction what are the accounting policies what are the regulatory and other changes which are out of the control of the management what are the new conditions occurred these are all something similar to subsequent event getting it suppose you no know, you found when you are reading the balance sheet you concluded that sir management you have given one warranty on one scrap item but you forgot to claim forgot to create provision for the warranty given on the scrap item getting the point you gave an assurance on the quality of the scrap and you gave one year time limit if the if the, if the scrap is used in so and so material and if that material was malfunctioning because of the scrap i sold it to you i will refund the amount that's why you said are this is a provision no this is a warranty you know, indirectly why have you not created provision for scrap item sold if auditor i if management failed in this case in our example management failed to identify an accounting estimate related to sale of scrap in respect of which management has given one year warranty getting it so if the auditor identify any transaction any event that give rise to need for an accounting estimate which management failed to identify in such a case auditor should determine is there a significant deficiency in internal control first of all you know this indicates management failed to identify an estimate here this indicates process of identifying estimates control that failed who is the person delegated this responsibility why he didn't identify i need to look for and if it is a significant deficiency i need to mention this point in my letter of request as per sa 265 i think it next up then now then now okay i understand where and all accounting estimates are required how management is identifying accounting estimates i understood now how they make estimate okay i know where they i i understood how management identifies areas now i will understand how they make estimate in those areas i want to assess the management estimation process are they maintaining biased attitude are they lacking neutrality how are they maintaining this i want to see the computational part of the management so here i will look at the methods i will look at the controls i look whether are they using any expert for making the estimate because obviously you know suppose oil reserves is there nrv valuation should be done obviously management is not having that competence so they take an oil engineer they take a valuer yes or no and what assumptions they follow are there any changes in the methods compared to last year to the current year how management assesses the effect of estimation uncertainty first of all is management taking into mind there is a uncertainty probability are they taking in mind that one or not i will check are you getting the point so they will ask in exam so as part of the audit sa 540 so and so auditing accounting estimates including fair value accounting estimates wherever applicable you are required to evaluate how management make estimate what points you consider four marks question they will give you they are they will give you write about risk assessment procedures and related activities for accounting estimates this itself can be given for four marks or they will give you as part of audit you need to obtain an understanding of how management identify need for an accounting estimate this itself can be given as a four marks question able to understand now if there is an estimation uncertainty if there is an estimation uncertainty what auditor shall do how management has considered alternative assumption if there is an uncertainty how auditor uh, management has considered alternative assumption like you created provision for 10 crores so why not 11 crore why not 9 crore alternative assumption getting it significant assumptions used are the reasonable you created 10% 10 crore provision behind this you assumed that in the industry in another company also created 5% only the provision which comes to 10 crore for you they used 5% so you also used 5% is this reasonable i need to check appropriate application of the financial reporting framework have you applied the framework guidelines accounting standard guidelines while calculating this provision what is the management intention to carry out specific course of action really management honor warranty obligations first of all they created provision 35 do they honor obligations when a customer filed a complaint so what is the management's intention of carrying out this objective you created provision for warranty i agree do you really give warranty service ultimately to the customer whoever approaches you if at all you are not deny you are always deny you are not at all incurring one rupee also past record indicates that you don't have intention getting it then this is, this provision is not correct are you getting it next you know on this itself this sentence itself is having a separate question in 330 how do you get evidence for management's intent there is a question how do you get evidence for management's intent 
suppose you no know, there is an estimation uncertainty but that is not addressed by management management did not consider it all when they are making estimates the estimation uncertainty point itself they forgot so auditor shall consider you develop a range and check the reasonableness so when auditor will develop his own estimate when estimation uncertainty is there and management did not consider or management considered but i felt it is unreasonable then i will develop my own estimate and check whether management estimate is correct or not primarily i don't develop my own estimate planting is there they said 30 years useful life i will see how 30 years has been arrived i will not first sit and develop useful life of this plant and check when i will check useful when i will develop my own estimate if there is an uncertainty and management did not answer that uncertainty means method of manner of calculation of this accounting estimate something went wrong then i will calculate my own estimate i will recruit an expert and i will calculate this estimate getting it yes slightly slightly then this is not required risk recognition and measurement criteria this and all not required finally evaluate reasonableness of the accounting estimate and determine mistake now you develop an auditor's point estimate right you compare and evaluate how far management estimate is reasonable if you feel unreasonable what is the misstatement they did and evaluate the misstatement is it material not not material material and pervasive material and not pervasive look at all that and report it if the auditor know what you have to report suppose if you identify estimation uncertainty see whether proper disclosure about the uncertainty is made in the financial statement see whether proper disclosure is made in the financial statements about this uncertainty i think i showed in the class uh, one audit report on this where they took it as q audit matter where they took it as q audit matter i think uh, reliance audit report only probably reliance audit report when they estimated 30 years to 50 years which involves estimation uncertainty and that uncertainty factor is disclosed in the notes to accounts whenever whenever there is an uncertainty which is significant no management will disclose in notes to accounts that this is based on so and so assumption if the assumption altered this will alter that fact they will show in the notes to accounts so the shareholder will understand okay depreciation is this much because of this estimate because of these assumptions and get a written representation that whatever assumptions and estimates management calculated and accounted they believe that they are true to the best of their knowledge and belief and to the best of the information available to them only they took this like that get a written representation and a document what is your what is the conclusion for you how do you conclude management accounting estimates are reasonable how do you conclude the disclosures are correct and what if, if at all any indicator you found no for management bias any indicator you found indicators you have to document how do i find indicators suppose whenever i find a mistake and took to the management no they are not rectifying it suddenly some mistakes when i took no they are rectifying it when i closely observe no they are rectifying the mistakes which increases profits and whenever i carry them any mistakes they are not rectifying they are making it dragging it they are not rectifying if they rectify it will decrease profit so those those mistakes if they rectify which decreases in profit they are not rectifying it those mistakes if i take and if they rectify the profit will increase they are rectifying immediately so management is biased towards profit are you getting the point that's it with this essay 540 is also done got basic clarity at least understood the structure of the standard so what the structure of the standard they gave some definitions they understood first you have to do risk assessment process then you need to check how management is identifying the estimates then you need to check how management is making the estimates then you need to check if uncertainty is how it is addressed if uncertainty is not addressed what you need to check then finally reporting and conclusion that's it standard is divided into these these parts only which is a logical arrangement again yeah that's it with this standards is over i have not covered 250 but uh, 250 is an easy standard based upon this may be possible in the next session i'll cover in 10 15 minutes 250 standard also okay that's it so with this predominantly major standards we have covered except that 7 or 8 ca inter standards and that also i gave brief overview brief overview has been given for all of them and if possible for them prefer ca inter marathon so ca inter marathon is there on audit documentation and evidence risk assessment sampling analytical procedure and all of them ca inter marathon is there. refer that i think that will be enough for you so that you will feel like you have not ignored them getting the point so in the next session we'll start uh, ethics at all okay that's it so fine we'll conclude this session yes so we'll continue the audit of nbfc after this i will start insurance audit then cfs audit 
then i'll come back to standards and auditing and ethics then after that audit committee fiscal laws will discuss okay almost till now we have completed easily i can i can tell you audit report 12 standards no they'll have a weightage of 10 to 15 marks with care all together minimum 15 marks it will be then peer review call review some another 10 marks so 25 marks is completed getting it and uh, now we are discussing nbfc hardly one and a half hour another five marks easily we can complete okay and insurance audit is another six to eight marks so with mcq solve put together it will be minimum six for sure then cfs audit today we will try to complete all this okay now so tomorrow again once in the next session no once we start standards and ethics no again we will be completing another 30 marks portion 30 to 35 marks portion now so write about audit of nbfcs see here with respect to this chapter we are having we are having some amendments like before before i proceed further how many of you have read read this chapter earlier thoroughly once at least once understood thoroughly have understood nbfc audit chapter yes like how many of you have never seen this like exactly uh, correctly tell me how many of you have not gone through this okay fine very few but believe me this is very easy chapter very small and easy five marks you can easily score okay now see in nbfc in nbfc first of all nbfc is an activity it's nbfc is an activity when an enterprise is treated as NBFC if it satisfies a principal business criteria. What is it called as? Principal business criteria. Suppose if the principal business is agriculture activity, industrial activity, trading activity, or immobile property activity, then you are not treated as an NBFC. You are not treated as NBFC. That is excluded from the definition of NBFC. If, the, if, if an enterprise or if a company whose principal activity is this, it is not to be treated as NBFC at all. Suppose if your principal activity, principal business is financing activities, getting it, then you are treated as NBFC. What do you mean by financing activities? They have given two criteria and both must be satisfied. It's plus, nothing but end. One is financial asset criteria. Another one, financial income criteria. One is financial asset criteria. Another one, financial income criteria. If the financial assets are more than or equal to 50% of the total assets. If the financial income is more than or equal to 50% of the total income. If the total income of a particular enterprise you take. In their total income. What is the income that is coming from financial assets? Income, financial income means what? Income from financial assets. If income is generated from the financial assets. Then we call it as financial income. Getting it? If the financial income is more than 50 percentage, getting it, of the total income of that particular enterprise, then financial income criteria is satisfied. Out of the total assets of that enterprise, if financial assets are more than 50 percentage, getting the point, then financial asset criteria is also satisfied. If both the conditions are satisfied, it's end, remember, if both are satisfied, then principal business criteria is satisfied by that entity so that it is now treated as an NBFC. It is now treated as NBFC. Between banks and NBFC, there is only one difference. NBFC cannot accept demand deposits. That's the only difference. And NBFC depositors will not have the insurance protection. Getting it? The, you know, there is a uh, government guaranteed insurance some program is there. Where in respect of bank, if a bank default up to 5 lakhs for you, insurance is there. But for NPFC deposits, you don't have that insurance facility. Deposit credit guarantee insurance scheme, we call it as. Able to understand? Now, you see now, there is a there is a bank, uh, very recently last month, Silicon Valley Bank case has come. Now there is a, a bank of Swiss. It's not SWA, SUISSE. Getting it, which is a Switzerland second largest bank. So it is, it is about to default. Last year their share price was, let us assume, 100 rupees, today it is 1 rupee. 99% decline in the market value of the share. Getting it? Uh, they used to say, no, like credit rate swap something, where you take insurance against default. Getting it? The insurance premium has gone up 40% of the debt. 
where the insurance premium gone up 40% of the debt all this is happening see you know the one of the important drawback in that you know credit i mean bank of cus is they don't follow basel 3 norms getting it whereas all nbfcs in india all banks in india we follow basel 3 norms income recognition provisional norms all that that is one advantage why indian economy is still stable in spite of repeated attacks on india in terms of whatever it is covid or worldwide crisis or recession whatever still indian economy is stable only because of the rigid financial structure in india getting the point the rbi policies everything were very 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 prudent compared to any other banking system in the world even the us banks are risky swiss banks are risky. swiss bank is like world of banker it's a banker to the world i can say swiss is, switzerland is a banker to the world in fact uh, we have we see you know basel 3 norms basel means it's a city it's a city in the switzerland it's a city name there inside that city there's a committee formed that committee is called as basel committee for banking systems banking supervision and that committee only formulated all the norms prudential norms all that anyhow that we will discuss in bank audit able to understand so the financial institutions has to be regulated very strongly and when an institution is called as a financial institution if predominant operations or financial activities it's a financial institution when predominant operations or financial affairs public money is being invested on financial affairs it has to be regulated and that's why if at all your principal business is finance activity you will come under the rbi radar are you getting the point so that is the reason why they defined this criteria if your principal activity is not financial activity you may not come under this particular thing insurance company is basically an nbfc chit fund company basically an nbfc nidhi company basically an nbfc housing finance company micro finance institution all these institutions are nbfcs only but they are exempted from registration they are exempted from registrations you have a question on this no you see here Now you see here, there are some NBFCs which are exempted. You can see here, these are the NBFCs which are exempted from registration. Yes or no? So you know they will ask you this question straight away. What are the NBFCs which are exempted from registration? You know logically they all satisfy NBFC criteria. Stock brokers also satisfy NBFC criteria. What is financial asset? Investments, loans and advances, deposits. These are all financial assets. getting the point non financial assets means what plant and machinery inventory all these are non financial again cash and bank balance is also financial asset if the financial assets are more than 50% of your total assets and income from the financial assets is what major income for you in the profit and loss account then you are treated as financial institution and you are liable for nbfc registration if at all you are not subjected to bank regulations are you getting the point now these all entities no these all entities are financial institutions basically but they are exempted from nbfc registration because for them there is a separate regulatory which is monitoring them some regulatory either suppose you say nidhi companies ministry of corporate affairs is directly regulating chit fund ministry of corporate affairs is directly regulating housing finance companies national housing bank is regulating able to understand so there are many institutions insurance companies irda is regulating since multiple regulatory exposure multiple regulatory monitoring should be avoided for that reason these list were exempted by rbi means all these entities rbi will not control some other regulatory sir they will have a control are you getting the point now you see in this there is one clarification you need to have now core investment company what is it core investment company first of all there are various types of nbfcs there are various types of nbfcs investment credit company infrastructure finance company systematically important core investment infrastructure debt nbfc microfinance nbfc factors nbfc non operative financial holding companies nbfc peer to peer lending nbfc aggregator which are newly introduced getting the point i'll discuss don't worry now see nbfcs are broadly classified into first of all in this chapter one confusion that we all have is regarding the directions regarding the directions whenever the directions word came students confused a lot like what is that there are some directions nbfc nbfc um non systematically important non deposit taking reserve bank directions 2015 or 16 some number okay 2015 or 
NBFC systematically important non deposit taking and deposit taking reserve bank directions 2015 NBFC acceptance of public deposits reserve bank directions 2015 NBFC auditors reports reserve bank directions 2015 are you getting the point these are the four set of directions these are the four set of directions which you will come across in this chapter now you see this is non systematically important non deposit taking directions now first of all nbfcs are based on what they are doing they were classified as deposit taking nbfc non deposit taking nbfcs based on what they are doing deposit taking means they take deposits and lend it to the public but demand deposits is prohibited demand deposit means you and me have bank accounts right savings accounts where we can use phone pay google pay whenever we want we can withdraw whenever we don't need we just keep funds in that that is demand deposit whenever i want i can withdraw that is demand nbfc cannot offer that a kind of facility but nbfc can accept term deposits if they have a license for that from rbi getting it now these non deposit taking nbfcs are further classified into systematically important non systematically important when do we say systematically important if the asset size is 500 crore if the asset size is 500 crore and above then we call them as nbfc which is systematically important it means in the system it is very important you have to regulate it well whereas if the nbfc whose whose total assets do not exceed i mean i think it's less than 500 crore less than a do not exceed that you see okay okay i am not here for that so less than 500 crore then we call it as what non systematically important nbfc what is it called as non systematically important now for all non systematically important non deposit taking we have a direction for all systematically important deposit taking because these are very important we have second directions are you getting the point now you take muthut finance muthut finance falls under second entity it is a systematically important non deposit taking nbfc muthut finance getting the point it's a non deposit taking nbfc systematically important nbfc because muthut finance assets are more than 15000 crore able to understand so it's a systematically important but are they taking deposits no they are non deposit taking how do i know muthut finance is non deposit taking because in the board report of somewhere they clearly mentioned board of directors have taken a resolution that the company will not accept any deposits this condition is there for which companies non deposit taking nbfcs are you getting the point then if nbfc is accepting public deposits also public deposits means 73 section public deposits under companies act chapter 5 regulations of companies act so then we call then for that nbfc this direction also will apply these directions will apply if at all you are not accepting any public deposits these directions will not apply in these directions only we, we will come across in this chapter that list credit rating downgrading in credit rating what to do if there is a downgrading in credit rating quarterly so quarterly returns to be filed with rbi with respect to deposits accepted all these points will come in this direction so question only are you getting it now one topic in this entire chapter which is again difficult is nbfc audit report directions like the auditors of an NBFC has to give a special report to RBI that's called exception report and auditors of the NBFC has to give a special report to board of directors what report what the audit report should contain while they are giving not audit, audit report means not report on the financial statements I am talking about special report to board what are the contents of the auditors report given to board of directors for NBFC accepting public deposits the contents are different NBFC accepting non and not accepting deposit but systematically important contents are different nbfc non systematically important in that the auditors report to board contents are again different are you getting it so that question where students generally confuse are you clear until now now recent amendment is what nbfc's classification earlier nbfc's are classified in the manner what i told here but now this NBFC classification is not based on the activity, but based on the uh, based on the category. What is it? Based on the category they have classified. Like NBFC base layer, NBFC middle layer, NBFC upper layer, NBFC top layer. Top layer is actually zero. Nothing will be there inside this. RBI will pick. Which NBFC comes under top layer? RBI will pick. Getting it? Base layer means all NBFCs all nbfcs which are 
which are non systematically important non deposit taking nbfcs they all straight away come under which layer base layer getting it now now nbfcs nbfcs which are systematically important non deposit taking which are systematically important non deposit taking and nbfcs which are accepting public deposits both of them will come under either middle layer or upper layer they have given a score card approach they have given a score card approach if a particular nbfc is satisfying so and so score like aqmm scoring is there no similar to that here also there is a score card benchmarking approach is given if a particular nbfc satisfies that benchmark they will come directly under upper, upper layer otherwise it is middle layer are you getting the point all of you so nbfc whether it will come under middle layer or upper layer it again depends on another criteria called benchmarking scores benchmark scores are you getting it now which nbfc is come under top layer zero rpi will hand pick them getting it considering the risk involved in that nbfc's operations all that rpi if at all an nbfc comes under top layer it is under the direct monitoring of rpi every activity will be under direct monitoring of rpi top layer means risky nbfc's will come there are you getting the point all of you now which nbfc's will come in top layer is generally according to me those nbfc's where capital adequacy is not sufficient we all know that the nbfc's have to maintain a capital adequacy ratio of 15% of risk weighted aggregate of risk weighted assets and of the balance sheet items able to understand now this is applicable for all nbfcs other than non system other than base layer now onwards i will discuss base layer middle layer i hope first you understand like one second i'll, I'll see nbfc if at all you are non deposit taking non systematically important you are not systematically important and non deposit taking all these nbfcs come under base layer suppose you are non deposit taking but systematically important or you are deposit taking nbfc you are deposit taking nbfc you may either fall under middle layer or upper layer depending upon the score benchmark scores top layer we don't need to discuss also because it's something rbi will take care are you clear now all nbfcs that fall under base layer they just have to satisfy net owned funds criteria of 2 crore we all know nbfc has to maintain a net owned fund of 2 crore and you know this net owned fund of 2 crore is gradually increased to 5 crore it which will be increased to 10 crore by 2027 getting the point this this net owned fund is going to be increased to 5 crore by 25 again it is going to be increased to 10 crore by 27 that is not now but right now it is 2 crore applicable so npfc in order to start an npfc your net owned funds must be minimum 2 crore which they they represent it as 200 lakhs or original limit is 25 lakhs later extended to 200 lakhs nothing but 2 crore now nbfc is fall under middle layer and upper layer net owned funds criteria will not apply for them which criteria will apply capital requirement adequacy ratio criteria will apply as per that for them we can't fix with this much amount you have to maintain what is net owned funds minimum your own capital how much you are bringing tell me first before take from public how much you are bringing that is important so how what are they saying if an npfc falling under middle layer or if an npfc falling under upper layer they must maintain 15% of aggregate of risk adjusted risk adjusted assets and uh, of the balance sheet items risk adjusted assets and of the balance sheet items of the balance sheet items means contingencies all that are you getting the point so this is the minimum capital you must maintain so capital 15% now this 15% this 15% again has been subdivided into two parts tier 1 capital tier 2 capital tier 1 capital should be minimum 10 out of that tier 2 capital maximum 5 you know muthoot finance has maintained 27% ratio what is the muthoot finance capital requirement ratio 727 logically how much is enough 15% but muthoot finance maintain not even 27 i think 29 percentage and you know what is tier 2 capital of muthoot finance maximum is 5 maximum is what 5 but muthoot finance has just bare 0.1 percentage what is it 0.1 28.9% is tier 1 capital 0.0.1% is only tier 2 capital of muthoot finance so tier 2 capital is very very negligible tier 2 capital means subordinate debt all that they will be coming at1 bonds subordinate debts 
those bonds where uh, you know they have issued which which are having the least priority are you getting the point at the time of default getting it so those are all comes under tier 2 capital are you getting it so tier 1 capital should be minimum 10 and suppose if the npfc is engaged in lending against gold jewelry getting it tier 1 must be minimum 12 in such case maximum tier 2 can be 3 are you getting the point all of you so out of the minimum 15 12 in case of lending against gold for normal nbfcs it is 10 so this is capital requirement adequacy ratio for nbfc one topic is completed are you clear principal business criteria topic is also completed now you see now we'll we'll, we'll go in a particular order now so first of all nbfc is a financial institution which is a company whose principal business is receiving deposits under any scheme or arrangement it doesn't matter whether you are receiving as a uh, you know a security deposit in respect of a construction contract that doesn't matter any scheme any arrangement you are receiving deposit that's it what we see is are you receiving deposit or such other banking institution or class of institution which government may specify what is principal business activity where more than 50 percent equal is not there more than 50 percentage Okay, financial assets are significant, major portion of financial assets, major income is financial income. Both the conditions are to be satisfied. Now, those, those enterprises which satisfy that condition, they must register with RBI under, under 45 IA. Getting it? Under 45 IA. In RBI Act, you know, there is a one chapter. That entire chapter is dedicated for NBFCs and that chapter starts with section 45. Are you getting the point? And they must have certificate of registration. Their net owned funds must be minimum 2 crore. Further, now, like what is it mean by RBI regulating these NBFCs? RBI will regulate by issuing them directions. What directions? Deposits acceptance direction, prudential norms directions, IRAC. We call this as IRAC norms, income recognition, asset classification norms directions, TBD norms directions, risk exposure norms, other measures and how these NBFCs has to report, everything is being monitored by RBI. So, if your enterprise is satisfying principal business criteria, you are directly liable for registration with RBI, where you are monitored on all these aspects by RBI, correct? Able to recollect? Next. Same way, NBA, RBI has also issued directions to auditors. As per that directions, auditors have to prepare exception report to RBI. Auditors have to give a report to the board of directors. In addition to auditors report to the members of the company. Audit report to members of the company, we have seen in audit report chapter. But audit report to board of directors of NBFC. Audit report to RBI, exception report. That is given under directions of our auditors. So, NBFC audit report directions, Reserve Bank 2015. So, as per that directions, auditor has to give two reports. One to the board of directors, two to the RBI. Uh, to RBI, whatever we present, we call it as exception report. Able to understand. I'll discuss all that. Next. What are various types of NBFCs? NBFC may be involved in loans and advances, assets, acquisition of share, you know, leasing, hire purchase, insurance, shit business, anything. All these activities come under NBFC but does not include agriculture, industrial, trading, immovable property. If you are dealing in immovable property or if you are dealing in goods and services or if you are doing predominantly agriculture or predominantly industrial manufacturing activity, then you are not treated as NBFC. By the way, remember, this should be principal business for you. Suppose you are doing manufacturing, but if you look at profit and loss account, major income is from financial assets. If you look at, if I look at your balance sheet, major assets are financial assets. You are having plant and machinery, you are manufacturing, but major assets are financial assets. Then you are treated as what again? NBFC. Are you getting the point? Here you see, whose principal business is this? This point need not be explained also. Are you getting the point? Next step. So, NBFCs are classified as deposit taking, non-deposit taking. Non-deposit taking are subclassified as systematically important, non-systematically important. Now, this classification has been changed into base layer, middle layer, upper layer. That is what the amendment. Are you clear? Enough. What are the NBFCs that are exempted? I spoke just. What is the difference between NBFC and bank? NBFC cannot accept demand deposit. They are not forming part of payment and settlement system. Nothing but you see, now when you are making any purchase on online, Razor Pay is acting. HDFC Bank is acting. Getting the point? These are all payment gateways. Getting the point? NBFC will not, will not be part of payment gateway system. Simple. They cannot do that. 
where payment gateways will get some commission. Getting it? NPFC cannot participate like that. Next. Deposit insurance facility is not available for the depositors of NBFC and there is no such requirement of NBFC must give minimum loan to priority sector. Priority sector means agriculture, MSMEs, all that. Getting it? Sick industries. Getting it? All these are called as priority sector. Banks must lend a certain amount to priority sector for sure. Getting it? Housing loans is a priority sector. Next. What is capital requirement ratio? 15% of the aggregate of risk weighted assets on the balance sheet and risk adjusted value of the balance sheet. Minimum tire 1 should be 10%. Lending against gold minimum tire 1 should be 12%. Getting it? These NBFCs know. These NBFCs. Which NBFCs? Capital requirement ratio will apply. Middle layer NBFC, upper layer NBFC. NBFCs which fall under, you know, base layer no. Base layer. For them, net owned funds criteria only will apply. Please substitute the words. No one words don't interpret. Non-systematically important, non-deposit taking. No, don't use. Directly use. Base layer. Whenever the word systematically important but not deposit taking or deposit taking, simply use middle layer or upper layer as a case may be. That's it. Are you clear? So, these are the risk values. You need not remember. In exam, if they want to give a question on this, they will give you. They will give you the percentages also and the asset also. Asset value will be there, percentage will be there. Apply that, you will get the risk value, risk adjusted value. Total that, on that apply 15 percentage. That's it. Next. So then we have recognition, asset classification, all that. We'll take a break and get back and discuss. So now let's continue the NBFC IRAC norms, income recognition, asset classification norms. The first thing that we need to understand is NPA norm for NBFC. Now, this NBFC NPA norm is different for base layer, different for middle layer and upper layer. The NBFC norms are different for base layer. See, I am using the language directly in the amended language. Directly. Getting it? Now, base layer means non-deposit, non-systematically important. Whereas, systematically important NBFCs and the deposit taking NPFCs, they come under middle layer and upper layer. For all of these systematically important NBFCs, NBFC norm is 3 months directly. What is the NBFC norm? 3 months directly. Remember, earlier you might have seen for systematically NBFCs and deposit taking NBFCs as per the directions given by them, 3 months is to be substituted for 6 months. You, have, you can see here. First, let us understand what is a non-performing asset for an NBFC. It may be an asset, it may be a term loan, it may be a demand loan, it may be a bill or it may be any interest in respect of a debt or income on receivables or even, even if you sell any asset, no. If you sell any asset or rent any service, no. Where reimbursement of expenses, whatever is there, no. Even if it is overdue for 6 months or more. In all these cases, you see it is 6 months or more, 6 months or more. Are you getting the point? In all these cases, the criteria to decide NPA is 6 months or more. However, if the NBFC is systematically important, deposit taking nothing but middle layer and upper layer, for them, you need to substitute it with 3 months. Sorry, not this. You need to substitute with 3 months, this one. You need to substitute with 3 months. Now, wherever NBFC systematically important non-deposit taking and deposit taking directions, as per the directions, so for those NBFCs which fall under middle layer and upper layer, upper layer, for them, three months is to be treated in, in all the A to and F above points, you know, six months word is used, right? Now that has to be substituted with three months, which is in line with the banking, banking items, banking companies. For banking companies, 90 days is what we use. Here we use three months, don't substitute. Because month definition is different, days definition is different. Next, for, for NPFCs, which are engaged in leasing and higher purchase business. Getting the point? For them, 12 months is a criteria. However, for again middle layer and upper layer NBFCs, again it is 3 months. For all middle layer NBFCs, upper layer NBFCs, if they have to receive anything which is receivable, if the receivable is not received on due date and the overdue period is 3 months or more than 3 months, it is straight away to be treated as NPA. Are you getting the point? All of you. For normal NPFCs, all types of receivables except the lease rentals, except the higher purchase installment, all other receivables for a normal base layer NPFC, 
six months is the criteria. For lease rentals, for a base layer NBFC, what's the criteria? Twelve months. So NBFC, NBFC, this is important. The NPA norm is important for um, this one MCQ questions. Getting it? NPA, okay, base layer NBFC, middle layer, upper layer NBFC, always three months. What is the three? What is the criteria? Always three months for all kinds of receivable. Whether you call it as interest on security. Whether you call it as dividend, whether you call it as sale proceeds on sale of fixed asset, getting it, or it may be a term loan principal interest or installment, or it may be call money, or it may be bill discounted money, whatever loan, whatever advance, NPFC has to receive something, and there is a due date for that. After due date, it cross, it's called overdue. If the overdue period is three months or more, it's straight away NPA. Are you getting the point? Now for base layer NPFC is. What is the receivable? You need to check. If the receivable is, if the receivable is lease rental or higher purchase installment, then it is twelve months. Other other receivables, then it is six months. This is a very simple NPA term. No need to mug up. Easy or not? All of you. That's it. Now, now you see. So that is NPA term. Now once an NPFC you know once. Once, see what is the significance of NPA. First of all, once a receivable is treated as NPA, we have to classify that asset as non-performing asset, and provisioning norms will apply. One consequence of treating an asset item as NPA is what provisioning norms will apply. Before we create provision, NPAs are subclassified into three more types. NPAs are again subclassified into three more types. One is substandard asset, doubtful asset, loss asset. Substandard, doubtful, and loss asset. When an NPA is treated as substandard asset, once it turns into NPA, when it will turn into NPA for base layer, twelve months or six months overdue should cross. Then it will become NPA. Primarily, it will directly go under substandard category. For a upper layer, middle layer. Just three months overdue enough. Ah, immediately, ninety first day or ninety second day, whatever three months expiry date, whatever is there. Immediately, it will be turned into NPA substandard asset. Now, for how long we will carry it under substandard category? How long we will carry that under substandard category? For base layer, we will carry it up to eighteen months. For middle layer and upper layer, we will carry it up to twelve months. Are you getting the point, sir? It already crossed three months. Eighteen months also completed. Eighteen months also completed. Then the next eighteen months we will be classifying it as doubtful asset. Whereas here next twelve months we will classify it as doubtful asset. After completion of initial twelve months, next twelve months we will treat it as doubtful asset. Here in case of uh, this is for base layer, this is for upper layer or middle layer. Able to understand? Which means? Which means? Suppose, suppose I am an NBFC which fall under base layer. First, overdue for more than six months or more than twelve months. If it is there, yes, we will straight away treat it as NPA. For how many months we will treat it as NPA? Up to eighteen months, substandard. After eighteen months, it will become as doubtful. That's it. If at all company identified this is something irrecoverable at all, then they will classify that as a. Loss asset, loss asset, no time. Getting it? Company will classify. Suppose if the same thing is, if the same thing is middle layer or upper layer, what is the consequence? Here we will use three months criteria. Here we will use which criteria? Twelve months. After twelve months, it will become doubtful asset. Exactly same logic. Just that the number will be different. Are you getting the point? All of you. Now, for substandard assets. For doubtful assets, for loss asset, for standard asset, how much provision we need to create is the question. Getting it? Now, generally, for standard assets, we are not supposed to maintain any provision. But here they have given a slight, very nominal provision. We are maintaining for base layer NBFCs and middle layer NBFCs. There is a nominal provision for base layer NBFC, zero point two five percentage of the outstanding amount. Which is, I mean, standard means what? Which is not NPA. Which is not a NPA. So, in respect of performing asset, standard asset also we have to create provision, but very, very, very nominal amount. How much? 
0.25% suppose if it is a middle layer upper layer npfc 0.4% are you getting it now suppose sir it's turned into npa right now it is under substandard category straight away 10% of outstanding loan shall be treated as a provision how much is 12 10% of the outstanding loan you can see here you can observe the provisioning norms here for standard assets how much for sub sub means uh, substandard asset how much it is 10% of the total outstanding suppose if the asset is turning into doubtful then we need to increase the provision substandard already 10 we maintain no now it turned into doubtful then we need to increase the provision until next one year up to 20% that next year we need to increase by another 30% that next year increase by totally 50 making it as a whole 100% provision by end of 3 years see first 12 I mean uh, let us talk about base layer NBFC overdue for more than 6 months substandard under substandard category keep 10% for next 18 months provision for next 18 months under substandard category as long as it, it continued outstanding loan multiplied by how much provision 10% now after 18 months it turns into doubtful right now uh, once it turned into doubtful let us classify it as uh, doubtful up to one year doubtful up to three years doubtful more than three years suppose up to one year after it turned into doubtful total provision we should maintain how much 20 already 10 is created only 10 we have to create next up to next three years additional 30 we need to add now total provision came how much 50 percentage three years also crossed 50 another 50 we have to create we have to be more conservative making it once an asset classified as doubtful and exceeded three years after classifying 100 percent provisioning is required sir instead of creating 100 percent provision we can write it off no depends on the bank's policy sorry depends upon the nbfc policy recovery agency response based on so many things see once an asset turns into nba recovery agency work will start getting it so finally they will give a report recovery agents bad banks getting it asset reconstruction companies all that they will be entering into this getting it so they will decide ultimately at the end of three years so sir three years already crossed we tried all our routes nothing can be recovered from the person except to bring him to the insolvency proceedings then we will classify it as a loss asset 100 percent then we'll file a case against him of course case will be filed the moment he started default the moment he started default we will try to initiate recovery against him if at all is not responding we will file a case against him so all the proceedings will be happening after three years irrespective of the status of the court case we will straight away write it off generally what what practice banks will follow write off able to understand now remember write off is different from waiver getting it see many many banks and all NPFCs they write off the amounts right so people unnecessarily newspapers media people and all will be commenting unnecessarily government is writing of loans given to so and so company so public money is right off means what it's a prudential law people don't understand right off is not waiver they think when we write off in books of accounts we are waiving the person no able to understand still the recovery proceedings against Nirav Modi is active still the recovery proceedings against the Vijay Malia is active all this whoever have absconded from India the recovery proceedings are still going on the cases are pending in international courts able to understand next so this is regarding NPN of and provisioning norm are you clear so i have even covered you know when it will be treated as see entire this content i've covered in the form of simple diagram getting it so asset classification for nbfcs we classify assets into four categories standard substandard doubtful and assets standard is actually called as performing assets all these three are nothing but non-performing assets getting it Now, sir, suppose if an asset is classified as substandard, can I again bring it back to performing asset category? There is some upgradation criteria. Upgradation criteria. Only if the conditions given under upgradation criteria is satisfied, only then we can. If at all rescheduling is done, we cannot classify until one year of satisfactory performance. What is it? Until one year of satisfactory performance as per the rescheduled terms, we will not upgrade it. Getting it? So substandard up to 18 months after NPA for base layer. If, if the same lab is same lab, same number is what? 12 months for middle and upper layer. Here they will tell, here they will mention that in, in a non systematic import and non deposit, nothing but which layer? Base layer. For remaining it is which one? Uh, middle layer and upper layer. That's it. 
Suppose where terms of the agreement, no, where they, where they were renegotiated or rescheduled or restructured, then until one year of satisfactory performance as per the renegotiated terms, you cannot upgrade. Are you getting it? For the doubtful asset, doubtful asset means what? Generally, after 18 months, once an asset is continued in substandard category for 18 months, it is substandard. Once it crosses 18 months, we have to reclassify that as doubtful. Whereas in case of middle layer, middle layer and upper layer, we don't wait 18 months. We just wait for 12 months and classify. And loss asset. Loss asset means which is identified by the NBFC management, the internal or external auditor or by the bank during inspection. Then we will treat it as loss asset and it will be written off completely. And there is another reason why loss asset will be created. An asset which is adversely affected by threat of non-recoverability due to either erosion in the value of security or non-availability of security due to fraudulent act of omission on the part of the borrower. This is also treated as loss asset. This is very important observation. Now you see here, here it is not about non-repayment. Here it is not about non-repayment. Customer is repaying me honestly, timely. But the problem is, we gave a loan to the customer based on security. And the security value has eroded completely. So, there is a threat of non-recoverability in future. There is a threat generally, if a customer do not, see banks will give loan based on two reasons. One is your repayment capacity to another security. 90% of the loans given by the banks are secured. But you may understand, now when the loans are secured, no, if a customer defaults, we can sell the security and do right. The problem is, when security is being valued at the time of giving loan, frauds are happening. Getting the point, that is where the problem is. And most of the security, suppose you see Vijay Malia has given enough security for taking the loan. The airplanes were there as security for the bank, but the problem is nobody is ready to buy. That is the problem. But finding a buyer is what, you know, uh, important for the security. How liquid the security given by the customer is more important. Getting it? So, so if at all, any security given by the customer has become you know, there is an erosion in the value. There is an erosion in the value when security has lost its market value. Or security is not available. The customer has fraudulently showed security, which is actually not there in reality. So, in such a case, irrespective of default, irrespective of default, we will try to be treated as what? Loss asset. We will try to be treated as loss asset. This is there in banking also. This provision is there in banking. In fact, this is taken from the banking provision. Erosion in value of security where value of security is not even 10% of the outstanding loan of the customer. To the borrower, there is an outstanding loan from the borrower. Not even 10% of the loan, the security market value is there. In such a case, whether he is repaying regularly or not, ignore the fact. Write it off as a loss asset. This is a banking loan. Are you getting the point? So, in question, no. If they will ask you, write about loss asset within the definition of NBFC. So, loss asset means two criteria. One, the auditors and the bank inspection will identify whether it is a loss asset or not. Two, security erosion, value erosion. Then also we will treat it as loss asset. Same way, doubtful asset. You see, doubt was substandard asset. Substandard assets, we have two categories. Substandard assets, we have two categories. One category, customer defaulted. More than six months or more than three months, depending upon base layer, middle layer. Next 18 months or next to 12 months, we will read it as doubtful. That is one category because of the default. Suppose, no. I am repaying regularly. Suddenly my job has gone. Getting it. So immediately I went to the bank without even default. Without even default, I went to the bank. Sir, please apply rescheduling. Suddenly, all these days, customer is paying on time. He came for reschedulement or extension of the loan period, whatever. Okay. Uh, definitely it's a threat of non-recoverability. Yes or no? It's a, it's a risk, right? So banks, you know, even though he is repaying regularly, he just asked for rescheduling. Sir, next six months I cannot pay. I have not defaulted. Remember, I have not defaulted. I am asking the bank to give me additional credit period for another six months. Able to understand. In that case, all these loans where wherever customer made an application for reschedulement, made an application for extension, getting it or renewal, for next one year, we will straight away classify it as doubtful category. Even the customer has paid promptly, even though there is no default. So, in examination, the last question, write about NPFC substandard set. Two categories will be substandard. One, there is a default. Here, an asset comes under substandard category through default route. Another asset will come from rescheduling route. So, once a customer applied for rescheduling, even though there is no default, bank agreed for rescheduling. 
So customer has not defaulted. But in the bank to records, in the bank to records, bank has to classify it as substandard and make a provision because customer asked for reschedulement is a potential threat of non-recoverability at a future date. Are you getting the point? So that is second criteria. This many don't observe. Able to understand all of you, MCQ is important. MCQ is important. They'll give you option A, option B, option A or B, option A and B like that. Are you clear? Next. Actually, the answer is A or B. Any of these two cases. If any of these two cases attract, it is a doubtful asset. Sorry, substandard asset. Substandard asset. And for doubtful asset, it is very simple. Once it can, you, once it classified as substandard and continued for more than 12 months and continued for more than 18 months, 18 or 12 cross immediately, it is a doubtful. Now, by the way, I told right reshuttling part, substandard reshuttling part. Until one year of satisfactory performance, even the customer is paying promptly as per the rescheduled terms, until one year will wait. Okay, let us see whether as per the rescheduled terms, customer is paying for the next one year. Okay, customer is paying, then I will upgrade it. Then I will again upgrade the customer account in my books of accounts to performing asset category. Are you clear? Next. So that is the NBFC norm here. So in examination, MCQs, they may be asking you a provision. Case based MCQ will be given for you to calculate the provision amount. To calculate provision amount. Now for standard set, what is the provisioning for middle layer and upper layer? 0.4%. For non systematically important, nothing but base layer. 0.25 percentage of the outstanding amount. Next. What are the steps involved in audit of NBFC? Obviously, similar steps like any other audit of a company. First, we understand about the business of the company. We look at MOA, AOA, we look at business policy, we look at minutes. Yes or no? we, what, what actual business they are doing? We apply principal business criteria, all that. Getting it? Remember, in CARO, of every company, for every company, wherever CARO is applicable, we need to check whether NBFC activity is carried on by the company. Principal business criteria we need to apply for every company. If a company satisfies that criteria, they have to obtain compulsory registration of RBI. If they do not obtain registration, we need to qualify the CARO report. Are you getting it? Next, we, we generally look at internal control systems. Then, most important thing is registration with RBI we need to check. Okay, we have to check the registration copy and see the principal business criteria, dual condition, financial asset criteria, financial income criteria, satisfied or not. Then we need to check mandatory investment in liquid assets. This point is applicable only for those NPFCs which are accepting deposits. Only if I accept deposits of a customer, I need to maintain liquidity position. Because when a customer comes back and takes back his deposits by surrendering the bond, when he wants to take back, I don't know. So I need to maintain liquidity. This is similar to SLR, CRO requirement in case of a bank. In a bank, CRR SLR is there. For NBFC, CRR SLR does not apply, no. So, they need to maintain investment in liquid assets as given by RBI. And further, they need to file quarterly returns. And auditors should ascertain whether the returns were regularly filed with RBI by the concerned NBFC or not. We need to check. Now, step number four. We need to check certain directions issued by RBI for middle layer, upper layer NBFCs. For middle layer and upper layer NBFCs, which are accepting deposits, auditor has to check certain points. What are the points? Whether the NBFC has accepted deposits based on appropriate credit rating allocated to them. See, credit rating agencies will give some rating to you. Ratings will be, in, it may be numbers or it may be A, A plus, that category or depends. There are many credit rating, credit rating companies that are there in India which are approved credit rating institution. Each credit rating company will follow one grading system. So, as per the grading system, you cannot accept more than so and so amount of deposits. Based on the credit rating, what is the quantum of deposit I can accept from public? Remember, this is similar for companies also. Suppose if a company want to go for public deposits, acceptance of public deposits, first they need to get a grading certificate. Based on the credit rating grading, the quantum of deposit they can accept from public will be decided. And within that amount only you can raise money from the public. Same way for NPFC also. Now, you see, whenever there is an upgrading of the credit rating, nothing. You, if you want, you can raise additional deposit. But whenever there is a downgrading, whatever the deposits that you have accepted, no. Downgrading happened. After you accepted the deposit, there is a downgrading. You should not renew. Like there is a question here. This itself can be asked as a four marks question. They will give you a practical question. You are, you are appointed as an auditor of an NPFC. 
getting it during the audit you found that the npfc has accepted certain public deposits at the time of accepting the public deposits there was a credit rating given by some credit rating agency approved credit rating institution in india and there are after uh, periodical credit rating inspection there was a downgrading in the credit rating what as an auditor you evaluate when there is a downgrading in the credit rating of the npfc this is the question they will ask you nothing but you just have to write this point as an answer four marks question getting the point so what you need to write when there is a downgrading in credit rating should i repay to the customer no need don't accept further deposits first point two if a customer deposit is expired no don't renew don't renew because you are a downgrading you need to repay logically speaking you need to repay but we are not asking you to repay we are asking you not to renew not to renew means what maturity over now repay in but suddenly because of downgrading don't repay all the amounts before maturity no need to repay on maturity you have to repay no need to renew and existing deposits whatever is there you can continue up to maturity date are you getting the point suppose if any customer want to renew give the customer complete information that there is a downgrading as per the, what is meant by downgrading we as per our liquidity norms should not accept if at all you are willing still to invest in our company in the form of deposit give your 100% consent then i will accept renewal so you see no matured no matured public deposits shall be renewed without express and voluntary consent of the depositor only if the depositor 100% agreed yes i am ready to bear the risk then only he can accept then only that application can be renewed otherwise if i do not intimate the depositor getting it about the downgrading i should i, sh I should i should not renew the application normally generally whenever company accept a deposit no whenever npfc accept a deposit no it can be renewed whenever maturity date comes it can be renewed are you getting the point so in the event of downgrading below minimum specified investment grade b npfc especially icc which are npfc investment and credit company or a factor okay shall regularize excess deposit so first one stop accepting fresh deposit all existing please run up to maturity report the position to the rbi within 15 working days and no mature deposit shall be renewed without express consent of the depositor probably in rbi they might have given additional guidelines that don't accept even if the customer give consent maybe in reality the situation would have been slightly different also slightly slightly tougher also are you getting it now we need to check interest calculation and we need to check whether deposits are accepted based on a proper written application written application means obviously e applications electronic applications next see whether the npfc is maintaining register of deposits see whether investment is made in the liquid assets approved by the reserve bank of india see whether timely returns are filed or not and suppose if npfc is not accepting deposit it is calling itself as a non deposit taking npfc but systematically important or may not be systematically important it may be middle layer upper layer or base layer getting it but if the npfc is not accepting deposit board of directors shall take a decision in a board meeting that this npfc decided not to accept deposit express non acceptance of deposits resolution shall be made if the npfc decided not to take deposits so that is what this point is are you getting it the point of this this one not required next <laughs> now auditor has to check uh, what else auditor has to check in the audit of npfc we need to check prudential norms so uh, and uh, whenever whenever an asset is classified as npa interest on that asset shall not be recognized on accrual basis only it will be recognized as income only if it's actually realized suppose and a loan is treated as npa before it became npa some interest is recognized on accrual basis in the past 3 6 months that interest we didn't receive now when the asset turned into npa we have to reverse it what we need to do reversal of income what is it called as actually reversal of income so see they ask you a question like this write about audit of uh, write about uh, uh, audit points or what do you verify with respect to npfc prudential norm then you need to write this answer what are npfc prudential norms you need to write the above answer like uh, performing asset non performing as substandard standard doubtful 12 months 18 months that entire thing getting it so provision uh, they may ask you a provision or they may ask you audit process audit process means this generally since it is audit subject what is important audit process and you if you want to write audit process correctly first you must understand the provision that's it clear so first they spoke about provision in this chapter in all the up to almost five or six question they spoke about provisions thereafter they are discussing audit processes are you getting the point next now see in nbfc is also just like any other company frauds will be happening 
But there is a direction by RBI with regard to frauds. There is a direction given by RBI with, resp with respect to fraud. RBI master direction monitoring of uh, fraud. RBI master direction monitoring of fraud. Okay, 2016. As per those directions, every NPFC shall classify frauds into the following categories. This is for unanimity of the reporting. See, RBI will prepare annual reports. So, uh, in the annual report, one of the segment is NBFCs. Wow, how NBFC performance in India? RBI will prepare a report. RBI report will be there every year. Getting it? So, uh, RBI will have to report to the, all the stakeholders what are the types of frauds happened in NBFC, how much quantum is involved in India with respect to the various frauds committed by NBFC. So, since RBI has to report to all the stakeholders the types of frauds, first, frauds has to be regularized in the sense um, frauds has to be uh, the names of the frauds. The terminology used for frauds should be uniform so that uniformity in reporting can be achieved. So, as per RBI, in NBFC, any fraud that may be happened, that will fall under these categories. Any fraud, whatever, the fraud may be in any category, that can be categorized into these. Criminal breach of trust, fraudulent encashment through forged instrument, manipulation of books of accounts through fictitious accounts and conversion, unauthorized credit facilities, negligence and cash shortage. You see here, negligence and cash shortage means there is no intention here. Negligence is not a fraud. Cash shortage is not a fraud. However, if the cash shortage is more than 10,000, it is always treated as fraud. If the cash shortage is more than 10,000, it is always treated as fraud. However, if it is less than 10,000, it is not treated as fraud unless intention is proved. Unless intention is proved, if the amount of cash shortage is less than 10,000, it is not treated as fraud. One more condition. If the cash shortage is more than 5,000, and it is not reported to the management by the cashier. Cash shortage is there more than 5000 and it is not reported to the management. Which means cashier is hiding something. Even though it is more than 5000, we will read it as fraud. Suppose no, cash shortage is more than 5, but less than 10. Reported to the management also, this incident. Means nothing is hidden. So we will not classify it as fraud. Suppose if the cash shortage is more than 10,000, whether intimated to the management or not, doesn't matter. It is always fraud. Are you clear? Next, cheating and forgery is a fraud. Irregularity in foreign exchange transaction is also fraud. Irregularity they used. Irregularity means what? It may be fraud or it may be negligence. Irregularity in foreign exchange is treated as fraud only when the intention is proved. Only when the intention is proved. So for cash shortage and negligence, irregularity in foreign exchange, the proving of the fraudulent intention is important. However, if cash shortage is more than 10,000, intention also doesn't matter. Straight away, fraud. Are you getting the point? All of you. Next, any other type of fraud which do not fall under above categories, residuary frauds, we call it as. That's it. So, this entire point also I spoke. In examination, they'll talk about, write about classification of fraud, specifically negligence and cash shortage. Getting it? So, you need to write this entire answer. Or they may give you a case study based question. NBFC, the bank man, the NBFC manager is arguing that since the cash shortage is more than 10,000, since intention is not proved, he is treating it as negligence but not fraud. Whereas you are, you are, you are I mean, whereas you are treating it as fraud. In, light, I mean, uh, in, in the light of the above circumstance, what is your opinion? They will ask you. You need to write this provision and in the analysis, you need to write, since as per RBA provision, more than 10,000 cash shortage is always treated as fraud. If it is more than 5,000, management is not having knowledge then also fraud. If it is more than 5,000, not exceeding 10,000, but there is no management knowledge, then also, I mean, if management is having knowledge, then it is not a fraud. Able to understand. Next. Next. Write about special audit checklist. This was asked somewhere in May 22 exam or December 21 exam. This one is asked in May 22 or December 21. Ah, correct order. This was asked in exam directly. Direct question, write about sample audit checklist for investment credit company they asked. This is a question which they asked. Write about sample audit checklist. Write about a sample audit checklist of an NBFC which is involved in investment and credit. Corpor I mean, it's an investment credit company. Getting it. For them, what are the audit points that you verify? You see here, it's investment company and also credit means loans giving company. Investments they are making, loans are also they are making. Getting it. So, Now you see here, so income recognition on securities, remember they may, not, they may not be asking entire question, they may be asking only one part of it. 
three to four marks question they will be asking or they may be asking how investments made by nbfcs are audited by auditor especially in case of icc if at all you are appointed as an auditor of investment credit company what are the points that you verify with respect to verification of investments what i will verify how the investments are classified is it current and long term we check valuation part we check whether investments were made in group companies how they were valued are they valued as per accounting standards or not and we get confirmation certificate if the investments are held with the depositors because investments are in dmat format right so we need to look at dmat statements depositor contract notes all that and see if it is unlisted debentures you know unlisted debentures unlisted bonds if at all you invested in unlisted bond or unlisted debentures as per rbi now nbfc shall be treated treat shall treat it as term loan but not as an investment and uh, there is something called a single borrower maximum limit for a single borrower suppose if nbfc has invested in some particular debenture or you know bond for a more than certain amount uh, that is not permitted by rbi because there is a restriction for single borrower there is how much nbfc can give loan how much nbfc can give investment in a single company or single borrower there is a limit for from rbi able to understand that's why you see consortium arrangements will come banks no suppose you can repay 20000 crore to me i can sanction you 20000 crore but the problem is my liquidity ratio cannot be maintained if i give 20000 crore loan so what i will do i will go, i will join with other banks and all of us together will lend you 20000 crore consortium loans are given by banks not because the bank do not have funds because bank cannot maintain liquidity position are you getting the point so by verification of investments by nbfc verification of investments by auditor of nbfc especially in case of investment and credit company this itself can be asked as a four marks question are you ready yet see every time whenever you are reading question how a question can be coming from that aspect you need to think getting it and you say 99 percent it will match in the examination then loans and advances normal point bill disc bills discontinued normal point npa normal point in that investment zone is the key point in this entire question able to understand You all, you all have to go through past four RTPs, including May 23 attempt, relevant RTP, past four RTPs, and past four question papers. More than enough. No need to read 20 attempts of papers. Okay, that's that's just a trick. Okay, that is that is not at all relevant. What 20 years papers? Auditing provisions have substantially changed four years back. Audit report provision no before 2018 is completely different format of audit report. That then key audit matter standard itself is not there. Key audit matter standard applicable from 2018. Material uncertainty related to going concerns is applicable from 2018. Getting it? Many standards were. Why to that extent? Standards on auditing itself came in picture from 2010. Before that, there is something called auditing and assurance standard. AAS 1, AAS 2, AAS 3, like that we have. When we studied CA inter, we have AAS 1, 2, 3, like that. What is the use of studying last 20 years? Moreover, Moreover, auditing paper is being sincerely tested, sincerely tested only from 2018 onwards. After you are existing, we are all existing students, right? Logically, if at all next year 2024 scheme is not there, we call you as new scheme students. Correct? Huh? Earlier we have something called old scheme. That is uh, uh, where in that old scheme, corporate society's audit is there. Uh, Audit of items of financial statements were there. So many useless syllabus is there. Now that entire syllabus is shifted to CA inter. Now in CA final, they have added all these new topics. Able to understand. So, four years before, four years before, the question papers were very, very, very substantial. Very, very, I mean, uh, substandard. Getting it. Very poor. Question papers were very poor. When I went to my CA final exam, my question paper is two pages. That's it. Only two pages. ISCA also we have only two pages. Getting it? So now the audited question paper is really dynamic. They are testing you really the knowledge. Earlier we used to study 5 chapters only in audit and go and write easily we get 50, 55. I got 59. Okay. So it's very easy. So without studying audit we used to qualify easily audit. Now there is a lot of difficulty. Now you need to really read entire syllabus. So there is no point of reading 10 years questions, 15 years questions, nothing. If you read past 4 years questions which is more than enough. In fact I will say past 4 attempts is more than enough. Getting it. So you, you see 2021 May, 2021 December, 22 May, 22 November, 4. That's enough. And RTP is also up to May 2023, past 4 or 5 you cover. More than enough. MTP is no point at all. Because MTP is just a copy paste of study material questions only. 
you see if you want any subject you take mtp they just copy paste study material exercise questions or illustrations only names amounts only they will change correct huh? next then finally what are the additional duties of an auditor for under rba directions i told no audit nbfc we have fourth set of directions like totally how many directions we see in this particular chapter mainly we read see there are investment directions were there frauds related directions were there that we don't read specifically exclusively so much but these four set of directions we frequently come across non systematically important non deposit taking reserve bank directions systematically important non deposit taking and deposit taking directions acceptance of public deposits directions audit report directions now in this question we are discussing audit report directions we are discussing what audit report directions as per that you have to give anyhow audit report to shareholders what is the format of audit report sa 700 format getting it in addition to that from the auditor you must prepare another report to the board of directors what to the board of directors it is something like a compliance report what is it it is something like a compliance report you need to report to board of directors what are all they complained what are all they have not complied from the auditor's perspective you need to give a report to the board of directors same way you have to give a you know non-compliance report to rbi we call it as exception report what do we call it as exception report so you need to file an exception report with rbi so they may ask you an exam straight away write about exception report to rbi very simple answer you are appointed as an auditor of an NBFC, so and so, so and so entity which is involved in lending of loans and has got registration of NBFC, registration from RBI as an NBFC. So, as part of you have completed the audit, you have done all your job. Now, you are requested to submit an exception report to the RBI. So, write about this exception report, four marks question. So, you need to write this. Now, what is this exception report? Nothing but you will report non compliances with, you will report non compliances with the following set of directions. What are the three directions? Acceptance of public deposit directions, non systematically important non deposit taking NBFC directions, deposit taking or systematically important non deposit taking dev directions. If auditor identified any non compliances with these three directions, auditor has to list out the list of non compliances and report to RBI. That's it. You need not report about compliances, you have to report only about non compliances. That's it. This answer is done. Are you getting the point? See, where in case of NBFC, the statement regarding any items reported in paragraph 3 above is unfavorable or qualified in the opinion of the auditor. Like the company has not complied with what? Provisions of chapter 3B of RBI Act, nothing but registration provisions. Chapter 3B is dealing with NBFCs. In RBI Act, each chapter deals with some set of entities. This chapter 3B deals with NBFCs. Or you have not satisfied acceptance of public deposit directions. Or you identified non compliances with NSI ND directions. Or you identified non compliances with systematically important non deposit taking and deposit taking NBS Reserve Bank directions 2016. Nothing but you have not complied with, uh, you have not complied with base layer directions, middle layer and upper layer directions. Are you getting it? But here, don't use the word base layer, upper layer word. You use the directions name only because directions names are not substituted. Understand? Just the referring only changed. The referring will be there. Earlier we used to refer so lengthy non NBFC, non deposit taking, you know, non systematically. That big reference is there. Now we are simply calling it as base layer. Getting the point. Now deposit taking NBFC, systematically important, non deposit taking NBFC, we are referring it as middle or upper layer. So reference only changed. Provision is not changed. Are you getting it? Classification names only changed. Provision is not changed. Understood or not? Still, in the amendment, there is something which is more important. So, what base layer comprises? Now, there is a clear one more small clarification. Base layer comprises NBFCs which are non-deposit taking. Which are non-deposit taking. Below asset size of 1000 crore. Below asset size of 1000 crore. Getting it? So, now this created a confusion. This created a confusion. Now, NBFC generally below 500 crore, no non deposit taking below 500 crore, it is non systematically important. Now, you see here references to NBFC with effect from 1st October 2022. How NBFCs shall be referred? 
NBFCs, which are non NBFC, which is non deposit, shall be referred as NBFC base layer. Whereas NBFC deposit taking, NBFC non deposit but systematically important. Getting it? Shall mean either middle layer or upper layer as the case may be. That's what we discussed, right? But now you see, generally, see NBFC non deposit means where systematically important what is not used? No. By default, it is what? Non systematically important. If the NBFC is not accepting deposits, we try to refer it as LD. Suppose if it is having asset size of more than 500 crore. We will classify it as systematically important non deposit taking NPFC. Once it is systematically important non deposit taking or deposit taking NPFC, we will classify either as a middle layer or upper layer as a case, maybe. Now, here, you know, when they copy pasted this notification from RBI website, no, they copy paste, they missed one line. They missed one line. I will show you. That is the reason why there is a confusion. I bet 99% will never notice this. I think we saved it up, just a minute. Now, these are the list of companies which are classified by RBA. Is it coming under uh, non-deposit or investment credit, which layer it is? So, these are the list of NBFCs, almost more than 9000 NBFCs were there. There are more than 9000 NBFCs were there in India which are classified. You see, there is no upper layer right now. Sorry, there is no top layer right now. And upper layer, no. There is one more amendment. Top 10 NPFC is based on asset size in India. They are straight away upper layer. They are straight away upper layer. Top 10 NPFC is in India. You see here. You see here, totally 11 have come. 11 NPFCs have come. Getting it? Totally. Which are coming under upper layer. Remaining NBFCs are middle layer. Now all these NBFCs are given in alphabetical order. After middle layer, base layer NBFCs will come again. They were listed in alphabetical order. Now they are middle layer. Moreover, they are investment credit companies or it may be core investment company or it may be ICC. Sorry, it may be microfinance institution or infrastructure finance company. Getting it? So infrastructure debt fund. So different subclassification. Getting it? So this is a layer. This is classification. This is category. Is it a non-deposit or deposit? Or is it a systematically important or simply a non-deposit taking NPFC? So that is also they have given. Getting it? So their address is given. This list is given. Now, I would just want to show the RBI provision clearly because that is uh, very important. In exam, if that question is tested, you should not confuse.
just one minute ma it will be available somewhere it will be available the link will be available earlier direct search on it will come Fine, got it. RBI scale based regulations. Yeah, this is the no, uh, yeah, correct. This is exact one. Okay, RBI scale based regulations. We call them as scale based regulations. You see here, inside this, they have given this point. You see here, two point one, the top. This one 2.1. Okay, visible, right? Now, this is what copy pasted. All reference to NPFC non deposit shall be in base layer. And all references to NBFC which are deposit taking and NBFC systematically important non deposit shall be in middle or upper layer as the case may be. Now, here there is a hyperlink given to that is not copy pasted in the institute book. Getting it? Because you know, when I am reading the institute material, no, first amendments, no. They use it in base layer less than 1000 proof. Now, here they are referring non systematically important as base layer. Are you getting my point? Non systematically important means less than 500 proof. In base layer, they mention 1000 proof. What is that? That is classified, that is clarified in this link. Getting it? You see here, it is clarified that existing NBFC non deposit systematically important having asset size of 500 crore and above, but below 1000 crore. Except those necessary necessitating fear during middle layer. Like in middle layer, also there is a scoring mechanism. So only if that score comes, middle layer it will come. So if an NPFC having more than 500 actually systematically important, it should, it should directly come under either middle or upper layer at less than 1000 crore and does not satisfy benchmark scores listed for middle layer and upper layer, they continue to be falling under base layer. This point, if the institute amendments not be given, they will give. Getting the point? See, I, you understood what is my doubt here? You understood my doubt? So, in order to understand that, I saw the original entire notification. So, that about 2 is, you know, that 2 not point is given below, no, that is not given by the institute. So, because of which, it creates a confusion. Some students don't even understand this, right? Because you, you have never seen this. See, normally, if an NBFC asset size is less than 500 crore, it's non systematically important. As per the new scale based regulations, every non systematically important NBFC is a base layer. Now, now what is base layer they defined here? What is base layer they defined? While they defining, if at all here, if at all here, they used 500 crore means happy, no confusion. But they used 1000 crore. If NBFC having asset size less than 1000 crore, they call it as base layer. My problem is, Below you are saying, below you are saying here, non-deposit, non-systematically important column comes under base layer, systematically important NBFC comes under middle layer. In the above list of base layer, 1000 crore you have used. Now, actual systematically important NBFC means what? If the asset size is 500 crore cross, it's a systematically important. As per this last point, what it should come? Middle layer. But you are given in the list what? Less than 1000 crore base layer. What is this confusion? So, I opened RPI, here when they are copy pasting this two point they didn't copy. Are you getting it? Institute people also copy paste on you know. So, the fellow did not understand whoever is copy pasted this work. Okay, so the second point not given. In exam they may give you that question only. If at all the paper center knows this provision they may, say they may give that question only. So, NBFC who, which is non-deposit and is systematically important, asset size is more than 500 crore but not exceeding 1000 crore and which does not fall under middle layer score point approach, getting it, still be classified as base layer. Are you clear? That's it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll show you here how the scorecard also looks like. That is given here. That is given here. Like I don't know existing uh, NBFCs, uh, 2 crore net owned funds, right? 
So by 2025 it is 5 crore, by 2027 it is going to be increased to 10 crore, which means there is a continuous amendment for the next 2 years. Next. Here, here there is an appendix given. The parameters, how upper layer, middle layer, all that will come. So here they have given. So what is the size and leverage? So based on that parameter weights were given. So whether NBFC comes under middle layer or upper layer depends upon these parameters. And they have given one... Uh, uh, They have given few more criteria, like I think we have given here itself. I think in our book it is covered. In our book it is covered, you see here. That the top 10, the top 10 NBFCs in terms of their asset side shall always be in upper layer, irrespective of any factor. In India there are 9000 or 7000 plus NBFCs. The top 10 NBFCs who are having biggest assets, highest assets value, they always come under upper layer. Remaining NPFCs, will, will they fall under upper layer or middle layer? We will check based on this scorecard, that benchmark parameters. Now, what other NPFCs will come under base layer? NPFC is a peer-to-peer -peer lending. They come under base layer. NPFC, where they are functioning as an account aggregator, they are base layer. Non-operative financial holding company, it's a base layer. NPFC is not having public funds and not having any customer interface, they will also come under base layer. They may ask you this itself for a 4 marks question. Write about RBI skill based regulations means like, I mean they will ask you more specifically, what are the NPFCs that fall under base layer? They will give you only this point. You see here already 4 points were there. It's on 4 to 5 points were there. If you write this in exam, you will get half page, more than half a page answer. Getting it? So, these NPFCs straight away will come under base layer. Now, you see peer-to-peer -peer lending. What is peer-to-peer -peer lending? Now, uh, many uh, example, suppose I register on one platform. There is one platform which is created where I will be registering as a lender. You also registered on that platform where you register as a, you know, borrower. Getting the point? There is a medium, medium NPFC which is there. The medium is actually NPFC. That application is maintained by NPFC. Now, the NPFC screen my application of borrower. Getting the point? The borrower application will be screened. Letter application will be screened. Now, a borrower need funds. NPFC will not give loan. NPFC has a list of letters now in their list of application. So, they will give loan. That's called peer to peer, customer to customer lending. For NPFC, you are a customer. Borrower is a customer. Letter is also customer. Now, I will scrutinize the borrower. The general, you know, if I have excess funds, I want to give loan to my relative. I am doubtful whether he will repay back or not. So, how to assess his credit rating all that legally? Okay, now there is a new model of business. It's a new fintech model. Getting the point. Same way, account aggregator. What is account aggregator? Example, bank bazaar is there. Yes or no? Um, credit is there. Credit is one account aggregator. Credit. Cred, you know, cred, have you heard? Yeah, cred. So, it's, it's, it's similar to something account aggregator. I'm not sure exactly is it account aggregator or not, but it is similar to account aggregator where the entire your information is at one place. See, now, when a bank want to give you a loan, getting it, they want to see what are the bank accounts you are having, where and all the loans you are having, all that. Now, civil report is there. But civil report is also having certain limitations. Now, I form one entity where with respect to one customer, what are all the loans he is having? What are all the banks he is having? What are all the finances, sources and applications where at all he is making? I will maintain one borrower related information at one place. Then I am called as account aggregator where I am aggregating account information of all the borrowers. Are you getting the point? Next. So next one, non-operative financial loaning company. It is similar to core investment company. It is similar to core investment company but not core investment company. Core investment company means, means, means what? If 90% of the total assets, if more than 90% of the total assets are represented by investments in subsidiaries and associates and joint ventures. Then we call it as a core investment company. Suppose Aditya Birla Group Holding Company is it? That is not core investment company. That is actually non-operative financial holding company. What is it? Non-operative financial holding company. There are some companies which are in India which are non-operative financial holding companies. These companies will not operate in any business. They are just holding companies for the name's sake. That's it. Are you getting the point? And NBFC is where they don't have public funds access or where there is no direct customer interface. They don't have any direct interaction with the customers. Some back-end service providers, NBFCs will be there. Those NBFCs, like example, NBFC, uh, recovery, recovery NBFCs will be there. Some recovery related service providers will be there. They may not have customer interface. Getting the point. So those NBFCs will be classified as uh, base layer NBFCs. Now, 
there are some NBFCs which will fall under middle layer. This itself can also be coming as four marks possibility. Are you getting the point? Now, uh, all deposit taking NBFCs, irrespective of asset size, since it's deposit taking straight away middle layer, or it may come under upper layer, depending upon the benchmarks, or non deposit taking with asset side of thousand crore and above, they will also come under middle layer. NBFCs which are doing, which are taking standalone primary dealers. Standalone primary dealers, no, primary dealers, no, they buy and sell government securities. SPDs we call them as. What they do? Buy and sell government securities. And core investment companies, which core investment company? Core investment company with an asset size of more than 100 crore. Which core investment company? Core investment company with an asset size of more than 100 crore. If core investment company having asset size less than 100 crore, it is exempted from registration of NBFC, yes or no? Have you seen NBFC exemptions? In exemptions, there is one, one more exemption. A core investment company with an asset size of less than 100 crore, that is called as non-systematically important core investment company. What is it called as? Non-systematically important core investment company. Generally, for all MBFCs, systematically important, non-systematically important criteria is 500 crore. But for core investment company, 100 crore is the criteria. Now, which core investment company is exempted from NPFC registration? That core investment company whose asset size is less than 100 crore. We call it as non systematically important core investment company which is exempted from registration. The question of base layer, middle layer do not arise. Now, any other core investment company where the asset size is more than 100 crore, which is a systematically important NPFC, straight away come under middle layer or upper layer. Are you getting the point? But NBFC core investment companies are always middle layer. This is what they gave. NBFCs which are core investment companies will always come under middle layer. And housing finance companies, IFCs, infrastructure finance companies, all that will come under middle layer. Now, upper layer. Upper layer comprise of those NBFCs which are specifically identified by RBI as warranting enhanced regulatory requirements based on some parameters and scoring methodology as provided in appendix. That's what I showed now. This is actually appendix. We clicked on this only. That only opened. Yes or no? So, appendix. Getting it? So, and further, the top 10 NBFCs shall always reside in upper layer, irrespective of any other factor. Are you clear? Now, top layer is generally empty. This is, this can be populated. This can be filled only by Reserve Bank if it is substantial increase in potential systematic risk from NBFCs which are there in upper layer. If at all an NBFC which is there in upper layer, there is a significant risk for that NBFC. Risk is very high. Then those NBFCs RBI will come, will classify, reclassify under this one top layer where RBI will directly monitor. Are you getting the point? Now, categorization of NBFCs based on specific activity. Now, NBFCs are again classified based on activity in which they involve, like regulatory structure envisages scale based as well as activity based. The following prescription shall apply. NBFC peer to be, see these are all activity based. What activity they are doing? Peer to be in NBFC, account aggregated, non-operative financial loading company, NBFCs without public, public access or no customer interface. They all come under base layer. This itself can come as 6 marks question or 4 marks question. Getting the point, write about categorization of NBFC which are carrying out specific activity or based on activity they carry out as per the new scale based regulations, four marks question they will give, which means you need to write this one. Are you clear? Now, NBFCs which are peer to peer lending, now you see here 1000 crore, 500 crore, that number itself is not used. That number itself is not used. So, NBFC which are directly peer to peer lending which are an account aggregator, non-operative financial loading company, not having public funds, not having customer interface, they all straight away come under base layer. Next, NBFC, deposit taking, core investment company, infrastructure finance company, housing finance company will be in middle layer or upper layer as the case may be. Primary dealers, NBFC infrastructure debt fund will always remain in the middle layer. This can be asked as an MCEQ, able to understand. They will give you statements below. Which of the following statement is correct? They will give you any four statements out of this. They will select and give you. You need to pick the right one. For this, you need to understand clearly what are they. Now, the remaining NBFCs, which are not uh, other above, which are not peer-to-peer, -peer, which are not account aggregator, which is not which is not a non-operative finance company, which is not a NBFC having public access, which is not an NBFC having customer interface, which is not a deposit taking NBFC, which is not a core investment company, which is not an infrastructure finance company, which is not an infrastructure debt company, yes or no. Other NBFCs, namely ICC, microfinance institution, factors, MGCs, mortgage guarantee companies, 
they could lie in any of the layers of the regulatory structure depending upon the scale based parameters this is something like summary for all the above discussion this is something like summary they summarize once again they revise once again are you getting the point all of you that's it so you have to read twice again remember here there is a second point note point which is given in the rpa notification there is a clarification what is the clarification nbfc non deposit systematically important with asset size more than 500 but not exceeding 1000 crore they will be treated as base layer only that's a clarification given are you clear that's it so with this nbfc amendment part is also completed confident or not now now let's come back to audit report provisions Just two minutes. So the next one, can I proceed? Next one. Now we are actually discussing audit report provisions. We are actually discussing audit report, uh, you know, to directors and to RBI. To RBI we discussed exception report. If auditor has identified any non-compliance with RBI Act Chapter 3B provisions or if auditor has identified any non-compliance with middle layer provisions and upper layer provisions, if auditor has identified any non-compliance with base layer NBFC provisions, then auditor has to submit an exception report to do RBI. Are you getting it? Now, same way auditor has to give a separate report to board of directors also as per RBI directions. Auditor has to give a report to do board of directors. Now, what report? What are the points the report should contain? That is the question. It depends on, first of all, there are some common points we need to include. For all NBFCs, we need to include certain common points. What are the common points? Is NBFC conducting a proper activity, finance activity? Is it having a valid registration certificate? Suppose, if the company is already holding certificate of registration, is it eligible to hold? Whether the company is meeting net want fund requirement has given it master direction, this is for base layer NBFC. In case of upper layer and middle layer NBFC, we look for whether NBFC is maintaining minimum capital requirement adequacy ratio. These are the points which auditor has to comment with respect to every NBFC while giving report to board of directors of the relevant NBFC. Are you getting the point? Now, further, Suppose if NBFC is accepting deposits, you are giving a report to board of directors now where you are including the above three points, whether NBFC is eligible to hold a certificate of registration, whether are they having a valid registration certificate, whether are they maintaining net bond funds and capital requirement adequacy ratio criteria correctly or not, you are giving this point. In addition to that, since you are doing an audit of NBFC which is accepting deposits from public, you should also report on various other points. Next point that you need to report is whether the deposits accepted by the NBFC, are they within the limits? Are they within the overall limits? Now, when, when deposits are accepted, overall limit means there is a overall limit on the borrowings of a company. Like in Companies Act also, we have a provision. Overall borrowings company, how much can have? Even deposits also, we have a provision. Yes or no? Eligible public companies, non-eligible public companies, what are the aggregate deposits they can have? Right now, existing borrowings are how many? Right now, how much I can borrow from the deposits? All comprehensively, we need to evaluate. Here, the way the public deposits along with other borrowings like debentures and bonds, borrowings from shareholders which are not excluded from the definition of public deposit for these NPFCs are they within admissible limits simply whether NPFC overall borrowings through deposits and other than deposits. Whatever borrowings were there which will come as part of deposits plus Debentures and bonds and borrowings from shareholders all put together are they within the overall limits specified to the NBFC as per the Reserve Bank directions. Are you getting it? See, Reserve Bank directions were very lengthy. We don't have entire all the provisions of those directions. Getting it? Next, suppose no, if at all the overall borrowings of an NBFC, namely deposits, if they are exceeding the quantum specified, if they are exceeding the quantum specified, auditor has to report the same. Further, if the NBFC has accepted any deposit without a minimum credit grading, we need to comply downgrading all that refunding. See, we need to check the compliance with the acceptance of public deposits guidelines. Auditor has to report, especially in case of NBFC which is accepting deposits, the NBFC which is systematically important, you need to check whether the NBFC is maintaining capital adequacy ratio and report to the board of directors. Dear director, your NBFC has maintained minimum capital adequacy ratio, 25% it is maintained. Like that you need to reply. Then this is not required. 
and an auditor has to report to board of director whether the NBFC has violated any restriction on acceptance of deposits. Auditor has to report to the board of directors whether the NBFC has defaulted, whether NBFC has defaulted to the depositors. Auditor has to report to the directors whether NBFC has complied with the prudential norms, income recognition, asset classification norms. Auditor should report to the board of directors whether NBFC has maintained liquid assets as required. Auditor has to report to the board of directors whether the returns, quarterly returns that are to be submitted with RPI on deposits is submitted or not. This is not required. So in this entire list, no, any four points. This entire list, any four points. Are you getting it? Now in exam, they'll ask you a question like this. You are appointed as an auditor of an NBFC, which is deposit taking NBFC or it may be a systematically important non-deposit taking NBFC. Getting it? Now as part of your audit, you have submitted the audit report to the shareholder. In addition to that, as per RPA master direction, you have to give a separate report to the board of directors. What are the contents of the board of directors? Any six points. Write any six contents, six items that are to be included in a special audit report submitted to board of directors. In case of NBFC, accepting public deposits or deposit take, sorry, non-deposit systematically important NBFC. For normal NBFCs, what we talk, anyhow, anyhow we need to talk these points, whether the NBFC is holding proper registration certificate, are they continue to hold the registration certificate, if the NBFC is a base layer, are they complying with net out funds criteria, if NBFC is accepting public deposits, whether overall borrowings are within the limits, if the NBFC has accepted more than public permitted limit, are they regularized as per the RBI directions, so next, are they maintaining capital requirement adequacy ratio, um, whether the NPFC has defaulted in repayments, whether NPFC has complied with prudential norms, whether they have complied with liquid asset requirements, whether the NPFC is filing return of deposits with RBI on a quarterly basis or not, all these points we have to report to board of directors, remember? Remember, they know very well about their company operations, but still they are expecting a report from the auditor. Dear auditor, from your point of view, if you give a compliance report on all these items. Are you clear? Next, suppose in case of NPFC, which is not accepting public deposits, which is not accepting the public deposits. Then in the audit report, there are few more points which you need to cover. Now, when the NPFC is not accepting public deposit, the company should take an express decision. Explicit decision. Getting it? What is the explicit decision? Board resolution should be there. Regarding what? That the company decided not to accept a deposit. So see whether the board of directors has passed a resolution for non-acceptance of public deposits. Even after passing the resolution, did they accept any deposit check out? Getting it? Next, whether the company has complied with prudential norms, whether capital adequacy ratio has been correctly arrived, whether annual statements are furnished to the RBI regarding capital funds, risk exposure funds, all that. And see whether NPFC is correctly classified as a microfinance institution as per the master directions. As per the master directions, if it is classified as MFI, some rules will apply. Just you just have to mention whether is this NPFC classified as a microfinancial institution. That's it. Now, suppose if the NPFC is not required to hold certificate of registration because of some criteria. If NPFC is not required to hold certificate of registration, they are having NPFC activity but are exempted from having certificate of registration then you need to, uh, you know, just report on this to the board of directors. Now here, whenever you give any common negative, no, you need to give reasons also. Whenever you give comment negatively, you give reasons also. Suppose you mentioned the NBFC has not maintained capital adequacy requirement ratio. It's a deposit taking NBFC, CRAR is not maintained. Or it's a non-deposit taking systematically important, CRAR is not maintained. What is that? Clearly mention the reason. The CRAR is maintained at 14% only. The tire 1 capital is 9% only, which is actually 10%. So there is a violation of capital requirement adequacy ratio as required by middle layer, upper layer provisions of the RPI. Yes or no? All of you. That's it. So, with this predominant chapter is completed. Then, compliance with CARO. Compliance with CARO. In CARO, this first point do not apply for NBFCs, which are primarily lending credit, investment credit company to them, first point do not apply. Inside class 3, first point do not apply. Getting the point? You can see for this Muthut Finance. Muthut Finance is also a credit company which is giving loans, getting it. And uh, this already we have seen, yes or no? This entire clause 3, when we are discussing CARO itself, we have seen. Next, what is another one? Clause number 16. What is clause number 16? 
clause number 16 what is important is whether NPFC is required to be registered under 45 IA you need to check every company are doing audit Tata Motors have clearly mentioned that that the company is not liable for registration why because Tata Motors do not satisfy principal business criteria so they are not liable for registration so whether now okay they are not liable for registration have they conducted any activity of NPFC see activity of NPFC means principal business criteria if principal business criteria is satisfied obviously NPFC activity is conducted now is the company core investment company if so whether it continue to fulfill the criteria in case it is an exempted core investment company whether it continue to fulfill such exemption criteria which core investment company is exempted yeah less than 100 crore asset size core investment company if the group has more than one core investment company if yes in you know indicate the number of core investment companies Tata group has six core investment companies in the group Tata has six core investment companies in the group getting it so they mentioned that it is six and there are Tata Motors reply that yeah the company is not a core investment company because Tata Motors is not a core investment company now whether the company is a core investment company no are you getting it? So, uh, this is no, this is not applicable. Whereas, third point is uh, six for Tata Motors reporting requirement. Are you clear? This is CARO reporting. Now, what about applicability of NDAS to NBFC? Division 3 will apply. Division 3 is liquid assets format. Yes or no? Where we, we don't speak about non current, current assets. We speak about liquid assets and non liquid assets. Where we classify assets and liabilities based on liquidity wise. Getting it? Now, how? How NDIS Division 3 is different from Division 2? They have given some points. This is also an important question. Many times has been asked for 4 marks question. Any 4 points you have to write. For NBFC is NDIS Division 3 is applicable. The Schedule 3 Division 3 is applicable. Getting the point. And for NBFC is NDIS is also applicable. NDIS is applicable for NBFCs. And they need to prepare financial statements as per Schedule 3 Division 3. How Division 3 is different from Division 2? They have given some points here. Getting it? Can you read this? It's a very basic thing. Okay, so with this, the audit of NPFC chapter is completed. We have thoroughly discussed almost one, one hour, twenty minutes, one and a half hour. We discussed. Confident.